Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, boys and girls, have you ever heard of big things disappearing right out from under your nose? Oh, like a building, or a car, or a mountain. Right now you're saying, don't be foolish. You can't lose anything as big as that. Well, you can. And in today's adventure with Bill and his rangers, we're going to find out what it is and how it all happened. Right now... Bill and Henry are waiting for Colonel Anders to arrive on the noon train. Here comes the milk run special, Bill. <laughs> what a train for Colonel Anders to take to Naughty Pine. Stops at every cow crossing and hitching posts along the way. <laughs> yeah, you're right, pal. I wouldn't dare to ride it. But the Colonel has a reason. What reason would anyone have to ride that slow boat to China? Unless they just wanted to look at the scenery. Well, that's what he's doing. Huh? You mean the colonel's out looking at the scenery? Yeah. Well, why? He's been looking at this kind of country most of his life, hasn't he? Well, ask me later, Henry. Here comes the colonel now. Well, let's give him a hand with his bag. Oh, sure, Bill. Hello, there, Bill. Henry. Hello, Colonel Hi. Anders. How are you, sir? Fine, and you? The same, thank you. Well, hiya, Colonel. Here, let me take your bag. Thank you, Henry. Well, Bill, are you all set? Yes, we are, sir. All set? Why, something going on around here I don't know anything about? That's right, pal. I didn't get a chance to tell you before. The colonel's here to make a very thorough inspection of our operations. Something special? Why, yes, Henry. Some very important people are going to pay you a visit. <laughs> oh, so that's why you took the milk train, huh, colonel? And sort of looking things over as you went along. That's right. <clears throat> um, yes, Henry? Uh... Well, may I ask who the very important people are? Why, yes. The governor of our state, one of our senators in Washington, and the secretary of the Department of Interior. So see if everything all right with Buffalo Herd. Well, they'll be all right. Last night, the whole shooting match of them was close to the feeding barns. It sure is a beautiful day. Ah, breathe in that morning air, would you? Say, where's Herd, Stumpy? They nowhere in sight. Huh? What'd you say, young feller? I said the Buffalo are not here. But they gotta be here. Uh, they gotta be here, but they're not. Great day in the morning. You're right, Grey Wolf. No, ain't that peculiar. They've always been around the feeding barns. That is, till the grass gets good out on the range. Ah, uh, grass not good on range yet. They should be here. It's mighty odd looking to me. Grey Wolf, I think we'd better saddle up and find that herd. Star boy, oh boy. Oh boy. Well, you all set for the inspection tour, Colonel? Yes, Bill. There's a fine mount you've given me. Easy there, Dusty. You ready, Henry? Mm, sure. Best. Quiet down, girl. Quiet down now. 
Well, where do you want to go first, Colonel Anders? I'd like to take a look at the herd first, Bill. That's what the governor seems most interested in. You know, largest herd in the country and all that. All right, Colonel. Get up there, Storm. Come yeah. on, come on, boy. Yeah, best. Come on. missing. That impossible. Impossible is right. But I've seen it with my own eyes. And there's only one conclusion. Yep. Only one. That there herd of nickel faces is just plumb up and vanished into thin air. Stumpy, I'm not worried so much about what Bill says, what Colonel Anders say when he come. Colonel Anders? Yeah. Great horned toads. I clean forgot about him being here for inspection. Well, it. Been nice working for a forestry service, Grey Wolf. Well, we can face the music better on a full stomach, Grey Wolf. So, what do you say we wrestle up some grub for breakfast? Can there's a feed barns in the cabin up ahead. Looks very familiar, fellas. Stumpy's told many a good yarn in that cabin. Say, Bill, where's the herd? They're usually around the barns this early in spring, aren't they? Huh? Well, I don't know where they are, Colonel. Oh, perhaps the fellas draw them to the other end of the range just to give them exercise. Uh, hey, Bill. Huh? There's Stumpy and Grey Wolf in front of the cabin now. Good. Be nice to see them again. <laughs> Maybe the fellas will have the coffee pot on, Colonel, and, and we can have a nice, friendly chat over a cup of coffee. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Maybe Stuffy's got a story for us, huh? <laughs> ah, it's really nice to be out here at the old cabin again, fellas. Just like old times. Yeah, mighty nice to have you with us again, Colonel. Sorry, I don't have the fixings for some flapjacks. Grey Wolf kind of hit me out of house and home. And you're still living, Grey Wolf? <laughs> no, see here, Sonny. Oh, I'm, I'm here. I mean because you make them so well, good, Stumpy. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can see things haven't changed much. <laughs> well, Stumpy, how about spinning one of your famous yarns just for old times' sake, huh? Huh? Well, well uh. Well, sure, Colonel. Uh, only the. One I'm going to tell, I can hardly believe myself. This one must be good. What do you mean, Stumpy? Well, uh, it's this way, Colonel Anders. You see, last night, uh, I mean this morning, uh, no, it was last night, uh, something happened. Uh Uh-oh, now we'll have it. Quiet, Henry. Something happened? What was it? The buffalo herds plumb disappeared. Buffalo herds disappeared. Yes, sir. Whole kit and caboodle right into thin air. But that's impossible, Stumpy. Uh, no, Bill. Not impossible. It's true. We get on horses, ride range from one end to other. Buffalo, not anywhere. But how can a whole herd of buffalo just vanish? Uh, that's plenty of good question, Henry. I wish I could answer it. Well, you fellows will have to find an answer soon. Huh? What's that? Uh, what you mean, Colonel? I mean, there's some very important people who are interested in these buffalo. We've got to produce them when they visit here. Bill, you have a report ready on your progress by noon, will you? I'll go back to Naughty Pond and wait at headquarters. There's some other matters I have to attend to. There. All right, Colonel. Come on, boys. We've got a job to do. Find that herd. Colonel took it rather calmly, didn't he, Bill? 
You'd think he would have blown his top when Stumpy gave him the news. Colonel Anders is a Christian gentleman, pal. Tries to understand people and their problems. However, I wouldn't want to stretch his patience and understanding too far. There's a limit, you know. Oh, not right, Bill. Me hope him not reach limit before we find Buffalo. Now you and me likewise, Gray Wolf. What do you think we should do to find these missing critters, Bill? Well, first thing, after we saddle up, let's follow the herd's trail to where it ends. Ah, uh, that easy, Bill. It ends at Shady River. After that, poof, nothing. Hiya, Bess. Are you ready for some exercise? Hold it, fellas. What's the matter, Bill? You see something? Yes, Henry. Stumpy, Gray Wolf, I thought you said all the buffalo were missing. That right, Bill. Whole herd gone. Yep. They all up and get clean as a whistle. Well, what do you call those two animals walking around in the feedlot on the other side of this corral? Man alive. There's two buffalo in the feedlot. It can't be. It can't be. That's a mirage. And their critters ain't real. If I not see with my own eyes, I say you're right, Stumpy. But those real live buffalo are right. But where'd they come from? There was an area critter here before. And where's the rest of the herd? How did these two happen to get away from the main group? Well, that's the question. How did they? This is crazy, I tell you. Or something's crazy. Uh, maybe it's me. But there wasn't any buffalo here a while ago. There's something mighty peculiar going on hey, around hey, here. Hey, Stumpy, take it easy. Yeah, old timer, slow down. He'll burst a blood vessel. But how do you explain it? Well, I can't. It looks like this is developing into a real mystery. Yes, pal, and it's up to us to solve it or have our heads chopped off. Now let's saddle up, boys, and get going. Mr. Secretary, Senator Rand, it's a genuine pleasure to have you two gentlemen here at my home. Thank you, Governor, for your hospitality. I've been impressed by the beauty of your home and your state as well. I agree, Mr. Secretary. Everything in this state is well maintained and a real pleasure to see. Now, Governor, how about that buffalo herd? You brag so much about it that the secretary says he's just got to see those buffaloes. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. Secretary. You'll see the herd all right. We'll take a motor trip across the state. It'll be a naughty pine Saturday morning. That's fine, Governor. I'm certainly looking forward to it. You know, Mr. Secretary, we've got the largest herd in the world there at Naughty Pine. The rangers have raised some beautiful animals. Just as majestic as they ever were back in the old western days. You'd better not describe them any further to me, or I'll want to see them first thing in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've arranged all the details with Colonel Anders and the Ranger Bill Jefferson, Mr. Secretary. Oh, yes. Bill's been on several special assignments for me. He and the Colonel are very competent men. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing both of them. And those wonderful buffalo. <laughs> well, I guess I'll have to admit this is a real puzzler, fellas. And how? Say, maybe we've got flying buffalo. We got some kind of special buffalo. Just what you'd call them, I don't know. You can see yourself, it's no different what Grey Wolf and I found. The trail leads to the river, and that's the end of it. Uh, what make it worse is those two buffalo who showed up at feed barns. Not plenty strange to figure. Yeah, I don't see any trail signs across on the other riverbank. It'd be easy to spot where they came out of the river if they swam across. Well, what do you geniuses propose we do now? There's only one thing to do, fellas. Huh? What's that, Bill? I thought we'd looked the place over thoroughly already. We have, pal. Now let's split up and search the riverbank carefully. Maybe we'll find something that way. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Gray Wolf and I will go downstream, and Stumpy, you and Henry go upstream. We'll meet back here in two hours. Well, I'll be a 
a bandy-eyed polecat. We've come all the way up to the headwaters of the Shady River, and nary a sign of them disappearing critters, Henry. Yeah, it's pretty discouraging, isn't it, Stuffy? You're worse than that, Sonny. I'm exasperating. Who ever heard of flying buffalo? Or maybe they turned into fish and swam away when they hit the river. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stumpy, now, don't be ridiculous. Ridiculous, huh? Maybe you can tell me where they went to. Well, they must have gone up in the air, or maybe an airplane, or into the river, or we'd have picked up their trail by now. Yep, that's what I mean. Well, let's go back and meet Bill and Gray Wolf. See how they made out. Oh, I don't think they found any more than we did. <laughs> how do you know? Maybe they're dragging the whole herd back on the end of a rope. <laughs> Well, fellas, I give up. This one has me buffaloed. You mean we'll have buffaloitis if we don't find them? Well, we might as well go back and face the music. The colonel's waiting for a report. Uh, what a report this be. Might just as well get it over with, I guess. It's getting dark now, anyhow. You fellas stay here and keep an eye on things. I'll make my report alone. Can I go along with you, Bill? No, Henry, you stay with Stumpy and Grey Wolf. I'll be back out in the morning about sunup. Oh, okay. Now, your report will be some encouraging, Bill. What do you mean, old-timer? The herd's still missing, isn't it? Not all of them, Bill. Remember, two of them came back. So... That's your report, eh, Bill? Yes, sir, that's my report, Colonel. I'm rather ashamed, sir, but that's the truth of it. And, uh, this is the best you can do? I, well, this is only a momentary failure, Colonel Anders. There has to be a logical answer as to where the buffalo went. Right now, the answer is eluding us. <sighs> you can say that again. <clears throat> well... I'll give you one more day, Bill, to find that herd. Is that an ultimatum, sir? Bill, don't you understand? We're being visited Saturday morning by three very important people. But, Colonel, can't you stall them off for a while? I should stall off the Secretary of the Interior and the Governor and the Senator of our state? No, oh, I guess not. You couldn't stall them off any more than you could a tornado. Why are they coming here, if I may ask? They're coming here to see the herd. That's the main purpose of their visit, Bill. In a way, the honor of the Forestry Service is at stake. Imagine me telling the governor that a whole herd of his buffalo disappeared. <laughs> yeah, does make a pretty embarrassing situation, doesn't it? I'll get it, Colonel. Ranger headquarters, Bill Jefferson speaking. This is Governor Jones. I understand Colonel Anders is at your office now, Bill. May I speak to him, please? You certainly can, Governor. The Governor wants to talk to you, sir. Thanks, Bill. Hello, Colonel Anders speaking. Colonel, this is the Governor. I'm just making a last-minute check to be sure everything's set for our visit. Oh, uh, uh, why, yes, Governor, we're expecting you. You and the Senator and the Secretary. First thing Saturday morning. Fine, fine. Now, you'll have the buffalo herd in closely so the secretary can take a good look at them. Oh, yes, sir. They'll, uh, <clears throat> they'll be right around the feed barn so you gentlemen can take a look at them. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent, Colonel. You and Bill have handled this matter in an extremely competent way. I just want to be sure our guests aren't disappointed. We'll see you bright and early Saturday morning, then. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, excuse me, Colonel, but uh, haven't you stuck your neck way out, sir? How can you be sure we'll have the herd back here by Saturday morning? Oh, well, Bill, I do have my neck stuck out pretty far, but I'm counting on you to save the day. What's that, sir? Yes, Bill. You've never failed me yet, and I can't believe you're going to start now. But, sir, wouldn't it have been better to delay their visit another week? Impossible. Two of those VIPs have come here all the way from Washington. I don't think they'd appreciate making their trip for nothing. Yeah, that's right, sir. But won't they be more angry if they come here and we don't have the buffalo? 
Wouldn't it be better to openly admit the whole situation? And how would you explain to the governor and the other gentlemen that 50 head of buffalo have dropped right off the edge of the world? Um, should I tell them they all fell in the river and drowned? Oh, well, this is a situation for which there's no explanation. If somebody rustled the buffalo, that would be something else again. But who ever heard of 48 buffalo weighing on the average 1,000 pounds per head, just vanishing into thin air? Answer me that, will you? <laughs> if you had the answer to that question, sir, I'd gladly pay a year's wages for it. But this is a nasty situation. We did tell the governor. He'd be on the spot, too. And so would the secretary and the senator. If the word ever got back to Washington. Yes. There might even be a Senate investigation. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's only one answer, Bill, and you know what that is. Yes, sir. We've got to find that herd by Saturday morning. Coffee, Bill? Uh, please, Henry. Ah, uh, sure hits the spot after the fast ride out here this morning. Mm, Stumpy? Gray Wolf? Uh, how about another cup of mud? No, thanks, Henry. I've had enough. Me have enough for now, Henry. What's the matter, fellas? Uh, this is like having breakfast before a funeral. Maybe not as funny as it sounds, Bill. Maybe this our funeral as for strangers. Yeah, that's right, Gray Wolf. Uh, I'm worried. Just plum worried. Here we got all the big wigs coming, and there ain't no buffalo herd to see. Yeah, and if we don't have that herd here by Saturday morning, we'll all be in the soup but good. What are we going to do, Bill? Well, I don't know about you fellas, but I'm going to take a swim in the Shady River. Huh? I guess I'll have to wash my ears out again. I ain't hearing so good today. You hear right, Stumpy. Bill just sick in head. Well, let me feel your forehead, Bill. You must be running a fever. So, young fella, you're going swimming. Don't you know you're supposed to be looking for the missing buffalo? Not swimming in the Shady River? Personally, I think your roof is leaking just a bit. <laughs> Bill, are, are you serious about going swimming? Well, yes. Uh, Want to come along, fellas? Yeah, just for curiosity. <laughs> I don't believe you're going to do it. Let's go, then. I guess he means it, fellas. Yeah, too bad such a nice young fella like Bill had to crack up early in life. Yeah, that right, Stumpy. I think he really flip lid. After I have a good swim, fellas, we'll look again for the missing buffalo. Okay? After you have a good swim, Bill, we're going to take you to town where you can have a nice rest. They've got a swimming pool there. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're the ones that are balmy and the rest of the world's all right, but I don't get it. It's bad enough with the buffalo missing, but now Bill's taking a swim in water so cold it would freeze an iceberg. He's out in the middle of the river now. Look at him. He must be looking for something. What's he doing anyhow? Uh, that's plenty of good question, Henry. Oh! Hey, now what? He must have bumped into something in the water. No, me going crazy, too. Look at Bill, standing in foot of water out in the middle of the river. Great jumping jackrabbits. You know what Bill's found, Sonny? No, Stumpy, what? He's walking on a ledge of rock across the river. Man alive. You're right, Stumpy. He's walked all the way across the river in, in only about a foot of water. Uh, maybe this big news we wait for. Hey, fellas. I found the answer to the disappearing buffalo. Come on, Storm. Walk along, boy. There's nothing to be afraid of. You can't see where he's stepping, and that scares him some. Yeah. The ledge is covered with water all the way up to the headwaters of the river. Easy, Bess. Easy, girl. All is gone now. That's a girl. Bill? Yes, Henry? Do you think this ledge goes all along the side of the river? Sure does. Well, how come we didn't see it before? 
So the shadows from the Shady Mountains fell across the river in such a way that you wouldn't see the ledge. Oh, I see. Now, push your horses along, fellas. We haven't got too much time before the sun goes down. Hey, look ahead there, fellas. You see what I see? Oh, yes. They're opening inside a cannon wall. It must be Arroyo. Well, it has to be. Sure. The water's carved out a small chasm in the soft rock of the canyon wall. We wouldn't have seen that from the other side of the river if we looked all year. That's where our buffalo are, Henry. That arroyo is large enough to hold the entire herd and a lot more. Look, there are buffalo sign now. Trail plane is nose on face. Let's hold up, fellas. Oh, whoa, that's Whoa, there, girl. Whoa, sir. Whoa, boy. Well, there they are, boys. Our missing buffalo herd. And if you count noses, you'll find 48 of them, all present and accounted for. Oh, this is wonderful, Bill. Hey, how did you figure this one out? Well, after our careful search, all that was left was the river. Oh, I figured the river held a secret. There was only one way to find out. That was to take a swim. As soon as I bumped into the ledge... I knew what the answer was. Uh, that's plenty of good think on your part, Bill. <laughs> I'll have to apologize, young brother. Next time you go swimming at the wrong time, I'm going with you. Maybe I can get smart, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no use taking the herd back down to the range now. It's too late. We'll move them at the crack of dawn so they're back in time for the VIPs to see. VIP sure seem pleased with the herd, Colonel Anders. Oh, they're very pleased, Bill. I surely didn't know whether to have a heart attack or not this morning when I started out for here. What a relief when I saw the herd as we pulled up in the car. Tell me how you did it, Bill. Oh, I just went for a swim, Colonel, and, well, there they were. What? <laughs> surely you must be fooling. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, Colonel. Don't worry. We thought he was off his trolley, too, but he sure showed us a thing or two. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell me all about it as soon as our guests leave. I was plenty scared you mightn't be able to produce that herd. You were scared? How do you think me and Gray Wolf felt? Well, I don't know, Stumpy. How did you feel? Why, uh, we was, uh... Yes, Stumpy? Yes? Well, we, we was, uh... Well, let's have it, Stumpy. Uh, we was plum petrified. <laughs> well, Stumpy, all's well that ends well, they say. And it was a pretty narrow squeak at that. What if Bill hadn't taken a swim in the Shady River? The colonel's face sure would have been red. And how about the governor's face? Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. <laughs> Fellas and girls, have you ever had to stand firm for what was right? 
When the friends you palled around with all turned their backs on you and there you were, alone? Well, this is a story about a young lad named Mike who stood for what was right. He stuck by his guns when all of his pals were against him. Let's find out how it happened. Now, as our story opens, Bill is down at Tony's Fruit and Vegetable Market. Tony's an Italian, a fine man in every respect. But when his patience is tried to the limit, he gets angry like most of the rest of us. Let's drop in at Tony's store just as Bill enters. Ah, good morning, Bill. Good morning, Tony. How's the town's leading fruit and vegetable man this fine morning? <laughs> uh, Tony's are just a fine, Bill. Uh, you like some fresh fruit and vegetables this morning? Uh, yes, Tony. Uh, here's the order Mom gave me. Uh, half a dozen items, huh? Yeah, that's a fine. Uh, Tony, have them for you in a jiff. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, three pounds of apple. Uh-huh. Yeah, there she is. How's the family, Tony? Oh, they're just the fine, thanks. Uh, my little bambino said they grow just like a weed. <laughs> uh, Mommy says she's a feed them so good, uh, they grow like crazy. <laughs> Almost Tony think they race each other to see who can grow up first. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's plenty of excitement at home with all five of the youngsters on the loose, huh? Uh, there's the three pounds apples. And Tony throw in the one more, uh, just in case the one she's about. Now, let's see. A dozen orange. Yeah, there's a plenty of excitement in the Tony's house when all the five bambinos are cut loose. <laughs> uh, but Tony's are like a children. Oop. Now, that orange, she's got a black eye like my little Tony. <laughs> oh? Little Tony's got a black eye, you say? Now, three green peppers. Uh, yes, the little Tony's got a black eye in the school. Got a black eye in school, huh? They're fighting? Oh, he's not to fight. Uh, the teacher, she's asked him to name a three collective nouns. <laughs> Guess what he's a teller to teach. <laughs> I haven't the least idea. What did he tell him? Well, a little Tony's a teller to teach. A three collective nouns are a waste basket, a vacuum cleaner, and a fly paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's that got to do with the black eye, Tony? <laughs> well, everybody, she's a laugh, even the teach. Uh, Tony's a laugh, too. Only uh, he overdo it and uh, double up. And as he uh, double up with a laugh, he bang his eye on the corner of his desk. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I tell a little Tony uh, that uh, that's what he's a get for laughing at his own a joke. Okay, Bill, here's your stuff. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, how much is that? Uh, for you, Bill, it's a one dollar even. There we are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you come back often now, Bill. Uh, maybe next time, uh, little Tony, he's a black on the other eye, huh? <laughs> oh, well, the boys, uh, what's on your mind? Uh, Tony, sell you some nice apples. Are uh, they good for the health? Tony, we'd like to know if you'd give us a couple of bucks for baseball uniforms. Yeah, a couple of bucks, huh? Well, Tony's not know about that. A uh, couple of bucks who want to buy much of a baseball suit. Well, who's the make-up of the team? All of us guys in the gang. If you give us a couple of bucks, then we can get a couple of bucks from each of the other stores we have. Uh, so then we'll have enough to buy our suits. Mm, I'm going to have to talk to your dad first. That's a lot of money. Oh, come on, Tony. You got lots of money hid in the sock. You won't miss a couple of bucks. Well, that's another the point. Tony thinks a grown-up person should have hold the money till you buy the suits. Then he give. Why don't you say you don't want to give us the money? Yeah. Come on, fellas, let's get out of here. Tony's a tightwad. He wouldn't give us some money anyway. Yeah, but first Come let's help let's ourselves with some apples. Yeah. 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 Uh, you're going to have no apples to without the pay. Here's a good one. Grab some, fellas. Go show this guy he can't make a monkey out of us. He's a foreigner. Uh, you kids are leaving that fruit alone. Are uh, you taking my fruit? I call it the cops. Go ahead and call. They can't catch it. Hey, come back. Come back, my fruit. Please. Come back. Well, that's a bright to call a Tony a foreigner, huh? 
You come back into this store and you break your neck. Okay, knock it off, you guys. Hey, hold on. Hey, hold on. Now, you got something to say, Fatso? Yeah, Ed. We ought to fix Tony for not chipping it in for our uniform. That's right, Fatso. I say, let's wreck his store. Hey, hey, when's a good time? When's a good time? How about Wednesday afternoon after school? Y'all be there? Yeah, I'll be there. Sure. We'll show that foreigner who's boss in this town. When we want something, we're going to get it. What's the matter with you, Mike? You ain't said a word. Ain't you in favor? No, I'm not. Why not? I don't like the idea of wrecking Tony's store. Okay, come on, knock it off. What's the matter, Mike? You turn soft or something? I'm not turning soft, Ed. But what's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. And this would be wrong. Another thing, you guys shouldn't have taken any fruit from Tony's store today. Now we'll never get our suits. No? That's what you think. We'll get them all right. I take it you ain't going to help us wreck Tony's store. You've got the idea, Ed. I'm not helping. Count me out. I don't think it's a job I can take any part in. What's going on, pretty boy? What's the matter? You ain't chickened out on us before. What's more, I'm the boss of this gang, and I say you ain't backing out, see? No? Says who? I'm leaving, and you nor nobody else had better try to stop me. You rat us, buddy. We'll beat you up. You can't make me do something I don't want to. I said I'm leaving. Okay, Mike. But I'm telling you, if you go out that door, you're out of the gang for good. Well, what's your answer? That's the whole story, Henry. I'd like you to help straighten the gang out. They're not so bad, but since Ed's been the leader, they've followed him the wrong way. Well, I'm sure we can find a way to solve the problem, Mike. Tell me, is uh, Ed really a bad fellow, or is he just a bully? Oh, I don't know, Henry. He's always got a chip on his shoulder, especially with me. I don't know why, but I guess he's not all bad. I see. Say, Mike, aren't you afraid of being seen on the street with me since the gang threatened to beat you up if you talk? Nah, I can outrun all of them. I'm not afraid of them one or two at a time, but I can't fight the whole gang. Anyway, I'm not worried. They gotta catch me first. <laughs> That's the spirit, Mike. Always stick up for what's right, no matter what it costs. I'll see what I can do to help. How? Well, I don't know yet. Let's go talk to Bill Jefferson. He's good at figuring out things. Mike, I want to commend you. It's not always easy to stand up for what's right, but it's the sign of a real man. Well... It was worth it, Bill. Just to hear you say that. What do you think we should do about all this, Bill? You got any ideas kicking around? Yeah, I think so. Mike, you say the gang's going to meet in the old barn Wednesday after school, huh? Yeah, that's right. They're going to set up their plan to wreck Tony's store. All right, let's the three of us be there to meet them. trouble as long as he behaves himself. You hear me? Okay, now quiet down. Quiet down. We're not here to arrest anybody. Are you sure about that, Ranger? That's right. I just want to talk to you, that's all. Come on, Ed. 
Knock off the noise and listen, won't you? Okay, you guys. Listen, let's listen to what they have to say. Okay, we'll listen. Let's start off with a question. How badly do you fellas want those baseball uniforms? Now, what do you think is the best way to get them? Uh, Work, maybe. That's right, work. Hard, honest work. Is that what you fellas are planning to do? What's the matter? You lost your tongues? I take it that you were meeting here this afternoon to plan various ways you could get your uniforms, such as odd jobs and after-school jobs. Is that right? Come on, speak up, Ed. You're the leader. Okay. You know why we're meeting here. Mike told you all about what we're going to do. And why? Because he's a stool pigeon, that's why. Don't you call me a stool pigeon, Ed Blake. Why not? You read it on us, didn't you? And I told you we'd beat you up if you did. We'll get you for it, too. I'm not afraid of any one of you alone. But I can't fight the whole bunch at once. And you, Ed, you're the leader. I'll take you on any time you want. Or are you scared? Scared? Who's scared of you? Yeah, you won't fight me by yourself. Yeah, we'll see about that. Come on, I'll fight you right here. Come on, step out and fight. Okay, Ed, you're asking Oh, wait a minute, fellas. There'll be no bare fist fighting. Henry, you jump in the car and bring the boxing gloves from the gym. But, Phil, do you think you ought to let him fight? Yeah, Henry, I do. That's the best way to settle this argument. I'll referee. It'll be three two-minute rounds and let the best man win. After it's over, let the fellas choose who they want as leader, Ed or Mike. Okay, Bill, I'll get the gloves. Wait a minute. I ain't fighting unless it's bare fist. No sissy fighting for me. All right. We'll let the gang decide. What'll it be, boys? Bare fists or gloves? Gloves. 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 I guess it's gloves, Bill. Well, Ed, all the fellows have voted that you and Mike should use gloves. What do you say? I say I ain't fighting unless it's bare fist. And that's final. I'm leaving. What do we do now? Fellas, let me ask you something. You still want to wreck Tony's store? No, we don't. All right. Let's forget about this whole thing. Meanwhile, I'll do all I can to help you get your uniforms. Is that agreeable? Come on, then, fellas. Let's go home. We'll find out a better way to get our uniforms. Okay, Mike. Come on, you guys. Yeah, come yeah. On. Okay. What now, Bill? I think I'll go over and have a talk with Tony. I'll meet you back at headquarters after I've seen him. Bill, uh, I guess it's a time for Tony to close up at the shop. Uh, she's been a pretty good day today. Make lots of money for Rosie, the little bambinos. I'm huh? glad to hear it, Tony. Uh, go right ahead and count your cash. I can wait. Oh, no, no. Tony can uh, do that later. Uh, maybe you want to talk to me, huh? Yeah, Tony. I would like to have a chat with you for a few minutes. Uh, what she's about, Bill? The boys' club. Yes. And uh, their baseball uniforms. Oh. Tony, you've taken a lot from this gang, but believe me, there's no greater investment in the world than to help in the development of these young fellas. We never know what great things will come from it. Sure, today they're roughnecks. Tomorrow they'll be fine young men and great citizens. What do you say, Tony? Tony, he's not to decide. Go ahead to talk some more, Bill. Oh, I know they gave you a bad time, made some very unkind remarks, but I've talked with them about this, a whole bunch of them, and they're sorry, Tony. It won't happen again. Uh, how you found out about what happened? Uh, Mike told me all about it. I don't have a no thing against these boys. I like them. And maybe, Tony, buy all of the uniforms if somebody take a charge and see that my money's in other ways. Oh, no, Tony. You wouldn't have to buy all the uniforms. I want to do it, Bill. All right. Maybe I can get one of the boys' fathers to take charge. Uh, Mike's dad, for instance. How would that be? 
Tony would like it the better if you would do the bill. Okay, Tony. Ah, yes, well. Well, uh, Tony, he's understanding the boys. Uh, he's a one to show. He's a real American. And what's more, he's a forgive. He's also forget. Uh, like a good Christian. <laughs> As I live and breathe. Come on in. Well, the top of the evening to you, Bill, me boy. How are you? Just fine, Pat. Now pull up a chair, will you? Uh, me aching feet ain't what they used to be. Uh, pounder the beat gets to be a bit of a chore these days. What do you mean, Pat? You're in good physical condition, aren't you? Aye, uh, that I am. Fit as a fiddle. All oh, but these feet are mine. Uh, I bring you bad news, Bill, me boy. Oh? What's going on now, Pat? Now don't get your blood pressure up now till I tell you this. Tony's store was wrecked this afternoon after school. Tony's store? Who did it? Young Ed Blake, the leader of the Richmond Hill Gang. You mean he wrecked the store all by himself? Aye, that's right, Bill. And he did a mighty fine job of it, too. And it's me bound and duty to pick up the lad and take him in. Ah, that's too bad. Looks like he's spoiled it for the rest of the lads in the gang now. Uh, that's what I'm wondering about. And uh, that's why I stopped in here to see you, Bill. What do you mean, Pat? Bill, you know me pretty well, I think. I'm just a soft-hearted cop. I don't believe that Ed's a bad boy at heart. He's just got a chip on his shoulder, that's all. Somebody's got to knock it off. Now, I can do that all right. But it wouldn't straighten the lad out. Now, I thought that maybe you could step into the picture and uh, show the lad what he's wrong. Would you do that for old Irish friend? <laughs> okay, Pat. And I think I've got an idea how we can help young Ed Blake. Don't arrest him till I give you the word. Hey, Bill. Bill, wait a minute. Okay, fellas. Hey. Hi, Bill. Henry and I want to talk to you. Sure, Mike. What's on your mind? Uh, you better tell him, Henry. Bill, Ed Blake's wrecked Tony's store this afternoon. Yeah, I know. You know? Who told you? Patty O'Rourke. He was on his way to Ed's house to take him in. Ah, uh, that's tough. Are they going to arrest him? No, Mike, not yet. Pat asked me to help Ed, and I said I would. Huh? Oh, well, how are you going to do that, Bill? Got an idea. You fellas get the gang together in the old barn at 7.30 this evening and wait for me. Right now, I'm going over and talk to Tony. I don't think it'll do much good. Tony's sore. You can't blame him. I guess I would be, too. Anyway, we'll see what we can do. I'll see you at 7.30. Okay. Oh, well, bye, Bill. So long, Bill. No, Bill. Tony's to change his mind. I would have put not one red cent in the baseball uniforms. Oh, those boys are no good. And here's the proof. Oh, look at this. No, I don't have much talking point right now, Tony. But I'd like to change your mind for you, if you'll let me. Now, what do you mean? Tony, it wasn't the gang. It was Ed. Why should all the lads have to suffer because of one? This is hard for you to take, I know, but... I don't think that Ed's essentially a bad boy, either. He just got a chip on his shoulder. And he's got a chip, all right. Now, look, Tony. I'd like you to stop working and go home for the evening. Stop work? Ha! <laughs> That's what a Tony like it to do, too. But who's going to clean up this mess? Leave that to me, will you, Tony? It'll be cleaned up. That's a promise. And the damage will be paid for. That's another promise. You mean uh, that's a promise like you make it before? You tell Tony you fix it all up and the boys are they're sorry? <laughs> now look what's happened. Yeah, I know, Tony. My promises don't look so good in the light of what's happened, but give the gang one more chance, will you, Tony? Okay. Tony's to do that. You know, Bill, a Tony's to try to be American. He's to try to be a Christian. I'm a try to forgive and to forget. But this Ed, he's not to let me do it. Why? 
Why, tell me why. I don't know, Tony. That's something I've got to find out. Sometimes it takes a lot of love and patience to win a boy like that. It's like the Bible story of the love of a father for his prodigal son. It took love and patience and prayer over a period of many years. When there wasn't one soul in the world who cared a rap whether he lived or died, the boy knew his father still loved him. And that's what finally saved him. You know, Bill, you always make a Tony feel better. Since you talk to me, Tony's not feel so bad. You got a lot of love and patience. We'll see. to talk to you. Uh, fellas, I don't have to tell you by now what's happened. Because Ed did what he did. Your baseball uniforms are probably out. Okay, but we didn't wreck Tony's store. Why should Tony take it out on us? Yeah. Well, Tony figures that Ed's a part of the gang. Anyway, I figured out a way to change Tony's mind. Okay, if you quiet down, I'll tell you what it is. First thing is this. Tomorrow's Saturday. What do you say we all go over to Tony's store first thing and clean up that mess? Well, that went over like a lead balloon, Bill. Why should we? We didn't do it. That's true. Two fellas were in on the first visit to Tony's store, weren't you? In Tony's mind, the whole gang's involved. He's right, you guys. I guess we ought to do it. But Bill will help us get our uniforms if we do? I don't know. Right now, Tony is against helping at all. But we're not doing this for the uniforms. We're doing this because Tony's a friend and neighbor. And because it's the Christian and the American thing to do. I don't know. It's an awful mess to have to clean up. Listen, you guys. Bill's promised Tony the store would be cleaned up. And if we don't do it, Bill will have to do it himself. Now, how about that? Okay, I'll be there. I'll work hard, too. Count me in. Me, too, boy. How about the rest of you guys? Are you in? Sure. 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 They got at the store looking like a brand new. <laughs> and they work a hard, too. Tony's a like of that very much. Well, I'm glad you do, Tony. Maybe it'll make up for some of the things that have been done. I tell you, as you call the boys together, there's something I want to tell them. All right. Hey, gang, stop work and gather around. Uh, Tony's got something to tell you. I want to say a thank you for a good work. And because you're such a good and nice a kids, I'm going to buy your baseball uniforms all by myself. Boy, these sure are keen suits. Tony must have put out a lot of money for these. Yeah, I hope we can play as good as we look. Yeah, yeah even Fatso here looks good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, boy. Uh oh, it's Ed. Probably looking for trouble. Oh, maybe not. Don't interfere, Henry. This had to come sooner or later. Hello, Ed. Want something? Uh, yeah. You're not in the gang, Ed. Now that we've got our uniforms, you want back, huh? Uh-oh, party's getting rough, Bill. Quiet, Henry. Let them blow off steam. This is our clubhouse, Ed. What do you want? Well, I'd like to come back into the club. I'm afraid not, Ed. Not only for what you did to us, but most of all, for what you did to Tony's store. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sorry, all right. Does that change anything? No, we don't want you. Uh, please, the kids. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, it's Tony. Uh, maybe you'll take Ed back. 
If Tony asks you nice, please. Why, Tony? Take him back. Tony, you want us to let Ed back in after what he did to you? Yes, Mike. He's coming to see me. He says he's going to work for me and pay it all back. So, let him back in the club. Tony, he's even a bad baseball uniform for him if you let him in. I sure you boys can forgive and forget if Tony can do it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, sure, Tony. If you can do it, so can we. Ain't that right, gang? So, Ed, you're back in the gang. Thanks, Mike. Now, one more thing. Yeah? You and I have got to settle things between us. Settle it? Yeah, with gloves. Oh, what for? Because I want it. Well, I don't want to fight you, Ed. But if you want it, all right. Bill, you want a referee for yeah, us? All right, fellas. You're about even so far. Now, this is the last round of the three. Come out, fight. Back to your corner, Mike. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's all. Fight's over. Here, Ed. Let me help you up. Well, that was a hard punch, that last one, wasn't it? It sure was. How you feeling now? Okay now, Bill. The last one really made you see stars. I'm sorry, Ed. I didn't want to fight you. But you forced me into it, so... That's all right, Mike. I didn't want to fight you either. But Tony wanted me to do it. Another thing I... I guess I needed a good beating, too. Sort of square things up. I want you and me to be buddies, Mike. How about it? Ed, from here on in, we're buddies. I can't even hear myself think with all the record cord out in here. It looks like I missed the party. Yes, the party. You missed the party, but uh, you can stay for the refreshment. <laughs> yes, and Pat did stay for the refreshments, and they all had a wonderful time. Indeed, it was like the celebration the father in the Bible story gave when his son came back from a far country. The Irishman, the Italian, the Rangers, the boys... Welcome, Ed Blake, back to the gang. We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Rangers! of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. This is a lazy day in Knotty Pine. The rangers are strolling down one of the town's shady streets, heading toward the town's old general store. 
The old store is a landmark of the days when the West was wild and woolly, and it's run by Mark Daggert. Many of the townsfolk visit the store to hear the old cowhands and prospectors, uh, desert rats as they call them, swaps yarns. Now let's join Bill and the boys as they head for the store. Little do they know that they're heading for one of the most grueling experiences of their lives. Listen now for the story, Burning Sand. You know, Bill, I like to visit Mark's store. It smacks of the Old West. Sort of gives you a feeling that you're living back in those times again. Yes, Ralph. There's a lot of history centered in Mark's old general store. You know, I get a kick out of listening to those old cow pokes and desert rats spinning their yarns, each trying to outdo the other. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a lot of competition there. <laughs> uh, you don't think that most of their stories are made up, do you, Bill? No, essentially, there's a lot more truth in them than most people think. Of course, the old-timers do add a little color to their yarns. <laughs> like uh, somebody else we know of? Now, see here, young feller. Don't look at me that way. I'd have you know I don't color up my yarns. Uh, not even a little bit, Stumpy? Nope. I'd give you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, maybe you just put a little tint to your tails, huh, Stumpy? Well, uh, maybe I should say I guess I do sort of tint them up once in a while uh, just to make them interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quit picking on the old timer, fellas. You enjoy Stumpy's yarns just as much as the rest of us. Yeah, I Look like big crowd in store. Many old timers there. Yeah, maybe we'll see some more hair raising tales about the old engine days. Well, whoever has the floor, it's my guess that Stumpy will go him one better. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Pandora. Uh, give him a chance, boys. That's right, Stumpy. Five of them. Yes, five? What's the matter? Were you two fellers weak that day or just plumb lazy? <laughs> now, you see here, you old cougar. I should have taken only one of you to finish five of them off. The other could have gone about his business. Yeah, is that right? Well, I ain't seen you do any better. You ain't? Did I ever tell you about the fracas me and Big Jim Hansen had at Hooker Pass with a gang of desperados? Why, I'm telling you, when I... Well, look at us here. Howdy, Josh. Hey, where you been keeping yourself, Joshua? Ain't seen you for a month of Sundays. <laughs> oh, I've been busy, Mark. I suppose you've been looking for gold again, huh, Josh? That's right. Been prospecting. <laughs> What'd you expect from an old desert rat like me? When are you gonna give up looking for fool's gold, Josh? Yeah, hell I expect when they dig your grave, they'll find gold, Joshua. You got gold fever that bad? <laughs> fool's gold, eh? Gold fever? Let me show you fellas something that'll make your eyes bulge. There it is, boys. You think I've been uh, wasting my time on the desert, eh? You haven't got gold in that sack, Josh. I ain't, huh? What'd you call this? Oh, look at that. Thing. <laughs> ah, don't stand there with your mouth open, Mark Taggart. Set me up some supplies and grub. I got some more work to do. There ain't nothing to get excited about. What do you mean, Joshua? Ain't gold findings like that something to get excited about? Yeah. No, it ain't. This was just a small pocket, and I cleaned it out. Where'd you find the small pocket, Josh? <laughs> now, that uh, would be telling, wouldn't it? Why don't you go out and hunt your own gold like I've been doing for 30 years? Fellows, that was big thrill to see Joshua pour gold nuggets out on Cocker. And easy to understand how men catch gold fever. And that's right, Gray Wolf. But old Joshua has been prospecting for 30 years. And this is only the fourth small find he's made. Not much reward after all, is it? A lot of work for a little pay, if you ask me. Uh, almost like work for nothing. Yep. That ain't the worst part of it, young feller. When you think of a desert rat being on the hot sand in the cold mountains, year in and year out, all by himself. Never gets to see people live like a hermit. Just him and his burrow. Why, it's awful. 
Ah, skin get like old horse hide from sun and wind. Get frostbite in cold winter. Not much satisfaction, I think. You fellas forget that these desert rats wouldn't have it any other way. And if that's the way Joshua wants to live, that's his business. The only thing is, I think he's flirting with real danger if he keeps going out there in the desert now. What do you mean? Uh, is it any more dangerous now than it was before, Bill? For him, it is. Joshua's getting to be an old man now. The heat of the desert is hard enough for a young man to take at this time of the year. To say nothing about a man of 70. Josh better be careful. Well, these kind always die with their boots on. And there's not much you can do about it. What's on the docket for tomorrow? Hard work. That's all I can tell you now. Rest well tonight. We hit the trail for three weeks in the morning. Where are we heading first, Bill? Up the Long Ridge Trail, Ralph. Huh? We got some scrub to clean out of a virgin stand of pine. Then we head for the North Forks and repair the soil conservation dams there. Somebody on the road ahead. Say, it looked like old Joshua Whip. Hey, it not only looks like old Josh, it is him. He must be going back into the desert. Let's stop and talk with him for a minute. Close time. Oh, boy. Hello, Joshua. Howdy, Bill. Howdy, fellas. Howdy, Josh. Heading out into the desert again, Josh? Yep, that's what I'm doing. Why, you not take it easy for a while, Joshua? No, no, I can't do that, Grey Wolf. I get the itch if I set a spell. Got to keep going. Wouldn't hurt you any to set a spell, you old desert rat. Someday you're going to overdo it. You'll set permanent six feet under. Never you mind, Stumpy Jenkins. I'm old enough to take care of myself. I'm sure you are, Josh, but Stumpy's right just the same. It's awfully hot out there in the desert. You're not a young man anymore. You could at least stay in town until the summer's over. Are you fellas that are trying to keep me from finding gold? Why don't you mind your own business? I can take care of myself. Now get. I didn't mean to offend you, Josh. I only wanted to remind you that it's dangerous. It's 120 degrees out there at this time of the year. I don't need your advice, I tell you. All right. So long, Josh. Let's go, boys. Come on, Storm. <laughs> Gray Wolf, we'll have to cut down this tree. It's too far gone. The disease may spread. Ah, oh, good. You cut the fall guide, will you? Well, I start on the underside and cut away the trunk. Okay, Bill. This tree not too big. Not take long. That's right, Stumpy. Why don't you pull on your end? I would. Oh, you're riding the saw. Yes, but my feet aren't dragging like yours, old timer. <laughs> okay, Sonny. I guess you're on the ball today. I thought I could get one up on you. <laughs> Not today, Stumpy. Uh, every time some fellow bends elbow, his mouth fall open. Yeah. And the proof of it is that we're almost through our log. They're only halfway. <laughs> Is that so? What do you say we race them, Stumpy? Let's see who get through first. Okay, Sonny. Let's pour a little elbow grease in this here saw and let her rip. <laughs> Our job is to trap some of these trout and put tags on them. Uh, you study their traveling habits, Bill? Right. Ralph, would you like to set out those water traps? Sure, I'll have them in there in a jiffy, Bill. And, Grey Wolf, you take motion pictures of the schools of trout swimming by. Oh, uh, me do. What's that for, youngster? 
Well, the idea is later we can set the projector on slow motion and count the number of trout that have passed the camera in a given length of time. Ah, that give us idea how many fish in river to spawn and go back downstream. Yes. You see, we'll count that number that pass in a 15-minute period, multiply by four to get an hourly figure, then a day, then a week, and so forth. Only approximate, of course, but the figure comes out amazingly close. Well, they've sure come a long way since I first started working for Uncle Sam. <laughs> Town seems kind of crowded after being on the trail three weeks, doesn't it, Bill? Sure does, Ralph. Say, I wonder if Joshua Webb came back. He'd been gone in three weeks. Didn't have more than two and a half weeks' supplies with him when he left. I hope old-timer make great. Say, Mark's store's just down the road a piece. Let's stop by and see. <laughs> No, Bill, I ain't seen Joshua, which ain't no surprise to me. That guy's got gold fever so bad he don't have sense enough to come in out of the heat. Hmm. Do you think he could stretch his supplies this long, Mark? It's three weeks now. Uh, maybe he'd short ration himself, make the supplies last that much longer. Ah, uh, that's all. It's possible that he could stretch his food and water a whole week longer that way, Bill. Yep. Oh, Josh could squeeze water out of a stone if he put his mind to it. All right, I'll buy that for two days, fellas. But if Joshua doesn't show up in that time, we're going out on the desert and look for him. Say, Bill, look hard for Joshua Webb, will you? much fun as I poke at him, I still like the old desert rat. And I hope you find him in time. Oh, sure. Easy, boy. Easy. I will find him, Mark. I hope we're not too late, though. We'll let you know as soon as we can what's happened. All right, Storm Boy, let's go. Come on, boy. Let the pack horses drag, Ralph. Keep them stepping along. Okay, Bill. I'll keep moving. Where do you figure to look first for Josh, Will? We'll follow his trail going out in the desert and watch for a back trail. Must be out on desert soon. It's plenty hot there now. Burning sand, Gray Wolf. Miles and miles of nothing else but. Uh, it's plenty hard on man and animal. Oh, we better slow down once we get out on the sand. The horses couldn't take this pace in that heat. Hey, fellas, look. Yeah? Over by that bunch of scrub. There's something laying on the ground. Great Scott. There's a burrow standing there, too. Come on. Yeah, hey, get up, up. Up. Get up. Oh. Hey. Well, looks like the gold fever finally got the old fella. Close, oh, 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 there, Matilde. Yeah, Josh, all right. He's still alive. We'll try to revive him as much as we can, then get him to the hospital. How's our prospecting friend coming along, Doc? Well, if you're talking about this old desert rat, Bill, he's doing fine. A week of rest, he'll be up and around. But he shouldn't go back out on the desert again for a long while. Well, you talk with him a while. I've got to finish making the rounds. I'll see you later, fellow. So long, Doc. <laughs> Imagine him telling me I can't go back out in the desert for a long time. <laughs> No man is going to tell me what to do. Why, you old buzzard, it would do you good to listen to some sound advice once in your life. You're too cantankerous. Remember, Josh, you're not a spring chicken anymore. Ah, uh, you flirt with death if you go back there now. <laughs> Ain't uh, you going to give me a piece of your mind, too, Bill? I was just getting ready to, Joshua. I'll go ahead. I agree with my rangers and the doctor. You'd be endangering your own life if you went out on the desert again. But there's more to it than that. What do you mean? I mean you ought to start enjoying life a little. Mix in with people more. 
No, I like prospecting too much to be bothered with people. Gold won't buy your life back if you lost it, Joshua. I ain't afraid to die, young man. When the good Lord's ready to call me home, I'm ready. Well, that's good, but think of the things in life that you've missed, that every human being enjoys. You've got enough money from your last strike to tide you over for the rest of your life. Ah, uh, that's right. Why, sure, Josh. You and me could go hunting and fishing together. We could set a spell over in Mark's store and talk with the boys of an evening. <laughs> yeah, now you got me thinking that uh, I might like staying in town. Well, why not give it a try for a while? Well, I might, but uh, I ain't got no place to stay. Why, you old walrus, you can stay at my place just as long as you please. Ain't nothing fancy, but it's homey. <laughs> Thanks, Stumpy. I think I'll take you up on that and uh, try civilized life for a while. Then you're definitely going to give up prospecting for gold in the desert, Joshua? In the desert? Well, yes. Well, Bill, you, you know there's gold in more places than the desert. Oh, sure. Well, Josh, let's come down to this, then. Are you going to give up prospecting, or aren't you? Yep, yep, I am going to give it up. From now on, I'm going to enjoy life. Josh, put it there. You've made a good decision. <laughs> Fellas, we'll have to get packed as fast as we can. Tom says the Scotch pine up at the North Forks have been hit by a strange new disease. They're wasting away. Ah, uh, that beautiful stand, worth much money. That's right. We can't afford to lose either the beauty or the money. Ralph, you finish packing the burrows. I'm going back to the office and get the portable lamp. We've got to make a thorough study of this new disease. Okay, burrows will be ready by the time you get back. And Gray Wolf, uh, give me a hand with this diamond hitch, will you? Oh, sure thing. Hey, somebody's coming in a big hurry. Oh, plenty quick. Hey, it's Stumpy. Oh, Danny, over there. What's wrong, Stumpy? Why all the hurry? I rode over to tell you about Josh. He ain't been home for two days. Well, why didn't you tell us sooner, old-timer? Well, I didn't think much about it, Bill. The first night, he could have stayed at Mark Dagger's house, but when he didn't come home last night, I began to get worried. Do you think he's gone back on his promise, Bill? I don't know, Ralph. Did he give you any reason to believe he might go back out in the desert, Stumpy? You can't say he did, Sonny. Nope. Nary a hint. What we do now, Bill? Well, we're going out on the trail anyway. Let's stop at Mark's store and find out if Joshua bought supplies. If he did, the Scotch Pine will have to wait until we find him. He's certainly in no condition to make a prospecting trip. I'm sorry I can't help you, Bill. Old Joshua didn't buy supplies for me, nor has he been staying here. You wouldn't be covering up for the old desert rat because he broke his promise to me, would you, Mark? No, of course I wouldn't. It might cost Joshua his life if it did. I agree with you and the doc. Joshua's prospecting days are over. His heart being what it is. Maybe he got his supplies from some other store in town, Bill. Yes, Ralph, he could easily have done that. Let's spread out and ask all the stores if they've seen the old gent. Report back here in two hours. No, I haven't seen Joshua Webb Stumpy. Sorry. Hey, Joshua didn't buy supplies for me, Bill. Joshua ain't been in my store for a coon's age, Ralph. Gray Wolf, he hasn't been near here for six months. Yes, Joshua was here, Bill. He bought himself some grub in the burrow. Also some prospecting tools. He was muttering something about he, he couldn't sit around and do nothing all the time. And that's what I was afraid of. Thanks, Barry. Come on, boys. We're going after Joshua. You mean out on the desert this time of year? Stumpy, you don't mean that. We're going to get Joshua before the desert gets him. Understand, I'm not holding back, but with a hundred miles of hot sand out there, he's going to be mighty rugged. I oh, bet you could fry a steak in my saddle horn. Oh, this is terrible. 
How could Josh stand this year in and year out? I don't know, Ralph. I think you have to be made of rubber and rawhide. Well, let's rest a minute, fellas. Most oh, on. Oh, 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 boy. Oh, now. Thank the Lord, it's only a couple of more hours until sundown. You better wet our horses and burrow's mouths, huh? Ah, uh, good. It, me take water bag and help Ralph. Yeah, hold this pan, will you, Grey Wolf? Uh. Now, don't you fellas take any more than that, either. It's better to drink more water at night to catch up on the dehydration that takes place during the day. How do these old desert rats stand this heat? I, I don't even care to keep my eyes open. It's so hot. 120 degrees. No wonder Josh looked like prune. Okay, let's push on, fellas. A high wind could come up and wipe out Joshua's trail. Let's follow it while we can. Sand in my teeth, sand in my ears, sand in my eyes, and sand in my food and water. Why didn't Josh stay home instead of coming out here like an old fool? Mm, what's the use of complaining, Stumpy? Got a job to do. Let's do it. I'm sure glad for sundown, though. After three days in this heat, it starts to wear on you. Not only on us, Ralph, but on the animals, too. Mm. Better all get some sleep. I want to push on as soon as the moon comes up. Let's shake a leg, fellas. We want to gain time before it gets too hot. Hey, that's a rattlesnake. Huh? Watch the horses and burrows. I'll get him. Uh, hold it, hold it. Ralph, Ready. those water bottles. Watch them. Get that snake before yes. we lose horses. Yeah. Bill. Bill, the horses what? have kicked the water bottles oh, in. Oh, no. How many bags were damaged, Ralph? All of them. The only water we have is what's in our canteens. That's right. Uh, that's very bad. Yeah. Well, let's get the horses and burrows and be on our way. Here, Storm. You guess the best thing to do is go ahead, Bill? Yes, Grey Wolf. There must be water somewhere close to Joshua's prospecting grounds. Yeah, but we don't know where that is. I'm beginning to have a notion as to the place. But we'll keep following the trail. Right now, it'd be more dangerous to go back than to go on. How far we must go to trail, Joshua? We must stop someplace and dig. Keep following the trail, Grey Wolf. Can't we have just a, a little water for ourselves? Ralph, use your head. There's only a quarter of a canteen left. We must keep that for the horses. Even the burros will have to wait. Far we go, Bill. Maybe we follow a wrong trail. I don't figure Josh would have come all this way. Stumpy, let me tell you something. Remember when Josh... Told me all the gold wasn't in the desert. Huh? Uh, yes. Uh, I remember. To me, that means only one place. Lonesome Mountain. There's water there. There's got to be. And, and what, if, what if you're wrong, Bill? It'll be my last mistake. There's the mountain up ahead, fellas. There's a piece of Joshua's gear, fellas. Uh, we're on the right track. Yes, sir. But how much farther? I, I, I can't go on. You've got to, Ralph. Uh, One more day should do it. Uh, we'll leave the burrows here, all our gear. Travel as light as possible. Let's go while we can. I can't... Don't go. talk, Bill. We go on like you say... Nobody talk. Just ride until the horses drop and then, then walk and then crawl. 
You can always die when you can't do nothing else. <laughs> here all day and pour this cool water over my head. <laughs> oh. Oh. And ruin your ten dollar shirt. <laughs> oh, I not care. Oh, it's man. worth my life. Uh, fellas, oh. look over by that flat rock. There's a man's hand. Poor Josh. With water a hundred feet away, he lay down and died. Uh, here is note. And some gold nuggets. What's he say, Bill? Well, he says, Bill Jefferson, I know you were following. My heart gave out. All the gold in the world wouldn't buy me water when I needed it. Not sorry dying this way. Bury me on lonesome. That's as far as he got. Well, he went just the way he wanted to go. Out on the desert and the mountains, looking for gold. Ralph, Grey Wolf, get the burrows and the gear. When you get back, we'll have a little service for Joshua Webb. Just before we bury him. Do you think it was a gold fever made Josh break his promise? Nope, I don't. I've got a notion Joshua knew his time was near and all he wanted to do was go across the desert and up in the lonesome mountain to meet the Lord. Well, I guess that's the story, boys and girls. The story of Joshua Webb, desert rat, who just wouldn't stay where he was put. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Boys and girls, have you ever been in a submarine? Or have you ever gotten inside a diver suit and gone down into the depths of the sea? <laughs> I suppose not. After all, most of us are land lovers, lake sailors at the best. But what would you do if you knew that a submarine was stuck at the bottom of the ocean? And meanwhile, the crew was suffocating. Why, you'd try to get them out, of course. But the big question would be how to do it. Well, let's find out what Bill and the Rangers did in such a situation as that. Keep your ears glued to the radio for the story of 20 Fathoms Under the Sea. Man, this blue oil really burns up the rails. I wonder how fast we're going, Bill. I don't know, Henry. There's a stretch of track ahead where the engineer pushes her up to 93. Wow, 
Ninety-three miles an hour. Oh, that's plenty fast in any man's book. Yep. <laughs> Just a little faster than I can run at high speed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, say, Bill, do we have to eat the fish we catch in this trip? Well, that all depends on what kind of fish we catch, pal. Some ocean fish aren't edible, of course. Probably eat some of them. Oh, I don't like fish that much. Not ocean fish, anyhow. Brook trout, yeah. But not even too much of them. You don't know what's good for you, Henry. Fish good brain food. Make you plenty smart. Oh, I don't believe that, Grey Wolf. <laughs> Besides, even if it is true, there must be other kinds of brain food. Yeah, there sure is, sonny. Huh? What other kind, Stumpy? Noodle soup. Oh, Stumpy. <laughs> uh, you walked right into that one, pal, with both eyes open. Yeah, mouth too. <laughs> I just wanted to show you young fellas that I'm still perking. Bill, you seem to know Ben Benson pretty well. How come? Well, Ben's an old salvage man, Grey Wolf. He's brought up some historic wrecks on the bottom of the sea in his time, including several maroon submarines. I got to know him when I was in the Navy. Well, is he retired now, Bill? Well, yes, yeah, sort of forced retirement, you might say, Henry. What do you mean by that? You see, Ben's son was accidentally killed during the salvage operation. Ben always felt he himself was responsible. So he quit the salvage game and bought himself a power launch to take fishing parties out on. Oh, rather a sad ending for the old gent. Does he show his sorrow, Bill? No, not as a rule. He has times when he's very quiet, though, and he looks out to sea. I feel sorry for old Ben. Served in the dining car. Dinner served in the dining car. First call for dinner. Dining car four cars forward. Hey, that's what I've been waiting to hear all day. Let's go before my stomach leaves my body and goes by itself. <laughs> Come on, fellas, let's head for the chuck wagon before they run out of food. Then we can get ready to get off the train. Stops on this side of the bay at Harbor City, then he crosses over to the main station. Let us out right at the sign that says Ben Benson, Gabby. Sure, Mister. Anywhere you say. This waterfront sure looks quaint, Bill. All the launch skippers along here must be old sea dogs, huh? That's right, Bill. Most of these men are retired seamen. I guess there's some mighty tall sea yarn spun around these wharfs. That'll be two fifty, mister. All right. You your friend? No, that's all right. Oh, thanks, mister. Come on, pal, let's go. I want to keep the cab standing any longer than necessary. Sure, Bill, sure. I've got my big feet tangled around the bag. There. Now I'm able to move. Hey, there's old Ben coming down the dock now. Mm, he look like a real sea dog. Him still walk with rolling ship. <laughs> you and he'll make good friends, Gray Wolf. Hello, Ben. Good to see you again. Uh, uh, uh. Well, Bill, how are you? Uh, it does my salty eyes good to see you again. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. The same to you. Ben, I want you to meet three of my rangers. They're also my closest friends. Henry Scott, Gray Wolf, and Stumpy Jenkins. Fellas, I'd like you to meet Ben Benson. Oh, hi, Ben. Oh, Howdy ben. there, Ben. <laughs> well, it's mighty fine to meet you fellas. I see you have uh, old men of the woods in your service, too, Bill. Uh, Stumpy's uh, got quite a bit of moss on his uh, <laughs> north side. Sure. We got old men in the woods. What do you see dogs think? You ain't got no lease on old age. Just because you're preserved in salt water. I noticed quite a few barnacles in your hull, you old Wallace. Uh, hey, uh, Bill, uh, maybe uh, we better go home. It's all right, pal. They've got a twinkle in their eyes. They're talking to each other like ducks to water. Glad to have you aboard, you old muskrat. I don't suppose you've ever been in anything larger than a rowboat. Nope. <laughs> and I stay out of them as much as I can. I get all the water I want in the bathtub. <laughs> oh, you're all right, Stumpy. Yeah, you ain't so bad yourself, Ben. <laughs> well, come on aboard the swordfish, fellas. 
It ain't no each sense standing on the dock when you can stand on the decks of the best sea going launch afloat. When we shove off for fishing grounds, Ben. Right at sundown, Grey Wolf. We'll be where the big fish are at dawn. Mr. Jones, I gave the order to surface this craft. What are we waiting for? Well, the engine room isn't responding, Captain Nagel. We've sounded the surfacing signal twice. Well, are they sleeping back there? I'll get them on the intercom. Let me have your headphones, Sandal. Hello, engine room. Well, what's the trouble down there? Can't you hear the signals? Well, what do they say, Mr. Jones? What? Are you sure? No, no, stand by while I tell the captain. Skipper, the ballast tank pumps have broken down and refused to work. A vast servicing and stand by. I'm going aft. Keep those headphones on for my orders, Jones. Aye, aye, sir. Well, Mr. Antonio, what's it look like inside the pump? It looks bad, sir. The main rod's broken clean in two, and it tore the cylinder to shreds. Hmm. Can you fix it? Well, I sure can, Skipper, but with those gouges in the cylinder wall, I, well, I doubt if I can get enough compression to handle the ballast tanks. What caused the break, Mr. Antonio? Weren't these pumps inspected before we put to sea? Well, they certainly were, sir. I inspected them myself. I'll see what I can do with the pumps. Very well. Report to me on the bridge when they're repaired. Aye, aye, sir. Now hear this. Attention all hands. Now hear this. The captain's going to speak to the crew. All right, men. Put your fears in your sea bags and listen to me. Most of you are green submariners, but I've gone through this before, and so have your trainers. Jones, McLaughlin, Antonio, Savage, Boyd, Prince, and the Torpedo Men. They've gone through this same experience, and they're still alive. Let's not get panicky. Remember an old axiom. He who loses his head may lose his life. Stand by for further announcement from the bosun. Now hear this, men. The captain will inspect the ship at 1,400. Mr. Jones, I want you to keep the crew busy. Keep them working so hard they won't have time to get panicky. That's a direct order. After you inspect the ship, what should I have them do, sir? Clean it again? That's right, Mr. Jones. Even if they have to do it with toothbrushes. Your job is to keep the men busy. Let Mr. Antonio and his men worry about the pumps. Mind if I join you, Ben? Huh? Oh, no, of course not, Bill. I didn't hear you come on deck. I saw you sitting out here from my cabin window. Then I join your fellowship with the sea in the quiet of the night. Oh, a fella can do a heap of thinking when there's just the sea and himself. But he's a good listener, Bill. Yes, Ben. The sea never tells any secrets either. She just listens, keeps the confidence of her sailors, and hides their thoughts in the deepest waters. I guess it's the sea that's kept me on an even keel since Frank died. Whenever I get depressed, I, I put out to sea and have a long talk with the Lord. I don't know if I'm right, but the Lord seems so much near out here. Ben, when are you going to stop beating yourself for Frank's death? I don't know, Bill. I keep hearing his last words. 
He kept, kept calling for oxygen. Just can't seem to get them last few moments out of my mind. But it was an accident, Ben. You couldn't help it if his lines fouled in the sunken wreck. Why put yourself on a shelf away from everybody? The world needs some good salvage men like you. That's the way I want it, Ben. How can men put confidence in a salvage man who, who let his own son die under the water? I just couldn't have men depending on me for advice and guidance below the water. Ten fathoms down is an awful place to be trapped by, by an old fool who doesn't know what he's been doing, Bill. Fifteen fathoms is, is an intolerable place for it to happen. You know, I'm sorry, Ben. I didn't intend to get you all riled up. I guess I'll turn in now. Wait, wait a minute, Bill. Yes, Ben? It's done me good to, to get some of this off my chest. I know you understand. Sure, Ben. I understand. before he falls overboard. Uh, we got him. No sense for us to fish for fish and Henry, too. Not you, you know, Henry, before you run out of the line. Take a couple of turns on your reel every time he gives you a slack, Henry. Hey, there's a fish. He just jumped out of the water. Boy, what a whale. <laughs> kind of small for a whale, sonny. <laughs> Maybe his mother didn't feed him when he was young. You fellas help Henry get his fish aboard. Old Ben's upset about something. I'm going to find out what it is. You go ahead, Bill. Henry got fish pretty well in hand now. Ben, feeling all right? Sure. Why? Do I look sickly? No, but you're acting strangely. What's wrong? I don't know, Bill. I, I just have the feeling that there's something going on under these waters. Huh? What do you mean, Ben? I can't explain it, Bill. I, I just got a feeling that there's trouble under this part of the sea. What'd you say we stop fishing for a while and cruise around? Perhaps we can spot something wrong. Well, sure. I'll tell the fellas to haul in their lines and you can get underway. Now hear this. All hands man your stations. The captain's going to try to surface the ship again. Quartermaster, sound the surfacing signals. Mr. Jones, tell the chief engineer to report continuously what happens in the engine room. Aye, aye, Skipper. Captain Nagel, Mr. Antonio wants to talk to you. Uh, use my headphones, sir. Very well. Yes, Antonio, what's wrong? It's no use, Captain. I can't get enough pressure in the pump because of the damaged cylinder. Can't you replace the cylinder? I don't have an extra cylinder, sir. If I get out of this one alive, I will have, though. Captain, the ship's listening to the port side. If she lays over any more, we'll get chlorine. Cut your engines, Mr. Antonio. Cut them now. I'd better check the storage batteries to make sure they didn't spill. We can't have any chlorine gas now. Very well. Let me know how you make out. Mr. Jones, release the distress float and force some oil and debris out of a torpedo tube. We'll have to hope and pray that somebody sees our cry for help. Well, Red, it won't be long before we've completed our 500th flight across the Pacific. That's right, Bob. Flown everything from the King of Siam to a plane load of penguins. Hey, Bob. What's that oil slick down there? Where? I don't see it. 
Just a minute. I'll circle around. Cut down our speed. I see it, Red. There's a sub-distress float down there. And there's some debris down there, too. A sub-distress float? That means there's... Yeah, a... Red. A pig boat's down there. And it's in trouble. Head for the field and I'll radio the naval base. Right. Boy, Ben, you sure know how to cook. This is a wonderful breakfast. No second the motion, pal. Ben, you do the job up brown. Too bad me can't eat more. Me willing, my stomach say it had enough. <laughs> yes, sir. If there's anything I like more than good food, it's more of it. We interrupt this program to bring you hey, an important listen. news bulletin. A transoceanic passenger plane reported sighted a Navy sub-distressed float 25 miles off the coast. About opposite the famous Ten Fathom yeah, Shallows fishing ground. Swordfish. They ain't very far from where we was fishing. Keep tuned to this station for more news about the distressed sub. We'll interrupt this program as soon as we find out more from the Navy. Ben, you were right when you had that feeling of trouble under the sea. Ben had that feeling? I sure did, son. That's why we stopped fishing and cruised around a while. They must have released the distressed boy after we left. Uh. You think Navy can handle this well? They have plenty of good salvage equipment. That's right, Grey Wolf. They've got specialists for that kind of work. They've also got the latest submarine rescue gear. Oh, they can handle it all right. It sort of gives you a queer feeling when you find out that we were having a good time while right under us a tough situation was developing. How deep is it out there, Ben? Twenty fathoms, Stumpy. The ocean bed suddenly drops after the ten fathom showers. A hundred and twenty feet of water, eh? I'm sure glad I'm not stuck down there in that sub. <sighs> How much more oxygen have we got, Mr. Antonio? About ten hours of play, Skipper, that's all. If you stop the men from working, we might be able to stretch it at twelve hours. That's right, Skipper. The men would need so much oxygen to... They were resting. I appreciate your counsel, gentlemen, but I'm the captain of the ship. I don't want a sub full of maniacs, so keep them busy. I feel sure that help will come. The fishing boat or plane will see our distressed boy and that oil slick. What do we do if they don't see our distress signal or, or they don't recognize what it means? Mr. Jones, we've got ten hours to think up an answer to that question. Broadcast more news of the sub. Well, be patient, Sonny. Things like news take time. Uh, maybe so, but just the same, it would be good to hear news. Hey, quiet, fellas. The music stopped. Perhaps I've got another bulletin. We interrupt this program again to bring you more news about the sunken submarine. Navy spokesmen are rushing salvage ships to the scene of the disaster. The ships won't arrive until tomorrow morning as they're with the fleet on maneuvers. The submarine that's distressed is an old type ship used only for training purposes. Stay tuned to this station for more news on the submarine disaster. Turn that noise box off, Henry. Uh, sure, Bill. What's eating you? Plenty. Those salvage ships aren't going to arrive in time. The old-style subs haven't that much supply of oxygen. I'm going ashore and find a telephone. Ben wants to know where I'm at. Tell him anything. Anything but what I'm actually doing. <laughs> Commander Bill speaking. Commander, this is Bill Jefferson. I'm a forest ranger. Oh, yes, Mr. Jefferson. I've read about you from time to time. What can I do for you? Commander, your salvage ships aren't going to arrive in time to help the men trapped in the sub, are they? Well, I don't exactly know about that. This is off the record, Commander. Maybe I can help the lads trapped in the sub. You're sure I'm not going on record? Positive. That's a promise. All right. For obvious reasons, we couldn't tell the newsmen that the rescue ships wouldn't get there in time. A mistake was made in letting all the salvaged ships go with the fleet. 
Whenever the training sub is operating, there's supposed to be a salvage ship here. For the simple reason, it's an old sub. You say you can help, but how? You know Ben Benson? Yes, I know him. He's a fine old man. He used to be a great salvage engineer and sub-rescue man. Say, now I get what you're driving at. Then you approve? Well, by all means. I'll give you all the cooperation and men you need. When can you and old Ben start work in the sub? I wish we could right now, Commander. But it isn't that simple. I've got to talk Ben into it. He's lost self-confidence since the death of his son. Yes, uh, I know. I'm going to talk with him right now. I'll let you know how I make out. And your answer is still no, Ben. Yes, Bill, it's still no. But why? Give me one good reason why. Because I... You know why? Ain't that a good enough a reason? No, it isn't. There are 20 men facing certain death because you haven't buried the dead, Ben Benson. What do you mean, I haven't buried the dead? Your son's gone. All the worry and fretting and self-accusation won't bring him back. Besides, it was an accident. But you can do something for 20 men who are still living. Do this for Frank's sake, Ben. It's what he'd want you to do if he were right here beside you. No, Bill. It's no use. Who could trust a man who would... Stop beating yourself, Ben. I trust you. I'll put on a diving suit and go down and work on the sub if you'll tell me what to do. You... You trust your life in my hands, Bill? Yes. Even in 120 feet of water. What do you say now, Ben? No, Bill, I won't do it. Ben, I always understood that men of the sea had guts and determination. Ben, you're a jellyfish. A disgrace to the memory of your son. Ben's harsh words, Bill. They cut pretty deep. I'm sorry I had to say them, Ben. I'm thinking of the 20 men more than I'm thinking of you. All right, let's drop it. I'll call the commander and tell him no. Bill, Bill, wait a minute. I've said all I'm going to say, Ben. Uh, you're going to call the commander now? Yes. Well, uh, tell him then. I hate it with all that's in me, but I'll be ready to begin rescue work in two hours. Once this job is over, they will never, nobody will ever get me on a salvage mission again. The tide's running out, Bill. You'll drift over to the sub. She lays about a hundred yards to our stern. Okay, Ben. Put the diving helmet on. I'm ready to go. Good boy. The escape hatch is rigged to on the winches. When you're ready for it, we'll lower away. As soon as you get the helmet on, let's test the intercom. Be careful, Bill. If you get into trouble, holler and we'll pull you right up. I will, pal. Don't worry about me. You sure you're not come up too fast? Or you get bends from changing water pressure, Bill. Say hello to Davy Jones, Bill. Tell him I ain't heard a word from him for so long that I thought he moved. <laughs> ben, put the helmet on. These guys will keep me here all day. Here you go. Uh, uh. All set, Ben? Yeah. Um, lower the platform into the water. I'll talk to Bill as he's going down. Hello, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, Ben. The intercom's working fine. I'm getting a good supply of air. Fine. Let us know when you feel the buoyancy of the water some, and uh, we'll stop the platform. Or you can ride it all the way to the bottom. I think I'll ride the platform all the way to the bottom. The oxygen's getting a little thin now, Ben. Okay, we'll step up the pumps. That's just right, Ben. I pass the oxygen hose down, and I'll put it along with me over to the south. Okay, Bill. You'll find the coupling on the port side of the conning tower. 
Fasten the hose on and it will force the valve open with air pressure and give the boys some clean air. You hear that? Somebody's outside the sub. You're right, Mr. Jones. It's a rescue diver working on the outside. Take the hammer and answer the signals. Right. It's the rescue diver, all right. Captain, it's happened. We're being rescued. Yes, Mr. Jones. And thank the Lord that somebody's are just press signals. Inform the crew as to what's going on. Oxygen. They're pumping oxygen into the sub. Wait, Mr. Jones. We'll do that for half an hour. Then we'll lower the escape hatch. We'll begin to leave the ship. Ben? You did a great job. In about five hours, we'll have the whole crew out of the sub. It ain't easy bringing them out one at a time, but it gets finished eventually. <laughs> Don't thank me, though, Commander. Thank Bill. Oh, nonsense, Ben. You're the one who has the technical knowledge to make this operation a success. I only did what you told me to do. Ben, what are you going to do now after this is over? Now, don't ask him, Commander. You saw a point with him. Rather not talk about it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> On the contrary, Bill. Well, um, what do you mean, Ben? I mean I'm not afraid anymore. Oh, that's wonderful, Ben. When did you get free of that fear? When I saw the top of your head please, sink under the water, Bill. Then I, I knew I would never be afraid again. <laughs> So once again we see that one last ounce of courage is all that it takes to turn defeat into victory. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. You know, fellows and girls, sometimes we think that mother and dad are just a bit stuffy with their advice and counsel. We even feel that our parents try to take the fun out of life. Well, that's not true. What mom and dad tell us is for our own good. Life would be so much better if we'd listen to what older folks tell us. This is the story about two young fellows who wouldn't listen to experienced advice, and it almost cost them... <laughs> Well, say, I'm almost giving the story away. Stick around for a breathtaking story. The End of the Rope. Hey, Bill, here's a telegram for you. I came past the Western Union office on the way up here, and Sid stuck it in my hand as I went by. Oh, thanks, pal. I wonder what's up. Yeah, maybe his uncle left him his old swayback mule. <laughs> yeah, for his Model T Ford. Uh, bad news, fellas. Well, how bad? My old friend Nathaniel Norton is sending his son Bart and a friend of his out here for a couple of months on a vacation. Uh-oh. 
And what kind of rascals are these young whippersnappers, Bill? Well, I guess they're well-behaved as far as that goes, Tim. Well, then we haven't anything to worry about. Perhaps not, but I don't like being responsible for his son and friend. No, I'll keep my eye on them, Bill. Oh, thanks, Bill. We've got lots of trail work to do in the next couple of weeks. Uh, when are these young series coming, Bill? Tonight. We'll meet them at the station. Tenderfeet, Sonny. Yeah, they're coming toward us. Yeah, he must be Bart Norton and his friends. Excuse me, sir. Are you Bill Jefferson? Yes. You must be Bartholomew Norton. Yes, I am. Just call me Bart. And this is my friend Jeff Murdoch. How do you do? <laughs> Fine, thank you. I'd like you to meet Henry Scott and Stumpy Jenkins. Oh, hi, Henry. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Bart. Our station wagon just outside the depot. We'll give you a hand with your luggage. This is a wonderful place you have here, Mr. Jefferson. Thanks, Bart. Uh, just call me Bill. I've never been in a ranger's office before. Oh, is that right? Well, I hope we'll see a lot of you in the next few weeks, Jeff. Say, uh, did you ever see a hoop snake, Sonny? No, Stumpy. What do they look like? Well, uh, they're big, long snakes. They grab a hold of their tail with their mouth and roll down the road like a hoop. Oh, go on, Stumpy. That's not true. It ain't, huh? Where do you think they get the name Hoop Snake from? Well, maybe you're right. Sure, that's just like the snake we got out here that milks cows. It's called the Milk Snake. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to swallow that one. <laughs> Why don't you guys lay off? Why, it's like the yarn about the left-handed monkey wrench. Monkey wrench? What in the world are we coming to? I've heard of a cow ranch and a sheep ranch... Never heard of a monkey ranch before. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> All joking aside, though, Bill, I've never seen a left-handed monkey ranch. You haven't? Why, they've got one down at Pete's garage. Can we go look at it? Why, sure. The garage is just a block down the street. Come on, Bart. I want to see that ranch. We'll be back in a few minutes, fellas. <laughs> 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 you got your nerve, Bill Jefferson. If I had to pull that, you'd have turned blue in the face. Well, old timer, it's like you said. We're trying to harden up their tender feet. <laughs> we'll yeah. pick them up at the garage in a couple of minutes and head for home. It's almost supper time. Sure is peaceful and quiet out here. I could sit on the porch all night and listen to the crickets and Katie Dids. Yeah. The Lord sure knew what he was doing when he created the earth. He knew that man needed time to rest so they'd be fresh for a new day. That's right, Sonny. Say, uh, I hope you ain't got no hard feelings about that left-handed monkey wrench. And the hoop snake and the milk snake. <laughs> We had to initiate you fellas into the ways of the West. But Stumpy's right. We hope you haven't taken offense. Oh, no, Bill, we haven't. We expected to have tricks pulled on us. Yeah. This is milder than we expected. Well, I think it's time we hit the hay, fellas. Now, why don't you sleep here tonight, Stumpy? Uh, twist my arm, will you? <laughs> How about Mom's wheat cakes for breakfast? That does it! I'm staying. <laughs> Let's have our devotions and then turn in. In the morning, we'll saddle up for a long trip on the trail. Easy, boy. Uh, Bart, Jeff, I'm leaving Henry here to entertain you. Well, we appreciate that, Bill. Just one thing I didn't mention, Bart. Yeah? 
Your father said in his wire to me that you're not to do any mountain climbing. What? That's right. But that's what we wanted to do most of all. Well, what's Dad thinking about? He's thinking about your safety, Bart. I must say, I agree with him. So remember, no mountain climbing. Oh, okay. Now, you can use one of our cars to take the fellas around, Henry. Oh, fine, Bill. I'll take them sightseeing. When you'll be back? In about ten days. Fellas, we've seen about all there is to see around Naughty Pine. We sure appreciate how you've taken us around, Henry. That's right. You've been a swell host. Oh, forget it, fellas. I'm glad to do it. When will Bill be back, Henry? Oh, about Wednesday, I imagine, Jeff. We'll have to dig up something to keep us busy for a few days. Well, I won't be able to help you for a day or so. I have some work to do over at headquarters. I'm bored stiff. Henry's got work to do, and here we sit. Yeah, what'll we do? Go mountain climbing? What? What? Your dad'll scalp you for that. Oh, dad won't care as long as we're careful. Oh, don't take me wrong, Bart. I'm all for it, but... But nothing, Jeff. As long as we're careful, who'll care? Yeah, maybe you're right. When will we start? How about right now? Okay, let's go. Oh, you got to this ledge without any trouble, Jeff? Yeah, but it scares me when I look down. What? We've been climbing almost straight up. Never look down when you're climbing. Uh, What do you say we start again? Yeah. Yeah, we can't stay on this ledge. Right. Uh, Say, Jeff, what do we do if a strong wind comes up? Don't worry. I got my pick set. I'll go first. Okay. Here goes. Got the pick set again, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, come ahead, Bart. Uh, uh, Jeff, hang on. The pick's Uh, slipping. Bart. Jeff, are you all right? No, Bart. I, I think my ankle's broken. We'll head back to Naughty Pine right now. Let's go, Storm. Hey, Matilde! Hey, plenty good to see you fellows again. <laughs> Got kind of lonesome on the northern boundary, didn't it? Uh, long time not see anybody. <laughs> Maybe you started talking to yourself, eh, Sonny? Uh, not quite. Hey, get out of here, fellas. The rock slide's hey. starting. Come on, Storm. Let's go, Matilde! Slide, Sonny. Oh, Storm Boy. He's the king. It's all right, fella. Oh. I don't know where the rock slide is, old timer. He's the king. It sure sound like rock slide start. I wonder where those large stones came from and why. There, answer. Up on ledge on side of mountain. Huh? Great Scott, how'd those men get up there? You'd have to be a monkey to scale that mountain. You have to be monkey with magnets in feet. That's straight up, 500 feet. There's two of them up there, as far as I can make out. Let's go back to town and get some rescue gear. Come on, Storm. Get him hey, up, let's go, boy. Come on. Get him up. Come on, get him up. The 
rangers are leaving. What do we do now? Oh, maybe they've gone for help. No, yeah, oh, sure. Uh, why didn't I think of that? They know we're up here. Oh. They'll be back, I hope. Oh. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry I got you into this mess, Jeff. Well, you couldn't help it. The rock gave way. Oh, perhaps. But if I listened to my dad's advice, we oh. wouldn't be in this mess. Bill warned us, too. Well, what's the use of crying over spilt milk? Even if you weren't hurt, we couldn't climb down with the wind blowing up the way it is. That's right, Bart. All we can do is wait and hope. Yeah, and pray. There's Henry in front of the office. He looks worried. Uh, we find out what's wrong in a minute. Something's out by the look on his face. Oh, Storm. Oh, beauty. Henry, what's the matter? It's Bart and Jeff. They've been gone all day. You know where they went? No, I left them at the house when I came over here to do some work. Mom says they took off about an hour after I left. Bill, you think maybe they fell us up on ledge? I don't know, Grey Wolf. I'm going to find out. How do you figure to do that, young fella? With a helicopter. Bring copter closer to mountain, Bill. Okay. Hold on, though. I gotta be careful of downdrafts. Hey, Bill. What are we going to do if those crazy guys did climb onto the ledge? Get them off, pal. Can you see them now, Grey Wolf? All right. Get dark now. Hard see through glasses. Use the landing spotlight on the copter. I'll shine it on the ledge, Grey Wolf. How's that? Huh. Oh, I see plenty good now. Can you tell who they are yet? Huh. You're right, Bill. That part and Jeff on ledge. Jeff, that must have been Bill and Henry and the other rangers in the copter. Yeah. Well, now they know we're up here. Hey, Jeff, you're shivering. I'm getting cold, Bart. I think I've got a fever. Jeff, I guess it's no use to tell you how sorry I am about getting you into this mess. Your ankle looks worse all the time. That's all right, Bart. You couldn't help it. Here. Here. Put my shirt on. What'll you do to keep warm? I can move around. You can't. You'll need your shirt. The the wind's getting colder. No, you take it. Bill will get us off here soon. Sure, but how's he going to do it? Nobody can climb up here in this wind. boxes look like they'll take a beating. There's plenty of rope around them, Henry. Okay, Bill. Uh, we got everything in boxes they need. Food, blankets, first aid kits, waterproof canvas. Fine. Let's take off, then. Everybody aboard? Go ahead. I'll close the door. Take her away, Sonny. You man the spotlight. Grey Wolf, Stumpy, you fellas man the winch and lower the supplies. Okay, Bill. Uh, Me do, Bill. Bring the copter closer, Bill. Shine the light on the side of the mountain above us. There. How's that? That's fine, Henry. I won't be able to get much closer because of that overhanging part of the mountain. Huh, that bad. What do you mean, Grey Wolf? You're not able to lower supplies on ledge. We're too far away from ledge. We ain't got nothing but thin air to drop these here supplies on now, young feller. Well, I can't move any closer to the mountain. Sudden gusts of wind could push us toward the rock and 
smash the propeller blades to bits. Well, how are we going to get the supplies to Bart and Jeff, then? Try swinging the cable back and forth like a pendulum. Perhaps you can get them on the ledge that way. Ah, uh, maybe that good idea. We try it. Now lay on the floor and reach through the winch hole and swing the cable. Uh, you lower away, Grey Wolf. Uh, you say one lower. All right, lower away. Hang out the box and cable swinging. Let the copter down a little, Bill. It might help. Okay. That enough? Yeah, that's good. It ain't no use. We can't get close enough to the ledge. I'll take in the cable, fellas. I've got a better idea. We'll go back to the airport and rig it up. to get those supplies on the ledge. We'll take this rifle and make a weighted plug. It's just a hair smaller than the rifle barrel. Oh, I get it. You're going to do the same thing as the lifesavers do on the coast. Exactly, pal. We'll tie a thin and light rope to the weighted plug. Stumpy, you can fire it at the ledge. As soon as the line falls on the ledge, then Bart and Jeff can haul in the thin line. Say, it's all right. On the end of the thin line, we'll tie a heavier line. When the lads get the heavier line, we can put the regular line on the end of that. When they pull third line in, then we can send supplies. Right. Henry, is the power megaphone on board? Yes, it is, Bill. All right, let's go, fellas. Freezing. Here, take your shirt back. No, 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 that's I'm doing. I'll just move, move, move around a little. Watch out for the edge of the ledge. Hey, here comes a helicopter again. There's the spotlight. Unless we're going to try something else to get those boxes to us. Bart, Jeff, listen closely. We've got supplies here for you. Food and blankets. We're going to fire a weighted plug at the ledge. On the end of the plug is a lifeline. When you get your hands on the lifeline, start pulling until you get a heavy line on the ledge. Stay right where you are and don't move around. When you hear the plug hit, then try to grab the line. Did you hear that, Jeff? We're going to get supplies. Yes. Well, thank the Lord for that. Boy, I'm so hungry I could eat rocks. Okay, fellas. Keep your heads down and don't move. Here it comes. There it is. Get it, Bart. I got it. I got it. Start pulling it in, Bart. Oh, you won't have to be hungry and cold now. got the last box. Good work, boys. Henry, tell them we'll be back in the morning to get them off the ledge. Bart, Jeff, we'll be back in the morning to get you off the ledge. Just take it easy until we get to you. Don't worry. We'll get you off. I hope you ain't bragging, young fella. That's going to be plenty tough climb. Well, let's go back home and get some rest. We'll find out how tough a climb that is in the morning. Ready, Grey Wolf? Uh, me ready now, Bill. Stumpy, Henry, you fellas just hold tight here until we find out if we can climb this mountain or not. Okay, Bill. We won't run off and leave you. Uh, Grey Wolf, I think we ought to climb parallel to each other. Uh, that good idea. Then it won't be dangerous from loose rocks. Yeah. All right, let's climb. Me got first solid hold with pick. <coughs> uh, now me... Climb wall like fly. I hope we can say the same thing when we're 400 feet up. It's 
rest a while, Grey Wolf. Uh, that funny good idea. How far are we? Oh, well, let me say about a third of way up. I think that's about right. Boy, this wind is terrible. Uh, it tears right off mountainside. Let's call it a halt, Grey Wolf. Yes, it's it no use to fool ourselves. Jeff and Bart must have climbed this with little or no wind in effect. Well, let's back down. Yeah, it all gets steeper as we climb. It's suicide to go higher. Take it easy climbing down. We have to take it some other way to get Jeff and Bart off that ledge. Glad to see you fellas with two feet on terra firma. That's right, Bill. Great wolf. We can see the wind push you around on the side of the mountain up there. Yeah, the wind's up there is savage, all right. Bart and Jeff must have climbed up when the wind was fairly still. Nobody be able to climb up or down to rescue Bart and Jeff. Well, how are we going to get them off then? I wish I knew. They can't stay up there forever, Bill. If we can't get supplies to them... I mean, we can get supplies to them. Why can't we get them off the ledge? Well, getting them on the ledge is one thing, but getting them off is another, Henry. Boxes of supplies and people are two different things. Hey, wait a minute. I've got it. What you said was right, pal. If we got the supplies on, why can't we get the lads off? Sure. Why not? Well, how can we do it, Bill? I'll explain on the way to the airport. Let's get a helicopter and get busy. Are we going to set this up just like we did for the boxes? Yeah, it's exactly the same, with one change. What change is that, Bill? Use the cable as much as possible. It'll take the strain better on the winch. Put the heavy rope on the end of the cable. It'll work fine. There's a stout eye spliced on the end. I'm going to bring the copter in as close as I can. Do you think it would be better to wait until the winds died down, Bill? No, pal. Probably won't be another windless day in this canyon for months. Yeah, I guess you're right, Bill. Stand by the power megaphone, Henry. I'm going to hug the mountain. Okay, I'm ready. Only don't hug it to death. We're going to try something again, Bart. I wonder what it'll be this time. Bart, Jeff, listen closely. We're going to take you off the ledge just like we put the supplies on. Now trust us. This is the only way we can do it. Be sure and tie the rope securely around your chest. Here comes the shot. Jeff, they're going to swing us off the ledge like a pendulum. It'll work. It has to. There it is, Bart. Gra- grab it. I've got it. Pull a thin line until you get the heavy line over to the ledge. Tie the heavy line securely around your chest. When you're ready, wave your arm. Then Bill will raise you off the ledge with the helicopter. Do just exactly as we say. Your life depends on it. Don't worry, we will. Okay, Jeff. Raise your arms and I'll get this rope around you. That feels good and tight. I'll hang on to the rope, too. And all set? Yeah, I guess so. Go ahead. Give him the signal. Take him away! Here I go! Here comes the end of the cable. Uh, me stop, Winch. Let's pull, Jeff, rest of way now. Yeah, let's lift together. Uh, here, here he comes. <laughs> Boy, am I glad to see you fellas. We're glad to see you. You said it, Bill. You all right, Jeff? I've got a bad ankle. I'll make Jeff comfortable, fellas. 
Then we'll get Bart off the cliff the same way with this flying banana. How does it feel to be safe and sound, Bart? It feels wonderful, Bill. You tell him, Bart. There's one thing I want to tell Bill and the rest of the fellas. Now, uh, what might that be, sonny? Oh, I'm awfully ashamed of myself for getting Jeff and myself into this mess. Well, did you learn something from it, Bart? Boy, and how. I'm going to wire Dad that I won't do any more mountain climbing and no more disobedience. Oh? When did you decide that? When I was dangling 500 feet in the air on the end of a rope. I guess that's as good a place as any to learn to be obedient, Bart. Well, fellas and girls, I think Bart found that his dad and I knew just a little more than he did. Only it almost cost him his life and the life of his best friend to learn that lesson. I hope it doesn't take you that long to find out. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger! there, boys and girls. This is Ranger Bill back again for just a third of a minute with an extra word of thanks to you for joining us today. Hope you'll team up with the Rangers every week at this time when your local station gives us this chance to get together. See you then. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hot weather, little rain, dry forest. All this put together adds up to terrible danger. Forest fire, scavenger of forests, a roaring hungry monster consuming everything in its path. Bill has sounded the alert. The forest around Naughty Pine is tinder dry. All fire towers are carefully watching for the slightest wisp of smoke to curl up from the millions of acres of treetops. All eyes are watching. Watching by day and by night. They're watching for fire. Listen to the story of the fire bug. Stumpy, have you seen our copy of the Rangers magazine around here? Nope. There ain't no comics in it, no house, honey. <laughs> I'll give you comics. Uh, Gray Wolf, have you seen it? Mm, I not see it, Bill. There are plenty of good article in there on new diseases of trees. Yeah, that's why I want to find it. I wonder where it went. I'll answer it, fellas. Bill Jefferson speaking. What's that? Yes. Yes, we're on our way. Goodbye. Fire. Right. Let's go, boys. Where fire, Bill? South Forks. It ain't along the Red Valley freight tracks again, is it? Yeah, that's where it is. Stumpy, you're closest to the driver's seat. Hop in. Yep. I'll let her roll. There you go. Step on it, Stumpy. Maybe we can nip this one in the bud. Okay, it's time to 
the control and off the water. Off with the water. Well, the fire's out, but we got here just in the nick of time. Damn how. Oh, another five minutes and woof. Ah, getting tired putting fire out along tracks. I am too, Grey Wolf. This is the fifth fire in three weeks. Well, Randolph Thompson's got to do something about those spark-throwing locomotives of his. Yeah. We've got to get proof that his engines are throwing the sparks. That's how right. do you plan to get proof, Bill? I'll tell you how, Grey Wolf. You and I are going to camp out here and watch the iron firebugs throw sparks with our own eyes. As good way as any, Bill. All right, let's pick up our gear and go back to town. Right. Then Grey Wolf and I'll get the horses and come back. I'm telling you, Randolph, we've got to do something about the stacks on our engines. They're throwing sparks like a torch. Listen to me, Scotty. I'm not spending one red cent on those steam locos. In a couple of months, we'll have our diesel engines, and then we can junk the iron horses. Yeah, but the rangers are going to get pretty sore when they find out how the fires are starting. Oh, that's all I've heard since the first fire. Rangers, rangers, look out for the rangers. I'm getting sick of hearing about them. They're federal officers, boss. You stick your neck out far enough, and the rangers will wrap a court order around it. Is that so? Let them try it. I'll run my freight trains when I want to and how I want to. Your job is to see that my trains stay on schedule. Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you. This easiest job I have for a long time, Bill. <laughs> I'll agree with that, Grey Wolf. And we'll stay camped here until one of Thompson's spark-throwing locomotives comes spouting along. How you plan to stop these fires? I'll ask Randolph Thompson to put spark arresters on his steam locomotives. Mm, I understand him plenty hard man to talk with. Yeah, I've heard that too, Grey Wolf. I know Thompson by sight only. I know he took over the Red Valley freight line from bankruptcy and made a going business of it. So he's plenty good. Sometimes these self-made men are hard to handle because they've had to work so hard to get where they are. And here comes the afternoon freight now. Maybe we hide back off right away. No, Grey Wolf, we'll stay right here. This right away is leased on government property. Look, Bill, engine throw plenty spark. Wow, I'll say... That's what I was hoping to see, Grey Wolf. That's our firebox. Back here again, Scotty. What is it now? I've got hot news for you, boss. Huh. I suppose you saw some rangers in your sleep last night. No, but the engineer on the three o'clock southbound saw them. What? Where? Along the right of way. You sure? Sure as I'm a foot high. Not only that, but the conductor watched them from the caboose. So? Then they followed them on horseback. They know what's causing the fires now, Randolph. All right, so they know. Let them make the first move. What? You heard what I said. Let them make the first move. Well, what you do about this is your business. But I know one thing for sure. What's that? If Bill Jefferson comes to see you, you'll know you've tangled with somebody. Yeah? Yeah, and take a tip from me. Don't rub his fur the wrong way. This feller Thompson's got a lot of equipment in his freight yard. And no wonder. He does quite a freight business, Stumpy. His line moves a terrific volume of freight, both north and south. And he 
his north runs, he has to use double headers to get over the mountains. Bill, I uh, checked up on his schedule. He runs from six to eight trains in 24 hours both ways. Oh, that'd make plenty tight schedule for one track. Yeah, his engineers have to push the throttle pretty hard. That's why the old locomotives throw so many sparks. Now, this looks like the general office building right here. That's what the sign says, if you can read, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was alive, I guess it'd bite me, huh? <laughs> hey, what's the plan of attack, Bill? Well, Stumpy, you and Ralph find out how many old steam locomotives he's got. Those are the ones that throw so many sparks. The newer steam jobs don't do that. The Gray Wolf and I will go see Thompson. We'll meet you back here at the car. Okay, Bill. Come on, Stumpy. Let's go count iron horses. Look out! One of them don't rear up and kick your teeth out! Uh, Stumpy, he sees something funny in everything. <laughs> Maybe we should have taken him into the lion's den with us. Now let's go pay an official visit on Randolph Thompson. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It isn't every railroad man who has a visit from the forest rangers. Uh, we're not here on a social call, Mr. Thompson. We're asking your cooperation in preventing a disastrous forest fire. I'll be glad to help as much as I can. Thank you. Now I'll get straight to the point. We've had five fires in the last three weeks along your right-of-way. It runs through the giant pines. Yeah, and... Uh... Did you put them out? Only quick action saved whole forest from burning down. That would have been most uh, unfortunate to lose the giant pines. How does this affect me? This affects you directly, Mr. Thompson. Since you own the firebugs... What do you mean, I own the firebugs? You'd better be careful who you accuse, Bill Jefferson. I am being careful, very careful. That's why Grey Wolf and I camped along the right-of-way after the fire... To get absolute proof. You can't tell my right away without permission. That's private property, in case you don't know it. It's private property leased from Uncle Sam, in case you've forgotten. You already forget? You and Colonel Enders signed papers that gave you permission to build railroad through giant pines. I built my road according to specifications. I don't know how you can accuse me of owning firebugs. Maybe you'd uh, care to explain... The firebugs we're talking about are the ancient steam locomotives you're using on the southbound line. They throw sparks like a welder's torch. Those ancient locos have always thrown sparks. How come they're so uh, suddenly dangerous? Simple. The forests have become tinder dry because of the heat and drought. Isn't that my fault? No, but it's everybody's job to be careful when so forest very dry. I suppose you want me to stop my freight trains until we get some rain. Thompson, all we're asking is your cooperation until we get rain. These evasive tactics only convince me that you know exactly what we're talking about. Isn't that so? Well, We know I... engineer on train see us standing alongside track. He must tell you by now. All right, what do you want me to do? I want you to put spark arresters on those old clunkers. Spark arresters? You want me to spend a lot of time and money putting spark arresters on some old locomotives that will be junked as soon as we get our diesels? Thompson, surely you're not comparing the cost of installing spark arrestor equipment with the value of the Giant Pine National Park. If you are, you're not the businessman I thought you were. Now, look here, Jefferson. I don't intend to put money on those old locomotives. Why can't you put your rangers on guard along the track until the dry spell ends? That's impossible. One fire needs all the men I have available. The rest of the men are busy watching the other forts. Well, gentlemen, I, I'll think it over. That's the most I can promise you. I want something more than a promise to think it over, Thompson. I want action. If your firebugs kindle another forest fire, I won't be so pleasant to deal with. That's a warning. I said I'd think it over, and that's the most I'll promise. Good day, gentlemen. (laughs) 
So your visit with Randolph Thompson didn't bring much in the way of results, huh, Bill? No, Ralph. He was polite in a cold sort of way, but definitely uncooperative. Uh, he in for a big fall. Maybe sooner than he thinks he come down from high horse. It seems to me we ought to teach that ornery critter a lesson. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do, Stimpy. What do you mean, Bill? I'm going to ask for a court order from Judge Deems. If the judge comes through, as I think he will... Thompson won't be able to move a single train south until it's equipped with a spark arrester. Here's your court order, Bill. All signed and sealed. Thanks, Judge Deems. I appreciate your cooperation. It's a matter of conscience with me. Randolph Thompson ought to be ashamed of himself for disregarding the safety of our national forest. Uh, what recourse do I have if he ignores this court order, Your Honor? Well, we've got a big jail here in Naughty Pine, Bill. What I mean, Judge, is... Is this court order binding on his employees as well as the owner? That's right, Bill. The court order reads that during the dry spell, not one train is to move south unless it has a spark arrestor on its stack. Any person or persons who break the order may be arrested on the spot. Thanks, Judge. I won't serve this unless I have to. But I have made up my mind that Randolph Thompson isn't going to burn down the giant pines. Here's the situation. Until we get this thing straightened out, you'll have to patrol the railroad track constantly. That's the only way a disaster can be avoided. We'll keep our eyes open, Bill. Yeah, we do. Now, I realize you're not Superman, of course. So I've alerted Towers 3, 4, and 5 to keep a special watch, too. If a fire starts, send for help at once. We'll take care of things, Sonny. There ain't no fire going to eat up the giant pines if we can help it. That's good, old-timer. Now, you fellas had better get going. It's almost time for the early morning southbound to take off. I'm going to have a talk with Thompson again. Okay, Bill. Get him up, King. Hey, Come on, get him up. Terry. Scotty, I'm depending on you to take care of things while I'm gone. I'll be back this evening on this freight. Oh, keep an eye on the whole operation, Randolph. Maybe you're convinced that Bill Jefferson means what he says, huh? <laughs> Why do you think I'm riding this caboose on the south run? Because you're afraid of Bill. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, Scotty. But uh, I think he may have gone after a court order, so uh, I'm leaving. He can't serve it on me if I'm not here. That won't stop him. He'll serve it on you. Don't worry about that. Maybe so, but uh, this shipment of perishables and machinery has to go through, and uh, I'm going with it to make sure it does. Boss, you'd better get going pronto, because here comes a ranger car down the road now. Thanks for telling me. Here's the engineer's signal, and uh, I'm on my way. <laughs> Give the ranger my regards, will you, Scotty? Bye, boss! You just missed him, Bill. He's in the caboose of the morning southbound. He is, huh? Well, that's the last train he's going to move south. What do you mean? This is a court order, Scotty. Judge Deem says it's binding on all employees of the Red Valley Lion as well as the owner. But you have to serve it in person, don't you? No, I don't. Not the way it's worded. I'll leave the order with you, Scotty. I'll let Randolph get away with the train he's running through now, but no more, you understand? 
Well, believe me, there won't be another drive wheel turn until this whole thing is settled. Good, Scotty. And I wish your boss had the same cooperative spirit. Now, when will he be back? Oh, probably around midnight. Why? I want to see him. Oh, Storm. Oh, big boy. Oh, well, I guess the court order did the trick, Bill. Thompson hasn't let another train leave the yard since this morning. Uh, that's good news, Ralph. I didn't like to take such drastic action, but the man wouldn't listen to reason. If he ain't gonna run no more firebug trains, we might as well go home. Yeah, that's why he came out here. Let's call it a day and head for town. Uh, that's plenty of good idea. It's plenty hot and muggy out here. All right, engineer, let's get rolling back to Naughty Pine. Wouldn't advise it, Mr. Thompson. Don't like the looks of the crack in that left main piston rod. Oh? Won't it hold? Well, possibly. Hard to tell. I'd say no. We'll chance it anyway. Just reduce your speed going back. But, sir, it's I said get the train underway, do you hear me? That's an order. Okay, you're the boss. Give me the high sign when they get in the cab, will you? You bet. What's the matter? I'm glad I ran into you. I was on my way over to your office. Yeah? Why are you so excited? Well, I couldn't get a hold of Randolph at the other end of the South Run. What do we do now? Oh, just wait until he returns. That's all you can do. Do you think he'll bring the freight back here or return the other way? You said it was bringing the freight back. Okay. You'll just have to wait and be ready in case of trouble. Sit still, fellas. I'll get it. Okay, Bill. Ranger headquarters, Bill speaking. Bill, this is Tom. I'm reporting a fire starting along the Red Valley tracks. Along the Red Valley tracks? Three miles below the pass. Thompson ran another train back from the south, huh? Did you notice it? Couldn't tell, Bill. The trees are too high and it's getting dark. Okay, Tom. We're on our way. Um, again? Yeah. We got a fire to fight. Let's roll, boys. We'll take care of Thompson later. This time, fire get good start. Get on both sides of track. Ralph, call for bulldozers and men. I'm not taking a chance on this getting away from us. Run away, Bill. It's a treetop fire. Our best attack is to knock down the burning trees onto the railroad track. Let's get dynamite in the safety cases and stuff it under those trees. Right away, Sonny! Uh, I give you hands, Dumpy. Yes. Treetop fire, that's right. As soon as you can, that's it. That's right, bulldozers. I got the dynamite all set, Bill. Fine, Stumpy. Ralph, set up flares on the tracks. Grey Wolf, let's get after those big trees and blow them down. Uh, I'm ready to go. We get going. Good thing there's not much wind. Fight the fuses, fellas. Let's get out of here. Okay. Come on, Stumpy! Light it and get going! Let's go! Move oh, fast, you shut it down! Step it on your heels! And it might blow any time now! Come on! Behind this big tree, fellas! I 
Yeah, good job, fellas. It's a good thing we can use the railroad right away as a fire lane. Yep. Them trees fell right across the railroad tracks. Hell, Ralph's got the flares up now. Hey, here comes Ralph like he's got a hot foot. Bill, Bill, look what's coming up the track. Great Scott, it's one of Thompson's big locomotives and pulling flat cars loaded with men. Yeah, here comes the fella. And it isn't Thompson. No, that's Scotty. Well, I got here as quickly as I could. About all the men I could get my hands on, including the yard crew. Oh, that's fine, Scotty. We'll need them. Gray Wolf, Stumpy, Ralph, divide the men and get after that fire. More help is on the way. Right. I'll be with you in a minute. Okay. So, uh, well, Bill, uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. I knew Randolph would get into trouble by not doing what he should. What do you mean, Scotty? His train standing on the sideway at the ten-mile grade. Yeah. He and the boys were looking at the drive wheels on the engine. Uh-huh. Something's wrong with the old clunker, but I didn't take time to find out. Well, now we've got real proof on Randolph. That's why I kept going and trying to offset some of the damage he's done. How'd you know there was a fire? I could see it from the dispatcher's tower. Well, I'd better general this fire. Come on, Scotty. We'll get to work. We've got to save the giant pines. your tired crew. Pass the word to Gray Wolf. Okay, uh, Bill. Bill. Look! Yeah? The boss's train is backing down on us out of control. Great Here I am my train. The caboose on his train will smash into the flat cars. Get the men back from the tracks. Pass the word. The trains are going to crash. Pass the word. Get back from the tracks. Get back from the tracks. Yeah, just in time, Stumpy. Here comes the freight, and she's going to smash. Bill, the boss must be in the caboose. Then let's get him out. How's Thompson feeling now, Bill? Pretty good, Ralph. Me and the crew jumped from the caboose just before the trains crashed. Good. He got a nasty crack on the head, but the doc says he'll be okay. Well, I'm glad for that. There's been enough damage done. Look, he's waking up. What happened, Randolph? You able to tell us? Yeah. yeah. The piston rod broke climbing the ten-mile grade. The rod damaged the air brakes, but we managed to back down the hill onto the siding and hold the train with hand brakes, but the hand brakes gave out, and then I decided to roll back down the valley and let the train stop by itself. But didn't you think about the fire? I'm afraid I didn't do much thinking. I didn't expect the tracks to be blocked. Oh, what a mess. Did you get the fire out? Yes, the fire's out, Randall. Uh, Scotty, have you got the piece of paper I gave you? Sure. Right here in my jumper pocket. What piece of paper is that, Scotty? The court order Bill served. Oh. Well, Bill... Bill, go ahead and serve it. I, I deserve it and more. Randolph, I'm going to tell Judge Deems I didn't need it. I think the Lord sort of allowed circumstances to serve their own court order on you. Yes, that that bump on the head knocked some cooperative spirit into me. And I appreciate your spirit, Bill. Thanks. Believe me, I'll I'll do all I can to make restitution. Yippee! The 
giant pines is safe from them there fire bugs. Well, Bill and the boys, with the Lord's help, finally got Randolph into a cooperative mood, even though it took a bump on the head. Some folks do have to learn the hard way, don't they? We'll see you next week for more adventure with... This is Stumpy Jenkins, a Ranger Bill's old sidekick, as I guess you all know. Just adding a little extra word of thanks for getting yourself in on the program today. Always glad to have you along. And I hope you invite your friends, too, for we sure got lots of adventures to tell you about. And we don't want you to miss any of them. So you make sure to be there by your radio every week. Don't lose out on our next story. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Today's story, boys and girls, is about a teacher. Her name is Miss Susan Anderson, and she's the teacher of Knotty Pine Public School, Beaver Creek Branch. The Beaver Creek School is a small place a little way out of Knotty Pine. How Miss Susan got into trouble and just how Bill and the fellows got her out of it, well, that's our story for today. Set the record straight. To begin with, let's drop over to the Beaver Creek School where Miss Susan is doing her best to bring order out of chaos. Children. 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 Now, that's enough of this. Now, the seventh grade is going to have an oral examination in grammar. And while this is going on, the rest of you will be quiet and listen. Justin Alexander, you will be first. Yes, Miss Susan? Justin, what is a collective noun? Uh... Did, did you say a, a collective noun, Miss Susan? Yes. Well, it's, uh, uh... Did you read your lesson at home, Justin? No, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> Weren't you here yesterday when we went over it? Well, yes, ma'am. And you have no idea what a collective noun is? No, ma'am. A teacher? Ask Pete. He knows. <laughs> Class. Class, quiet. Quiet. Now, that wasn't at all funny, Justin. And Peter Kloss, can you tell me what a collective noun is? <laughs> well, this takes the cake. What are you laughing at, Peter? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, Miss Susan. I, oh, I was just laughing. Peter, what were you writing just before I called on you? It, um, uh... Well, it was just some writing, Miss Susan. Peter Kloss, open your notebook. Huh? Now, open to the place where you were so busily writing. Yes, um. Mm-hmm. Just what I thought. Basketball plays you were drawing. Peter Kloss, when are you going to learn something besides sports? Justin, let me see your notebook. Yes, Miss Susan. Here's where I was writing. And you were doing the same thing, Justin. 
Yes, ma'am. I'm ashamed of both of you. You've got all the time in the world for jokes and sports, but none for education. Both of you will stay after school this afternoon and learn your grammar. Hiya, Pop! Hello, son. Say, uh, where have you been? You were due home an hour and a half ago. Oh, I... Uh... Oh, I don't know. You don't know? I mean, uh, I mean, Miss Susan kept justing me after school. And why were you two young gentlemen the honored guests of Miss Anderson? Uh, well, it was her fault, Pop. Oh, her fault, huh? Well, how come? Well, if she wasn't so dead set against sports, she wouldn't have cared so much. Wouldn't have cared uh, about what? Oh, she caught me in just drawing basketball plays. I see. Tell me, son, uh, how many times has Miss Susan kept you and Justin after school for the same thing? Oh, a couple of times during baseball season, uh, once during football, and this time. Four times, huh? She seems dead set against you fellas having anything to do with sports, doesn't she? Yeah. I wonder why. I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's because she's a cripple. Morning, Lou. Uh, good morning, Mel. How are you today? I am the pink, boy. Good. Say, uh, did the big boss sign the quarterly statement last night? No, he said he'd do it first thing this morning. Uh, he liked your accounting summaries, Mel. Well, that's fine. Say, uh, something I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, Peter didn't come home from school until after I got home last night, and I was what? wondering if... Is that right? Well, the same with my boy. Say, Mel, what do you think about their teacher, that Anderson girl? Uh, I don't know what to think, Lou. If she's so prejudiced about sports... And I'm beginning to think she is. And she isn't the one to teach my son. To me, athletics is a vital part of education. I'll say it is. It teaches coordination, teamwork, sportsmanship, and develops a competitive spirit that all youngsters need. Right. The upshot of it is, if Miss Anderson is going to give the youngsters a bad time whenever she catches them not doing the three R's, then I'm going to see that a change is made. Just what I was thinking, Mel. Seems to me she fails to realize that figuring out plays takes brain work and ingenuity, too. The next time this happens, I've made up my mind I'm going to read her the riot act. Well, I'll go along with that. You know what, Lou? No. My kid says she's dead against sports just because she's crippled. <laughs> Gather up your books and papers. Class, it's time to go home. Oh, Peter and Justin, you will stay after class. Aww. The rest of you are dismissed. <laughs> Peter and Justin, I'm keeping you behind for just one reason. I'm afraid you're not going to pass into the next grade unless you settle down and do your schoolwork. And to do that... You'll have to forget about sports. At least a while. My dad says that sports are what counts, not book learning. Now, I'm sure you misunderstood your father, Justin. No, he didn't, Miss Susan. My pop feels the same way. He says that athletics make you keen and sharp. It makes you think. You've got to learn sportsmanship and teamwork from sports. Well, I'd agree with that. And I can appreciate how your father feels since both boys... Both of them were great in athletics in their day. And you said it, Miss Susan. My dad was the greatest fullback state ever had. And my pop was the best track man state ever saw. He could run like the wind. But the primary reason that you're in school is not to learn sports, but to receive a basic education. Mm -hmm. And to get that, you've got to knuckle down to your schoolwork. If you don't, then I'm afraid I can't pass you to the next grade. Ah, uh, you're always picking on just and me. Just because we can't answer some silly old questions about history or something. Peter, believe me, 
I'm not picking on you two. Now let that be understood. All I'm asking is that you give up sports for a while and pass your examinations. Now, is that asking too much? You don't pick on the other kids like you do us. When I get home, I'm going to tell my dad about this. He'll tell you off. Yeah, so will my pop. You just don't like to see anybody have fun because you're crippled. Tell your father I'll be glad to talk to them at any time. We will. Don't worry about that. there, old-timer. Yeah, the snow's getting pretty deep in most places. <laughs> One more blizzard ought to tie things up pretty good. Ah, uh, we get plenty more snow soon. It's no joke, then. Hey, there's Beaver Creek School ahead. Looks like a couple of the boys we kept after. Yeah. Hey, look at them take off for home. <laughs> Just like a couple of antelope being chased by a mountain lion. <laughs> look at them go. Look at this split. <laughs> hey, look at school chimney. Hey, that could catch the roof on fire. Hey, we better get down there and fix that stove. Or we'll have a fire on our hands. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Bill, Stumpy, by Henry and Grey Wolf. Come on in. Hello, Susan. You're late today, aren't you? Yes, I'm. I had a lot of papers to mark, so I thought I'd stay and finish them. I have to prepare my Sunday school lesson this evening. Uh, take a look at the stove, will you, fellas? Okay, Bill. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the stove, Bill. I, I just banged it. Well, we saw quite a few sparks flying out of the chimney as we rode out, so we thought it best to look in before the roof catches fire. Sparks? Well, what do you think caused that, Bill? Oh, I don't know yet. Uh, how's it look, fellas? Looks okay, Bill. Yeah. Well, we need the chimney cleaned out. That's cheaper than having to buy a new building. Well, I'll phone Mr. Winters this evening and tell him. Well, do you think it'll be safe overnight, Bill? Oh, I think so. We'll bank it heavily for you. That should do it. Well, more company. Yes, but these two fellas don't look too happy, Susan. And I think I know why. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Miss Anderson. Good afternoon. I'm Louis Alexander, uh, Justin's father. Miss Susan, this is Melvin Kloss, Peter's father. I'm glad to make your acquaintance. Excuse me, Bill. Certainly. And now, won't you gentlemen sit down? No, thank you. We well, won't be here that long. Oh, I wonder if I can be of any help to you. Uh, Miss Anderson, if we understand correctly, you won't pass our sons to the next grade because they're spending too much time on sports. That's hardly the reason, gentlemen. The true reason is that, in fairness to the other children, I can't pass your sons if they don't meet the academic requirements. Which means? That they've got to knuckle down to the three R's and learn something. Now, all they seem to know or care to know is baseball and football and basketball and a dozen other sports. You wouldn't say that was wrong, would you? Yes, when it interferes with their basic education. Don't you agree? The question is, when does it interfere? And that's where our opinions differ. Now, you listen to me, young lady. My son has plenty of time to get the education he needs, but just now athletics are vital. And more important than reading, writing, and arithmetic, Mr. Alexander? Now, you can stress that more than it's worth. I'd have you know my son is a fine sportsman. He's fair-minded and knows teamwork. You can't get that out of books, Miss Anderson. That's right. It's become more and more evident, Miss Anderson, that the standards are not what they used to be. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Bill, I... let me handle this. And the reason is that you're simply dead set against any athletic program. Now, that is not true. I think, gentlemen, it's if you... It's too late now to alibi, Miss Anderson. We're going to the school board and ask for your dismissal. Well, that is your prerogative, of course. Just uh, how much of a factor your own personal handicap is in this matter, you be the judge. Of all the prejudice and misunderstanding I've ever heard of, that takes the cake. Why, they didn't even give you a chance to get your mouth open, Miss Anderson. 
Oh, it doesn't matter, Henry. I'm sure that nothing will come of it. Oh, both these fathers are intelligent men. It's simply a misunderstanding, that's all. Well, I hope so. We'll see you Sunday morning, Susan. Oh, yes, Sunday school. Yes, I'll be there. Bye. Bye, Bye. Susan. So long, Miss Anne. What are you thinking about, Bill? I can tell you. He's thinking about Mel and Lou and how angry they were. Ain't that right, Sonny? Yes, old-timer, you're right. Those two weren't just giving Susan a piece of their mind. They meant what they said. Ah, I watched their faces. I think you're right, Bill. Well, there isn't much we can do about it, is there, Bill? No, pal, there isn't. But I know one way I'll be able to tell if this will blow over like a loud storm. I'll that, Bill. Both Peter and Justin are in my Sunday school class. If they're on the warpath Sunday morning, I'll know their fathers intend to start something. Help us to love your son more and to learn to walk closer to him. Bless our studies together as we open our Bibles and you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, this morning, fellas, we're going to continue studying the gospel according to Mark. Last week, our lesson was about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. Today, Peter, Justin, we're in Mark, the 10th chapter and the 17th verse. Oh, go ahead, Bill. We're listening. Yeah. Here was a young fellow who came to the Lord and wanted to know what he had to do to find eternal life. And the Lord Jesus asked him what he had done to deserve eternal life. Well, she turned to him and she said, Well, listen, Anna. Shut up, Just. I don't think this is the place nor the time to discuss your outside problems, fellas. You came to Sunday school to learn about the Lord, not to talk to your friends about the week's events. Well, this is important, Bill. More important than what the Lord has to say to us, Justin? Well, I guess not. But this is important. Then after class, you can discuss it all you want. Right now, this lesson is the important thing. Ah, uh, you're as bad as Miss Susan. Sure, all teachers are the same. They like to take all the fun out of life. If you two fellas think I'm not doing the right thing, you can leave the class or the rest of us may study the Gospel of Mark. Well? Well, we don't want to leave, Bill. We'll listen. Yeah. That's fine, Peter. Justin, I'm glad for that. Now let's continue. Bill Jefferson caught us talking about Miss Susan and bawled us out, Pop. He did, huh? He was at the school with the rest of his rangers when Lou and I headed out with your teacher. I suppose he's taking her side. Well, if he wants a fight, he'll get it. Lou, I think we ought to get a petition up to the school board asking for Miss Susan's removal. A good idea. Let's get us started and push it for all we're worth. That's the story, Mr. Hazard. Well, if she's that set against athletics, then she's too prejudiced to teach my children. Sure, I'll sign the petition. Well, my daughter told me what's going on. If the teacher's that bad, she should get the axe. Lou, stop at my home. I want to sign that petition. I agree with you all the way, Lou. Bring that piece of paper around. Look at all the signatures we've got. <laughs> and how. When the school board sees this, they'll wake up and get a good teacher. Have you fellas heard the news? We sure have, young brother. We saw what people won't do when they don't use their heads. Ah, this plenty bad. Whole countryside in turmoil over this. Yes, and the signatures. Look at them. How could they do it? Boy, what'll we do, Bill? 
The only thing we can do is to try and clear up this misunderstanding and prejudice. Yeah, it's simple, but how you aim to do that, sonny? Yeah, that plenty big order, Bill. I wonder when the school boy's going to meet to consider this petition. Any of you heard? Not I. Mm, no. I'm going to call Lance Fetrick and find out. I want to attend that meeting. <laughs> Come to order. Order, please. <coughs> this special meeting of the Naughty Pine School Board has been called to hear a petition to remove Miss Susan Anderson as teacher from Beaver Creek School. The secretary of the board will read the petition. <coughs> we, the undersigned, hereby demand that the teacher of Beaver Creek School be removed from her job and be replaced by one more competent. That's right. This teacher, Miss Anderson, has displayed a gross disinterest in sports and athletics of any kind and has openly attacked several pupils <coughs> because they've shown an interest in the same. The undersigned hereby state that this is an unhealthy educational atmosphere. And that said, Miss Susan Anderson shows great prejudice on this subject. It is hereby demanded that her resignation be obtained at once. This petition is signed by 40 persons directly involved in the above and recipients of the effects of the stated charges against this teacher. There are 50 registered students at the Beaver Creek School. The names of 40 heads of families appear on this petition. I must say that I did not ask Miss Susan to attend this hearing because I thought it best. We can speak freely at this time, and the board will make its decision after discussion. That is, if any discussion is necessary. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jefferson has the floor. Mr. Chairman, I challenge your acknowledgement of Bill Jefferson since he's not a parent of any of the Beaver Creek school children. In fact, he's not a parent at all. <laughs> your challenge is overruled, Mr. Claus. You have the floor, Bill. Thank you, Lance. For Mel's information, I am an interested party. <laughs> Not only because I was privileged to have a part in raising a boy who attended this school for years, but also because I heard Mel read the riot act personally to Miss Anderson before it ever came to the school board. I move that this meeting be adjourned until it can be held with Miss Anderson present. We ought not to condemn anyone without granting that one the privilege of a defense. There's a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? Mr. Chairman, apparently Mr. Jefferson is in sympathy with prejudiced teachers. I don't condone prejudice in teachers any more than I do in parents, Lou. I want to see a good teacher get a chance to defend herself. If in the face of that defense, the petition still holds good, that's another matter. Why don't you keep your nose out of this, Jefferson? The charges will stick whether she's here or not. That's right. Call a meeting in her presence if you want to. I'm not afraid to face her with a question. That will you second the motion that's on the floor? Sure. I'll second the motion, Lance. You've heard the motion and the second. Are you ready for the question? Ask the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion is carried. <laughs> Bill, I'm awfully grateful for what you did at the meeting. I wanted to be there, but a substitute teacher wasn't available, and, of course, I had no authority to close school. Well, you don't need to thank me, Susan. I was only doing what's right. Bill, I'm afraid that they've built up a case against me, and nothing I can say will change it. Hmm? You don't mean you're ready to quit? No, I guess not, Bill. Only I'm getting awfully weary fighting this prejudice. Well, just keep your chin up, Susan. 
Trust the Lord completely, and he'll see that everything works out the way he wants it to. I will, Bill. I honestly mean that. Why? Uh, by the way, what college did you attend, Susan? Oh, state normal. Why? Oh, just wondered. I'll see you Saturday morning. I hope everything turns out all right. Come to order. Miss <laughs> Anderson, I sent you a personal copy of the charges listed in the petition, which no doubt you've read. Can you and are you willing to protest them here before this gathering? I can, and I will. <laughs> First of all, are these charges true? No, they are not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Claus. I would like to ask this teacher some questions. Proceed. Miss Anderson, you say that these charges are not true. Is that right? They're not only groundless, but absurd as well. Did you not verbally attack my son and Justin Alexander on four different occasions because they were preparing sports plays? I did. Did you not refuse to pass my son and Justin Alexander to the next grade because they put too much emphasis on sports? I did. Bill, she's hanging herself. Well, I don't think so, pal. Let's see what happens. I have no further questions, Lance. I would like to know why you did these things, Miss Anderson. Would you pass a student or students who drew sports plays during recitation hours and who couldn't say or wouldn't even try to learn their multiplication tables, Mr. Fetrick? I would not. <laughs> she hit him on the nose with that punch. <laughs> Ask her why she never allows sports during school hours. And she won't take part in games with the children. Do you care to answer that, Miss Susan? Well, we can't have sports during the school hours because Beaver Creek School hasn't the facilities for such activities. And as to why I don't take part in games with the children, well, probably you Excuse can... Excuse me, Susan. Uh, Lance, may I have the floor? This is important. Uh, yes, Bill. Go ahead. Thank you. Folks, regarding these charges against Miss Anderson, I have two letters here I want to read to you. The first is by the Dean of Women, Miss Olive A. Beach, at State Teachers College. Dear Mr. Jefferson, she writes, You ask me concerning Miss Susan Anderson and her interest in sports. Miss Anderson held top scholastic honors while enrolled in this institution. Besides this, Susan obtained three letters in athletics. These were for swimming, tennis, and track. Most notable were her accomplishments in swimming because she set several new records, two of which are still unbeaten. I hope this information will be most satisfactory for your needs. Sincerely yours, Olive A. Beach, Dean of Women, State Teachers College. Bill, you shouldn't have done it. Now, folks, let me read the second letter, and I'll withhold the name until the end. Dear Mr. Jefferson, I was a lad 15 years old when my life was saved by a girl. I was trying to navigate a canoe down the shady river when it was swollen by the spring rains. As I came into the rapids just before Dead Man's Gorge, my canoe smashed on the rocks of the rapids. This girl was picnicking along the river bank with some friends, and she saw the danger I was in, dove into the river after me, and pulled me out. She saved my life. In the rescue, she was smashed several times against the rocks by the vicious current. One of those blows broke her ankle, but it didn't stop her from rescuing me. I will always be grateful for the courage of this girl who still bears the mark of her bravery, Susan Anderson. Sincerely yours, Thomas R. Winthrop, Mayor of Stocktown. You say Susan Anderson has no sympathy for sports? And you ask why she doesn't take part in games with the children? These letters give the reason. 
<laughs> Is there anyone else who would like the floor? Uh, yes, uh, I, I would like the floor uh, just to make a, a public apology to Miss Anderson. And I want to apologize, too, and say three cheers for Susan Anderson. Hooray! 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 And there, boys and girls, was the story of how the record was set straight. See you next week for more adventure with... Struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, showing rare courage in the face of disaster. In the air. On horseback. Or in a screaming squad car. Ranger Bill, his mind alert, a ready smile, unswerving, loyal to his mission. And all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. There's something about a police officer pounding a beat at night that gives everyone a real sense of security. He walks along in the dark with his lead-weighted nightstick dangling readily from his hand while he stops here and there to check locked doors to make sure they're doing their job. Every once in a while, he flashes his light into some dark corner to make sure that only the dark of night is there. The officer on the beat also watches Holmes to make sure there's no suspicious smoke coming out or people trying to break in. And then he's an awfully nice fellow to meet if you're walking home late at night. Now, in Naughty Pine, there isn't much in the way of excitement on the night beat. But officers O'Rourke and Ryan walk their beats just as carefully. Let's find out what happens on this night in the story, River of Fire. Come on, Patrick, this is the halfway mark in the bridge, me boy. And the rule book says you got to walk to the half mark. Ryan, you're a hard man. It's too bad you ever learned to read. You'll drive me to retiring by reciting that rule book every time you look me squarely in the eye. Come on, Patrick, me boy, you can make it if you try. Oh. All right. Are you happy now? I'm sure glad you never made sergeant. Say, and what's the matter with your nose? It's jumping around like a rabbit. Don't you smell it? Smell what? Fuel oil. Well, certainly I smell it. Do you think me nose is stopped up? It's coming from one of them barges tied along the dock upstream. I tell you, that smells strong. Sure, and so's the breeze, Flatfoot. You're standing downwind of the barge. Mm, maybe you're right for once in your life. Did you ever know the time I wasn't? Take it easy, Patrick, me boy, on your next round. Uh, you too, Ryan. Yeah, and don't try to be a hero if you spot something. Use your whistle or phone for a squad. Remember that for yourself. And stop smelling so good. Sure now, me aching feet give me more trouble than me nose. <laughs> <laughs> T 
two warm-hearted Irish policemen having a bit of chin music at the end of their beat before they start back. Let's follow Pat as he slowly walks along, giving everything the once-over. Wait a minute. Pat stopped. Has he seen something he doesn't like? No, he's just standing there. Now he's turning back. Pat's walking quickly now, back toward the river. Something's on his mind. Something's disturbing him. He's not letting it go by as a passing thought. Let's follow Pat as he heads back toward the bridge. Ryan, what are you doing back here? Now, I might be asking you the same thing, all right. Uh, you got the river on your mind, too? Aye, that I have. Let's go down and have a look. Come on. Here. Watch it. Careful. Yeah, flash your light on the water. The fuel I'll smell is as strong as day old fish. I'll have to agree with that. What? The river is covered with oil. Aye, and that it is, my lad. The whole thing is covered. One of those barges must be leaking. Let's have a look. <laughs> These aren't oil barges. Where's the stuff coming from? Now, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be worth a million dollars right now. It's coming from up the river, sure as I'm standing here. The pipeline's over the river. You don't suppose it sprung a leak, do you? Where else could it come from? Let's pull the box over there and get the boys hot on it. Come on, Ryan. We've got to sound the alarm. One spark and this will be a river of fire. Hello, Bill. Hello, Cal. What's all the excitement about? Yeah, it's a fine time to be getting people out of bed. <laughs> That's the way I felt until Pat and Ryan showed me that river. Well, let's take a look. Well, it's about time the top ranger got here. <laughs> Hello, Pat. Hello, Ryan. Top of the morning to you, Bill. <laughs> That's what it is. The top of the morning or the bottom of the night. I'm not sure which. Uh, now, there's a youngster for you. You're full of fire no matter how little sleep. <laughs> say, Bill, can you smell it? I'll say I can. Fuel oil. How bad is it? Uh, take a look across the river. You follow the beam of me flashlight. Uh -huh. There's a regular blanket of the stuff floating on top of the water. It must be a couple of inches thick. You said it, pal. Have you found out where it's coming from? No, not yet. Pat and Ryan think it might be coming from the pipeline where it's bridged across the river. It isn't leaking in town. You're probably right. Come on, pal. Let's pick up Stumpy and Gray Wolf and take a look at the pipeline bridge. Yes, sir. I'll have the fire engines flood the river with water and try to disperse this stuff down rapidly. Right. You better send cars around informing the people of the danger, even though you'll wake them out of a sound sleep. Make sure there isn't any fire of any kind nearby. What are you going to do about that fire way over yonder? Huh? Where? The lightning. Looks like a storm coming on. And how? We've got to try and get that leak stopped before the storm gets here. All right, let's go. Attention, please. Attention, please. The river is covered with fuel oil, and the situation is very dangerous. You can help by staying in your homes until this emergency is over. Please do not go down to the river to sightsee. It's too dangerous, and you'll only be in the way of the firemen who are trying to disperse the oil downstream. This is the sheriff speaking. If you refuse to cooperate, I'll have to ask the governor to establish martial law and to send troops into town to keep you home. Please, cooperate, and this won't be necessary. Thank you. Naughty Pine Dispatcher calling Junction City. Naughty Pine Dispatcher calling Junction City. Come in. Over. Junction City Police. What's up, Naughty Pine? We've got a river covered with fuel oil, and it's moving your way. Naughty Pine Sheriff wishes you to notify Central City. Say, you fellows got your hands full. What's leaking? We think it's the pipeline. Man, that's not good. 
I'll pass the word to the Central City Police. Thanks for the warning. got in that line. What do you mean? What they've got in it? Isn't it all oil? Not this pipeline, pal. This is a freight line. You mean, you mean they send batches of different stuff through that line instead of only one kind of fluid? Right. How do they pull off that stunt? It's a matter of chemistry. They know which liquids won't mix. Like they can put a load of ethyl gas between two loads of regular gas. Suffering catfish. You mean they pump automobile gas through that line? Yep, they sure do, pal. That's smart trick. How they know where one can begin and end in pipeline. They put a mass of radioactive substance in between each load. And by using Geiger counters, they can tell when a load begins and ends. Well, how do you like that for a fancy dangle contraption? (laughs) You speak truth. That company can send a lot of different liquids through line. That's what has me worried. What's next in line after the fuel oil? Scotty, ten seconds and you're on. Good morning, everyone. This is Scotty Logan with the 5 o'clock news. This early morning, I'm sure there are more listeners than usual... And this isn't the cheery morning we'd like it to be. Here's our sheriff to speak to you about the emergency situation of the flood of fuel oil on the river. Here's Sheriff Harper. Thank you, Scotty. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Jefferson and the Rangers are trying to locate the source of this fuel leak. I haven't heard from them yet, but I expect to at any time. I want everyone to be calm and to stay at home just as you've been doing. Those of you who have to cross the river to get to your jobs will have to do it on foot and only across the Main Street Bridge, and only if conditions permit. If we feel dangers increase, the bridge will have to be closed to everyone. I wish to thank you for your wonderful cooperation by staying at home. It's made our job much easier. And again, I urge you not to become panicky, even in the face of the oncoming storm. The fire department is rapidly dispersing the oil as it comes downstream, and our fire chief feels that the danger point has been reduced considerably. Thank you. Henry, throw the spotlight along the bridge. Right. There it is. Look at the oil spilling out. There, a big hole in pipe, all right. Maybe a bridge sway too much from wind. I don't know, but I'm calling the pipeline company right now. Look at Malcolm Gray and his men up here on the double. Malcolm Gray speaking. I'm Al, Bill Jefferson. You got a busted pipeline. No. No, where? I'm at the bridge over the Shady River, and watching the fuel oil spill out by the hundreds of gallons. Is there room to land a helicopter close by? Yeah, plenty of room. Well, I'll be there with a the crew in 20 minutes. <laughs> the company men are in the air now flying here from Canyon City. That's about all I can tell you right now except the stuff is spilling out like crazy. That's fast work, Bill. How are things in Naughty Pine? Wonderfully quiet. Everyone's doing his best to stay cool and calm. The fire boys are pumping water into the river as fast as they can. Fine, Cal. It's fine. I'll call you as soon as I know more. Over and out. Here come pipeline men now. Yes, sir. None too soon. That storm's beginning to kick up an awful fuss. The wind's sure tossing that copter around. Get your men out there 
past. There isn't a minute to lose. Yes, sir. Let's go, boys. Hello, men. Hi. Hello, Mal. Howdy. Say, sure looks like a kind of risky business out there. Yeah, you're right there, old timer. Hey, Bill, may I use your radio? Sure, help yourself. Thanks. QXBC3, this is JMNX1. QXBC, this is JMNX1. Over. This is QXBC. Come in, boss. Cut off the line immediately, Fritz. Sure, boss. What's up? I'll tell you after you close the valve. Do it now. I'll wait. Right. Be back in a minute. What's up? The line is split open on the bridge. Oh, no. That's bad. I'm afraid to ask you, but I've got to know. What's the load behind the fuel oil? I think I know, but let me check the manifest to make sure. I don't want to scare the pants off you for nothing. Hurry up. Mal, Hmm? it's mixture coded 107. No. Are you positive? I'm looking right at the manifest now. If it were cow's milk, I might joke about it. But not 107. Okay, Fritz. Now, don't open that valve for anyone or anything. You understand? Sweeney, what are you doing back here? Get out there and fix that hole. Boss, we can't work out there. The wind's too strong. Get out there. Don't tell me what you can and can't do. But, Mal, we've got all we can do to hang on. We can't repair that leak now. It's 500 feet to the bottom of that door. What kind of man are you? Get out there or I'll know the reason why. What's the matter with you? We might get killed. That's too bad, but it's part of your job. Or maybe you figure the rangers should do your work, huh? Now get out on that bridge and fix that leak. Oh, all right, we'll try it. But I'm not making any promises. Get out there, do you hear? Stop blabbing and get out there. Bill, I'm going to talk to Fritz again. Okay, Mal. Use the radio all you want. Thanks. Boy, you see a bottle of nerves all of a sudden like... You said it, sonny. I smell a rat in the woodpile. I think same thing. He changed like wind after he talked to Valve Station. You fellas are pretty sharp. Pretty sharp. What do you think's wrong? I don't know. I'm waiting for Mal to tell us. Maybe he'll wait until it's too late. I hope not. Here comes Sweeney and his men crawling back on bridge. And they're hanging on for dear life. We ain't going back out there till this thing blows over. Trying to plug that hole in this storm is like like trying to walk a tight wire on a one-wheel bike. Are you telling me what you're going to do? Yes, and if you don't like it, you can jump in the river. I ought to punch you in the nose, you coward. And that goes for your men, too. Uh, Let's make him go out there if he's so smart. Uh, No, I think we ought to throw him in the river. Come on, start swinging if you think you're man enough to lick me. You used to be a good boss until just a few minutes ago. This thing's got you scared stiff. Yeah, uh, you mind your own business. Now you get out there or you're fired. Wait a minute, Mal. Now you keep your nose out of this, Bill. It's none of your business. That's where you're on. I'm top man here. This is government property, remember? Come on in the car. I want to talk to you. You are telling me what to do. Get in the car and make it snappy. We haven't got time to stand around and argue. Sweeney, you and your men take it easy. There's something wrong here. You can say that again, Ranger. I ain't looking for no fight. But I ain't taking any more abuse either. He'll get Mal straightened out. All right, let's have it. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, Mal, don't play Ring Around the Rosie with me. You change like night from day right after you talk to the valve station. What's in the pipeline behind the fuel oil? The next load is... Aviation gasoline. Aviation gas? Yes, 50,000 gallons of it. If the lightning hits that stuff, the whole county's going up. Bill, 
until I'm almost to the point of nervous collapse. That pipeline comes down to the river in a long incline. I don't know how to stop that stuff. It just keeps draining out. I do. Well, how? We've got to cut the pipe open on the other side of the bridge and let the gas run on the ground. Yeah, yeah now that would do it. Come on. we got work to do. You talk to Sweeney. I'm ready to jump out of my skin just thinking what could happen if that stuff spills into the river. Okay. Sweeney, gather your boys around. Okay. Come on, boys. Your boss is on the point of nervous collapse, so I'm taking over. Uh, Mal called the valve station and found out there's a load of aviation gas in the line behind the fuel aisle. Aviation gas? That's right. Now there's only one thing to do to save us from a catastrophe. We've got to open the pipe on the other side and let the stuff run out on the ground. That means we've got to cross the river. That's right. Oh, no. Can we go around? It'll take too long to go around. Come on now, I'll lead the way. Henry, you stay here and man the radio. But that's an order. Yes, sir. Inform the sheriff what's going on. You and the copter pilot keep a close eye on us. You may have to pull us out if the lightning touches off the gas. Why can't we use the copter to cross? Too many dangerous wind currents over there in those canyons. We'll save the copter for emergency. Real emergency. Let's go. Last one of us was in extreme danger crossing the pipeline bridge over the shady river. One misstep on the narrow catwalk, that would be all over. They might find our bodies down in Dead Man's Gorge, or they might never find us. The wind howled an angry gale and tried to tear each man off the catwalk and throw him into the river. I wasn't worried about the bridge itself going out, even though it swayed like a rope. It was engineered for that. My big worry was getting the men across. And the electrical part of the storm hit us. The lightning played about us wickedly, one flash after another, so that I could have read a newspaper by it. I decided to hang onto a brace cable and let the men pass me. So I could bring up the rear. That would leave me on the bridge longer. I didn't want anyone to panic and lose his life. I tried to encourage them as they inched their way along. Keep going! Hang on! It isn't far now! Go slow, man! sight, watching the men crawl across the bridge in the eerie lightning flashes. I pray that all would make it safe and sound. Screaming and yelling and burning gas. Nobody to help them. I'm going to rescue them. I'm going to rescue them. They'll die. They'll die screaming with pain. Now, come back here. Okay, boy, you ask for it. No, no. I'm sorry, Mal. Sorry I had to tackle you. I couldn't let you kill yourself either. Henry Scott. To Sheriff Wan at Nutty Pine. Henry Scott to Sheriff Wan at Nutty Pine. Come in, over. Sheriff Wan to Henry Scott, over. Cal, send an ambulance right away. I just had to tackle Mal, throw him on the ground. Knocked him out. He was going off his rocker with worry. He was going to go out there on the bridge. Is it that bad up there? Yeah, it's pretty bad. What about the pipeline? Where's Bill? 
Bill's leading the men across the bridge to try and cut that pipe open on the other side. Let the gas run out on the ground. Gas? Yes. Aviation gas. We'd better get together on this end and pray for those guys. They'll need all the help they can get. Get that cart away from here. Want to kill us? How long, Sweeney? There's a small hole now, Bill. Maybe ten minutes. We'll have it split in two. Can't wait that long. You'll have to. We need miracle men, you know. It's time to cut through steel. It's like opening a can of soup, you know. Get your men out and back. Are you cracking, too? First you say cut faster, and now you say stop cutting. You see those rocks up on that ledge? Yeah. Will they open the pipe if they're dropped on it? A watermelon dropped off a truck. Okay, get your men out. You too, Stumpy, Grey Wolf. But if the gas is coming through the line when the rocks hit, we won't find you after it's over. I'm not asking you to risk your life, am I? No, sir. I get you. Come on, boys, clear out. I go with you, Bill. You heard me, and that's an order. Get out of here. Scram! climbed rapidly up to the top of the ridge. That is, as rapidly as I could in the early morning darkness. Now I was glad for the savage lightning, because it helped me see where I was going. I thought of all the people and property along the river for a hundred miles would be in danger if the gas got loose on the river. What a blazing inferno that would be. Finally, I made it to the top of the ridge. I stopped for a second... Looked the rocks over with the help of the lightning. And I saw the key rock that would start the slide to crush the pipe. Put my muscle to work. The rock began to move. Finally, I pushed it over. It went crashing down. Taking more and more rocks with it. Now I wait. Where's the gasoline in the pipeline? Suddenly I realized I was holding my breath, waiting for the explosion of the deadly gas. But it didn't come. Then I smelled it. The gas, that is. The rocks had smashed the pipe seconds before the first of the gas got there. I was still alive. explosion and breathe again after it not come. I did too, Grey Wolf. Thank the Lord there won't be a river of fire. Little did O'Rourke and Ryan realize how important their keen sense of impending danger was. The whole Shady River Valley was saved from a most disastrous holocaust. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Bill, 
warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, do you have a dog? If you do, you love him, don't you? Well, this is the story of a great dog who lived on a ranch near Naughty Pine. His name was Bim. Bim's masters were Otto Jorgensen and his two sons, Eric and Paul. Now, Bim was a very unusual dog, yet he wasn't any different from your dog in lots of ways. His love and devotion to his masters were boundless. Bim is gone now. That great dog heart is still. Those who love his memory are gathered in the lobby of the newly built Memorial Clinic for Animals. All of the rangers are there, and Bill is the master of ceremonies for the dedication of this wonderful animal hospital. Let's join the crowd as they talk together. Quite a crowd of folks gathering here. Almost fill the lobby, they do. Ah, Bim, great dog. Have many friends. I didn't realize so many people knew him. Yes, Bim was quite a dog, all right. This animal hospital is a fitting memorial to him. Bill, I was coming this way. Oh, I guess he wants me to start. Bill, will you begin the ceremony, please? Why, sure, Otto. Uh, folks. We're gathered here today to dedicate the BIM Memorial Clinic for Animals. A building that is more than brick and steel and concrete. This hospital is a memorial to a great dog that we all love and whose memory we'll cherish for a long, long time. The idea for this building originated with Otto Jorgensen and his two sons. They wanted this clinic to be a living token of their love and esteem for their dog. A good deal of the money came from folks like yourselves. This hospital and clinic was built for the study and treatment of animal diseases so that the animals may enjoy a fuller and longer life. To the memory of Bim, a great dog, and his heroic deeds, we dedicate this building with all its equipment and staff. Also, so that no other animal will have to suffer the same slow and painful death, we dedicate the scientific research that will go on inside these walls. Thank you. Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson, may I talk to you a minute? Why, sure. What's on your mind? Oh, I'm Ed Sloan. I'm a writer for Bancroft Newspapers and Dog Lovers Magazine. I see. We have a combined circulation of half a million. Uh, I'd like to write the story of Bim's life, if I may. And I gather you're the one I ought to see. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Sloan, but that's not within my authority... You'll have to talk to Otto Jorgensen and his two sons. Perhaps they'll help you. Ah, I understand. Uh, But I don't know Mr. Jorgensen. I'd be glad to introduce you. Uh, They're over on the other side of the lobby talking to some friends. Well, Mr. Sloan, I don't know how well I can tell this story, but uh, maybe Bill can help me out in a few places. First thing, I ought to say I wasn't too sold on Bim at first. Oh, why not, Mr. Jorgensen? Well, I'd always set my heart on owning a pedigree dog. Bim was just a gangly poppy. Good blood, but a mixture. Bim actually was rather a badly put-together mass of fur, big paws, and powerful body. I never thought he'd amount to much, to tell you the truth. How wrong I was. I'll never forget one day when Bim was about six months old, Paul Nerick was playing with Bim on the front lawn. Come on, Siggy, Bim. Get, Bim. Get, Get Eric. Eric. Come on, come on. Pull his ears off. Right a boy, come on. Come on, tease him, Brown. Come on, pull his ears off. Right a boy, come on, let's go. Paul, what in the name of common sense are you doing playing with that hound on the front lawn? We were... We, uh... Dead. That is, we... 
What's got into you boys? Look at that lawn. And look at my flower beds. You let that mud run around in my prize flowers. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, Dad. It's our fault. Ever since you've had that pooch, things ain't been the same around here. Well, I'm going to get rid of him. Oh, no, Dad, please. Don't make us get rid of Bim. Oh, all right. One more chance. But if this happens again, out he goes, understand? <laughs> I was very angry at the time, but I saw no reason to change my opinion about Bim. But as time went on, gradually he grew out of the awkward stage. At nine months, he began to show signs of becoming a powerful dog who could run like the wind. I was pleased, but I still didn't think he'd be much more than a pet for the boys. And I really didn't intend to make good my threat of throwing him out. I knew it would break the boy's heart. He was their dog. Well, the first in a series of outstanding acts of bravery and heroism occurred when Bim was ten months old. Eric and Paul got the habit of taking Bim out on the range with them every spare moment they could find. Let's see if we can find any more of those swell-colored rocks, Paul. Okay, that's a good idea, Eric. Uh, what kind of rocks did Dad call them? I don't know, something like quartz. Cor quartz. Yeah, that's it. Hey, let's head for that ridge over there, huh? Okay, I'll race you. All right. Come on, Skeeter. Dig it, boy. Let's go. Anyway, well, I don't know. I've probably seen a rabbit. Hey, look at these rocks, Paul. Say, those are the nicest we've found yet. You know, Eric, the Lord sure made rocks beautiful, didn't he? And how? Hey, let's move this big rock over so we can get the smaller one out. Okay. Say when. I uh, no. Uh. <laughs> Uh, that's good enough. <sighs> now, let's get those... D don't move, Pa. That rattler will strike just as quick as we move a muscle. Yeah, you said it. Look at the size of him. Where did he come from? I don't know. He must have come out from behind the other <sighs> big rock when we moved the smaller one. Eric, looks like we're going to have to stand here all day. That's better than getting bit. He hasn't coiled yet. Maybe he'll go away. Oh, yeah. He's crawling right at us. What do we do? Hey, Paul, look. The rattler's not after us. Huh? He, he sees something. It's Bim. The rattler sees Bim. They're going to fight. Yeah, let's get back. Get going. Get it, Bim. Get it. Come on. Know, that snake is a bad dog. Oh, I never thought of that. He hasn't got Bim yet. Come on, Bim. Kill the rattler. Come here, boy. Oh, boy. Good boy, Bim. Good boy. Atta boy. Hey, we've got to get home and tell Dad about this. You said it. Now well, maybe Dad will believe that Bim's a real good dog. Well, when Eric and Paul came home with a big yarn about Bim killing a big rattlesnake, I didn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that Bim had the courage and fight in him to tackle and kill a live rattler. I was at the corral when the boys came in and told me this whopper. It's the truth, Dad. Bim did kill the rattler. Come on now, fellas. I wasn't born yesterday. How could Bim kill a big rattler? Especially one as big as you say it was. We can prove it, Dad. All right. How? We'll show him to you. We tied a rope to the rattler's tail and dragged him here. Huh. Yes, I gotta see him. Come on over to the horse barn, Dad. The rattler's outside on the ground. Okay, let's go. There, Dad. 
Take a look. Yeah. And Bim killed him all by himself. Well, the boys had me where they wanted me. I examined the dead snake and could easily see where Bim's teeth had done their job right in back of the head. I was still pretty pig-headed about it all. I told the boys that Bim's killing the rattler was an isolated incident and he'd probably never do one thing else that was worthwhile. You say that was the first big incident in Bim's life, Mr. Jorgensen? Yes, it was, Mr. Sloan. The second incident followed six months later. Winter was close by, and uh, I'd sent Paul out to round up some wild cattle. Uh, by wild cattle, I mean the cattle that leave the herd and shift for themselves during the grazing season. Let's go up this canyon, Pim. Come on, boy. Yeah, there's a couple of wild ones, Pim. Let's get behind them and drive them out of there. Higher, higher, come on there. Come on, Skeeter. We can't let that maverick get away. It'll freeze out here this winter. Higher, higher. out like a light. His horse, Skeeter, had stepped onto a chuck hole and thrown Paul against the canyon wall. The boy had a broken collarbone, a fractured shin bone, and he was very badly bruised and shaken up. Bim started licking his face and hands, and Paul slowly came to. He was crying from pain. Oh! oh. oh. Surely. Bim! I'm hurt bad. Bim, go find Skeeter. Oh, bring him back. Find Skeeter. Bring him back, boy. Go. Bim left Paul and went after the horse. He picked up Skeeter's trail and soon caught up with him. Skeeter was over his initial scare now and was just browsing in the grass. Fortunately, the bridle straps was hanging down, and Bim took them in his teeth and obediently led the horse back to Paul. Oh, oh good boy, Bim. Lay down, Skeeter. Lay down, big fella. And a boy. Thanks, Skeeter. Now, hold still, boy. I try to... Crawl across the saddle. Just a little bit farther. Oh. Oh. I made it. Up, Skeeter boy. Up. you don't know, Mr. Sloan, it's a rather a difficult job for a horse to get up with a rider on his back. And Paul was in such pain that he didn't re- realize he wasn't balanced properly across the saddle. So when he told Skeeter to get up, Paul fell off. Back home, Eric and I began to get worried when Paul and Bim didn't show up for supper. It got to be about nine o'clock. Then I decided to do something. Dad, what could have happened to him? I don't know, Eric, but I'm going to find out. I'm glad Bim's with him anyway. What good will Bim do if Paul's in serious trouble? Don't talk that way, Dad. Bim's real special when you need him. Sure, sure, son. You saddle up the horses. I'm going to call Bill Jefferson. You lead the way, Otto. We'll pick up the trail when we get into the area. Okay, Bill. If Gray Wolf and Stumpy can't find them, we can always get blood on. Yep. Get Come on, on Storm. Get up. Here you go, boy. Come on. Is there enough light to see the trail, fellas? Uh, plenty light, Bill. Oh, boy. Trail very clear. Oh, oh, boy. Get, oh, come, oh, on, oh, oh. come on, Jerry. Come on, boy. Come on, Storm. Let's go. Come on. 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 
Hey, let's hold it up here. Whoa, Matilda. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, the sign's kind of messed up here, isn't it? Uh, can you make it out? Is this where they had the trouble? What's it say, Grey Wolf? Uh, this sign say horse and dog going to small canyon ahead. Uh, this sign say cattle maybe half dozen head come out of canyon. Mm, that shit. Paul and Ben was rounding up wild cattle. Now over here it says that horse come out again. Did the dog come out? Uh, did they go back, or were they chasing the cattle? Over here, out of Bill. What'd you find, Grey Wolf? See something different? Yeah, look here. Dog walk in front of horse. They go back in canyon. Hmm. I say dog lead horse back into canyon. Well, I'll buy that, sonny. That means Paul and Bim are in that canyon, unless I miss my guess. You agree, Grey Wolf? Ah, Stumpy, you're right. Then let's get into that canyon. the light over the canyon floor, Grey Wolf. They should be close by now. Hey, that's Skeeter, fellas. Uh, throw your light to the left. Hey, there they are! Come on, Matilda! Get up, Storm. Get up, boy. Oh, Matilda! Whoa, boy. Easy. Idle. Look. Look at that dog. He cover a paw with his own body to keep him warm. Afterward, Paul told us the whole story. Then I knew I had been wrong and the boys were right. We had a great dog in him, so I asked the boys to forgive me. From that time on, Bim and the boys and I became an inseparable foursome. Then the day came when the catastrophe at Pearl Harbor plunged us into World War II, and the boys came to me with a request. Dad? Mm-hmm. Dad... We've been reading in the papers how the armed services need dogs. Uh, that's right, Dad, and, uh, uh, well, we'd like to send Bim. You, you want to send Bim to war? Sure. We're too young to enlist ourselves, so... And we want to do our part to help win the war. Are you absolutely sure you want to do this, boys? Yep. We thought about it a lot. You will realize, of course, that... Uh, Bim might be killed in action. We thought about that too, Dad. And... Yes? Well, a lot of soldiers might get killed, but then they might not, too. That's right. Bim's really tough, Dad. We're sure he'll take care of himself. So I thought, far be it for me to dampen the patriotism of my sons. I was proud of both of them the next morning when we walked into the recruiting station for the Marine Corps in Nazi Pine. In no time at all, Bim was in the service of our country. We said goodbye to Bim, and I'm not ashamed to say that, just like the boys, tears was rolling down my cheeks. Bill, you take over the story from here, will you? I think you can tell about Bim's war record better than I can. All right, Otto. I sure appreciate your helping me, Mr. Jefferson. I, I don't want to leave a thing out of Bim's life. Well, it so happened, Mr. Sloan, that I was with the 3rd Marines in Bougainville, same as Bim. I got the story firsthand from the fellas that had Bim with them. It was pretty rough going. A Company of the 1st Battalion was trying to flank the enemy and... They weren't having much success because they were pinned down by a Japanese machine gun nest set up in a pillbox, which the artillery just couldn't get. Captain, we won't move another inch until we knock out that pillbox. I'm well aware of that, Sergeant. Got to be patient for a while. If we try to rush, we'll lose a lot of men. But, sir, it's the only way we'll ever get past them. The artillery and the mortar shells bounce off that thing like water off a duck stand. I know. That's why I've sent for Bim. Oh? Hey, Bim will get him out of there if anything will. And believe me, they'll think a screaming Mimi hit him if Bim ever gets into that billbox. Mm -hmm. Hey, here comes a corporal now with Bim. Well, that's fine. Corporal Lutaski reporting. Good, Corporal. Bim, how are you, boy? I hope this isn't too risky, <laughs> sir. I wouldn't want Bim to get it. 
Corporal, please don't get the idea that these dogs are out here for us to use or we don't want to send in men. We use them only where they can be used to better advantage than men, see? They're not cannon fodder, understand? Yes, sir. Now, look. You see the fire lane from here? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, I do. Well, send Bim up the left side. We'll give him covering fire until he jumps for the window. Yeah. Then we'll cease fire and rush the pillbox. Prisoners are on their way back to the stockade, sir. Very good, Sergeant. How's Bim? He's wounded, sir. What? Why didn't you tell me? Bim comes before the prisoners, don't you know that? Uh, take it easy, sir. The doc's looking at him now. The wound isn't bad, sir. He got knifed in the leg. Not bad. Oh, okay. That's fine. In the leg, huh? Uh, yes, sir. We'll see that he's carried to the rear on a stretcher. That's an order, Sergeant. Yes, sir. It'll be done, sir. Even if I have to carry him myself. That's the story of Bim's service with the Marines. Thanks, Mr. Jefferson. Is there more, Mr. Jorgensen? Yes, Mr. Sloan, there is. We received a telegram from the War Department saying that Bim had been wounded, though not seriously. Uncle Sam was sending him home. They also said that Bim would receive a Purple Heart. Bim recovered the full use of his leg, and in about six months, you'd never know he'd been wounded. I'll say you could, Mr. Sloan. He was as fast as he ever was. But he sure grew up, though, while he was away. It seemed quieter and more serious. That's right. Well, one day, a year after Bim came back from the war, I was dragging our road. We have a private road that leads from the highway to the house and barns. I had the tractor hitched to a weighted drag, and I was trying to even out the rough spots. I was alone. That is, except for Bim. He was playing around nearby somewhere. Well, I don't know exactly what happened to this day. All I knew was that suddenly the tractor overturned and I was pinned under it. I'll see if I can... Yeah. yeah, that's it. Good boy. I'm almost clear. That's all right. You can scratch me if you want to. That's it. I'm coming out. I'm... And you mean to tell me that your dog dug you right out from under that tractor? Yes, Mr. Sloan. Amazing as it sounds, he not only dug the ground out from under my face so I could breathe, but he dug the ground out from under my chest and body. Enough for me to crawl painfully out, broken back and all. That sounds unbelievable. Mm, all of it was in the local newspapers. What a dog he must have been. Uh, would you care to tell me how he died? Yes. Uh, about a year ago, we noticed that Bim was beginning to fail. Not too quickly at first, but noticeably. We took him to Dr. Crawford, a veterinarian here in Naughty Pine. Dr. Crawford examined him and said that Bim had a malignant tumor. And there wasn't anything we could do to save him. Just a matter of time. It was heartbreaking to watch a dog so full of life and courage as Bim was slowly to waste away to skin and bones. I'm sure it was a heartbreaking experience, Mr. Jorgensen. Well, we watched him this way for three months. Finally, the boys spoke to me about it. I'm glad they did, because I wouldn't have spoken to them if they hadn't brought up the subject first. 
So, in the morning, the three of us went to Bim's bed to take him to Dr. Crawford. It was like visiting a sick and dying friend. Eric kneeled down to awaken him. Bim. Bim. Come on, fellow, wake up. He hasn't moved a muscle. You don't suppose... Uh, let me that... see, Eric. Yes, boys. Bim's dead. We were glad we didn't have to take him to Dr. Crawford, though all of us were broken-hearted that we'd lost him. The men at the Naughty Pine Legion Post were only too happy to give Bim a military funeral, and we buried him in our front yard. I make no bones about saying that I cried like a baby. Here was a dog that had given us all he had. And when he needed our help, there wasn't a thing we could do except watch him die. Several months passed by, and I talked to Dr. Crawford. I offered to contribute a sum of money for an animal clinic and hospital if he would head it up. He agreed. Dr. Crawford and the local newspapers let the story out, and many, I should say a host, of Bim's friends and those who love dogs gave to the fund. The result, you see before you. Well, that's the story, Mr. Sloan. I don't know if I'll be able to do justice to this story, Mr. Jorgensen, but I'm sure going to try my best. Well, that's all we ask, Mr. Sloan. Before we leave, I, I'd like you to see the bronze tablet. Yes, sir. I'd like to. Read it, will you, Bill? In loving memory of our dog, Bim. He loved and asked no love in return. He knew no selfishness except a duty. He knew no fear except that he hadn't done enough. He gave all he had and asked no recompense. This tablet is inscribed for all to read, realizing that Bim lived as we should live. The Jorgensen's. Boys and girls, the story you have heard is fictional, of course, so far as there actually being a dog named Bim is concerned. But all the incidents which have occurred in the story are true, for dogs actually perform the unusual and heroic deeds that were told to you today. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, have you ever been in an automobile accident? They can be pretty frightening. And on the spur of the moment, you might even get scared enough to want to run away. 
never run away from the scene of an accident, no matter how bad the accident is. Why? Well, listen to the story of two boys, Reuben and Smitty, who had an accident with their hot rod. Only by hard work and fast thinking did Bill Jefferson save them from the angry citizens of Big Pine. That's a village about halfway between Knotty Pine and Canyon City. Here's the story, Hit and Run. Cut it down, Smitty. Got to keep well within the limit. Yeah, yeah, okay, Rube. You know, I don't know where folks get the idea that hot rod drivers are always speed demons. Oh, that's because a couple of smart Alex didn't use their heads. Going through town like a jet plane the way they did, and everybody's been sore ever since. Well, I can't blame them exactly. Can you? No. Say, Smitty, we got to put the strobe light on this thing when we get back to the garage. It must be out of time again. Yeah, you're right. Seems to be missing at high speeds. Watch out. The street's narrow here, Smitty. What's the matter with you, Rube? Getting the jitters or something? No. It's just that the folks in town are so dead set against us. We wouldn't stand a chance if anything should... Look out! Look out for that man! I think I hit him, Rube. Yeah. Let's get out of here, quick. You mean run? Sure. Okay, here goes. Cut around him wide. That's right. Now take off. farther we got. Quite a ways, Ralph. Coming into Big Pine now. Uh, oh, that means we're halfway home. Yep. Gray Wolf and Stumpy are still sleeping. Guess I'll do the same. Hey, Bill, uh, what's going on up here in the center of town? I'm just wondering myself. Better wake up Stumpy and Gray Wolf. We'll find out. Okay. Hey, Grey Wolf, Stumpy, come on, wake up. Come on, wake up. Hey, why are we, why are we stop here, Ralph? Well, something's going on in the street. Bill says we should take a look. Hey, look at all the people. Sounds like a riot started. I'm not joking, Ralph. Lock the cars so no one can get our weapons. Come on, fellas, let's find out what this is all about. Hey, they're the rangers. Let them through. Thanks for letting us through, folks. Where's Constable Gorman? Right here, Bill. Is he dead, Sid? Yeah. How'd it happen? I don't know, Bill. Some of the folks heard a car tearing down the street, and then they found poor old Sam here. Yeah, it was one of those dirty hot rodders. Well, get a blanket out of the car and cover the body, will you? Sure, sure. Let me through, please. A uh, blanket won't do Sam any good. Why don't you go after those rats that did this? Yeah, that's what's going to do. Oh, look here, mister. Yeah. We'll handle this your own way, if you don't mind. Uh, Gray Wolf, Stumpy, uh, let's clear the crowd off the street. Ah, uh, not good idea. They only wipe out evidence when they walk around. You haven't got enough rangers to move us, mister. There are three of us here and one at the radio car. That's enough. You seem to be the ring leader, mister, so I'm talking to you. You don't stop making trouble, I'll arrest you for inciting mob violence and obstructing the work of law enforcement officers. Yeah. I'll get a move on. Yeah. Back it in, Smitty, before somebody sees us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think I'm trying to do, Rube? Just so scared I can't see straight. Look out now. Yeah, okay. Come on back. Well, that's that. Close the doors, Rube. Yeah, right away, Smitty. Now, why don't you go home, Rube? I hit the guy, not you. Uh uh. We're in this mess together, aren't we? Boy, I. I sure don't know where that fella came from. All I know is suddenly he's right in front of the car, and boom. I know. 
Let's stay here for a while and think what we should do. I know what we shouldn't have done. Yeah? What? We shouldn't have run away. Maybe you're right. And I'm the guy that told you to do it. But we wouldn't have had a chance with some of those hotheads in town. But it's too late to think of that now. Is it? Sure it is. If I could only calm down and do some straight thinking. We've got to think straight. It's our only chance. The ambulance will be here shortly, Bill. Thanks, Sid. Did you find out anything? Yeah, some very interesting things. As soon as they take old Sam away, we can go into my office and talk this over. Yeah, it's a good idea, sonny. Something mighty fishy about this here accident. Huh? Well, it's a clear case of hit and run, ain't it? Not the way we see it, it ain't. Is that right, Bill? Well, there are some very peculiar factors in the case, Sid, that you don't find in the ordinary hit and run. I hope you can prove your point. There's some ugly rumors around that the citizens of Big Pine are going to take the law into their own hands. Well, Smitty, I found out who the man was we hit. Yeah? Who is he? Sam Potter. Sam Potter? Oh, no. I found out something else. What? He's dead. You mean... You mean it was our car? Must have been. They found him dead on the street. I I can't figure it, Rube. Neither can I, Smitty. But we killed him just the same. Do you... Do you think we'd better give ourselves up? Smitty, we can't do that. The town's people would lynch us. Well, Bill, how does the evidence stack up? Let's start with the tire marks, Sid. We measured the short skid marks, and they tell us the car was going between 20 and 25 miles an hour. Twenty miles? Mm -hmm. How could there be skid marks at that speed? Well, the brakes were in excellent condition, and the driver slammed them on hard. The marks aren't prominent, but they're there just the same. Um, They're even more important point about skid. Tell him, Bill. I'm just getting to that, Grey Wolf. Another reason the car skidded as it did is that the tires were bald. Makes skidding easier. What kind of a car would have bald tires? It ain't safe for a regular car to have them. But hot rod have bald tires in some cases. Hot rod? That would make matters worse for whoever hit Sam. What do you mean, Sid? Why, a large portion of the population of Big Pine is made up of only half a dozen families. Intermarriage and so forth. Sam Potter was recognized as the leader in the town. I see. That's why the folks here were so angry. I sensed more than just the usual anger and disgust over a hit-and-run case. Not only that, Bill. These folks are very prejudiced against hot rods. Most people are, Sid. It's the hot rodder's own fault. Well, we just got to keep ahead of them, that's all, and ask for patience. How do we do that, Bill? By finding the driver of that car before they do. Where we start to find driver, Bill? Well, the first thing I want to do is take Sam's outer clothing to the lab and have him gone over for paint fragments. Uh, Gray Wolf, you and Ralph get a list of all the lads who own or drive hot rods. And Stumpy... You stay here and help Sid keep things under control. Uh, Say, Stumpy, let's stop in here at Ben's store and have a cup of coffee. A lot of the folks just sit around there and talk. Yeah, that's for us, Sid. Maybe we can get an idea what they're thinking about in this here accident. Yeah, seems to be quite a crowd in the store. Yeah. And I don't like it. Well, Sonny, let's go on in. Yeah, only right. one way to catch a polecat. Go in after him. Hey, fellas. Here's Sid. Yeah. Got a ranger with him, I see. Uh, he's just an old guy. He can't do any harm. Oh, just a minute there, youngster. I 
Mother was putting three cornered pants on grizzly bears before you were born. <laughs> and step up here, I'll show you how old I am. Okay, Pop, I take it all back. Okay. Hey, Seth, you find out who did it yet? No, but uh, the Rangers think a hard rod may have hit him. Uh-huh. No. You shouldn't have said that, Sonny. No, you're telling me. It's too late now. Let's grab those hot rodders and let's get them one by one. Yeah, let's get started on this manhunt, boys. I know the first place to go. All right, let's go. Let's get them. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I guess I'm not the peace officer I ought to be. I didn't even try and stop them. Yeah, don't talk foolish, Sonny. There's some things you can do and some things you can't. Let's get a shooting iron and follow those men. And call Bill while we're at it. And listen, if we'd have got beat up, we wouldn't have been able to help anybody. Hello, University Lab. Bill Jefferson there. Uh, just a minute. Bill, it's for you. Thanks, Pat. Hello, Bill Jefferson speaking. Bill, this is Sid Gorman. You'd better get over here right away. Hmm? What's happened? Oh, I let it slip out accidentally that you thought the hit-and-run driver was a hot rod. Now the men of the town have taken matters into their own hands. They're going after all the lads who own hot rods. Oh, that's bad. Well, I'll get over there as fast as I can, Sid. You stay at the office and have Stumpy follow the mob. Tell him to call in and let you know where he is. Okay, Bill. Oh, one more thing, Sid. Try and get hold of Grey Wolf and Ralph and any other rangers you can. I'll see you soon. Something unexpected, Bill? Not unexpected, Pat. Just came sooner than I thought it would. Phone me at the constable's office in Big Pine when you get through going over the clothes, will you? you guys. Quiet. Quiet down. We gotta find out some things. Is this your hot rod, kid? Uh, yeah. It belongs to me and Smitty. Have you been driving a car recently? Hey. Huh? Here's a piece of Sam's coat caught in the license car. Quiet. Quiet down. Quiet. Did you two kids run down Sam Potter? Answer me, did you? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Who was driving? Me. So you're the guilty ones. You ran away, didn't you? You did run away, didn't you? You dirty hit and run. That's right, sir. Yeah, let's take him away before the law gets here. We didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Accident, my eye. Let's get a barrel of tar and some feathers. I got some. We'll take care of these kids our way. Okay, let's go. Come on, let's get them. Let's go. Here's the Rangers. All right, all right, release those boys. We ain't doing it, Copper. They're guilty. This time we're doing things our way. Who appointed you as judge? How do you know they're guilty? Release them, I said. You make me. All right, I will. <laughs> Hold it there, boys. Don't make me shoot. I can go GI out of a June bug at a thousand yards. Don't make me prove it. I'm warning you. Thanks, Stumpy. Now listen, you people. These kids are going to get justice. If they're guilty, they'll be punished. If they're not guilty, they'll go free. That's for the law to decide. Tom, take these two boys over to the jail and lock them up for their own protection. And stay there with Shorty and Ned and guard the jail. We'll keep these men here until you're safely away. Okay, Bill. Come on, Lance. Let's go to the car. Hey, you in the back. Don't try and sneak off. That's right. Everybody stays here until the car leaves. All right, you can disperse now. You fellas, go on home. Behave yourselves. One peep and we'll need a jail stretcher. 
you. Huh. That was a close one, Bill. We got here just in the nick of time. I'll say we did, Ralph. This isn't the end of it, either. I uh, think you're right, Bill. Those men plenty mad. You think they try and break into jail? Well, they wouldn't try that in this day and age, would they? Sounds ridiculous, I know, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if they did. Now, let's go back to the jail and talk with the boys. See what's what. Uh, first, let's take a look at the hot rod, Sid. We'll be back at the jail before the mob gets rebellious enough to try to break in. <laughs> Smitty, suppose you tell us just how it happened. I was driving, Bill. I'm the guilty one, not Rube. But I told him to drive away. I'm the most to blame. All right, take it easy, fellas. All I want to know is what happened. And don't worry about the mob. They won't get you, believe me. Okay, Bill. All I can say is that we were driving down the street. Couldn't have been more than 25 miles an hour at the most. And suddenly, the old man was in front of us. Man, we couldn't stop. Man, we hit the brakes. It didn't do any good. I still can't figure where he came from. Only, all of a sudden, he was right there. And that's all there is to it, Bill. Now, I know we did wrong by running away, but we were... All right, Smitty, that's what I wanted to know. And I believe you. We, we wouldn't lie, Bill. Not even when we were in a jam. Now, look, fellas... I want you to know that I didn't lock you up because I thought you were guilty of killing Sam Potter. I did it for your own protection. They were going to tar and feather us. Don't you worry about those men. I'll take care of them. Bill, Bill, you better come out front. We got huh? trouble again. Fellas, guard the reel of the jail, will ya? Right. Come on, boys. Bill, I'm sure glad you and your men are here. I've never seen anything like this. Don't fret none, sonny. You're in good hands. They don't scare us none. This has always been such a peaceful town. Perhaps that's why they've let themselves get carried away. Ah, they feel they have right to mete out justice, but they wrong. Here they come. With a battering ram, it sounds like. You said it, Ralph. They mean business. And so do I. Open the door, Sid. Did you say open the door, Bill? That's right. I'll be in the doorway and let them try to get past. Okay, Bill. You're calling the signals. All right, quiet. Quiet, you people. Ah, uh, you men, listen to me. Unless you go home and behave yourselves, I'm taking Rube and Smitty to the Naughty Pine Jail. You'll never make it, Ranger. I'll make it all right, mister. Even if I have to use a tank. Now, either you disperse and go home, or I'll take drastic steps to make you. How do we know justice will be given to those two hot Yeah, yeah. how do we know that? You have my word for it. Yeah. His word. That's a good one. Yes, it is a good one. Because it's a promise, not only as an officer of the law, but as a Christian. You're a Christian, Ranger? That's right. You can believe Bill Jefferson. He's never gone back on his word in all the years I've known him. All right. That's good enough for me. Let's go home, men. When's the inquest going to be held? I haven't talked with the coroner yet. The day and time will be posted. Okay. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going home. Okay, George. Stumpy, for a minute, I thought we were going to have a shooting brawl on our hands. Well, we can shoot if we have to, Sonny, but we learned a long time ago that God is a lot more powerful than anything we can do. Bill, what do you hope to prove by reenacting accident? I'm not sure yet, Grey Wolf. I have a couple of points in mind. Well, they're coming in close now. Be ready to push that stuffed dummy in front of the car when I give you the word. Ah, hot round, almost here. All right, now. Okay, Smitty. That was just what I wanted. That's just how I start, Bill. It all happened so fast, but I'm sure that's just as near as I can come to what actually happened. That's fine, Smitty. Thanks a lot. Uh, Gray Wolf, you escort the boys back to their garage and return them to jail. 
Ralph and I are going to Knotty Pine to see the corn. Bill, uh, what's your honest opinion about this case? Not quite ready to make a statement yet, Rudy. I need one more piece to finish the jigsaw puzzle. Mm-hmm. What's that? A court order for a post-mortem on Sam Potter's body. Do you think it will show something? I don't know, Rudy. That's why I'm asking for it. All right, Bill. I'll sign the order. Well, here's the place, Ralph. Bill, uh, how'd you find out Jim Land was Sam Potter's doctor? Uh, Sid told me. Uh, hello, Jim. Well, Bill Jefferson has a live and breathe. And Ralph Mitchell. Hello, Dr. Land. Well, come in and don't just stand there. Well, I'm sorry, Jim, but I got a lot to do. You're busy, huh? Hey, what's that piece of paper you got there, Bill? Court order for a post-mortem on Sam Potter's body. Oh, you won't need that. You mean... Yeah, I'll testify at the inquest gladly. Oh, fine. I'll call you to the witness stand first thing. Thanks a lot, Jim. Bye. Samuel Potter met his death. Coroner Rudolph Gordon presiding for the county of Canyon in the village of Big Pine. Spectators will not make comment, pro or con, as the principals involved are interrogated. Coroner Gordon. As coroner, I'm setting aside the usual practice. Now I'm asking Ranger Bill Jefferson to present the salient facts in the case. All right. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Coroner. First, I'd like Dr. James Land to take the stand, please. Dr. Land, you've been attending the deceased for some years because of a physical ailment. Is that right? That is correct. What was the physical impairment? Heart disease, angina. Jim, I served you with a court order to make a post-mortem on the deceased Sam Potter. Why did you say it wouldn't be necessary, since the order was in conjunction with this inquest? Because, Bill, I already knew how Sam Potter died. How did Sam Potter die, Jim? He died from a heart attack. Well, this uproar occurs again. I'll have the rangers clear the room. All right. Proceed, Bill. Thank you, Rudy. Dr. Land, how did you come to this conclusion? I warned Sam to take it easy because his condition was getting worse. He wouldn't listen. When I heard about the accident, I went to the undertaker and looked at Sam's body. That was clear and positive symptoms of heart attack, despite the bruises. Well, will you sign the death certificate as you've stated? Cause of death, heart attack, coronary insufficiency? Certainly. That's what kills Sam, and that's what I'll put on the certificate. Thank you, Jim. You may leave the stand. Now, I call to the stand Ranger Bill Jefferson, the arresting officer. Bill, I want you to explain what you found out regarding this case. All right. As you can see, I have drawn on this blackboard a diagram of the scene of the accident. We know that the car was traveling between 20 and 25 miles an hour. That fact has been very carefully checked. The victim was here at the X mark. The car didn't have time to stop and avoid hitting the victim. However, Smitty's reflexes are rapid. Upon seeing Sam in front of him, he applied the brakes instantly. It's a fact that the car was going only five miles an hour when it hit the victim. There's no dent in the fenders or grill of the car, nor are there any paint fragments in the clothes. Sam was hit 
in midair by the car bumper as he toppled right into the path of the oncoming vehicle. Now I remember, Bill. That's the way it was. He didn't exactly fall. He sort of toppled. I've presented the evidence to an unbiased mind, which proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Sam's death was accidental. This concludes my presentation. Then if Rube and Smitty didn't kill him, they ought to be punished for running from the scene of the accident. (laughs) I'm not making excuses for that, except that they're only boys and that they were frightened. How about you, mister? You should know better of been inciting riot and mob violence, obstructing justice and invading the right of privacy. Did you have a search warrant when you broke into Smitty's garage and examined his car? No, I didn't. I apologize. I made a mistake. So did Reuben and Smitty when they hit and ran. They've learned their lesson. And thanks to you, I'm sure they'll have nightmares about it for a long time. Take it easy, Bill. As coroner of this county, I've heard the evidence and do now pronounce Sam Potter's death as being from natural causes, not because he was hit by the automobile <laughs> driven by these two boys. I also waive any punishment recommendation to the court because the boys ran away, since I'm sure they've learned their lesson. This inquiry is concluded and adjourned. We sure sure owe you a lot, Bill. You were great on the stand. I'll never forget you for the lesson we've learned. I owe you the most thanks because I drove the car. Oh, boy. What a load you've lifted from my shoulders, Bill. I'll never forget the lesson you've taught us, either. And what is that lesson, fellas? It's just this. Never run when you're in trouble, no matter how bad the circumstantial evidence. In this country, you're innocent until you're proved guilty. Well, I was just as startled as you were when Bill presented the truth. But it was the truth, and that's what really counts. We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hello, boys and girls. This is Ranger Bill. Have you ever had your heart set on getting something and then was disappointed because someone else received it? By all right, you should have gotten it. But somehow it was the other fellow who was given the break. How did you act in that situation? Did you take it gracefully, realizing that all things work together for good to those who love God? Or did you spunk up and act as though you never knew what Christian behavior really was? Well, this is exactly what happened to Ranger Ralph, who was due for a promotion when the next opening came along. (laughs) But wait a minute. First thing you know, I'll be telling you the whole story. Here it is. Next in line. Hi, Ralph. How are you? 
anything of her shaking importance take place while we were gone, Ralph? <laughs> no, nothing happened, Stumpy. Everything quiet. Oh, Bill, a letter came for you from Colonel Anders. Put it on your desk blotter. I thought it might be important. Mm, thanks, Ralph. Mm-hmm. Well, now that you fellows are back, I'll run along home. Okay. See you in the morning. Right. So long, fellas. Right. Bye, Ralph. Hello, Ralph. Bye, Ralph. Well, from the size of that, looks like the colonel threw the book at you, Bill. Well, what's it say? Shh. Everybody quiet. Genius at work. Henry, you full of monkey business today. Well, okay, it's probably a good thing Ralph left when he did. Mm, what do you mm. mean? What mill? Andy Thompson from the Mid-Central District is retiring the 1st of June. And Gil Zodkin from the Pennsylvania Eastern District is coming out here to fill the vacancy. Gil Zodkin? Uh-oh. Ralph's going to be mad about that. By whose orders, Bill? A man in Washington, I assume. Colonel Andrews says his hands are tied by a top-level directive on both transfer and promotion. Woo! Ralph's liable to blow a fuse over this... He's an next in line, isn't he, Bill? Yes, he is, old-timer. Well, how do you like that? We're being invaded by a new boss ranger. There's going to be some fancy fireworks when this gets out. Uh, one thing, you fellas keep this under your hat until I have a talk with all our men in the morning. <laughs> Let's quiet down. I have just received a letter from Colonel Anders relative to some personnel changes. As most of you know, Andy Thompson is close to retirement. The date is June 1st. There's a ranger from the Pennsylvania Eastern District assigned to take Andy's place. This man's name is Gil Zotkin. Now, Colonel Anders wants him to visit us for a while to get an idea how we work out here. As you know, our method of operation is somewhat different. The colonel would like Gil to actually run things for a while under my supervision. This will be like a training course for him. <clears throat> He'll arrive day after tomorrow. That's it, men. Well, I wish I were a mind reader right now, Stumpy. You and me both, sonny. Boys, you're unhappy. Bill? May I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead, Tom. Well, what's happened to the rule of promotion by seniority? Has it been junked? Not as far as I know, Tom. Then whose bright idea is this? Colonel Anders? No, Ed, it isn't his idea. The orders came from him, but he wrote and told me that he's guided by a top-level directive. Bill? Yes, Ralph? This looks to me like a fellow doesn't have a chance to get ahead by hard work. Well? It's who you know, not what you know. I was to get the next promotion. Everyone knows it. And either I get it or I quit. That's right. I thought the Forest Service was one place where influence didn't come. Yeah, that's right. Why should we train this new boss? Let him find out for himself. Yeah, like all of us did, including yourself, Bill. Yeah, that's right. Fellas. Fellas. I can understand how you feel about this. However, I'm just following orders like you. Yes, I have a few questions myself on this issue, and I intend to find out the facts. When I do, those facts will be passed on to you. In the meantime, I think the less said, the better. Until we've all had time to settle down and think this whole thing over and cool off. There isn't going to be any cooling off, as far as I'm concerned, Bill. You better tell those big wheels they're going to be missing some rangers unless this is straightened out pronto. That's right, Ralph. We're all back in the back. <laughs> Got that report finished, Henry? Uh, right now, Bill. You know, Bill, I can't get over the strong reaction that news from the colonel got out of the fellas. I've never seen them act that way before. Ralph didn't even come in after lunch, and he always does. Well, I sent him out on the trail for today, at least, Henry. Maybe he'll think differently about things out there. Yeah, 
Well, take it from me, fellas. There's a lot to this thing. More than meets the eye. Ah, but plenty right, Stumpy. More than just facts that Ralph not get promotion. I don't follow you. I was under the impression that all the fellas are angry because Ralph didn't get promoted since he's the next in line. Well, that's all very true, pal. The hidden part of it is that all the rest of the men put themselves in Ralph's shoes. Oh, you mean they're all saying to themselves, why should we work hard for so many years only to lose out in the end? Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's some reason why the central office is doing this. I don't think they should hold it back. It's not good psychology. You know, this is the sort of thing that shatters a man's dreams, his ambition. We all work for more than dollar wages. We work for prestige, importance, authority, reputation... Take those away, and dollar wages don't mean much, because a man's unhappy. What do you think can be done about this? Maybe Colonel Andrews cleared up what you plan to do, Bill. I can't do a thing right at the moment. I'm as much in the dark as you fellas. And from Colonel Andrews' letter, it's plain that he's in the same boat. I think the best thing to do is wait and see what happens. There's a ranger standing over there, Bill. That must be the fellow, Henry. Let's walk over and meet him. Help him with his bangs. Ah, he fine-looking man. Clean cut. Yep. Looks like he's got something under his head besides hair. Hey, he sees us. Hello there. You Gil Zatkin? Yes, I am. You're Bill Jefferson? That's right, Gil. Shake. Now, these are my assistants. Gray Wolf and Stumpy Jenkins. My friend, Henry Scott. Hi, fellas. How do you do, Mr. Zatkin? Yeah, let us help you with your bags, Gil. We'll get over to headquarters. Ah, uh, that'll be fine. I appreciate your meeting me, Bill. It's always helps in a strange place. Well, it won't be strange for long, Gil. You know your way around in a couple of weeks. Ten and six, Ed. Okay, Ralph. Well, a new boss ranger must be here. There goes a nine five. Hey, there's the train. We got visitors. Visitors. I'd just as soon punch that guy in the nose as look at. Now wait a minute, Tom. That won't get us anywhere. Remember, we've got to behave ourselves if only out of respect to Bill. That's right, Tom. Bill's the best boss ranger on two feet. We don't want to hurt him if we can help it. Yeah. Well, what I'd like to know is, how are you going to fight this, Ralph? All the fellows are pulling for you, you know, 100%. That's right. What well, you say goes, Ralph. Nobody in a big, fat office a long ways from here is going to jip you of your rights. If they do it to you, they'll do it to all of us. Yeah, I know that. Let's, let's bide our time, fellas. Wait and see what happens. <laughs> Ends the guided tour of headquarters, Gil. No charge, of course. <laughs> well, there should be, the way you took me around. You fellas have a very impressive layout here. I should think you're ready for everything and anything. This largest district in country. Plenty ground to cover. I'm glad you said that, Grey Wolf. Bill, may I have a look at your maps? Ah, you beat me to the draw, Gil. That's next on the list. Let's see... How many maps have you got here on your rack, Bill? Ten altogether. You use them all? You see, we carry all the maps, so if we get lost following one, we can use the other nine and hope to find a way again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stumpy, you have quite a sense of humor. Quite enjoyable. Oh, you shouldn't have said that, Gil. He'll drive you to distraction now with his corny jokes. Ah, you see here, Henry. You laugh almost as hard as I do at my own jokes. You know it. Better take it easy, fellas. I'd like to get through showing Gil around so he can meet the men in the morning and start working on the trail with them. Let's have it quiet, fellas. There's no need for me to point out to you who Gil Zadkin is, since that's very obvious. Now, Gil isn't going to remember all your names first, anyway. 
So I'll just introduce him to the three <laughs> senior men, then he'll meet the rest of you as he works along. Uh, come on along, Joe. Uh, Gil, this is Tom Allen. Hello. Hello, Tom. And, uh, Gil, this is Ed Freeberg. Howdy. I'm glad to meet you, Ed. And, uh, this big hulking fellow is Ralph. So you're the new boss ranger, huh? Well, not exactly yet, Ralph. Uh, you can meet the rest of the fellas in a few minutes, Gil. Men, I want you to extend every courtesy to Gil as you would to me. In a few days, he'll be out on the trail working with you as your boss. This is only temporary, of course. It's kind of training ground for Gil, so he can find out our problems firsthand and benefit from experiences with us when he leaves for his new post. But when Gil gives an order, it's the same as though I gave it. Is that understood? Yeah. 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 Fine. And now I want you fellas to get acquainted with Gil. We'll be making a trail inspection first thing Monday morning. Got a fine group of rangers under your command, Bill. Thanks, Gil. You'll find that they're well-seasoned veterans. Cool as cucumbers in the face of any emergency. I could feel that. It's the impression you get from men who've been through a lot. Well, now if you'll excuse me, I've got to mail some letters. Also take a stroll around town on my own. So long, fellas. Yeah, I so see, long, you. Gil. see you. See you. Boy, talk about a refrigerator. Ralph, Ed, and Tom really were cold, weren't they? You said it, young feller. The ice was a foot thick. The rest of the men weren't so bad, though. I think the whole thing come off better than expected, in spite of bad feelings. Yeah, I agree, Grey Wolf. No comment, Bill? Oh, I don't know what to say, fellas. I'm a little angry with our senior men. They know better than to act that way. I'm sure Gil felt it. That's why I wanted to take a walk, sort of think things over. Uh, can you blame fellows too much, Bill? Well, no, Grey Wolf, I can't. They have a point, all right. But that still doesn't excuse them for not acting more friendly to Gil. Well, what do you think of him, Ralph? Oh, I don't know. Seems like a nice enough fella. Uh, I don't know. Thinks he's got, think he's got any more on the ball than anybody else. Why should he get my promotion? You're right, Ralph. I can't understand why they're breaking the seniority system in the Western Division. Personally, I think we ought to give the guy a bad time. Let the higher-ups know where we stand. Yeah, well, what about Bill's orders? We don't want to hurt him if we can help it. No, we don't have to stage a rebellion or anything like that. No, what I mean is heck old Gill in little ways. He'll only be here for a short while. Bill wants him to get experience. <laughs> so that's just what we'll give him, eh, Ralph? Yeah, that's a general idea, Ed. Let him know just how we operate. You fellas follow my cues. Pass the word to the boys to sort of goof things up for Gil. You know, nothing drastic, but, but good. Understand? <laughs> sure. We'll call it his initiation into the Western Division. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you out to where Ralph's working with the trail crews, Gil. Good idea, Bill. I'd probably end up ten miles off base myself. This will save time. You got everything you need? I think so. Uh, if you want anything from here, have one of the fire tower boys call in or else use the trail crew radio. No, I'll do that, Bill. Should be back in three days. Right. Don't forget to make out your daily reports. Okay, you better get going. Yeah, so long. So long, Gil. I'll be back as soon as I can, Bill. Hey, hey, get up there. Ed, uh, what's the matter with the men? Those stumps aren't regulation. What do you mean they're not regulation? The men are cutting them off two feet from the ground, aren't they? Two foot stumps aren't regulation, Ed, and you know it. We have trees back east, you know. Tell the men to get back over there and cut them over. Stop wasting the government's time. A foot and a half this time and be sure they keep them all that low. A foot and a half? What are we making? A lawn? Hey, Lefty! Hey, 
Yeah, what's the matter, Gil? How wide are you plowing this fire lane? Well, 75 feet. Why? Why? What do you mean, why? You should know it's 90 feet. Huh? Oh, okay, so I made a mistake. I'll make it as wide as you want it. Ralph, when are the grazing permits report due in? I think they're supposed to be in now, Gil. What? Let me look at the schedule again. I haven't got it all down yet. Uh, let's see. Tree plantings, wildlife diseases, flood control. Here it is. You're right, Ralph. They're doing today. Well, they won't be. You mean you haven't got them ready? Nope. Well, why? You knew they were due, didn't you? I've got other things to do than make out reports. How soon do you think you'll have them finished? A mm, couple of days. A couple of days? Can't you understand? If that doesn't we... satisfy you, you can do them yourself. You want to see me, Bill? Yes, Gil. Uh, sit down, will you? Gil, I've just got the grazing permits report this morning. Some things I wanted to ask you about. Footbridge over Otter Creek had to be torn down and rebuilt. Fire lanes were plowed wrong, had to be corrected. Signs warning tourists not to pester the bears aren't up yet. Guardrail and the trail Dead Man's Gorge only half completed. So on. How about it? Uh, I guess I'm not cut out to be a boss ranger, Bill. Uh, nonsense, Gil. You wouldn't have been sent here for training if somebody didn't think you had it in you. Why didn't Washington wait until Andy Thompson retired and then send me right into my new job? That might be disastrous for you and the forest skill. If I were transferred to the Eastern Division, I'd want them to train me the way they're training you. Oh, you're right. But running a forest out here is different in lots of ways than it is in the East. You have different problems here. Believe me, I've learned a lot this past week. Glad to hear that, Gil. However, you haven't learned how to handle men. Gil, how would you handle this personnel problem if it happened when you take over Andy's district? That's why you're here, to give you training as a boss, not as a ranger necessarily. When you go to your new assignment, you've got to be ready for anything. Oh, what do you suggest I do? Gil, my men are testing you, just as they did me when I first took over. Call their bluff. Don't let them push you around. Meet them face to face and talk straight from the shoulder. You'll have senior men in your new command. All right. I'll take your advice. Thanks, Bill. Fellas, I've called you together to tell you that I've just been raked over the coals for not getting the job done either right or on time. <laughs> What's that got to do with us, Gil? Plenty, Ralph. I know you're giving me the business. Let's call it testing. Oh, uh, what if we are? Can't you take it? Yeah, Tom, I can take it. As long as your testing doesn't interfere with the job. We're here to get certain things done, and from now on, they're going to be done, or I'll know the reason why. Test me all you want. That's all right with me, as long as we get the job done. All these little errors and failures have got to stop. And stop right now. Okay. It's your turn to talk. Well, okay, Gil. We'll take the heat off. Yeah, let's give Gil a break, fellas. All right. Yeah. Okay. Say, Sonny, have you noticed something? By the way of things, Gil's got the boys moving right along. Yes, old timer. I think Gil's finally got the man under control. They pushed him around for a while, but they've been called on it. Maybe the battle's over. You think Ralph and the fellas have gotten over their resentment? I hope so, pal. Resentment can eat in a man's spirit like a cancer. and He hardly realizes it. Yeah, but other people realize it plenty quick. Ah, uh, not true enough. Time will tell if fellows get over this. Well, Gil's called their bluff. He has the control. Chances are that now they'll try and get that control away from him. Henry, have those reports arrived yet? Hmm? 
No, Bill, they haven't. Uh, just what I thought. Well, what do you mean? How would you know? You took Storm out for a fast run early this morning. That's right, and I did that for a reason, pal. Hey, you're angry. Yes, I am. Get Ralph on the radio, will you? Tell him I want to see him at once. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Bill. You wanted to see me? Ralph, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? Look, you know as well as I do, the fella hasn't got what it takes. That isn't what I'm talking about, Ralph. I want to know what's wrong with you. Me? Yes, you. I mean, deep inside. Ralph, we've been friends going on five years. You're not only a ranger under my supervision, but a personal friend. I know you like a book. You're not acting like your old self. Ralph, you're a strong Christian. But it's my guess you've fallen into the trap of Satan. I don't think my spiritual life is any of your business, Bill. But what you do for the U.S. government is my business. You're next in line for promotion, Ralph. <laughs> you mean I was next in line for promotion. However, with your present attitude, if an opening did come up, I wouldn't even recommend you for promotion. You wouldn't, eh? Showing your friendship, I suppose, huh? That's just why I wouldn't recommend you. Because I am your friend. Ralph, let's face it. You're filled with bitterness and resentment. Things haven't gone just the way you wanted it. So you're spunking. Is that so? What is this? You're giving me a sermon? No, Ralph, I'm not giving you a sermon. I'm talking straight from the shoulder about the terrific change for the worse that's come over you since Gill arrived. You've got to realize that we can't always have things our own way. Remember the lesson God taught Job? Job. Yeah, there's a lesson you and the big guns over you need to be taught. You can't push senior men around. God, he belongs to you. Deal with him as you would a son. In Jesus' name, amen. Huh? Oh, I'll get it, Henry. Boy, the way it's ringing, something must have happened. Hello, Bill Jefferson speaking. Bill, Bill, this is Ralph. I, I'm sorry I woke you up. That's all right. What's wrong, Ralph? Me. I know it's an unearthly hour, but can I talk to you? I mean, as soon as I can get to your house. Well, of course, Ralph. Right over. I'll be waiting for you. Bye. Bill, I, I had to come to see you. God has been giving me a terrible whipping. Now, I'm terribly sorry for what I've done and the way I've acted. Uh, everything you said to me is true. I, I knew I was guilty. That's why I was so mean. The Lord wouldn't let me sleep until I came over here and apologized. I accept your apologies, Ralph. Believe me, I understand how you feel. Maybe I would have felt the same way if I'd been in your shoes. Thanks, Bill. You're a real friend in every sense of the word. Thanks, Ralph. And you can still help me, Bill, if you will. Gladly. Just name it. I'd like you to pray with me. and Ask the Lord to take the resentment out of my heart and put love and patience there. I want the Lord to give the patience that Job had. Ralph, why are the fellas gathered around? They're supposed to be out working. I called them in, Gil. 
I have something I want to say to you in front of them, if you'll let me. Okay. What is it? Well, Gil, the first thing I want to do is apologize for the things I've done to you and the way I've acted since you came on the job. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'm the one who's been ringleading the special treatment you've been getting. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I must say anyway that I'm terribly sorry and please accept my apologies. For the rest of your stay with us, you'll have my wholehearted cooperation and I'll help you as much as I can. Ralph, I appreciate what you've just done more than you know. It took a lot of courage. I most certainly will forgive you and accept your apology. Thanks, Gil. Okay, fellas, let's get with it. Do the job we're supposed to do. <laughs> Well, Gil, I must say you've done a fine job and won a tough battle. Good for you. Thanks, Bill. It's been a terrific experience. I've learned a whale of a lot about supervising men. To give credit where credit is due, Ralph, Tom, Ned, and all the rest of the men have been an invaluable help in showing me the special problems you have out here. Well, that's fine. Very happy it turned out the way it did. Uh, you leave us in the morning for a new job. Is that right, Gil? Yes, Gray Wolf, that's right. I'm sorry to have to leave you, fellas, but, well, orders are orders. Well, you won't be so far away, Gil. That's right, Sonny. We'll be working together. Oh, hi, Ralph. Oh. Hi, Ralph. Hi, fellas. I'm sorry you have to leave us, Gil. Thanks, Ralph. I'll be around to see you as often as I can. I'm afraid Ralph won't be here then, Gil. What's that, Bill? What do you mean, Bill? I... Uh, Ralph, uh, here are new orders for you. Huh? Well, what kind of orders? Read them. I just came through. Fellas, I've been promoted to take over the Southern District. Louis Hampton's going to division headquarters, and I'm taking his place. It sounds almost too good to be true. It is true, Ralph. So you see, you really are next in line. Well, you can see, boys and girls, it never pays to jump to conclusions and think you've got all the answers. And in being bitter and resentful because things don't happen the way you'd like them to, you're only hurting yourself. Because the Lord may have bigger and better things planned for you. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Boys and girls, what would you do if a king cobra got out of its cage and escaped and you were responsible? How would you go about capturing this deadly reptile, a bite from whose fangs means sure death, more deadly than the fur de lance or the bushmaster of South America? A king cobra has enough poison in one injection of venom to kill 500 men. Listen for the story as Bill and his rangers go looking for 12 feet of danger. Our story opens as Paul Pearson, young son of Thad Pearson, director of the Logan County Zoological Gardens, amuses himself by playing idly with a baby boa constrictor. He watches fascinated as the writhing creature slithers across the floor of the snake house. Just as the door opens, George Hill, a longtime head keeper of the zoo, enters. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, George. 
I see you're playing with the baby boy again. You'd better be careful, son. That's that fellow's going to gain strength pretty fast in the next couple of months. I'll watch him. If I feel he's getting too strong for me, I'll quit playing with him. Well, I don't like you to play with snakes at all. Someday you might make a mistake, and it would be too late. Oh, I'll be all right. Besides, Dad says it's all right as long as I don't go near the dangerous ones. I know what your dad said. But you know how I got this crippled left hand of mine? Sure. He got it from snake bites. Four of them. That's right. It's only by the Lord's power that I ever pulled through. Now, you go on, Paul. I've got to feed those killers today, and I don't want you here when I open the cages up. All right, George, but I'd like to help feed them if you let me. When you get a little older, son, I can't take any chances now. It'll be too late after you got bit. Son, back so soon from the snake house? Yeah, Dad. What's the matter, Paul? You're acting rather down in the mouth. Oh, nothing. George says that baby boy is going to be too strong for me to play with pretty soon. That's right, Paul. Is that what's bothering you? No, not exactly. Uh huh. Something is bothering you, son. Come on, out with it. Oh, it's nothing, really. Honest. Oh, come on now, Paul. We've had, we've talked over lots of problems before and ironed them out, haven't we? Uh, let's forget it, huh, Dad? I don't want to complain. It's nothing, really. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, the first opportunity I have, I'll talk to George about letting you in the snake house. How'd you know, Dad? <laughs> oh, just a dad's understanding, I guess. I was a boy once, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks. Just one thing, Paul. Yeah? Remember, George has big responsibilities. And he takes pride in seeing that they're well taken care of. Stay away from the poisonous snakes. They're dangerous. Morning, George. Good morning. Got to clean this cage out. If this monkey would stay away from the broom. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there, Pedro. How's the chief snake keeper's helper this morning? <laughs> he's a lot of help. All he does is run off at the mouth and eat bananas <laughs> and get into monkey business like most monkeys do, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's what monkeys are made for. Hey, Pedro. Here, here, Pedro. Don't take on so. Stop that racket. What's the matter with him, George? He acts like he's afraid of something. Look, the king cobra's out. No, it can't be. The cage is locked. Turn around and look, man. That isn't a hose crawling out of that cage door. Oh, we've got to stop him. Twelve long feet of danger slithers slowly out of its cage. King Cobra, deadliest of all poisonous reptiles. Quick as greased lightning, cunning as a fox and ruthless. For a frightening moment, the two men stand paralyzed with awe as the killer moves soundlessly out of the cage onto the service floor. Suddenly, the director springs into action. George, throw the door locks. Make sure nobody's in the building. Run right away, stick. Chief. The sticks are behind the door. Get out of here, Pedro, before you get killed. Let's see now. Here are the sticks, Pose. Now, Mr. Cobra, we'll see if we can't talk you into going back into your cage. The building's locked, Dad. I've got a shotgun here. That's fine. Stand back of me, George. I'll need plenty of room to maneuver this character. Let me take the risk, Dad. It's my responsibility. You just stand ready with a shotgun. If the snake gets me, then it's your job to kill him. Okay, Chief, he's all yours. I don't want to lose him unless it's absolutely necessary. He's a valuable specimen. Watch him, Chief. He sees you now. I'm watching him. And he's watching me. 
I'm going to try to get this this loop around his neck before he hoods. Maybe you'll be able to get him before he suspects a scrap. Is this his eating day? Yes, he's fed. He should be rather lazy. Oh, just raise your head up now, big boy, and don't hood out or your goose is cooked. Now, Thad, he isn't hooding. I've got him, George. Good work, Thad. Get a hold on his body and we'll, we'll uh, put him into the cage before I choke him to death. Right. Oh. Have you got him all in? Yes, all 12 feet. Wedge his body down with a pole so I can take the loop off his neck. Okay, I got him. Take the loop off now. There. Release the pole and we'll slam the cage door. Now. Oh. We were very fortunate this time. That fellow's fast. Oh. Half a second more and he'd have piled right out of here again. You said it, Thad. We'd better go around and look at him through the glass and see if we heard him, huh? All yeah, right. Oh. And then I want to find out how that cage door got unlocked. I guess he didn't hurt himself. He seems to be all right. Yes, he's all right, George. You'd better put some sedative in his water supply to cool him down. It isn't good for him to get too excited. Okay, I'll do that, Thad. Now, one question. How'd that door get unlocked, George? That I don't know. It beats me. I always check the cages carefully. You know that. George, I'm not questioning your integrity. Anybody can make a mistake. I make more of them than anybody else does. But this, well, it's, it's frightful. Just be careful, George. Do you hear? That... I know you think I did it. But there were others in the snake house beside me this morning. Others? Who, for instance? Well, Paul. Are you intimating that Paul left the cobra's cage door open? I don't know that, but, well, I just worry about the boys making a mistake, that's all. I'm very fond of the boy. Watch him grow up from a baby to a fine lad but I don't think he should be in the snake house, at least alone. Well, I think I'm a better judge of that than you, George. He's becoming quite a herpetologist. He won't make any mistakes, I'm sure. Anyway, I've given him specific instructions to stay away from the poisonous reptiles. Dad, I don't like having anybody in the snake house, even Paul. That is, before and after visiting hours. Well, now, let's not argue about it, George. Just be sure you give the cobra a sedative. I'll see you later. Paul! Hello, George. Paul, what are you doing in the snake house? I thought I told you I didn't want anybody in here before I arrived in the morning. My dad says I can come here. He just wanted to exercise my black snake. You're not going to exercise any snakes until after I get here. And I don't intend to get up at 4 o'clock just so I can be here before you. I suppose you know all about what happened yesterday. Yeah. My dad told me. Boy, what a close call that was. Sure must have been some job to put that cobra back into its cage, huh? It wasn't easy. We had to wrestle him around a bit. I should say, 12 feet is a lot of snake to handle. Well, I've got work to do. I can't stand here and talk all morning. Okay, George. I'll put the black snake in its cage in a little while. You remember what I said about coming in here before I do it? Paul, come here! What's the matter, George? Plenty's the matter. How did these cages get unlocked? Three of them. Three cages unlocked? How'd that happen? That's what I'm asking you, Paul. Did you unlock these cages? 
Well, of course not, George. I didn't. I'd tell you if I did. Well, if you didn't, all right. Just the same, I don't want you in here before I get here in the morning, and that's an order. Do you understand? Sure, George. If that's the way you want it, I'll put the black snake back and leave right now. Hey, look, Bill. Here's a king cobra. Well, the card says he's 12 feet long. <laughs> That's a lot of snake, isn't it, pal? Oh, I'll say it is. Hey, look how he moves. Very little effort, too. Boy, what a smooth operation. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. You know, the only critter that isn't afraid of a cobra is mongoose. Mongoose? The animal's called a mongoose, Stumpy. Stumpy talk about more than one. Maybe he think they come in flocks like an Indian geese. Okay, so one of them critters is called a mongoose. When you're talking about a whole bunch, you call them either mongooses or mongooses. Now, which one of them words do you use? <laughs> oh, Stumpy, are you murdering the king's English? <laughs> Take it easy, fellas. Uh, Stumpy, the plural for mongoose is mongooses. Don't let these Bill, fellas... Hey, look at the cobra. Look at him. Great Scott. He's getting out of the cage. Henry, find the keeper. Bill, right away. Stumpy. Hey, George. Grey Wolf. George. Start herding the people out of the building through the other door. And keep them quiet. I'll guard the service alley so the snake can't get out. We get people out plenty quick. Don't take any chances with that there killer, sonny. If he tries to get out, fill his head full of 45 slugs. Bill, Henry tells me the cobra's out again. Is that right? Take a look, George. Yes, it's a cobra, all right, and he's hooding. That means he's feeling ornery. I'll sound the alarm and get some help. The escape alarm. It's the snake house. Oh, don't tell me another one's gotten out. How is this, John? Grab shotguns and let's go. You think the cobra's out again, Fred? Oh, I don't know, Howard. Let's get in the car, boys, and get there as fast as we can. How many more times we'll have to put Mr. King Cobra back into his cage? I certainly hope this is the last escape he makes, Chief. Yeah, me too. That's for sure. It had better be. I... I know what you mean, Thad. But I did not leave those doors open. Moreover, Paul was here before I was here this morning again, after I'd forbidden him. I found three cages unlocked, and I told Paul I didn't want him in the snake house anymore unless I'm here. It's your duty and responsibility to see that the cages are all checked and locked before visitors are allowed in the building. Isn't that right? But I did that, Thad. I always make a security check before opening my doors to visitors. And when I made my routine check this morning, the cages were all locked. And I'll verify before anyone that I'm telling the truth. All right, George, let's not argue about it. But there's something mighty peculiar going on around here. I wish I could put my finger on what it is. Bill, yeah. Henry, Stumpy, Gray yeah, Wolf, sure. let's go over to my office. I want to have a talk with you fellows. <laughs> Well, it's the next morning now, and George, the keeper of the snake house, walks briskly to get about his early morning chores of caring for the reptiles. George seems to be in a happier frame of mind than he's been for several days, and he hums as he walks up the short stairs to the main doors of the building. He finds the door locked and congratulates himself that Paul is at last listening to reason. He takes out his keys, selects the right one, fits it into the lock, and opens the door. Suddenly, he stops short. Oh, the, the cobra's loose! He jumps back to escape the cobra. Oh. His feet stumble and he falls oh. while the cobra moves rapidly by. 
There on the concrete steps of the snake house, George lies for a moment stunned, while the cobra, with hardly an effort, makes his getaway. The slithering ribbon of death moves out of the building, across the road, and vanishes into the underbrush. Then George rouses from his unconsciousness, seeking to pierce the mental fog. Oh, my head. Oh, what happened? Oh, I fell. The cobra. The door's open. The cobra's gone. Hello, gate one. This is gate one, Chief. We're closing the gates now. Good. Break out your rifles and stand by. The alarm means that whatever's escaped is now out of the building and onto the grounds. Don't let anybody in. Gate two. two. This is Thad Pearson. You get that alarm? Yeah, Chief. We've got the gates locked and the rifles broken out. Good. I'm going to the snake house. Holly, call the rangers and the sheriff's men. If that cobra's escaped out of the building, we're going to need help. Right away, Chief. How's the head feeling now, George? It's mighty tender where I struck it on the stair rail, Bill. That concrete's awfully hard. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You better stay here while we track the snake. Uh, Thad, uh, how much of a start does the cobra have on us? Oh, about an hour and a half, Bill. Mm, not so good. He could get plenty far by this time, especially if he kept in high gear. How about a mongoose, Thad? Do you have any here? No, Bill, we don't have a mongoose. The zoo at Silver City has one, though. Mm, that's 50 miles. Thad, would you take my car and get that mongoose? All right, Bill. I'll make it as quickly as I can. This thing gives me the creeps, Bill. Any second I expect to see the cobra's head pop up under my nose. It could happen that way, pal. You just stay behind me and keep your shotgun ready. Ah, uh, snake leaves plenty good trail in ground. It's good for us there not be rain for many days now. Dust help make snake trail easy to find. Now that there cobra fella weren't much interested in covering his trail. All he cared about was getting for the far away places. That's right, old timer. I'd say offhand that the faraway place could be that barn over on the other side of the road. Yeah, I think you're right, Bill. The trail's heading straight for the road. Yep. Sure as I'm a foot high, that there reptile's in that barn. We go in barn after Cobra and kill him? No, Grey Wolf. Let's let the mongoose do that trick. We wouldn't stand a chance against that killer if he caught us off guard. But a mongoose isn't made for that kind of work. <laughs> you said it, sonny. Only one thing faster than a cobra, and that's a mongoose. Only one thing faster than a mongoose, and that's grease lightning. You fellas keep circling the barn and make sure the cobra stays inside. I'll send the sheriff and his boys over to help you keep him in the barn. Well, where are you going, Bill? Back to the snake house to make sure everything's all right. You never met Pedro before, have you, Bill? No, I haven't, George. <laughs> Talk to the man, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's quite a guy, isn't he? How are you feeling after your fall, George? Well, that goose egg on my head's gone down to a pigeon size by now. I'll be all right. <laughs> Good. Well, i got to be getting back now. I've got the cobra trapped in an old barn on the other side of the highway. Uh, by the way, George... See that the locks and all the doors are set, will you? For a while, I don't think it's enough just to have the latch on. Okay, Bill. Will do. See you later, George.
Hello, Paul. Your dad back yet? He just drove up, Bill. Here he comes now. He's got the mongoose in a cage. We're all set, Bill. All we've got to do now is get on the scene and open the cage. The mongoose will do the rest. Fine. I'll have the squad cars brought up. Their spotlights can be used to light up the inside of the barn. Good idea. Now, remember, I don't want the mongoose to kill our cobra. I just want him to tire him out. Then we'll step in and stop the fight. I've got the equipment for it with me. Okay. I'll get the cars in position. Then we can get started. Hurriedly, the way is prepared for the duel between two mortal enemies, King Cobra and Mongoose. Bill turns the spotlight on to illuminate the inside of the barn by beaming the lights through the large center door. Then Thad and Bill walk toward the barn. Thad is ready to release the mongoose in an instant. Bill's ready with his shotgun in case the cobra attacks before they're ready. The mongoose becomes frantic with excitement. He's got scent of the cobra, Bill. Good. Let him go, Thad. <laughs> Look at him go for the barn. Hey, he stopped dead. No wonder. Look where that big snake is, just inside the door. Boy, it's a good thing we didn't try to go in after him. He'd have nailed one of us for sure. Look, the battle's on. This will be short. The cobra's on unfamiliar ground. He can't put up a good fight. Did you see that? The cobra missed the little animal only by a fraction of an inch. That's the way he fights. Close range, a hair's breadth distance. Boy, with perfect coordination. Wow. The mongoose raked the cobra's neck that time with his teeth. Boy, how that little fella can weave and dodge. Back and forth. Back and forth. Back and... Hey, there. He's teasing the snake. The cobra got him. No, he didn't. He just missed the mongoose by a hair again. Ah, the cobra's getting woozy, Bill. He must have struck at the mongoose about two dozen times by now. I'll get him when you give the word, Thad. My main concern is that the mongoose doesn't close in for the fatal bite. You mean where he grabs the snake by the back of the head and, and breaks the cobra's neck? Well, that's it, Henry. I think we'd better close in now, Thad. The snake's getting pretty tired. Hey, yes. Let's take both of them. Come on. Now. There we are. There we are. There we go. <sighs> We've got both of them caged and ready to go back. Thanks to you, Bill. And to Stumpy Gray Wolf and Henry. That's all right, Thad. Say, uh, would you be interested in finding out who's been unlocking the cages in the snake house? Would I be interested? I should say so. Who is it? Yeah, who is it? Well, I'd rather it was demonstrated to you, just who it is, than tell you. Let's all go over to the snake house, shall we? Quiet, Pedro. Uh, George, let me have your keys, will you? I want to try an experiment. Sure, Bill. Here you are. Thanks. Now, how in the world is using them keys going to show who let the cage doors open? Well, quiet, Stumpy. Let Bill finish what he started. What are you going to do now, Bill? Yeah, that's a good question. My curiosity is sticking out a mile. Okay, Pedro. Uh, you can go along if you want. Now, fellas, just watch as I go along and check the locks on the cage doors. Uh-oh, there's one on the bottom I didn't check. Hey, Bill, look above you. Pedro's opening the cage door. There, my friends, is your mysterious cage opener sitting right on my shoulders. Pedro. But how in the world did you discover that, Bill? Well, Thad, in watching George opening the cages, I noticed each time how intently interested Pedro was in the way George was handling the latches on the doors. Of course, we all know the disconcerting habit monkeys have in mimicking human beings. So I got an idea and thought I'd test it out. And as you see, it worked. <laughs> well, that throws me for a loop. George... Well, please accept my sincere apologies for ever questioning your integrity. Oh, that's all right, Chief. You're not the only one at fault. 
Paul. Yeah? I want to tell you how sorry I am for misjudging you. Will you forgive a crabby old man like me? Oh, there. There, lad. I mean, there. look. They're hugging each other. I guess this thing had us all on attention. But thanks to you, Bill, and to your rangers, the mess is straightened out. Oh, it's all in a day's work, Thad. Uh, by the way, what are you going to do with Pedro now that his monkey shines have been exposed? <laughs> Maybe we'd better put him over on Monkey Island and retire him for the rest of his natural life. <laughs> hey, Thad, just think what would have happened if he'd opened the cages in the lion house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Paul. Only I don't know that a cobra is any less dangerous than a lion. But at least he's not so loud. However, I'm sure glad that neither George or Paul were guilty of opening up those cage doors. Aren't you? We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Hey, fellas and gals, Ranger Bill again, stepping in here for less than a minute to invite all of you out there to another half hour of adventure next week at this special spot on your radio dial. We've gathered a pile of stories for you with mystery and adventure and all kinds of excitement, and we don't want you to miss a single one. So next time, call up your friends or get together with them and join all of us rangers for a session of fighting forest fires, grappling with grizzly bears, or just plain trying to help somebody out. We're sure you'll enjoy the story, and you might just learn something that'll be of real help to you in later life. So, next week, be sure to listen. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, have you ever thought about your heart? Have you ever thought about how important your blood is to your life? Of course you have. Oh, perhaps only casually, as you've read about them or had a lesson on them in school. But what would you say if I told you about a young fellow by the name of Leo Foster who had two hearts? <laughs> well, you'd say I was balmy. But the facts are that Leo's blood was being pumped by a second heart for a brief time. Yes, a real human heart. Well, I guess this is enough of the riddle. Uh, let's get into the story of the second heart. Leo and his older brother Jim are walking along Main Street in Naughty Pine. They're heading toward their father's place of business so they can walk home with him at quitting time. Officer Patrick O'Rourke keeps an eye on the lads as they skip across the street while he stops the traffic. There, there, boys. Walk across the street. Don't run. I'll keep the car stopped until you get to the other side. Okay, Pat. We'll walk. Come on, Leo. Don't go so fast, Jimmy. I'm tired. Ah, oh, you're tired most of the time. We gotta hurry or Dad will be too working. And then we'll miss him. 
it's only another block. Daddy don't quit for no while yet. Come on, Leo. You can rest for... Hey, Leo, what's the matter? You look sick. Huh? Uh, I don't know what's wrong, Jimmy. I don't feel so good. Jimmy, stop running around me. Uh, I'm not running around you. I'm standing still. Uh, I'm gonna fall, Jimmy. Oh, I got you, Leo. I got you. Hello, Callahan. This is O'Rook. Get an ambulance to Main and Center Streets right away. Okay, Pat. I'll have one there as soon as possible. What's happened? A young lad by the name of Leo Foster has passed out on the sidewalk. Oh, that's too bad. I'll have the boys on the way right now. Well, here comes the ambulance, Steve. Well, I'm glad you got him. Can I ride with my son to the hospital? Well, I don't see why not. All right, folks. All right, stand back now. Make room for the stretcher to get through. Stand back now. Thanks for your help, Pat. I think just enough of tea. It's me duty. I sure hope Leo will be all right. I've got your dog tags, fellas. Here you are. Mm, I think there's plenty of good idea for us to wear identification tags round neck and that show blood type as well as name. Is this part of the National Civilian Defense Program, Bill? That's right, Henry. It's not compulsory, but it's strongly suggested that this be done. I like the idea, not only in case of air attack, but these will come in handy for our work. Well, I say they will. Forest fire season isn't too far off. Yeah, it won't do any good to know what type of blood I got anyhow. <laughs> uh, why you say that, Stumpy? Yeah, nobody could match the blood of an ordinary critter like me. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right, Stumpy. Uh, you're right. Hey, now, wait a minute. I didn't think I was going to get a unanimous decision. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, fellas, all of you have common blood types except me. Huh? What? What type of blood yeah, do you B. have, Bill? Type B, RH negative. Is that very rare type, Bill? <laughs> it sure is. I'd be in a bad way if I needed a transfusion in a hurry. Say, listen, fellas, we're supposed to be hitting the trail for parts unknown. Yeah? Where are we going this time, Bill? Up to the North Ranges. Hey, that is parts unknown. So let's get saddled up and hit the trail. The crews have a two-day start on us. They'll be resting with nothing to do unless we get there quickly. <laughs> Dr. Flint, have you been able to tell what's wrong with Leo yet? I'm sorry, Mr. Foster. Just at present, we're up a tree, diagnostically speaking. Your son has the whole staff puzzled. Has he regained consciousness yet? Yes, yes, he has. And that's the only encouraging report I have at the moment. You can see him any time, just don't get him excited, that's all. When will you know what's wrong with him? I hope it won't be long. I'm going down to X-ray now. Perhaps they'll have a picture from which we can learn something. Boy, I hope so, Doc. You go in and visit your son. I'll be back in 15 minutes and let you know what we find out. How are you feeling, son? Well, I'm awful tired, Daddy. Are you mommy mad at me for falling down the sidewalk? <laughs> of course we're not. All we want you to do is to rest and to get well. I will. How's Jimmy? Oh, he's fine, fine. He says you should come home real soon. But remember, you've got to do what the doctors and nurses tell you, or you won't get well. I will, Daddy, honest. That's a good fella. I know you will. Mr. Foster, may I talk to you, please? Why, yes, of course. I'll be back in a few minutes, Leo. Okay, Daddy. I'll be waiting. Well, Doctor, what's the news? The x-rays show us that your son has a heart condition, Mr. Foster. A heart condition? At his age? <laughs> now, don't jump to conclusions. It may not be as bad as it looks. What do you mean by that? Well, let me answer it this way. 
We'd like to call in a very fine heart specialist from Canyon City, a Dr. Philip Redwick. A specialist? It's just that, uh, well, it's just that we'd like a confirmation of our diagnosis, Mr. Foster. Also, Dr. Redwick is the only man in this part of the country able to perform the surgery, if such became necessary. But isn't that awfully dangerous? Yes. Yes, it is. That's why we want the most competent doctor we know of to do it. Dr. Flint, you can call in anybody you want to help my son. But I want to know what's wrong with Leo's heart and no beating around the bush. Give it to me straight. I can take it. All right. Frankly, I have been beating around the bush. I wanted to find out if you could take the shock. We believe Leo has a patent foramen ovale. I don't know any more now than I did before. Let me explain. Before birth, there's an opening in the muscle wall between the two auricles. Now, normally, this opening closes shortly after birth. The opening in Leo's heart didn't do that. I see. If he's to survive, it, it must be closed. Is that right? Yes. Remember, of course, that we're not positive about this. And we want to be. That's why we want Dr. Redwick to come in on it. Okay. Get Dr. Redwick here as quickly as possible, will you? speaking. Phil, this is Grant. Jolly good to hear from you, old boy. I thought you'd left the country. <laughs> it has been a long time since we've seen each other, or even talked for that matter. Say, Phil, I suspect that a patient of mine here at the hospital has a patent foramen ovale. I'd like you to see it. Just a young lad. Oh, you don't say. Oh, I'm interested. I'll be on the next train. Or drive to Nutty Pine, whichever is faster. That'll be fine, Phil. I'll see you soon, then. Right, uh, as soon as I can get there. Now, here's our work plan, fellas. Uh, wait till I open the map. It'll be easier to explain what I want done. Uh, Grey Wolf, you see this stream here? Ah, uh, Yes. I noticed on our fall inspection there's a nasty erosion wash along this stream. Take a crew and have them fix it. Ah, uh, we do. Anything else, Bill? Well, that's all for you right now. You better get started. Take you quite some time to check the erosion. Oh, right away, Bill. Now, you fellas in crew one, come with me. Stumpy, here's what I want you to do. I'm listening, Sonny. Take the second crew and head for the timber north of the Little Shady River. What are we going to do, Bill? We're going up into the North Peaks and fix the trails, Henry. Also, I want to find out how the high-altitude wildlife are making out. Oh, that ought to be interesting. Hey, maybe there's still some snow way up in the mountains. The Foster boy is in room 28, Phil. I'm sure glad you were able to come right away. <laughs> I'd drop everything for one of these cases, Grant. How old is the lad? Eight years old. I'd like you to conduct your own examination before making a diagnosis, Phil, just as a check. Oh, all right. Well, I want to see your records and test reports, too. The lad's father is here. Oh, that's fine. Hello, Mr. Foster. I'm Dr. Redwick. How do you do, Doctor? This is my son, Leo. Hello, son. So, you're the lad who's having a bit of a problem. Well, we'll have a look at you and see what we can find. I'm sure there's nothing we can't fix up, and you'll be as good as new. I hope so, Doctor. I'm getting so tired of being tired all the time. You'll find he has a lot of courage for a little fellow, Phil. I'm sure you're right. Now let me get this conglomeration out of my bag, and we'll have a go at it. I say, Leo, you're a jolly good patient. I've been pounding you and poking you, and 
You haven't said a solitary word. Are you able to make a diagnosis yet, Doctor? Oh, hardly, old fellow. If it's what Dr. Flint says it is, there'll be several more hours of work to do before I can say. You'll just have to be patient. But there's one thing I can tell you. Uh, what's that, Doc? We can't afford to make a mistake. Slow but sure is a very good motto. I've been out in God's country for a long time now. You know, fellas, somehow I never get tired of it. Never grow stale. I'll say it doesn't, Stumpy. Anything the Lord has a hand in never grows old. Oh, look at those stars. Smell the pines. Oh, what more could a fella ask for than this? I can say amen to all of that, fellas. Just now, however, I'm going to have my devotions and turn in. Ah, uh, me too. Mm, that's a good idea. Hey, we haven't listened to the radio today, Bill. Yeah, he's just afraid of missing something. <laughs> oh. sure is. We'll tune in tomorrow evening. Nothing important could have happened in this short time. Here's the complete lab report, Phil. Oh, you don't say. That's fast work, Grant. Let's have a look. Shall we go across the hall to my office? Right home. Here's your examination and mine. Two sets of x-rays, cardiograph, laboratory, metabolism. And that about does it, eh? That's the whole ball of wax, Phil. Now what do you think? Phil? Oh, oh sorry, old chap. I, I was mentally turning the pages of my experience with this sort of thing... You fellows have hit the nail right on the head. Then you would agree with our diagnosis. No, quite. There isn't a doubt that Leo has an opening between the oracles. And if he's to keep on living, it'll have to be sewed up. You gentlemen want to see me? Yes, come in, Mr. Foster. Please sit down. Dr. Redgwick and I have just completed the di diagnosis... And it's this. Leo has an opening in the auricular wall of his heart, and it has to be closed. I see. Is the surgery dangerous? Well, Phil, will you describe just what we're up against? Certainly, Grant. Mr. Foster, any surgery of the heart is dangerous. All I can say is I've been completely successful in performing this type of surgery in the past... So I see no reason to be unduly alarmed. Uh, what does the operation involve, Doctor? Well, it involves the connection of Leo's cardiovascular system to that of a second person. While we open the thoracic cavity and the heart and sew up that opening. You mean that you have a second person on the operating table? Mm, on another table alongside Leo. Then you'll disconnect Leo's heart from his blood vessels and connect them to this second person's bloodstream? Mm, quite. The second heart will pump for both persons while we operate on Leo's heart. Can't believe it. How can one heart pump for two people? Well, Mr. Foster, I, I know it sounds fantastic, but I've done it at least a dozen times. We use an auxiliary pump as a booster to bridge the gap between the two persons. It's awfully hard to believe. It sounds like a desperate measure. But if you've been successful before, let's do it by all means. You're sure it's the only way this condition can be cleared up? I don't wish to be tried, Mr. Foster, but you can't chew a horse while he's running. See your point, Dr. Redwick. You'll be operating soon. There is a difficulty we must overcome first. Difficulty? What's that? Your son has a rare type blood, Mr. Foster. Very difficult to procure. B-R-H negative. Easy, Storm. This is a pretty steep slope. Well, you said it, Bill. Walk down nice and careful like, vessel girl. 
I want to fly through the air like a cannonball because you lost your footing. We'll ride over and take a look at the other antelope herd. Okay, Bill. Hey, I wonder if we'll find some mountain lion tracks around there, too. I don't know. If we find where Mr. Cougars killed some young antelope, we'll have to hunt him down. Boy, I'll say. One or two mountain lions could cut down the antelope population pretty badly. That's right. Then after we finish looking the herds over, we'll head back to camp and quit for the day. Hey, now you're talking my language, Bill. Boy, am I hungry. You weren't joking, Dr. Flint, when you said Leo had a rare blood type. You've tested 50 of my friends already, and still you can't match it. Don't get discouraged, Mr. Foster. We'll keep trying. And it could be the 51st person. But what if you can't find it in the dozen or more folks who are still to come in for the test? Then I'll get in touch with the newspapers and the radio stations. I'll ask them to make an appeal for a person with this type of blood. I'm sure that out of this part of the country, there must be one person with Leo's blood type. Well, we should know by this evening if any of the rest of my friends can qualify. Spence Brown speaking. Mr. Brown, this is Dr. Philip Redswick. I want you to make an appeal for someone with... Naughty Pine Radio Station. Cliff Nichols speaking. I say, Mr. Nichols... Would you do me a bit of a favor? This is Dr. Redwick. Oh, yes, sir. How can I help? One of my patients is badly in need of a pill. Hey, Bill. Hmm? What do you say we find out what's going on in the rest of the world, huh? Oh, sure, Henry. Why not? Uh, warm up the radio. I wish I could have heard the, the whole march. The next march we play will be by John Philip Sousa. But before we play the next march, I'd like to present a heart-stirring appeal to you again. Oh, what's Quiet, this? Henry. Dr. Philip Redswick is appealing for someone with type B RH negative blood. Come to the Naughty Pine Hospital hey, Bill, at once. That's Henry, your blood type. let's listen I to this. I repeat that type B RH negative blood is needed in a serious operation to save the life of young Leo Foster. Anyone who has Turn this type off, of Henry. blood, please contact or come to the Naughty... Stumpy, Grey Wolf, you fellas take charge. I'm riding to Naughty Pine right now. Yeah, not dangerous to do in Darkville. Yeah, you better wait until morning and then go Don't in. Don't worry, I'll get through. There's no time to wait when a life is at stake. Henry, turn that radio on short wave and tell him I'm on the way. Jefferson. Yes, I'm Bill Jefferson. I've come in answer to your appeal in behalf of young Leo Foster. My friend, we're really glad to see you. Are you sure you have the right type of blood? Reasonably so. Let me take a blood test now, if you wish. Oh, that's rather decent of you. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm Dr. Redwick. This is Dr. Flint and Mr. Foster, the boy's father. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do? You don't know how deeply we appreciate this, Mr. Jefferson. That's all right, Mr. Foster. I'm glad to help if I can. Well, let's get to the lab, then, and make the test. I'll alert surgery, and if it's the right type, we'll operate within the hour. Right, Al. We'll know in a minute, gentlemen. How do you know that you have this rare type blood, Mr. Jefferson? I just had a blood test made a short time ago for my identification tag. Isn't it wonderful how things have a way of working out? What do you say, Grant? 
Was it meant? Look for yourself. Perfect. Let's proceed to surgery at once. Mr. Jefferson, I'm going into the preparation room and scrub up. It'll take about 20 minutes for Dr. Flint and me to get ready. The orderlies will wheel you in just before that time. Okay, Doctor. I'm ready whenever you are. Bill, you're... You're not afraid, are you? Why should I be, Dave? Well, what I mean is... Well, if something should go wrong... Maybe your heart can't pump for two. Dave, I'm a Christian. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin. He's my Savior. If I should die on the operating table, then I'll enter into the full blessing of eternal life. I have nothing to be afraid of. Christ conquered death for me. I don't understand. What are you talking about? Bill's telling you about Jesus, Daddy. Don't you remember what the teacher told me in Sunday school? Oh, yeah, sure, Leo, I remember. His mother sends him to Sunday school to learn about religion. I think it's a good thing for children to know. You should learn about Jesus, too, Daddy. Jesus told me not to be afraid of the operation. I prayed. <laughs> sure, I know, son. You'd better rest now. Do you honestly believe that salvation is only for children, Dave? Well, sure, why not? Religion won't hurt him, will it? It's not religion your son is talking about, Dave. It's Christ. And if he won't hurt children... And how can he hurt adults? You know, Dave, you're more frightened than your son is. You're scared to death that this isn't going to work. Who? Me? Why should I be scared? I'm not blaming you, Dave. You ought to be scared because you don't know the Lord. You should accept Jesus as your Savior. I, I don't need help. Some other time. Not now. All right, Mr. Jefferson, Leo. The doctors are getting ready for you. We'll take you into the operating room now. Well, I'm ready. See you later, Daddy. We're ready for you now, old man. Leo's well under the anesthetic. I'm ready for you too, Doctor. What type of anesthesia is it? A local. You'll be conscious throughout. We'll administer it now, and then we'll make the splice. Don't move a muscle. The nurse will wipe your face for you. After a bit, we'll start an auxiliary pump to help push the blood along. Now, we'll have a go at it. Here's the high pole, Phil. Thank you, Grant. I say, Ranger, you surely have tough hide. You won't feel a thing in a moment. Let's start to work on Leo. I'm right with you, Phil. Skin knife? Uh, yes. Swab. Clamp. Second knife. Swab. Retractor. Clamp. Clamp. Swab. Suit you. Start the auxiliary ground. Right. Oh, I say that's working like a top. Now, the heart. Yes. Scalpel? Right here. We'll have to move swiftly now. We don't want to give that second heart any more work than necessary. hot in here. Can't be helped. How are you doing, Bill? Just fine, Doctor. My heart isn't complaining a bit about pumping for two people. Oh, you're the one. Just snipe the suit you want. Right here? Yes. There we are. Now, get this cardiac plumbing back together again and the lad will live to be an old man. Ready to disconnect? 
quiet. The pump's going off. Pump? Forceps? Suture. More suture. Are you taking care of Bill Grant? Yes, I've got him put back together, Phil. Suture. Now's the test. There we are. Grant, we've done it again. Ah, that's wonderful. <laughs> You're terrific, Phil. And you too, Bill. Thanks. <laughs> Don't thank me. All I had to do was the pumping. You fellas did the work. <laughs> Well, how do you feel now, Leo? I feel fine, Daddy. I'm not tired anymore like I used to be. The doctor fixed me up real good. Uh, is, is he really going to be all right, Doc? Oh, well, he'll be ready to leave the hospital in a couple of weeks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ridgwick. It was a pleasure to help, Mr. Foster. So it was. Here's the chapter, thank. Leo's second heart. I know. Bill. Bill, you, you risked your life to save Leo's. H how can I ever repay you? You can repay me by going to Sunday school with Leo instead of just taking him, Dave. I'll do that, Bill. From now on, we'll all go to Sunday school and church as a family. That's a covenant with God, because he spared my son. Well, how about that? There were two heart operations going on. While Dr. Redgwick was working on Leo's heart, the Lord was working on the heart of his father. While for just a little while, Bill Jefferson's heart beat for two. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Warrior of the Woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Hello, boys and girls. This is Ranger Bill. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to lose your memory? Yes, I mean, really and truly forget your past, except perhaps for a few unrelated snatches of your life here and there. How'd you feel if you didn't know your name and couldn't remember where you lived or who your family is? <laughs> I'd be scared to death, wouldn't you? Stumpy, Gray Wolf, and I... Get involved with a man suffering from amnesia. And this is the story. The Man Who Couldn't Remember. Have you ever seen a hobo jungle? A hobo jungle is a place located near a railroad track where hobos gather around a fire and swap stories and experiences. They also eat and sleep there. The hobo jungle we're going to visit is located near Junction City about half a block from the main freight line. Let's find out what's going on there, shall we? How's the stool coming, boxcar? Okay, Rails. Hey, when you're going south. Who <laughs> knows the engine? Why you want to know? Uh, I ain't nosy. I don't care if you ever go south. Okay, maybe I'm going soon and maybe later. Hey, what's that? Huh? 
deck. Maybe it's a, a railroad deck. No, I'm making too much noise. Besides, we ain't on railroad property. Uh, what could it be? An animal? I don't know. We'll know as soon as it gets in the clearing. Hey, it's a guy. He's acting kind of funny. He ain't no bull, that's for sure. He got funny clothes on. Them's riding clothes, Rails. I've seen them before. What's he doing here? He looks kind of goofy. What's your name, Bo? I don't know what my name is or, or who I am. My head hurts. Hey, I don't like this, Rails. Let's get him out of here before the cops find him and blame it on us. Yes, that's right. May I have some food and water, please? Oh, oh, my head. We gotta get rid of this guy box car before the law gets in. Oh, yeah. Hey, there's a freight coming up the grade now. Hey, let's put him in an empty, huh? Well, let's go. I'll put him to sleep. You catch him. Good. Please, may I have something to eat and some water? We don't want no part of you, mister. The law might be after you. Let's get him in an empty. I'll help you carry him. Know something, Big Joe? Ah, don't bother me, Shorty. Can't you see I'm trying to get some shut eye? Yeah, I know, but this is important, Big Joe. Ah, you're worse than a talking machine. What is it? Well, that guy that was thrown in here. Yeah, what about him? He ain't bothering us. Lays there. Yeah, I know, but well, maybe there's something wrong with him. I lit a match while you were getting shut eye. Guess what I saw? Yeah, what have you said? It's so important. Go on, I want to sleep. Look, the back of the guy's head is bloody. It is. All right, let's take a look. Sure. Yeah, I got a match here. For once you're right, Shorty. Hey, maybe the guy's hot, huh? It could be. Now let's jump him. I don't want no trouble with the law. I'm just bumming a free ride. Yeah, sure. Me too. Hey, this guy must be hot. Or why would them guys throw him in here? Yeah, the guy ain't no bow, that's for sure. First grade we come to, we'll dump him. We're going too fast now. We don't want to kill him. He ain't done nothing to us. Okay. The first grade, and out he goes. Shorty. Okay. But do it fast so the crew don't see you. Yeah. Can't run now, so settle down, big boy. Horses have plenty of pep all time, Bill. That's a good sign. That's right, Gray Wolf. We need our horses, so we got to keep them healthy. Besides, I enjoy being around healthy animals. <laughs> if these ponies of ours ain't healthy, it ain't our fault, sonny. What you mean, old timer? Now yeah, we give them stuff to keep their teeth good, then we give them stuff to give them pep. On top of that, we give them stuff to make the coat shine. And to top it off, we give them a regular tonic. <laughs> and sakes, if I took all that stuff, I'd live to be as old as Noah. Maybe you will, Stumpy. Hey, fellas, look at the trail cabin. Hey, smoke come out of chimney. Hey, somebody's moved in and he ain't been invited. Hold it there, fellas. Easy, King. Oh, Storm. Oh, Matilde. Yeah, this is plenty of surprise. I'll say it is. Whoever it is has got nerves. Must have broke the lock and busted in. I think we'd better walk the rest of the way. 
I'm not too sure we should announce our arrival until we're sure who's inside. I ain't heard a sound from the cabin yet, Sonny. Don't let that fool you, fellas. Keep quiet now. Perhaps whoever's inside is watching us right now. Uh, not plenty right. Maybe a person watched down rifle barrel. Hold it here, fellas. Uh, I don't hear near you peep. Uh, wait a minute. You'll take it back. As far as we know, there's a man inside. Uh, that right, Stumpy. I think it only one man or we hear talking. Yeah, I think you're right, fellas. There's only one man inside the cabin. Let's go in and find out what he's up to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Old Betsy here will keep him acting like a human being. I'll go in first. You fellas cover me and follow. Hey, that's a stout door, sonny. If he's got it locked, we're going to have trouble getting in. I'll give it a good kick and see what happens. You ready? Ah, I'm ready. Well, that'll be a wall-eyed pollywog. I must be hearing things. I better stop at the docks and give me one of them there hearing aids. You not need hearing aids, Stumpy. And that fellow sing gospel song. Put your guns away, fellas. We're going in like gentlemen. Bacon and coffee sure smell good, gentlemen. I'm so hungry, I, I'm almost beside myself. Yeah, just take another hitch in your belt, young fella, and I'll have some grub on the table in no time. Uh, Stumpy, plenty good cook. We tease him about cooking, but he do all right. Well, thank you, sonny. Now get your bib tied up, fellas. The grub's on the way. I'm sure glad you fellas arrived when you did. I can't even boil water. We're glad to do it, mister. Um... Uh, what did you say your name is? I didn't say it. Soup shine, boys. Filled with pray. You can feed your faces. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this food. We're grateful to Thee that we have an abundance of food. Use it to strengthen our bodies so that we might better serve Thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Rock of ages cleft for me Let me hide myself in thee Let the walk That hymn fits the moment perfectly, friend. Campfire here in front of the cabin. Starry sky above. Night noises. Cry of the wolf. All is peace and quiet. Peace, peace, wonderful peace Coming down from the Father above Sweep over I'm sorry, Bill, Stumpy Gray Wolf I can't seem to finish the hymns, as you call them I get so far, and that's all I can start from the beginning again, but... I can't go on. I don't even know who I am or what I'm doing here. Well, I wouldn't fret about it, my friend. Obviously, from the gash on the back of your head, you've had an accident. Um, you lost memory. Only temporary, we hope. 
Doesn't look too bad. We'll get you to a doctor after you've rested up a couple of days. There's no immediate hurry because you don't show signs or symptoms of brain injury. That is, as far as hemorrhage or concussion is concerned. You've had some brain damage from your accident or you wouldn't have amnesia. I think it's wise that you rest for a while, since it's quite a ways to the doctor. Yeah, apparently it is. This here is thick forest. Can't get no helicopter in here to pick you up. I see. I hope you'll excuse me. I, I'm very tired. Mm, that all right, Stuart. Sure, all right. Thank you. You've been very kind to me. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. What do you think, Bill? I don't know what to think, old timer. I really don't. Ah, you say it, Bill. This tough one to figure out. Well, let's turn in and sleep on it, fellas. Perhaps in the morning we'll have some answers. Good morning, Raul. Yeah, I'm in the mood for thinking this morning. Ah, me too. Oh, good morning, Stumpy. Good morning, old timer. You sleep well? Yeah, for sure did. So did our friend. He's still pounding his ear. Ah, not good. He needs plenty of rest. Well, Bill, have you come up with any answers yet? Some of them, Stumpy. Not very many, nor the important ones. Well, I'm listening. Ah, me too. Who is this fellow? Well, that's one important answer I don't have, Grey Wolf. Uh, let's start from the beginning, shall we? That is, the beginning, as far as we know it. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Tell more. First of all, he got to this cabin the same way we did. Yeah, bad fellers. In this forest, he'd have to take this trail. Secondly, I'd say he was thrown from a horse. Oh, I think that too, Bill. He wear riding clothes. Also, he cracked the back of his head, which means the horse threw him forward and he went head over first. Yeah, pearl by that, sonny. And I'd say he's a Christian because of the hymns he sang. Perhaps. At least we know he's been around at church sometimes, quite a lot. And I take it you think he comes from quite a ways, Bill. Yes, I do, Stumpy. Why? Couldn't he be from Naughty Pine? Yes, he could, but I doubt it. You ever seen folks around Naughty Pine wear riding clothes when they go horseback? <laughs> they wear jeans and jackets. Ah, you have strong point there, Bill. Hey, come to think of it, Sonny, I, I never have either. You mean this fellow comes from a fair-sized city? Right. Maybe he visitor to Naughty Pine. Yes, Grey Wolf, that's a possibility. Well, what's your plan, Sonny? Somebody, somewhere, is worried sick by now. Stumpy, you stay here with our friend. Grey Wolf and I will go to the sheriff in the hospital and find out if there's a missing persons report on him. That's the story, Cal. I've written down the man's description. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have a missing persons here on my desk. Uh, maybe you're too soon. Well, that's possible. Any suggestions? Not offhand, Bill. Well, I always get a missing persons report if one's turned in. And I'll be glad to let you know if one does come in. Fred, I can't wait that long, Cal. What's your plan to find this fellow's identity? Would you contact the police at Canyon City to see if they have anything? Why, sure, right away. Let's stick around. This won't take long. Yep, we get missing persons ads to run all the time, Grey Wolf. We got a description of this fellow? Ah, yes, here. No, we ain't uh, had any so far that fits this man's description, Grey Wolf. Uh, will you let us know if you get an ad for this man, Frank? Sure, be glad to. I hope you find out who he is. I sure hate to have amnesia. Ah, you're not only one that feels that way.
All right, Sheriff Hodges, if you hear anything, let me know. That's fine. Goodbye. Not a thing, huh, Cal? No, Bill. Not at Canyon City. Well, that's too bad. Yeah, it makes the job just that much harder. Any more ideas right now, Bill? No, Cal. I'm fresh out at the moment. You have anybody call here at hospital about a man with this description? No, Ranger, we haven't. I've been here all evening, too. There's nothing here in the special bulletins. Uh, thank you, Doctor. You let us know if somebody asks about this man. I sure will. I'll call your office right away. Well, Grey Wolf, it's been a dry run all the way around. Too bad. Ah, yes. What do we do next, Bill? Let's go back out to the trail cabin and talk to Stumpy and our unknown friend. Perhaps we should call him Mr. X. Well, old timer, how's Mr. X? Here, here come again, uh, Mr. Who? Mr. X. Uh, X is an algebraic symbol for the unknown. Yeah, why don't you talk English? <laughs> Our friend's doing fine, Bill. Uh, what'd you find out? Nothing, old timer. Not one little iota. Mm, even less than that. Uh, it's not so good. Uh, what now? I want to talk to Mr. X again. Perhaps his memory's on the way back. No, but ain't, sonny. You can't talk to him now anyway. He's sleeping again. <laughs> You're sure a good news, Stumpy. Uh, you stay here. Grey Wolf and I are going to back trail this fellow and see if we can pick up anything that way. <laughs> Plenty of good trail. I'll say he did. Walked along here in a dazed condition. I'm not right. I wonder he make trail cabin safely. Now let's push on fast since his trail's so clear, Grey Wolf. Okay, Bill, not a good idea. Bill, look here. Huh? Trail turn off into underbrush. Oh, you got a sharp eye, Grey Wolf. All right, let's go. This should be easier to follow now. Ah. He more dazed when he come through here than back on trail. Bill, look ahead where trail lead to. Train tracks. Hey, you don't suppose... Oh, no, he couldn't. You mean he ride freight car? Yeah. That's impossible. He's not a hobo. We tell soon. Trail not lie. Bill, trail sign, say you right. Here where he fall off freight train. Like you say, Grey Wolf, trail sign doesn't lie, but it's incredible. What would he be doing on a freight car? Not good question. Hey, maybe I've got it. Hobos. Perhaps in his day's condition, he met up with some hobos and they helped him into the empty. It sound far-fetched. I'll say it does. I know how to check it out. Let's get back to the sheriff's office on the double. Sounds crazy. I know it does, Cal, but it might be just the thing we're looking for. Yes, I agree. I've seen you pull some peculiar ones before and they worked out. And now, here's where the closest hobo jungles are on this map. Um, there where nearest one is, outside Junction City, nearly 70 miles from here. And that's the one we'll visit first. Let's go, Grey Wolf. <laughs> Looks like we'll get right into camp, Grey Wolf, before they hear us. Hey, you guys. How come it's coming? Ah. Huh? Hey, cops. Peter, you guys. Hey, 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 where you are. This isn't a raid. First guy that tries to leave gets pinched. 
Watch him, Gray Wolf. Ah, I watch close. Yeah, this guy's a ranger. Yeah, government cop. Now, you can't touch us, Ranger. We ain't done nothing wrong, and we ain't on government property. I'm looking for a man. He's six feet tall, weighs about 200 pounds. Wore riding clothes. Oh, him. Well, he was... Shut the... up, Rails. Did you see him, Rails? Okay, if you won't talk, perhaps you'd like the Junction City Police to pay you a visit. No, no. no. Okay, let's have it now and fast. <laughs> He, he was here, Ranger. We put him in an empty because we figured he was hot. I guess we was right. He is hot. Which way did he come from? Uh, I threw the brush over there. Mm, this looks good, Gray Wolf. We've got our man. Uh, I think you're right, Bill. Let's try a shortcut and go to Junction City Police Headquarters. They no doubt have a missing persons on him by now. Hey, you, you ain't going to tell the city cops who are here, are you? No. All right, let's go, Gray Wolf. <laughs> That's the whole story, Sheriff Hunches. You have a missing persons on this man? Well, I sure do, Mr. Jefferson. Two of them, in fact. Ah, that's interesting. Who are they from? Well, this man's wife and, uh, and the stable owner where Reverend Atkins has his horse. Reverend Atkins? Yep. Reverend Stuart Atkins. He has the largest church in Junction City. What's the address, Sheriff? Maple and 4th Street. It's on the corner. His house is on the south side of the church. Thanks, Sheriff Arches. Let's go, Gray Wolf. Oh, we not come too soon. Mrs. Atkins plenty worried now. I no doubt she is. Somebody's coming. Rangers. Yes, Mrs. Atkins. We have good news about your husband. Oh, yes, you found him. Is he all right? Please tell me. He's fine physically, Mrs. Atkins. What do you mean? There is something wrong, isn't there? Yes, there is. Your husband has amnesia. Amnesia? Now, don't get alarmed. I feel sure that it's only temporary. How can you tell? Well, I'm not a doctor, Mrs. Atkins. I'm only guessing. But I have a plan that will tell us if it's temporary or not. If I have your permission to try it. Oh, yes. Anything. Fine. Uh, Gray Wolf, will you bring Stuart here? Oh, um, I can go right away, Bill. I'll set up my plan the hours you're gone. do to help you put your plan into operation, Mr. Jefferson. Do you, perchance, have any of your husband's sermons recorded, Mrs. Atkins? I don't have any here, but he has recorded short devotional messages for the radio station. Oh, that's perfect. I'll go get one and some equipment to play. Oh, I'll drive you. I can't sit still now. <laughs> Is there anything else you want me to do? Yes, Mrs. Atkins. Keep out of sight in the other room until I give you the signal to come in. I hope the shock of hearing himself and suddenly seeing you will be enough to recall his memory. There's a car pulling up out in front now. Well, that's Gray Wolf and Stumpy with Stuart. You better go into the other room, Mrs. Atkins. Yes, right away. Just one question. Yes? What if this doesn't work? Well, then, only the Lord... And a doctor can help Stuart. Uh, Stuart, uh, we'd like you to listen to this recording. Oh, sure, Bill. Uh, is my name Stuart? That's right, Sonny. This is your house, too. My home. Ah, oh, we listen to recording now. Yes, yes, sir. Go ahead, Bill. I I'm listening. Our blessed Lord was speaking to a very religious man and recorded for us in the third chapter of John when he said, Ye must be born again. You see, that's it's my voice preaching a sermon. Each one. Yes, Stu, that's your voice. Irene, now it all comes back to me. 
do. I'm so oh, glad. Oh, my dear. So glad. Phil, Stumpy, Gray Wolf, how can I ever thank you for what you've done? We'll think of something, Stu. Mm. We owe them so much. They saved your life. I really don't know what to say, fellas. Well, don't bother trying. You'll have me blubbering here in a minute. <laughs> we only do a job that we should do. Now, the fellas are right, folks. This just goes to prove that the Lord watches over all of his children. If he watches the sparrows, then it's a simple matter for him to watch over us. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eyes on the stairs. Well, Stuart really went through something, didn't he? But the Lord knew all about it and took care of everything. Even to the spot where he was pushed off the freight car. So, I think you'll agree... I'm right. See you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. This is the story of a stretch of highway outside of Knotty Pine called Death's Half Mile. Along this half mile, there are three killers. One is an extremely sharp curve. The second killer is a narrow bridge just around the sharp curve. The third killer is a railroad crossing, where the trains come roaring out of a narrow valley and across the highway. This is the place where, on the average, there are three accidents a week. Let's find out how Bill and his rangers correct this horrible stretch of road in the story, Death's Half Mile. On one side of the highway called Death's Half Mile, mountains drop to the edge of the road, except where a narrow valley opens up. Along this valley runs a small river and a railroad track. On the other side of the road, the ground is fairly level, and there's a ranch. Bruno Allen and his family live there close to the highway in a comfortable home. It's about midnight, and Bruno and his son Eric are sleeping. Hey, 
Pop. Oh, wake up. I heard it, son. You get the first aid kit and I'll call the police. Okay, Pop. Put my jeans and shoes on in a hurry. Good boy. I wonder if this will ever stop. Let's go, son. No, I'll meet you out front. Operator, this is Bruno Allen. Please notify the state police that there's been another accident on this half mile. My son and I are getting out there to give first aid. There's two cars, Pop. It looks like a head-on collision. <laughs> How's it look, Sarge? Uh, two men are dead, Bruno. A woman's dying. The doc's trying hard to save her. The children seem all right. You saved a couple of them with your first aid, Bruno. I sure wish something should be done to stop this butchery. Three accidents a week, Sarge. I know. Is that a ranger car coming in? Yeah, I radioed Bill to come out. Hey, Smitty, tell the other ambulance to back in. The doc's signaling for us. Okay, Sarge. Hey, driver, bring your ambulance in here. Hello, Perry. Bruno. Hi, Bill. How are you, Bill? Hey, this is a nasty one, Sarge. How'd it happen? I don't know, Tanner. Bruno called us. Bruno, you and Eric ought to get a medal for the lives you've saved. We just assumed we didn't have to do this, Stumpy. Yeah, I know what you mean, Sonny. I can see your point quite clear. Eric means what he says, fellas, and he speaks for both of us. Bill, will you and Stumpy and Gray Wolf stop over at the house for coffee? I, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, it's plenty late. Maybe you won't sleep. I can't sleep for, for a long while after one of these, Gray Wolf. We'll stop by, Bruno. I want to check out the details with Perry, and then we'll be off. Let's go, Sarge. All right, Bill. Well, that's the last ambulance. Let's go back to the house, fellas. Nothing more we can do here. Yeah, I reckon you're right there, young fella. The doing should be done before these accidents happen. You make a tasty cup of java, Bruno. It hits the spot. Well, Pop doesn't do bad for a pinch hitter. Uh, Mom's away over to Junction City to visit Aunt Minnie. Uh, Bruno, what's on your mind? Death's half mile, Bill. Something's got to be done about that suicide lane. Yeah, I agree with you. But only half the highway is under my jurisdiction. The half on the mountainside because it's in the National Park and government range territory. Oh, so that's why the Sarge called you, huh, Bill? That's right, Eric. It's a crazy arrangement, but that's where the boundary is. Right down the middle of the road. Here, fellas, now, uh, take a look at these figures. I've kept a record of every accident that's happened here for the past six months. This will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Mm Mm-hmm. Not bad. You know, Bruno, you've got a real head on your shoulders. This is a pretty jolting record of what goes on along Death's Half Mile. Thanks for the compliment, Bill, but that's what they all said. Hmm? I don't understand. Mm, That's plenty strange remark to make. Pop's talking about the highway commissioner, the captain of the state police, and the superintendent of the railroad. They gave Pop a pat on the back, and and that was the end of it. Did you go and see these fellas? No, Stumpy, I wrote to them. I gave them the facts, and all I got in return was a thank you. Said they'd look into it. Well, nothing's ever come of it. I don't think they care how many people get killed on the highway. Eric, don't talk like that. You don't know the facts, so don't make any harsh statements. Oh, I'm sorry, Pop. Well, you see what you can do with the powers that be, Bill. Maybe they'll listen to you. Yeah, they sure will, Sonny. Bill has a way of making anybody listen. Oh, you speak plenty of truth, Stumpy. <laughs> flattery will get you nowhere, fellas. It ain't flattery, young feller. It's the plain truth. Bill, please, will you help my Pop? Okay, Eric. I'll help your dad. Oh, swell. Oh, Good thanks, day, Bill. I know if they won't listen to you, they won't listen to anybody. I'm not making any promises, Bruno, but I'll give it a try. 
By the time Bill's through with these fellas, they'll be willing to listen. Mark my words. Seeing that accident kind of makes a fella think about how dangerous an automobile is, don't it, fellas? Ah, uh, you say plenty that time's dumpy. Car like loaded gun. You can imagine what Bruno and Eric go through each time there is an accident. They're the first ones there. It's bad to hear hurt people cry for help and find bodies laying on the highway. How you plan to help Bruno, Bill? First thing I'm going to do, Gray Wolf, is go back out in the morning and take a real hard look at Death's Half Mile. I pull off plenty far on shoulder, Bill, so car not in way. That's a good idea, Gray Wolf. Leave the red light flashing so it'll slow down oncoming cars. We don't want to be part of an accident. You can say that again, young fella. Ah, there's a curve ahead. Very bad turn. Yeah, sure is. It's like a hairpin almost. There's only one sign. All it says is curve ahead. More warning signs needed for this curve and speed limit sign, too. That's right, Gray Wolf. You've hit the nail on the head. I think there should be a really large sign about here and... It should have reflectors on it so it can be plainly seen at night. And then another sign showing what kind of curve this is, and also a speed limit sign ahead. Maybe a high concrete ridge in the middle of the road would keep the fellers in one lane, out of the other. That's an excellent idea, old-timer. You should be a safety engineer. Let's walk around the curve and take a look at the bridge. Ah, uh-huh. that death trap number two. <laughs> That bridge ain't wide enough for a bad elephant to get through. Uh, it's strange that four-lane highway become two-lane, that bridge. That's right, Gray Wolf. It happens that way frequently. I see that there aren't any narrow bridge warning signs, nor are the abutments striped with black and white paint. Maybe reflectors help show bridge structure, too. Yeah, I believe they would. Boy, you fella don't have much of a chance. You come around that curve and right at this skinny bridge... If one don't get you, the other one will. Let's take a look at death trap number three. Well, here it is, fellas. A perfect setup for an accident. Ah, a train come roaring out of valley and sound is muffled by narrow valley walls. Yep, pitch on you like a human dragon before you know where it come from. Here come one now, Bill. That'll be the Fireball Express. Uh, Gray Wolf, get on the other side and stop any cars. Ah, I hurry. Hey, look at that monster come roaring. Look at it. Sure was deceptive. To a motorist, it's even more so. Should be wigwag signals here with blinking lights. Yeah, if you said it, Sonny. Them there wooden cross arms don't tell you nothing, except that there's a railroad track here. Most folks probably think that this is some backwoods line. They don't realize that some of the fastest trains in the country fly through here full uh, blast. That fellow scoot through here like arrow. Need more warning. That's right, Gray Wolf. Well, fellas, I've seen enough. Let's go back to headquarters, and I'll write up my recommendations. What do you plan to do, Bill? The first thing I'm going to do is show them to the State Highway Commissioner. You finished writing recommendations, Bill? Yes, Gray Wolf, I have. There we are, all five pages up. You writing a book, Sonny? <laughs> Not quite, Stumpy, but I haven't left anything out. Uh, you go to Canyon City now. Yes, Gray Wolf. I'll be back early this evening. You're walking into a lion's den, Sonny. I understand the highway commissioner is about as ornery as a grizzly coming out of hibernation. 
I'll feed him these recommendations and see how he acts. Bill, this is a very impressive write-up. I say that seriously. Originally, I thought that Bruno Allen was stretching a point or two, but... Words I... can only describe half the truth, Commissioner. Yes, I'm beginning to realize that. Now that you've stepped into the picture, I know this is serious. And you don't spend your time on nonsense. I don't mean to be caustic, Commissioner, but this flower throwing isn't solving the problem or answering the questions you've read in my write-up. Yeah, I know that, Bill. I really wasn't trying to avoid the issue. All the compliments are true and deserving. However, I was paving the way for the bad news. Bad news? Yes. There isn't enough money in my budget to follow your recommendations. Not even to put in the signs I've asked for? I'm afraid not. But why? I don't understand. Bill, see those drawings on the wall? Yeah. They're the three superhighways the state's building, aren't they? Yes, Bill. They are. They've taken every red cent we can scrape together. I see. I thought the highways were financed with bond issues. Well, they are, but the money, the bond money keeps coming in and dribbles and well, it's all soaked up like rain on dry ground. You can't set aside enough money to take care of death's half mile? The construction men have to be paid. So do our material bills. I'm sorry, Bill. But there's not a thing I can do for you now. Folks will just have to drive more carefully when they travel that stretch of road. That's the whole story, Mr. Scanlon. And the facts you have before you in black and white. Yes, Mr. Jefferson, I've been looking at them. And I must say, you've got a strong case here. Thank you. I think you'll find that all the statements I've made can be checked out and found to be accurate. Without a doubt, Mr. Jefferson, without a doubt. But there's more than just these facts to consider. Oh? Mr. Jefferson, if we were to put wigwag signals and flashing warning lights at every country road crossing, this railroad would go broke first thing in the morning. But that isn't what I'm asking, Mr. Scanlon. I can understand your problem, and I think you're right. However, I'm not asking this for every country road crossing. This crossing is definitely a hazard crossing and needs attention badly. I'm sorry, Mr. Jefferson, but I can't agree with you. If we do this for you, then every crossing will have to be treated the same way. We'll set a precedent, and our company can't afford to do that. Is that your final word, Mr. Scanlon? Yes, I'm afraid it is. The drivers will just have to be more careful. Honestly, Bill, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. But I can't see how more frequent patrolling will stop the slaughter on that stretch of road. It won't stop it, Captain Paulson, but I know it'll reduce it. Your men can hail down fast drivers and warn them of the waiting traps. Yeah, you, you do have a point there, Bill. But there's one hitch in it. What's that, Captain? I don't have the extra men to do the job. My force is understaffed. Why, we need 30 more men. And there's no possibility of getting the extra patrols? Sorry, Bill. I just can't do it now. I can't even make the required patrols right now. Tell you what, though. Yes? 50 men will be graduated from police school at the end of the year. And I'll put the extra men on patrol duty around death's half mile. Well, that'll be fine, but it doesn't solve the problem right now, Captain. I know that, Bill. But there's nothing I can do about it. Well, young fella, you're licked now, ain't you? Not yet, Stumpy. Bill, you never learn when you're beat. What plan you have now? I'm going to try an experiment for a week. Experiment? We're going to do our own patrolling. Stumpy... Go out to the garage and get another patrol car. Okay, Sonny. You're up to something. I've got a feeling it's going to be good. I'll get the car ready. What idea you have, Bill? 
We're going to see if we can cut down the accident rate on death's half mile for one week, Grable. Ah, uh, you pick up more rangers for a job. Not for the daylight hours, Grable. I'll put two men at each end of death's half mile for the night watch. It won't be so lonesome that way, and one can sleep while the other stands guard and changes off. Let's go. This is your spot, old-timer. Yeah, it's fine. This is a right nice place to stand guard. How are we going to work this, Sonny? I want you to stop every car. Warn them about the dangers ahead and tell them to reduce speed and then let them go on. Say, that's easy as falling off a log. Okay, Stumpy. All hands will stand eight-hour watches, including myself. I'll take the first night watch. Tom will probably relieve Grey Wolf. I'll bring two more of the boys out to keep us company at night. Okay, Bill. Sounds good to me. Oh, it sounds good to me, too, Bill. I think we'll cut down the axes and told and nothing for the next week. Let's go to our station, Grey Wolf. See you later, Stumpy. I yell loud if you get lonesome, but I yell back. <laughs> It'll be easier to talk to myself and yell for a while. <laughs> Here come car now, Bill. Let's stop them and give them a helpful warning that'll save their lives. What you looking for, Rangers? Bandits? No, we're not looking for anyone in particular, mister. Oh? Why the roadblock, then? To save your life and the lives of the people in your car. The next half mile of highway is called Death's Half Mile. It is? How come? The railroad crossing over tracks that carry fast trains... Then there's a narrow bridge and a nasty curve. Go ahead now, but drive slowly and carefully. Thanks for the warning, Ranger. I don't want to be caught napping. You're welcome, mister. Now go ahead. You have plenty of good feeling inside, Bill. That fellow will appreciate our warning. That's right, Grey Wolf. Nobody wants to have an auto accident. That is, nobody in his right mind. Uh, here come three cars now. You take care of him, Grey Wolf. I'm going to walk over and talk to Stumpy. I'm beginning to get another idea. Many thanks, Rangers. I've heard about this place, but I didn't know exactly where it was. That's what I'm here for, sonny. Now go ahead and take it easy. going, old friend. Yeah, right smart, sonny. All the drivers are thankful I stopped him and told him what's ahead. That's fine, Stumpy. I'm going over and have a talk with Bruno and Eric now. What's up? What do you mean, what's up? I can tell by the please with yourself look you have on your face that your brain cells are turning over full speed. Well, I was just thinking. Yeah, that's when things start happening. Half of this terrible piece of road is ours, Stumpy. Why can't we put a sign up at each end on our half of the highway? See, now, you're cooking with gas, sonny. Make it big enough so even an owl can read it in the daytime. Bruno, you sure are a handy fella to have around. <laughs> so are you, Bill. Eric and I have been getting some wonderful sleep since you got your men out on the highway. Man, it sure has been peaceful around here, Bill. I used to shudder every time I heard a car go by. I can understand how you feel, Eric. I'll have these signs finished in a couple of hours, Bill. Okay. I'll go back to the highway. You bring them out when they're ready? Sure will. When folks read these, they ought to stop and think. Those are right smart signs, Bill. They ought to do the trick. I don't think they'll correct the difficulties here, but they may make drivers stop and think. And then slow down, huh, Bill? I hope so, Harry. 
There you are, fellas. Both signs are up. Ah, oh, plenty of good job. Boy, that hits right between the eyes. Are you next? This is Death's Half Mile. Drive carefully. That ought to stop him. I think you've licked the problem, Sonny. I'm not through yet. What do you mean, Bill? There are three gentlemen that have to be shown this problem firsthand. What time does the Fireball Express roar through here, Harry? Uh, five minutes after ten every morning, Bill. And, man, does she go. I have a date with the Fireball Express right here at this crossing at 10.05 in the morning. Hello, Commissioner. This is Bill Jefferson. Yes, Bill. What's on your mind? I'd like you to take a ride with me out to Death's Half Mile in the morning. I don't see that it's necessary for me to do that, Bill. I haven't changed my mind. Would you do it as a favor to me, please? All right, Bill. What time? Be at my office by 9.30. Okay, I'll be there. I'm not asking you to change your mind, Mr. Scanlon. I'm just asking you to take a ride with me. I know you're up to something, but I guess the only way to find out what it is will be to go on that drive with you. Well, what time? Be at my office at 9.30. I'll be there. Well, Captain, what do you say? All right, Bill. What time? Be at my office at 9.30. I'll be there. I'd like to know what you're up to. So would I, Mr. Scanlon. Well, I've known Bill long enough to be sure we're not going sightseeing. I'm afraid you gentlemen will have to wait for my answer. Approaching Death's Half Mile, gentlemen. Oh, a sign. Oh, I wonder who put that up there. Oh, kind of gory, isn't it? Oh. I put the sign up, and there's one just like it at the other end. Aren't you going to slow down, Bill? <coughs> there's a hairpin curve ahead, you know. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I don't see any warning. The sign sure. just says curve. Doesn't say anything about it being dangerous. This isn't any no. time for jokes, Mr. Jefferson. Slow down. Well, I'm only going 35 Please miles fire. an hour, Superintendent. Great Scott, man. Slow down, and we'll never make it. <laughs> Captain, I'm driving at a safe and sane speed, am I not? Yes, Bill, you are. I see why you brought us. Hey, look out for that pitch. Oh. Man, we're going to... We're never going to... Well, now we're almost through with that half mile, and uh, nothing's happened. Uh, stop at the tracks. The Fireball Express is coming through the valley right now. I don't hear any train, Mr. Scanlon. Well, in the sure. name of common sense, stop. Get us all killed. Frankly, gentlemen, there's no indication that a train's coming. We'll be perfectly safe. I can hear very well. I've heard the whistle, Bill. Stop this car. I'll jump. Well, it... Seems that I did hear something like a train whistle. Uh, all right, I'll stop. Oh, Boy, am I glad you stopped. We'd all be dead. That's exactly my point, gentlemen. I'm sorry I had to do this, but ordinary appeals didn't do any good. Bruno Allen tried to get you to listen. I tried, and you turned a deaf ear to me also. This was the only thing left. I had to give you this first-hand experience and show you how easy it is to get killed anywhere along Death's Half Mile. I expect you gentlemen to act accordingly. Well, Bruno, Eric, what do you think of Death's Half Mile now? Bill, I can't believe it. There are adequate and proper signs. There's a bumper hump in the middle of the curve and is painted yellow. Yeah, and, and the bridge has been widened to four lanes. You said it, Sonny. There's one of the best ding-dongs at the railroad crossing you ever seen. Uh, also flashing red lights and wake-wag signals. 
State Police Patrol more now than ever. Bill, you and your men have done automobile drivers a real service. Oh, don't forget, Bruno, you and Eric have done your job well, too. Uh, now we can put another sign up. This is the world's safest half mile. <laughs> Yes, it was a battle, Eric, but now you can put up your new sign. Isn't it strange that we can never learn by other people's experiences? We have to go through them ourselves. That's what I had to do to the superintendent, the commissioner, and the captain of the state police. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... This is Stumpy Jenkins, the Ranger Bill's old sidekick, as I guess you all know. Just adding a little extra word of thanks for getting yourself in on the program today. Always glad to have you along. And I hope you invite your friends, too, for we sure got lots of adventures to tell you about. And we don't want you to miss any of them. So you make sure to be there by your radio every week. Don't lose out on our next story. of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. boys and girls. Ranger Bill and all his friends have had a lot of experience with animal problems. Mountain lions, bears, wolves, and a host of others. But in our story today, they're up against a real toughie. The whole trouble in this problem is that the creatures involved carry their own gas equipment. <laughs> yes, you've probably already guessed it. Well, let's find out what happens in this story. The eviction of Pa and Ma Skunk. A tall Texan by the name of Arnold Fleming is out at Goose Lake right now looking for a home for his family. Goose Lake is mostly a summer resort area for Knotty Pine, Junction City, and Canyon City. But some of the homes are built for year-round living. Arnold's been looking all over the area for a home with the help of a real estate agent by the name of George Sims. Now Arnold's come back to look at a particular house again. Let's drop in on the two men and find out what cooks. Mr. Sims, I sure like this here house. Suits me just fine. Well, I'm glad you like it. But there's one thing I must tell you now, about Now, see it. here, man. You all sound like you're trying to discourage me from buying this here house. Not in the least. It's just that I want you to know all that... All I know is that I like it. The view's fine. It's close to Lake. And it's close to Vittles. And the school is just down the road a piece. Let's go back to your office and you can draw up the papers. I'll go over to the bank and have a certified check made. Okay, Mr. Fleming. I guess if your mind's made up, it's made yes, up. Yes, sir, Mr. Sims. Us Texans know what we want. We know how to go after it. I want this house, you hear? Yes. Let's go back to my office and we'll close the deal. Well, Mr. Fleming, your furniture is all in the house without a scratch. 
You all did a fine job of moving, mister. Yeah, thank you. Hey, will you sign this invoice, please? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. Well, we're showing off now, Mr. Fleming. I hope you enjoy your new home. Thank you for them kind words. That's mighty fine of you. Bye. I'm going to like it here fine, Daddy. Mm, me too. Boy, look at the lake. There must be lots of fish in it. I'm mighty glad you all like this place, children. How do you like it, Sue? Oh, just fine, Arnold. You sure picked a pretty spot. Hey, who's this old fella coming to see us, Dad? Why, well, I don't reckon I rightly know, son. We'll soon find out. Howdy, folks. Howdy. Howdy, sir. Hey. Name's Abner. Live down the road at the store. The son runs the place now. Oh, glad to meet you, Abner. Our name's Fleming. This is my daughter, June. And my son, Fred. And my wife, Sue. <laughs> and my name's Arnold. We all hail from Texas. <laughs> it ain't hard to figure. You bought the best house on the lake, eh? <laughs> yes, sir, we did. Us Texans always do things right. Not this time you didn't, Mr. Fleming. Huh? What, what you all mean, Abner? Well, Ferguson's used to live here. They couldn't get him out. Get who out, Abner? Skunks. That's Skunk? who. In this I house? I don't understand. Now, Abner, see here, you, you ain't joking, are you? <laughs> no, sir, ain't. Wish it were. There's a family of skunks living under your house. They've been there for years. Nobody's been able to get them out. You say that under the house? Yep, that's where they be. Oh, well, then we haven't anything to worry about, Abner. I thought they was in the house from the way you talked. You plan to move in anyhow? <laughs> Certainly. We're not afraid of skunks. Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you. They get mad and let fly. You come out of your house smelling like a barrel of old eggs. Children, it's time you went to bed now. Oh, my, I don't want to Mother, go to bed yet. Mother, we have to... Now you get to bed. You've had a busy day, do you hear? Yes, Mother. You think there's any truth in old Abner's story about the pesky old skunks, Dad? I rather doubt it, son. You know how these old timers are. I like to spin yarns. Well, come on now. You get to bed and no more stalling. Night, Mommy. Daddy. Night, Mom. Dad. Night, Fred. Night, children. June. Arnold, we've got to buy some rugs tomorrow. I don't like these bare floors. All right, Sue. I'll take you and the children to town in the morning, and you can... <gasps> Arnold, what's that noise? Now, Sue, there's no need for you all to get excited. For land's sake, that, that racket half scared me to death. I'm here to take care of things now. What's, what's matter, wrong, Mom? Mommy? What's the matter? What's that smell? I smell it, too. Ugh. Oh, it's awful. We've got to get out of this house. Huh? That skunk gas. Oh, Skunk. You all get out of here oh, now before it gets all over your clothes and people won't get near you. Now get, you hear? Arnold, you, you should have opened the window. Well, that wouldn't do a bit of good. Wait till I get my hands on that high-binding real estate agent that sold me this place. What will we do now, Dad? It's cold out here. Well, uh, uh, we'll have to move in with the neighbors. In the morning, I'll see what I can do about these here skunks. <laughs> I'd like to slow you down, Arnold, but I, I got the miseries in my back. It, you go on ahead if you want. I, I'll catch up. Uh, You'll take it easy, Abner. I'm in no hurry to open the door to my house. Uh, just wait till I get my hands on the skin flint real estate agent. Too bad you didn't listen to me. You never get that skunk smell out of the house for a long time. Uh, I guess I got to learn the hard way, Abner. You'd better stay here. I'll open the door. Mm, I think we will. Just can't move fast anymore. Oh, my. This, this, this is terrible. Oh. 
I thought rotten eggs smelled bad, but this is worse. Yeah, I'll say it's worse. It, it's worse than a field of cabbage after the first frost. Let, let's get our way from here, Arnie, before we pick this up in the clothes. Yeah. Come on. I wish I knew what to do about them pesky skunks. Maybe I can help you. You can? Why, Abner, I'd be mighty obliged if you would. Yeah. We get back to the store, I... Call Bill Jefferson. Who's Bill Jefferson, Abner? <laughs> a specialist in evicting skunks? <laughs> no, he's a forest ranger. Best there is. If Bill can't get your smelly friends out, then nobody can. I'd sure appreciate it if you'd call this here ranger. And when you're finished, I'm going to call that no-account real estate varmint and get him out here. I think I'll throw him inside my house. Oh, you wouldn't do that, would you, Arnold? <laughs> Why not? Then he'd be with his relatives. I got it, fellas. Hello, Ranger Headquarters. Bill Jefferson speaking. Why, hello, Abner. How are you? Oh, that's fine. What? Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, maybe Bill swallowed a feather and it tickled his stomach. Abner, I really shouldn't laugh because it's serious. Those skunks probably have ruined the poor guy's personal belongings. What? Oh, sure. We'll get out right away and see what we can do. Okay, Abner. Goodbye. Now, oh, Bill Jefferson, what's so all fired funny? Mm, what this about skunks? Well, fellas, as I told Abner, it really isn't funny, but then again it is. There's a family of skunks under a house at Goose Lake. Seems though they won't let anybody live there but themselves. <laughs> I suppose you're going to go out there and talk to Ma and Pa Skunk and ask him to move, huh? Yeah, that's the general idea, old-timer. Bill, you make jokes. I ain't gonna get close to any pole cats, sonny. Now, Stumpy, be reasonable. We're not going to get close to them, you know that. I got close once and I had to take a bath every night in the week for a month. Then my ma made me sleep out in the barn. I didn't mind sleeping in the barn, but I sure didn't like taking all those baths. <laughs> Stumpy, you... <laughs> Come on, fellas. Let's ride out and take a look. Maybe we can help these folks. Okay, sonny, but... If one of those critters raises his tail, I'm going to get. And I mean get good. I'm going to throw you right through that door, George Sims. Anybody that would sell a house with scones in it ought to be tarred and feathered and rid out of town on a rail, you hear? Listen, Texan, you lay a hand on me and I'll have you pinched. I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Listen to me, you ballin' maverick. The only thing you told me was the price and where to sign my name. I'm going to heave you right through that door. You touch me and you go to jail. Keep away. I I'm warning you. Don't threaten me, you sawed old prairie dog. It'll be worth going to jail to see you get what's coming to you. Hey, you two. Give me a hand, Ranger. He's twice as big as I am. Rangers. All right, mister. Take your hands off this man. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I just wanted to make this fellow smell like his relative. Now, let's cool down and find out what this is all about. Uh, just behave yourself, sonny. We'll get to the bottom of this. And I'll tell you what happened, Bill. Arnold here's too hot under the collar to talk sense. That'll be fine, Abner. Go ahead. Well, sir, it all started when Arnold here bought this place. It was the Ferguson's house for. When these folks from Texas came along, they... So that's the whole story, Bill. Thanks, Abner. Now, Mr. Sims, you'd better leave while the leaving's good. I think you pulled a fast one, but I'll go into that later. You just go ahead, Ranger. If that man wasn't such a know-it-all, I'd have told him. But I couldn't get in a word edgewise with a crowbar. You should have drove those smelly varmints out before you sold the house. Now, see here, sonny. If you don't get a hold of your blood pressure, we'll just up and skedaddle. Oh, well, no, don't do that. I'll 
control myself from now on. Then we stay and try to help you. You really think you can get rid of them there pesky skunks, Bill? Yes, we'll help Arnold Abner. It's not our job, but we're always glad to help folks in trouble. I sure appreciate your help. I'm just plain up a tree, and and it looks like the skunks will keep me there unless you fellows get me down. Well, I'm not making any promises, but we'll do our best. Are you planning to get those fellows out, Bill? The first step of my plan is to make a phone call. We're going back to town for a while, Arnold. Don't start anything until we get back. (laughs) Don't fret about that, Bill. I ain't got a hankering to get perfumed with that anti-social gas the skunks put out. (laughs) Okay. We'll see what we can do to make the skunk family more acceptable society. Calling, Bill. Dr. Fordham at State University, Stumpy. State University? I'd like to speak to Dr. Fordham, please. Just one moment, please. I'll ring Dr. Fordham. Thank you. Is this fellow a skunk specialist, Sonny? <laughs> Not a such old timer. He's an outstanding chemist and zoologist. One moment, please. I'm ringing Dr. Fordham. All right, operator. I'll wait. You think he'll be able to tell you how to get rid of skunks? I hope so. Dr. Fordham speaking. Uh, hello, doctor. This is Bill Jefferson. Well, hello, Bill. How are you? Just fine. How are you, sir? Oh, fit as a fiddle, Bill. Not bad for an old man, eh? Oh, <laughs> what are you talking about? You're not old. <laughs> well, well, what's on your mind, Bill? How can I drive skunks out from under a house? Your house? No, a friend of mine has them under his house, and they won't let him move in. They're giving him the gas, huh? <laughs> yeah, more than he can bottle, too. Well, really, it's nothing to laugh about. Hey, why don't you try mothballs, Bill? Will they do the trick? They should. But you know how skunks are. Yeah, they're used to strong smells. All right. Only they don't smell with the same organ that they make gas with. Well, it's a good thing, and they'd be trying to run away from themselves. Yeah, no, that's right, Bill. <laughs> mothballs, huh? Well, we'll try it, uh, Thanks for your help, sir. Well, that's quite right, Bill. If it doesn't work, let me know. I will. Goodbye. Hey, who ever heard of driving out skunks with mothballs? That's like using flypaper to catch grizzly bears. What in the world is that gear you're taking out of the car? <laughs> Looks like you're getting ready for a rainstorm. We well, ain't getting ready for no rainstorm, Sonny. This is our battle gear for a skunk war. Wait till you see what else we brought. Huh? Well, a gas man. Sure. You don't think I'm going to put my bare face under your house without this over it, do you? You think the gas mask will keep the odor out? I don't know, young feller. When they see me coming with this mask over my face, they'll probably drop dead from fright. Hmm, they think you men from Mars. You see, <laughs> I'll tell you how you'll know if this gas mask works or not, Arnold. How's that, Stumpy? When one of them fellers swings his caboose around and aims his tail at me, well, the first whiff of skunk perfume I get through the mask, I'm coming out from under the house. In fact, the house will move right off its foundation. Because if I come out from under it, I'm really coming out. Yes, sir. Just call me House Wrecker Jenkins. <laughs> oh, Let's get down to work, fellas. First, I want to carry out Arnold's clothes. His family's, too. Then we'll carry out the upholstered furniture and store it in the garage. Then we go to work and put down the mothballs under the house. You really going to crawl under the house, Bill? No, Arnold, we're not. With your permission, we'll open up the floor in strategic places and drop the mothballs down. That's okay with me. Anything to get rid of them pesky skunks. You bring along some extra gear so I can help you all? Yeah. We'll have your outfit sorted out here in a minute. Uh, gear already now, Bill. Hey, your poor pool cats don't take these things for candy and come back for more.
put mothballs down here, Stumpy. Okay, sonny. Well, you want me to tear up the floor next, Phil? Make a hole in the kitchen floor, Grewal. Okay, I do. I think we got enough mothballs under the house, except for the kitchen. Quit mumbling, what would you say? I said this is enough. Huh? What you say? Oh, forget it. Follow me. <laughs> Don't we smell pretty? You think we'll ever get that odor off the rubber gear, Sonny? No, sure. It'll wash off, old-timer. And wash off rubber easier than off skin. Those white-striped kitties are getting some of their own medicine. When they get out in the woods smelling like mothballs, none of their relatives will come near them. <laughs> I sure haven't seen any of them running out from under the house yet. On given time, mothballs not work as fast as skunk gas. Uh, that's true. But I hope this here stuff starts working soon. Arnold, when are the skunks going to leave? I'd like to get back in my room, Dad. Yes, Daddy. You said the mothballs would drive them away. You all have to be patient now. Bill didn't make any promises. Well, we can't stay with our neighbors forever, Arnold. Uh, I reckon you're right. Maybe the skunks will be out in a couple of days. What do you see, Stumpy? This house is so big, I can't see them critters. But I sure can smell them. They're still under there, Bill. I say the same thing. Mothballs not work. The whole family probably put on weight eating the mothballs. It's the best candy they ever <laughs> had. Oh, Stumpy. <laughs> Put the can of mothballs out here and see if they don't come out and lean up against it. Now, see here, fellas. I I don't like to be ornery, but, well, I don't think we're getting anywhere. If you all don't get results, I will. How's that, sonny? I'll get a shotgun and go into there after them. Hey, don't be foolish, young fella. Stumpy's right, Arnold. Just take it easy. I'm going to call Dr. Ford and tell him what happened. He'll have something else we can use. So that's the bad news, Doctor. As Stumpy says, it's the best candy they ever ate. <laughs> oh, that's funny, Bill. Did they really eat the mothballs? <laughs> well, frankly, I don't know. I rather doubt it. <laughs> Say, Bill, I'm driving down my car right away. I'll bring some chemicals with me. Well, that's fine. Uh, we can pick up the chemicals if you wish. Oh, I'd rather bring them along, Bill. I'm intensely interested in this problem. I'll be there in a couple of hours. Okay, Doctor. We'll be waiting. Goodbye. Now what, Bill? Let's get a bite to eat, and then we'll drive back to the Fleming's home. Dr. Fordham will be here in a couple of hours. Ah, uh, he better have good idea this time, or Arnold will get plenty mad. <laughs> How do you think the skunks feel? You ever had somebody try to evict you? Which is worse, get the skunk smell all over you, or drown in your own sweat from wearing all this rubber clothing. I feel like I've been in the shower bath. It's plenty hot inside rubber gear, all right. Well, Dr. Fordham, we've got the bags of chemicals placed under the house. We put them in the same place as we put the mothballs. Well, that's fine, Bill. Chemicals would probably activate the mothballs as well as generate their own gases. Well, we might as well go home for the night. Nothing's going to happen till morning. I sure hope this works, Dr. Fordham. I'm getting mighty short of patience. Can't make any promises, Mr. Fleming. I'm not a specialist at driving out skunks, you know. <laughs> Why don't you charge them rent? Look <laughs> 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 that. I would, old time, if I could get close enough to collect. <laughs> yeah, that's right, sonny. These skunks are getting more attention than any of them ever got in history. Doing their job. Dr. Fordham, what are you trying to do to me? 
I'm trying to get rid of the pest under your house, Mr. Fleming. Well, that's great. All the neighbors are complaining of the odor. From the skunks? No, from the chemicals. <laughs> get a whiff of that. Yeah. Well, you, you see what I mean? Well, I smell what you mean, Sonny. I guess the skunks are dead by now. Dead? What? Them there critters probably knocked themselves out trying to outsmell the smell that's coming from the chemicals. That's the worst smell I ever smelled. What's the use? I, I, I give up. You, you fellows have some sense of humor. I'm sorry, Arnold. I know you're in trouble. Now, let's get our gear on, fellas, and take the chemicals out. You can throw them into the lake. It'll dissipate the odor. You'll kill the fish. No, nope, it won't, Arnold. That stuff's only good for getting rid of people. It won't bother fish or skunks. I'm sorry it didn't work, Mr. Fleming. Well, that's all right, Doctor. You, you tried your best. I think I know what'll work for sure. What's that, Bill? We'll build a wire mesh fence around the bottom of the house and leave only one opening. Outside the opening, we'll put food and water. Oh. They'll come out when they're hungry and thirsty enough. Sounds That's like a good, good idea, Bill. Sure. Let's get the material and go to work. Boss of ours has a good idea here. Even a polecat gets hungry and thirsty. I believe this is a workable plan, too, old timer. Ah, here comes Bill. He and Dr. Fordham must be finished on the other side of the house. That's good enough, fellas. I want to leave a big opening for them to get out. Huh, maybe they go back under the house if they get food and water. And we'll make a gate and drop it on a rope and pulley after they go for the food. Oh, that'll do it. If you leave the wire mesh around the house, Mr. Fleming, no animals can get underneath it. That's right, Doctor. Let's get the bait set and the gate up, fellas. Uh, we do right away, Bill. The Arnold told me that you've got the right idea now. You sort of make them rascals move. And I'll tell you better two or three days from now. In about an hour, we'll be ready to see what happens. soon be dark, Bill. Uh, how do you plan to split up the watches? I'll take the first watch, Grey Wolf the second, and you the third. I'll take a turn to setting up. I will too, Bill. Why should we sleep when you fellas are watching? Okay. This'll make it easier. Well, let's hit the hay, fellas. If your body don't need the rest, your patience will. This is going to be a long wait. Bill, 24 hours have gone by and nothing's happened. How long can they hold out? No food, no water? Well, they've probably still got some mothballs left to eat and they've gnawed through the water pipe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, they can't go too much longer without food and water, fellas. Well, it better happen soon because my patience is getting mighty thin. Bill, I've given you gents long enough. Now, I'm going to do things my way. I'll get those skunks out of there. Arnold, where are you going? To get my shot done. Oh, don't be foolish, man. Wait a little longer. They can't live in there more than the rest of the day without food and water. Wait, wait, wait. That's all you can say. Well, I'm through waiting, you hear? Look, fellows, there come skunks now. Well, what do you know? Here comes Pa and Ma and the three little skunks. Let them eat and drink, fellas. Don't scare them off until they've had their fill. All right, drop the gate, Stumpy. Rouse mid them, fellas. Get going, Arnold! There they go, hey, right for the woods. What's all the yelling about? You missed it, Arnold. The skunks came out and they're gone. <laughs> now Pa and Ma Fleming and the two little Flemings can move in. How are you feeling now, Arnold? I'm feeling mighty fine, Bill. 
thanks for all you and your rangers did for us. Oh, forget it, Arnold. We're glad to help. Uh-oh. Here comes the real estate agent. Better control yourself, Arnold. Hello, Mr. Fleming, rangers. Hello, Hi. Mr. Sims. What do you want, Mr. Sims? I'd like to buy your house, Mr. Fleming. I'll give you $1,000 more than you paid for it. Why, you saw it off ground, Hog. I wouldn't sell my property Take it to easy, you. Arnold. He's gone. <laughs> Look at him take off down the road, would you? <laughs> That's right, Stumpy. He got the same thing the skunks got. <laughs> Eviction. You said it, Sonny. Maybe we should have kept the polecats in a bag. So he could take them home with him. <laughs> Maybe so, Stumpy. Well, the skunk family moved after they'd given everybody a bad time. Or I should say a smelly time. You know, uh, rangers could have shot or trapped the animals, but they didn't uh, like to operate that way, only as a last resort. Rangers like to treat animals the way we'd want to be treated if we were in the same spot. Well, we'll see you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! <laughs> Classic radio from MBN. It's the Sugar Creek Gang. Fables of Faith. Radio drama, a hallmark of Moody Broadcasting for over 60 years. Join us now as we take you back to another classic in MBN radio history. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Every year at this time, Bill goes to the State University to lecture. Bill's lecture is given to the student body as a whole, but it's directed toward those studying geology and anthropology. The lecture is on the science of staying alive in the mountains and forests. You see, many of the students go into the mountains and forests to gather material firsthand under the leadership of competent guides and with the rangers constantly checking on their well-being. What Bill is trying to do is prevent the isolated adventurers from going out into the wild country and becoming casualties because they haven't the knowledge of survival. Say, we'd better perhaps get into our story. This one is called Fossil Canyon. We're ready to begin the second hour of your lecture, Bill. That's fine, Dean Sands. How's your voice holding up? <laughs> as long as this pitcher of water holds out, I'll be able to keep my windmill running all right. <laughs> Who ever heard of a, of a windmill run with water? <laughs> yeah, you're looking at one, sir. <laughs> I hardly think that. But I'm enjoying your sense of humor. I never tire of hearing you talk about survival in the outdoors. I'll never forget your first lecture three years ago. My, little did I realize how much knowledge and experience a man must have to, to stay alive when meeting nature face to face. But, well, we're not here to listen to me. I'll make a few introductory remarks and turn the rostrum over to you. That'll be fine with me. Uh, perhaps they have some questions first. Attention, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jefferson suggested that uh, you may have some questions before he begins this second half of the lecture. If you have, uh, then you can ask them now. Yeah, I have a question, Dean Sands. 
I'll yield the Rosman to Mr. Jefferson, Bob. Then he can answer you direct. Uh, Bill, if you please. Thank you, Dean. Now, Bob, fire your question. Uh, your first hour lecture was interesting, but I object to the inference you make that we're not able to take care of ourselves. Are you making that inference, Mr. Jefferson? Yes, Bob, I am. Mr. Jefferson, I think you're underestimating our ability. We're adults. It's been my experience that college students are the hardest to convince that they should keep out of the wild country. Also, it's a statistical fact that college students are highest on the casualty list. And I might add, on the mortality list. I can't swallow that, Mr. Jefferson. Why should we be the highest on the casualty list? Because you let your zest for scientific data run away with your common sense. You wander into places that even experienced guides and rangers avoid, if at all possible. You mean to tell me that I couldn't go out into the boondocks and survive? You've hit the nail right on the head, Bob. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Perhaps a true story will convince you. Oh, it'll have to be a good one to convince me that I or any student couldn't go out into the wild country and come back alive. I'm sure you'll be convinced, Bob. Members of the faculty and student body, the story I'm about to tell you is true. It illustrates to perfection what I've been telling you. Dean Sands remembers this tragic story very well even though it happened several years ago. Virgil Adams and Stanley Grimshaw, both State University students, decided to go into Fossil Canyon. Virgil and Stanley didn't know that it's 115 degrees at the bottom of Fossil Canyon, and there were a lot of other things they didn't know about that death trap. I'd sure like to find a good fossil down here, Stan. So would I. They've been found here before, only last year, as a matter of fact. Yeah? Well, Professor Glomkin would give us a good boost toward our degree if we made a real fire. I'll say you would, Virg. Yeah. I'm going to make as good a collection of the, all the fossils I can find, mm. even if we don't stumble onto the big one. Mm, so am I. I'd rather find a good specimen prehistoric age. Hey, uh, we're only halfway down to the bottom of the canyon. Let's step it up and get down there before mm. it begins to get dark. Then we can do some work. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Let's go. What's the matter, Stan? I guess it's the heat, Burge. I didn't think it was this hot down here. I didn't either. I, I'm beginning to feel the heat myself. Look at my shirt. It, it's ringing wet. Let's stop and rest a while. Yeah, sure. I could use a rest, too. Boy, there isn't a breath of air moving down here at all. You said it. Whew. We've still got another third of the way to go. Let's, let's stop. I'm really getting sick. Yeah, well, let's try to make the bottom. Then, then we'll rest a long time. It isn't far. I don't know if I can make it, but I'll try. Man alive, it's, it's miserably hot down here. I'm beginning to feel lightheaded. Let's stop and leave our packs and gear here. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Feel any better, Stan? No. You? No. Hey, Stan, let, let, let's try to cross the canyon and get in the shade. This sun is terrific. Go ahead. I'll follow you if I can. Burge, I can't make it. I'm going to faint. Burge, do you hear me? Uh, I hear you, Stan. You, you got to make the shade. Uh, I can't help you because I can hardly stand on my feet myself. I can't see you, Burge. Burge, I can't make it. Help me. Don't don't leave me out here in the heat and sun. Oh. 
going. You stand. Stand, try to get up. You hear me? I'll try to help you. Where are you, Stan? Stan, I, I can't see you. Water. I, I gotta get water. I... Virgil and Stanley made many mistakes on their trip to Fossil Canyon. The reason Virgil couldn't see Stanley was that Stanley had fallen behind a large rock. It had also fallen into quicksand. Real quicksand. He was never seen again. Bill, uh, will you point out the mistakes that the two young men made? I'll be glad to, Dean Sands. First of all, Virgil and Stanley never should have entered the canyon in the heat of the day. They should have waited until sunset, or early in the morning is even a better time. Dean, I think continuing the story will drive home the mistakes more strongly than if I were to talk on them now. Perhaps you're right, Bill. Do as you wish. Thank you. My rangers and I were at our headquarters when we found out about this whole thing. You want me to get the phone, Bill? Thanks, pal, but I'll take it. Okay, it's probably for you anyhow. Hello, Ranger Headquarters, Bill Jefferson speaking. Mr. Jefferson, this is Dean Sands over at State University. Oh, yes, Dean. How are you? Physically, I'm fine, Mr. Jefferson. Mentally, I'm worried. Oh, is that right? What's on your mind? One of our students, Virgil Adams, is missing. He hasn't returned as scheduled. When was he supposed to be back, Dean? Yesterday morning. Well, perhaps he'd been delayed somewhere and couldn't get word to you. You've spoken more truth than fiction, my friend. What do you mean? Well, his classmates say that he told them he was going to Fossil Canyon. Fossil Canyon? What's the matter, Mr. Jefferson? Why, we just brought out the remains of a human being from Fossil Canyon three days ago. And the week before that, we lugged out another. <sighs> this could be tragic. Glad I called you. Will you please check the canyon for Virgil Adams? We most certainly will. I'll call you as soon as we know something definite. Bill, you got an angry look on your face. I get scared when you get that gleam in your eye like you've got now. I am angry, pal. I'm going to get a letter off to Colonel Anders when we get back. A good, strong letter. Now, will it be about Fossil Canyon? Yeah. Something's got to be done about that place. What, I don't know. Stumpy, how many times have you been down there? Well, not any more than I have to, sonny. The only time I go into that miserable hole is to bring out greenhorn tenderfeet lashed to the back of a horse. No man in his right mind would go in there. Here's the canyon rim. Let's hold it up, fellas. Oh, 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 oh boy. Now scan the canyon floor with your glasses. You might see, Virgil, and save time. Ah, not plenty of good idea. Yeah, there's lots of rocks and boulders down there that could hide him. You said a mouthful there, sonny. But as big as the canyon is, we might spot something that'll tell us where he's at. Well, I don't see anything. How about the rest of it? Uh, I can't see anything but rocks and more rocks. That goes for me, too. Lots of rocks, but no human being. You spotted something, Grey Wolf? There. Vulture flying over top of canyon. Oh, yes, I see him, too. Look to your rifles, fellas. we got to keep these terrible birds off the ground. If you see him dive, then open fire. Oh, boy, you said it, Bill. Those birds give me the shivers. They only fly around the dead. Let's go! Get him, get him! Come on, get him! Let's take it easy going down, fellas. When they get to the bottom, we'll stop and rest before going on. It's 115 degrees down there. Uh, 
Bill, uh, will you tell the student body what preparations you made before going down into that uh, natural oven? Gladly, Dean Sands. First of all, each man had four canteens of water, two for himself and two for his horse. If needed, a third one could also be used for his horse. The horse is doing all the work and needs the water. If the horse collapses, the man's in a bad way. We keep a close watch on the animals to be sure they perspire freely. That's a healthy condition and means that their bodies are cooling. On the trip into the canyon, we stopped frequently and rested the horses. Also, each man swabbed his animal's mouth to keep it moist. We kept our sun helmets pulled down, our sunglasses on, and our shirts buttoned up to the neck to keep the sun's rays off our bodies, especially the backs of our necks. After about two hours, we reached the bottom of the canyon. Hot here. Man, man, why? This heat is murderous. That's putting it mildly, pal. Let's hold up, fellas. Okay, easy boy. Oh, boy. Loosen the cinch straps and give the horses a chance to relax a bit before we go on. You better give them a small amount of water, too. Uh, okay, we Bill. Bill. You pour the water, Henry, and I'll hold this here bucket. All right, Stumpy. Yeah, just a little bit now, Henry. You only need enough to wet their mouths and throats. We'll give them a good drink after dark. How's that? Yeah, yeah just dandy. I'll give them each a mouthful, then we can go on. Bill, I not see any signs of man here yet. I know. I've been looking around, too. Actually, we're not sure Virgil's down here. The dean said it's only supposition. But we'll have to look thoroughly anyhow. Ah, uh, not right. All right, let's get ready to ride, fellas. Henry and I'll take the west end of the canyon, and you two take the east end. Give a yodel if you find anything. Yeah, we do. All right, right, we'll get right at it. sure is hot down here. I'm really beginning to feel it. Take a drink of water, pal. Not too much. You'll get a waterlogged feeling. It isn't good. Just enough to keep your body from dehydrating. Oh, okay, Bill. Let's ride along way to the west end. There's another trail leading into here. Virgil may have come down it. Uh, okay. How do you feel now? Oh, much better. That's fine. Keep a sharp eye out for anything that belongs to a man. Uh, we find nothing, old-timer. I'm glad for that. Yeah, me too, young feller. It's so hot down here that I could fry an egg on my saddle horn. If Bill and Henry don't find anything, that means his Virgil feller ain't down here. Uh, that make me happy. Hello! Stumpy! Gray Wolf! Hello! We found him! Okay, Bill, we hear you. <laughs> Guess we talk too soon, Gray Wolf. Not what I'm afraid of. We better ride and join Bill and Henry. Ah, he in plenty bad shape. I'll say he is. Another hour would be all over. Let's get him into the shade and give him first aid, fellas. Henry, get a canteen and the first aid kit off a of storm, will you? Yeah, sure, Bill. Right away. All right, let's lift him together, fellas. Carry him over in the shade. Okay, Bill. Uh, I ready. Say when. You all set, Stumpy? You sure am. On the count of three. Okay, one, two. Help, Bill! I'm stuck in quicksand. Quicksand? 
Let's go, fellas. Oh, oh, quicksand. Go, oh, fellas, fellas. Oh. Henry, don't move. Right. You'll go down faster. Gray Wolf, Stumpy, hold my feet. I'm going to stretch myself out and grab him. Okay. Make it fast, Bill. Not real quicksand. Hurry, hurry, Bill. Keep your arms up so I can grab him, Henry. He sink plenty quick. I'll start to sink myself soon. When I grab Henry's hands, you fellas pull away. I'll have to hold my breath because my face will be in the sand. Oh, we do that. Couple of inches more, Bill. There, you got him. Gotcha. Hold tight. We're going to pull you out. Pull, Stumpy. Pull. <laughs> Let's pull it out, fellas. Pull harder. Pull. Hey, I'm free. Are your face feel now, Bill? You have it plenty far into quicksand. That feels okay, Gwilf. But my lungs would burst before Henry hollered he was free. Yeah, it was quite a scare, all right. How'd you get into that there sinkhole, young feller? Oh, I suddenly got awfully lightheaded. Must have staggered into it. Boy, that was close. That's real quicksand. Well, thank the Lord that you're safe. I ain't know somebody that wasn't as fortunate as Henry was. Uh, what are you talking, Virgil. talking about? Virgil. I'm not talking about Virgil, fellas. Okay, you, mean, you mean there was another man and he fell into the oh, quicksand? Wow. Yeah, that's what I mean, pal. Oh, wow. Boy, who, who this? Boy. Well, how'd you find this yeah. out, young feller? Yeah, how come you didn't say something about it before? Yes, Bill. Well, I wasn't sure for a while. Both men wear the same size shoes. I thought that Virgil might have been doubling back on his own trail because he was delirious from the heat. Then I found definite trail signs that there were two men. Oh, not very tragic. One of them died in quicksand. Yes, it is, Trenching Grey Wolf. He must have wandered into the death pit. But we can't worry about him right now. We've got to get Virgil out of here and get him to Naughty Pine Hospital. <laughs> Boy, am I glad to get out of Fossil Canyon. That place gives me the creeps. It even smells like death. Yeah, you can say that again, youngster. That there hole in the ground reminds me of an open grave. Hold it up here, fellas. Okay. Whoa, 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 Storm. Whoa, whoa. Oh, Matilde! Henry, unpack the radio. I'll help Grey Wolf and Stumpy lift Virgil off of Storm. You not take Virgil out by horseback, Bill? No, Grey Wolf. I'm afraid the long ride might do him in. I'll have him picked up by helicopter. Dean, this is Bill Jefferson. Yes, Mr. Jefferson. Have you found him? Yes. He's in Naughty Pine Hospital right now. We flew him back by helicopter. The doctor says we got to him just in time. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Uh, are you going to be at your office for an hour, Dean? Well, um, I was going home, but uh, I can wait for you. Will you please? It's extremely important. While you're waiting for us, will you find out if anybody else went to Fossil Canyon with Virgil? I certainly will. I'll see you in an hour. Right. Goodbye. Let's pile into the car, fellas. We're going to college. That's the story up to date, Dean Sands. Gruesome as it is. Oh, it's terrible. Why can't these young men learn by other people's experiences? 
We didn't take time to check for more evidence as to the identity of the other man because I was primarily concerned with saving Virgil's life. Yes, I understand, Bill. I began checking carefully after you called, and uh, I find that Stanley Grimshaw is missing. Oh? Whether or not he went with Virgil can't be determined. Thanks, Dean. We'll check with the hospital and let you know what we find. Perhaps we can talk with Virgil. I'd like to talk with Virgil, Doctor. I'm sorry, Bill. I can't allow it. But I thought you said we got to Virgil just in time. I'm sorry I made a misleading statement, Bill. What I meant was that life was just about gone, and you found him before it was too late. He's suffering from shock, exposure, heat exhaustion, and sunstroke. I'm sorry, but you can't talk to him. Well, this is extremely important, Doctor. We're sure that another man lost his life in the canyon, but we don't know who this man is. I'd like to help you, Bill, but I've got to think of my patient first. Perhaps in a day or so you can question him. Okay, Doc. I know you would if you thought it was all right. Let's go out and talk to the students, fellas. Say, young fella, can you tell me if Stanley Grimshaw hung around with Virgil Thompson? Well, they're friendly, Ranger. I'd say they palled around together. Did Stanley say anything to you about going to Fossil Canyon? Well, no, he didn't. He's my roommate, too. However, I went home over the weekend. Professor, you hear anything about Stanley and Virgil going to Fossil Canyon together? Mm, I don't recall hearing anything about that, Ranger. If I did, I would have warned them against going through with it. We're up a tree, Bill. Nobody knows a thing about those two. What now? Well, let's go back to the hospital, Henry. Perhaps we can talk to Virgil now. I'm sorry, Bill. Virgil's not responding the way he should. I'm afraid it'll be three days before he's out of the woods. Okay, Doc. But we can't wait three days. Fellas, let's saddle up and go out to the canyon and do our own sleuthing. Virgil and Person X had horses when they got here, fellas. That's right, Sonny. But they let the horses get away. Those two fellas are real tenderfeet. Uh, two men get off horses and walk down into a canyon. Yeah, I wonder why they did that. They should have ridden down into the canyon. Well, perhaps they weren't experienced enough to handle the horses on a steep down grade. Let's ride down and watch for some of their gear along the way. Plenty of trail sign along here. Shouldn't be hard to find some of the gear. Oh, uh, you plenty right, Stumpy. Hey, look up ahead there. There's some gear alongside the trail. Come get on, him bro. Up, get get him. Him. Come on, Come on, boy. Oh, whoa, 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 boy. I'll take this pack. Stumpy, you take the other. Henry, Gray Wolf. Look through the other gear. Oh, we yeah, do, okay, we'll look through the... Hey, hold it. I found something, I think. Yeah, what is it, Bill? Here's a notebook with a name in it. Stanley Grimshaw. Bob, I hope you and your fellow students are now convinced that it takes knowledge and experience to survive out in the wild country. You're right, Mr. Jefferson. I'm thoroughly convinced. Well, I'm glad to hear that I've driven my point home. That's the sole purpose of this lecture. If I can save your lives by talking to you, then my time is well spent. Uh, one more question, please. Go right ahead, Bob. Uh, how'd you close off the canyon? Well, we've put up a fence and a gate around both entrances to the canyon. On each gate is a sign. It reads... Keep out of Fossil Canyon. 
unless you want to become a fossil yourself. That's really sound advice, Bill. Certainly the students of State U should learn from their classmates' tragic experiences. I know that I wouldn't go into Fossil Canyon if I was paid to do it. See you next week for more adventure with... Boys and girls, this is Ranger Bill back again for just a third of a minute with an extra word of thanks to you for joining us today. Hope you'll team up with the Rangers every week at this time when your local station gives us this chance to get together. See you then. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Up in the knotty pine country, there's a terribly deep gash in the earth's surface. This oversized ditch is called Dead Man's Gorge. It's 1,200 feet to the bottom of this monstrous chasm, and Uncle Sam's decided to build a new bridge over it. Ranger Bill is responsible for the construction of the bridge since it's on government land. Of course, we know that Bill's hired bridge builders and engineers to construct the steel giant. Right now, he and Gray Wolf and Stumpy are in the main construction shack talking to the top bridge-building boss, Stony Farwell. Here's the story. They called it the Jinx. Well, you're the best boss I've ever had. It's a real pleasure to work with you. Oh, thanks, Stony. I'm just here to see that things roll along on schedule. You're the man who's building the bridge. Why not want your job for all tea in China, Stony? Well, why, Grey Wolf? How you know bridge going to stay up? Maybe first big wind knock it over. Yeah, you got a good point there, Sonny. And I wouldn't want to be the feller to figure the stress and strains on that there bridge. Not the way the wind takes off down Dead Man's Gorge. Ah, it too bad if engineers not add two and two and get four. <laughs> yeah, you said it, Sonny. That bridge out there would make a lot of pieces to pick up at the bottom. <laughs> Now you fellas are going to make me lose faith in my engineers if you keep on. Actually, all the engineering is checked and double-checked. And a safety factor is added to be on the safe side. Uh, but plenty of good idea. The bridge have to hold extra large fat man as well as extra skinny thin man. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, you'll be catching up to my record if you keep that up, young feller. I like you fellas who laugh at corny jokes. Well, gentlemen, we've got work to do. Uh, Stoney, how's the schedule coming along? Not so good, Bill. Hmm? What do you mean? Well, here, take a look at the schedule yourself. It'll explain better than I can. Mm. Thanks, Stoney. Mm -hmm. well, according to the schedule, you're a week behind. That's right, Bill. How come? I need a good general bridge foreman. Someone who really knows the fine points of getting things done. I just can't do it all myself. Well, is there such a man available? Yes. Who is he? Tom Ferris. Tom Ferris? <laughs> Been a long time since I've seen him. Is he the man we need? I'll say he is. Tom is the best in the field. Well, then, let's get him up here right away. Well, it's not as easy as all that, Bill. Oh? 
Is he employed now? That's the least of my worries. Stoney, will you stop beating around the bush? What's the matter with Tom Ferris? Well, I guess you have a right to know. The men call him a jinx. <laughs> It's mighty cold out on the bridge, and the men get so chilled from the frosty wind and the cold steel that they're given a rest period every hour and a half. There's the stop work signal. The girder setters, the riveters, the bucket men, the structural foremen, the laborers stiffly climb down from the superstructure or up from the substructure and head for the coffee shack. The half-frozen men try to get their blood circulating full steam to drive the cold out of their bodies. Ah, the fragrant aroma of good coffee sifts into their nostrils, and they quickly find their way to the coffee shack in the warm stove. Hey, fellas. What do you want, Tony? I heard a rumor that uh, Tom Ferris is coming to be boss of this job. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you hear of that, Tony? I went to buy Stoney's shack to get a bucket of rivets, and he and a Bill was talking about being late on the schedule. Yeah, yeah, go on. Uh. Well, Bill was giving Stoney the business about us uh, losing the weeks of time. Stoney, he ups and says uh, Tom Ferris be brought in for top foreman. That's all I heard, Pedro. I ain't a wicked for Tom. He's a jinx. That's all right, he's a jinx. Oh, what are you fellas talking about? That's right. I heard that Tom Ferris is the best top bridge foreman in the game. He gets things done. It's all right, Sandy. But as old timers know, when Tom's a boss in the job, there's always a lot of accidents. That's right, Sandy. You younger fellas don't know about the jinx that Tom carries with him. All the kinds of crazy accidents that happen. What are you talking about? Tom, he's a bring a jinx with him. There isn't such a thing as a jinx. That's superstitious nonsense. Maybe it's a what do you say, but I'm not going to work for Tom Ferris. I'd probably end up in the bottom of Dead Man's Gorge. It's right. <laughs> Stoney, what's all this here nonsense about Tom being a jinx? Don't you men know that there ain't no such thing? That's superstitious foolishness. Well, actually, it's not that Tom's a jinx, but the way he handles a man. They call it the jinx. Well, what do you mean by that, Stoney? Well, let me tell you how Tom used to lead his men to accomplish outstanding construction records. All right. I'd appreciate some of the background on Tom. We've met several times, but this I didn't know. When I graduated from engineering school, I worked on the Mid-Mountain Bridge as a junior engineer. Tom was a top foreman on that job. Tom had a way of getting things done. He led his men, and they worked like Trojans and didn't know it. They wanted to beat the schedules. The Mid-Mountain Bridge was completed three weeks ahead of time. There was a clean spirit of competition. The riveters tried to catch up with the beam setters. The painters were pushing the riveters. The men were happy, and they were proud of their work. Building a bridge was more than a job to them. It, it was an art. And then Tom changed. He grew tense and impatient. He soon passed this tension and impatience on to his men. Uh, not, not good. Men have accidents that way. You said it, Grey Wolf. Tom began needling the men into getting more work done instead of leading them. If the riveters were setting a thousand rivets a day, he'd needle or shame them into setting twelve hundred. Yeah, somebody should have called him for that. Uh, Tom was young then, wasn't he, Stoney? Yes, he was, Bill. But he hasn't changed any with maturing age. Tom can get up and set rivets like a madman. And therefore, he thinks that the rest of the men should do the same. Not all men can work like Tom. That's right, Grey Wolf. But you can't tell Tom that. Now, that's strange. What's strange, young feller? Tom professed to be a Christian when I last talked to him. In fact, he was walking very close with the Lord. Well, maybe he did then, Bill. Well, that's changed now. Perhaps this change came because he's away from the Lord now. Well, it could be. You might say he's no more than a human machine that's never satisfied with the amount of work done. He's lost his easygoing quality of leadership that makes his men want to work. We need Tom, don't we, Stoney? Yeah. Tom's the only answer to our getting back on schedule. But Tom won't do us much good since the men refuse to work for him. 
You're absolutely sure of that, Stoney? Absolutely. Then get Tom up here as fast as you can. Leave the rest to me. Okay. I'll go after him first thing in the morning. Oh, by the way, Bill. Hmm? Who's going to tell the men? You are. Quiet down. You all know by now that we're behind schedule. You also know that this can't go on. The only answer to our problem was to get the one foreman who could do the job. I think most of you know Tom Ferris. Tom's going to be the general bridge foreman on this job starting as of now. We're all familiar with Tom's ability to get things done. Since our construction is... A week behind, we've asked Tom to help us bring the work up to schedule in a reasonable length of time. Tom, do you want to say anything to the fellas? Nothing more than I'm glad to be here. I know we'll all work together as a team and build this bridge ahead of schedule. And so what do you think, Tom? I ain't working for you. Not no more. You're a jinx. As you said it. Yeah, Pedro's right. I'm quitting too. Pedro, you know better than to talk like that. You've never had an accident on the job? That's a matter, Tom. I ain't no sticking around until I get one either. Oh, that's yeah, right. That's right. Pedro's right. You're not. It's a long way to the bottom of the gorge. I'm not waiting till I'm on the bottom looking up. I quit. What's the matter? Have you lost your nerve, Tony? When it comes to the work with you, I have. I'd rather be a live coward than a dead hero. You're a jinx, Tom, and you'll know it. All right, fellas, let's quiet down. Fellas, I think we're letting ourselves be influenced by a lot of things we've heard about Tom. Some of you have been on jobs with him before and seen some of the accidents. You say something at that time. Yeah, that's right. I was seen of the accidents a lot, some. No doubt you have, Tony. But we must remember this. Your work is hazardous. Yeah, it's true. It's a hazardous. Accidents occur 99 times out of 100 because somebody was careless. Carelessness such as not checking the scaffolding to make sure it's safe, being in too much of a hurry, ignoring warning bells and verbal warnings. There are dozens of ways a person can be careless. Sometimes they'll get away with it, and sometimes they won't. I think he's got something there, fellas. You're superstitious if you believe Tom's a jinx or that he's bringing a jinx with him. Like stopping and turning back because a black cat crossed your path. Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds absurd, but what you're accusing Tom of is the same basic thing, isn't it? You're right, Bill. I'll work for Tom. Now what you say makes the horse sense, Bill. I'll stick on a job. I want to be a stubborn mule, but the first accident that comes, I'm a leave here. Unless the accident's to me. I'm glad you fellas are thinking straight. What do you say to Tom taking over first thing in the morning? What's the matter up there, Lefty? Ah, the lip on this skirt is not straight, Tom. Can you set it with one bolt? Yeah, I can do it. Well, do it then. Don't stand there yakking. You got another beam coming behind you. Hey, Tony! Well, what do you want, Tom? You got to rip it faster. The beam setters are getting way ahead of you. Those bolts can't take too much strength. I don't know, Superman of us. I'm going as fast as I can. Don't give me the business, Tony. You're the best riveter in the country. Step it up, man, or those bull and bees will fall on your head. Sven, you're holding up the other half of the suspension because you haven't got the footings blown out of the gorge wall. Your charges aren't heavy enough. You don't put them in the thumb. If you make the charges bigger, it'll be pretty dangerous around here. Nonsense. Make the fuses longer and holler the warnings louder. Well, Bill, look at the way the work's getting done. 
Now, the end of next week will be a day ahead of schedule, thanks to you. <laughs> thanks to me? Yeah, you're the man who talked the men into working for Tom. Well, there wasn't anything to that, Stoney. Tom's the man who's getting the men to produce the goods. And he's doing it without accidents. Boy, that man can sure hit the ball. You know, it's nothing short of a miracle the way the bridge is going up. Well, I'm certainly pleased the way things are going. But you know, Tom's not himself, Stoney. He's tense, too tense. He never relaxes, even when he's eating. Now, he's not the Tom I knew five years ago. Stoney, Billy, it's an accident on the bridge. I assure you're all right, Jack. I'm okay, Tom. Really, I am. I think you'd better see the dog before... You have an accident, Jack? Yeah. I don't know what happened yet, Stoney. Jack's bosun chair gave way and he fell 20 feet. Are you all right? Sure, boss. I'm okay. Well, you let the jock doc check you over before you go back to work. Jack! Is that the way you had your block and tackle tied to the superstructure? Yeah, that's right. I want to get this beam torched up before quitting, Tom, and I... I thought the rig would hold me. Well, you got a lot of nerve topping your rig like that. What's even worse is that Tom gets blamed for accidents that happen because of careless birds like you. I don't let this happen again or I'll fire you. You understand? Sure, boss. Sure. I understand. <laughs> Pin the accident right on Jack's carelessness in front of the men, Stoney. I'm glad I was able to, Tom, for your sake. Yeah. You don't know how this accident thing haunts me day and night. I don't even dream about the men having accidents. Yeah, you better take it easy, young fella. You'll have a case of nerves. You can't go around and hold men by hand. All you can do is tell them to be careful and watch for those who aren't. Oh, uh, I don't know. I'm beginning to wonder if there isn't some truth about me being a jinx. Hey, Pedro. Hey, Pedro, the bridge, she's a go up like a growing a boy, huh? Yes, Tony, the bridge, she's a growing almost too fast. <laughs> Pretty soon we have to change it from knee pants to longer britches, huh? <laughs> All the time you make a joke, Pedro. Yeah, why not? Uh, Tom says we's one day ahead of schedule. All the men are proud of that. Huh, why shouldn't we be? Takes a good foreman and good men to do what we've done. Sandy, you're right. We do it without accident except for Jack fall down from the bosun ladder. And that was his own fault. Say, uh, you know something, fellas? I uh, know. What should we know, Pedro? I think a bill is a right. There ain't no such a thing as a jinx. We all got to be careful and nobody's going to hurt. That's right, Pedro. It's a jinx that Tom is supposed to have, I think, is going to fall away and never come back. Tony's right. The jinx appears to be going far away, but I don't know about it not coming back. In the superstitious minds of the men, that is. Bad weather is descending over the knotty pine area, and Dead Man's Gorge is not excluded. Strong winds, rain turning to ice and snow. Add these up, and building a bridge becomes an almost impossible task. Tom slows the work down. All the men have to use safety belts as much of the time as possible. But in spite of the nasty weather, the construction must go on unless it gets so bitter cold the men would stick to the steel right through their clothing. Tom's worried and apprehensive. Then one after another, things begin to happen. Ease the beam down carefully, Max. The swindle will wrap it right around that pier. I'm watching it, Tom. I said watch it, Max, or you're not cliff right off that setting joint. Hey, hey, do not knock him off. No, not yet. Keep your right lever a little. Pull the right lever. The wind's saying the beam right at cliff. Pull the right lever, Max. Oh, God, the wind's too strong. I can't stop it. Get that bucket, Pedro, quick! I, I can't do it! Hey, I look out of below! Hot rivets! Run for her, fellas! Well, 
What's my leg look like, Tom? It's broken, Lefty. I thought so. Feels like it's been smashed to smithereens. Let me see the rope burn you got, Sandy. Pretty, isn't it? If I hadn't slid down the rope, I'd have been right where that bolt snapped. Though he's not dead, Tony, he probably wishes he were the way he's smashed up. I'm sorry to hear about Louie. You're sorry? How do you think I feel? Oh, take it easy, Tom. That's easy to say. First Cliff, then the bucket of hot rivets burns half a dozen men, then Sandy and now Louie. Oh, I forgot Lefty with a smashed leg. I understand how you feel, Tom. What do you say we stop construction for the rest of the week? Maybe the We won't have to stop work. What? The boys just walked off the job. All except six. I see. The jinx again, huh? What do you think the men call it? Call me. Well, there's only one thing to do. Is there? Yes, I'm going to call Bill. Well, that's a whole story, Bill. You can see the six men on the bridge from here. Seven with Tom. Perhaps Tom should have stopped operations during this foul weather. Bill, we've got a contract with a penalty clause in it if we don't finish on schedule. Tom did slow down the pace of the work. He even gave the men extra rest periods and worked them in shifts several of the really nasty days. Our men are used to working in foul weather. That's part of the job. Yeah, that's right, Stoney. What do you think about it? Well, I know you'll blow a fuse when I say this. But I wonder if maybe there isn't something to this jinx business with Tom. Hmm? Now you too, Stoney? Well, what else can I think, Bill? Something's wrong with Tom. He radiates this deep-down trouble of his right into the men. I don't call a man a jinx who's fighting with himself. How are we going to find out what's bothering Tom? Perhaps I know what this trouble is. Do you really, Bill? I think so. Will you let me talk to Tom privately in your office? My office is yours. I'll send Tom in. Now, Tom, what's eating you? What do you mean, what's eating me? There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing besides this terrible fear I've developed of accidents to my men. Tom, don't try to buffalo me. I've worked with men all my life, all kinds of men. I know them pretty well. What are you getting at, Bill? I've told you what was wrong with me. You only told me half the story, Tom. What do you mean? Why are you fighting with yourself? Why, uh... You well... told me a long time ago that you were a Christian, Tom. Can you still look me in the eye and say you're playing square with the Lord? Well, I... That is... Well, you see, Come on, I... talk like a man, Tom. Are you still letting the Lord run your life, or are you trying to do it on your own? Tom, if you straighten things out between you and the Lord, then things will straighten out between you and your men. Well, Tom? All right, Bill. You win. What's the use of fighting the Lord any longer? You're right. I haven't been letting him help me build bridges. And I've been beating my head against a stone wall. You aren't telling me a thing, Tom. I knew that the first day you came on the job. You did? How? You aren't leading your men, Tom. You needle them into jealous competition with one another. They've contracted your restlessness and impatience. Oh, they do good work. But it's not the satisfying, high-quality work they could do. You see, Tom, a boss radiates his thoughts to his people. 
this happens faster by the boss's actions than his words. I never thought of it that way. Now that I do, I know you're right. Tom, are you ready to straighten things out between yourself and the Lord? Yeah, Bill. Let's have a good old-fashioned prayer meeting right here. Okay. Are you ready to go all the way with the Lord? Yes, Bill. The Lord's got to help me build bridges again, or... Or I'll never make it. Fellas, what I'm about to say may shock some of you, but I'm going to carry it out anyhow. <coughs> this morning and each morning after this, we're going to have prayer before we begin our day's work. What? Prayer? What do you I know some of you don't like it. You can pray with me or you can leave as you wish. In any event, I'm going to pray. If any of you want to leave, please do so now. There'll be no hard feelings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you keep us safe from accidents as we go out on the bridge today. Help me to... Hey, Sandy, it's good to see you. What's the news? Pedro, I hear good news from the grapevine. Tom's a changed man. Uh, I hear the same thing, Sandy. You did? Yeah, maybe I go back to work in the morning, eh? I left it. I just stopped by to tell you I go back to work for Tom. He's a different, like a night from a day. That's right, Tony. As soon as my leg mends, I'm going back, too. Well, Tony, how about my old job? Can I have it back now that Tom's acting like a human being? Tom, I'd like to work for you again. Tom, how are things going? Oh, wonderfully well, Stumpy. The men are happy and they work together like real teammates. Yeah, the boys are bragging they'll finish the bridge a week ahead of time. Uh, you're much happier now, too, Tom. How can a fellow help but be happy when he's in good fellowship with the Lord? Oh, say, uh, I better keep an eye on that batch of concrete the boys are going for. See you fellas later. <laughs> Hey, Tony, don't you think a Mac Woods is a crater pretty close to painting scaffold? Oh, that's all right, Pedro. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't want him to work that close to me. A Mac, he can put a hook right in your pocket and not a scratch. Yeah? It's a pretty big hook. Oh, never your mind. Just set Tony some rivets, eh, Pedro? Okay. Hey, Sandy, throw some hot ones, eh? Here they come. I'll push him right here. We finish it to be my tooth sweet. Flatten the river to Tony. Watch that crane, Max. What are you trying to do? Knock me out of hell. Hey, Josh, you got to put him out of right now. I'm sorry, Josh. I try to keep away from the step. No better. I'll take it out with Tom. I don't blame Josh for being ashore. It's a long way down there. Well, let's not worry about that. Tony wants you to set the river so we can get some work done. She's a lunchtime, Pedro. Hey, let's quit work, huh? You say, hey, hey, look at it, Josh! Uh, hey, the crane! Uh, fuck! Uh, fuck, Jeff! Uh, You're gonna uh, I'm a no kind of look at it. Hey, fellas, look! Josh is okay! Hey, hey look at him, Tony. He's the same! Oh, it's a great day. Hey, Josh, he's a catch a rope and a hang on like a crazy. Hey, <laughs> That was a close one, Bill. I'll say it was, Sandy. 
The rope saved the painter from a bad fall. Well, you know, Tony, just to what do we think everything's going to be finer than this happens? Uh, so what? The painter didn't have fallen, did he? He's a grab of the rope, he's a safe, huh? Hey, that's right. That means a jinx, he's a broke. No, Pedro. That means that God has answered prayer. Yes, Bill, that was the Lord's answer to prayer, all right. He has strange ways of doing things sometimes. That is, they may be strange to us. But then the Lord's ways are always the best ways, aren't they? We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Knotty Pine, as you know, is in the heart of some pretty rugged country. Because of the difficult terrain, there are two transport companies who have battled back and forth for years. The railroad, during winter months, gets the freight because it can keep a better schedule than the Canyon City truck lines can. But the railroad can't give door-to-door -door service like the trucks. So, in the good weather months, Leonard Grant keeps his trucks rolling day and night. Spence Niehoff and Leonard Grant don't know it yet, but they're soon going to have to get their heads together in teamwork, which neither man will do. Let's find out how Bill and the fellas handle two stubborn men in the story, Piggyback. Hey, Gordon, there's a signal from the caboose. It's Spence. Yes, that old ball of fire one now. Ah, he wants more speed. Now, what's he think I'm pulling? A load of kitty wagons? I got 50 freight cars I'm towing. He doesn't like a district superintendent. What should I signal back? Tell him to get out behind the caboose and push. <laughs> you and your humor. Signal full high ball, and that's the best we can do until we get up this grade. Okay, I'll say. Hey, there's a truck in the crossing ahead. Trucks and cows on the track, they're all the same. That's probably some broken down old crate and the driver can't get it going. That's no crate. That's a Canyon City truck. Our old enemy, huh? Yeah, maybe I'll get a medal if I split it in two. Hey, you're joking. Yeah, him. The old ball of fire's gonna be real happy about this. Like that truck's front wheels are jammed in the crossing. And here comes Spence. Look at he cut. Whee! <laughs> Old ball of fire's happen mad, eh? Look at him come. <laughs> Just like one of them big jackrabbits. Yeah, we'd better get out in front before he gets here, which will be soon. <laughs> What's the matter with your truck? The motor fall out? Don't get wise, Superintendent. If your crummy railroad would fix the grade crossing, this would never happen. For your information, truck driver, my crummy railroad ain't interested in fixing crossing grades for blind men. How'd you get your chauffeur's license if you can't see a hole in the road? Listen, wise guy, one more crack like that and you'll have to see your dentist, pronto. Wait till my boss hears about this. No, I'm not afraid of Leonard Grant or any dozen of you truck drivers. Now get that thing out of the way or we'll make hamburger out of it. Ha, <laughs> don't make me laugh. I'm not moving until the record gets here. 
I radioed for help, and the boys will be here in about an hour. You don't think you're going to hold us up for an hour, do you? I'll sue your company if you do. I got perishables and fast freight on this load. Hey, we've got some heavy jacks in the caboose, Super. I think we can get this truck out of the hole without any trouble. Well, okay. I'm going back to the caboose. I can't stand blind truck drivers. Why, you arrogant section hand. I ought to bash your face in for that remark. You take it easy, son. He's their boss. We have trouble now liking him. How do you think we'd feel if we had to look at him with his face all pushed in? <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. I'll get the crew to help me bring those jacks up, and we'll have you out in no time. Say, that'll be fine. I don't want to hold you fellas any longer than necessary. I'm sure glad that all railroad men aren't like that superintendent. Hey, thanks, son. You know how it is. The old ball of fire probably forgot to take his high blood pressure medicine this morning. <laughs> You know, boys and girls, it never pays to jump the gun and unjustly accuse people of doing things intentionally. Let's follow Ned and Gordon as they roll along. Whoops, I should say they were rolling along. Right now, the freight is switching cars onto sidings in Knotty Pine. But in the process of cutting out half a dozen cars, the freight train has blocked the North Highway for almost half an hour. Three big transport trucks owned by Canyon City Truck Company are waiting for the freight to move so they can be on their way. Big Jim Mandel leans on his air horn as he grows impatient. Hey, when are you guys going to break that train and let us through? Ah, keep your shirt on. We'll be through in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Break that train or I'm going to call my boss. Go ahead and call your boss. And quit playing with that tin horn. I'll give you tin horn, Brakeman. Don't say I didn't warn you. Big Jim to dispatcher. Big Jim to dispatcher. Come in. Over. What's the trouble, Jim? We're being held up by a switching freight on the North Highway. I've asked the crew to break the train so we can get through, but they refuse. Yeah, not much we can do about it, Jim. Except get hot under the collar. But we've been here half an hour already, and they say it'll be 20 minutes more. Can't you call the police and have them send a squad to make them break open the train? I don't think we ought to do that. I mean, don't think it'll take longer than 20 minutes or so. I'll, I'll clear the track if they don't. Then we'll call the police. Okay, you're the doctor. Hey, uh, they're breaking open the train now. They must have seen me talking into the mic. See you later, dispatch. The Canyon City Truck Company is owned by Leonard Grant. Len is a hard-working executive who's well-experienced in the trucking business. But there's one thorn in his side that keeps him more or less in a state of perpetual displeasure. This is the railroad. Len's made up his mind that Spence Niehoff isn't going to get the freight business this winter. Let's drop into Len's office as he and the dispatcher talk things over. Spence isn't going to get my business no matter what he pulls. So we really got off to a bad start today, Chief, huh? Yeah, but with the new equipment with that we've got on the trucks, we'll give him and his Tunerville choo-choo a real run for its money. I don't know about that. Roads get real bad once it starts to ice and snow. Ah, what do you mean? We've got sanding equipment on all the trucks. And having them travel in threes gives them enough manpower to change tires. The new tractors have the special low, low gear for inching over bad ice. We can keep in constant touch with our drivers by radio. I don't think we'll have to give up this winter, Lee. I hope not. Uh, Were the boys able to fix Pete's truck after he hit the bad crossing grade? Yeah. Fixed it on the spot. Fine. Who's rolling where today? Here's the dispatching schedule. Hmm. Group one rolling east. Group two southwest. Good. Group three will take off at noon. Pete's on a short haul and be back to join group four. Let's see. They take off at supper time, eh? Mm-hmm. They should be well on their way by midnight. How's the weather? Well, not very good. Group one will run into ice at Breezy Ridge. 
Group two will hit snow at Middletown. That's all right. The boys are equipped for any kind of weather or roads they come up against. I don't know about this road, Will. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Want me to take the wheel for a spell? Driving this slow can hypnotize you. Oh, I'll be all right. Thanks for the offer. You better call dispatch and tell them we're slowing down. Right. We're going to do for a time check anyhow. Boy, if this keeps up, we won't be going far, that's for sure. Group under dispatcher. Group under dispatcher. Over. Go ahead, Will. We're reducing speed. Road's getting nicer by the mile. Okay. Do the best you can to maintain schedule without risking your lives in the cargo. Where are you now? Well, we're coming down the east slope from uh, from Breezy Ridge. Okay. Next time, check at midnight. Over and out. Right, over and out. We'll do the best we can to keep on schedule, he says. <laughs> what do you think we're driving? Cable car? Yeah, he's getting just like Len. They think that we can drive like crazy men just because they pay us a bonus. Well, the boss can keep his bonus when the roads are like this. I don't hanker to jackknife off this road. You and me, too. It's a long way to the bottom, and we haven't got parachutes. Snow beating against the windshield. <laughs> Not quite yet, Nick. I'll drive another ten miles or so, and then you can take the wheel. Okay, I'll be glad to take over any time. Wonder what Big Jim and his group doing. Hey, there, there's a big one ahead. Boy, you're not kidding. That is a big one. How many drifts have we hit so far? Uh, I stopped counting a while back. at that time. So did I. We won't get through if we hit any bigger than that. How are the boys behind making out? Oh, they're doing okay. All they have to do is follow. We're doing the flowers. isn't going to like this. Well, tell the boss to come out here on his ice skates and drive the trucks himself. Let me talk to Big Jim. I'll show him who's boss in this outfit. Jim, can you hear me? Uh, are you joking? You don't need a radio. I can hear you hollering all the way out here. But we're not moving these trucks. At least not until daylight. Now you listen to me and listen hard. Either you drive those trucks or I'll know the reason why. I'm paying you guys a big fat bonus to drive, not to sit around and bay at the moon. You tell that to the rest of the men with you. Understand? Okay, we'll try it. The trucks jackknivers get out of control. We're ditching them pronto. Okay? Listen, you hug the mountain coming down, do you hear? Hug that mountain. I'll get sand to you by helicopter as soon as it's daylight enough to fly. Okay. If the truck starts to go, we're flying too, right out of the cab. We'll give it a try. Over and out. Over and out. Aren't you overdoing this, Len? You're asking the impossible from some mighty good man. Who's running this company, you or me? I'm not losing my contract to the railroad if I have to drive trucks myself. Wow. I agree with Lee, Lee the dispatcher. Leonard Grant's overdoing it. And unknown to Leonard, there's somebody else who feels the same way. Bill, Stumpy, and Henry have taken in the whole conversation by means of the radio and the snowmobile. Rangers are cruising about five miles away from Big Snake Drive in the snowmobile. They're on a routine inspection trip, and when they're out in the wilderness country, they often ride with the radio on just to pick up any calls for help. Say, Len Grant must be out of his mind. He can't make his men risk their lives like that. Uh, he can't, but he is. Bill, can't you do something to stop those trucks? Yes, I can, pal. 
I can keep them from moving on a technical charge. Huh? What technical charge? Well, they're out of sand. And they're also a hazard to traffic on the road because they haven't any means to control the big transports if they get away from them. Besides, Big Snake Drive goes right through the center of a national park. Hey, yeah, that's right. Are we going to stop those trucks soon? Right now. It'll take us a while to get onto the highway from here. Oh, not too long. Hold on to your hats, fellas. I'm opening up to full speed. You fellas work the spotlights. Well, fellas, this is as far as I'm going for the night. Is that all right for the rest of you? Yeah, that's all right. I'm not risking my life on this glass for the boss or anybody else. Look down the road. The headlights show up nothing but a sheen as far as you can see. Hey, wait a minute. What kind of a motor is that? Sounds like a small plane flying low. Well, it is a small plane. The pilot must be crazy. Why, he's flying down the highway. I know what it is. That's a Ranger snow car. <laughs> Boy, am I dumb. I wonder what they want. I wonder what the Rangers do not hear this time. Here goes. Howdy, fellas. Oh, Hi, what's Ranger. up, Ranger? How come you're on the highway with your snow car? I'm here to take away your road rights. You can't travel this highway. What do you mean? We can't drive. What, what, what are you talking about? Oh, just keep your temperatures where they belong. It's nothing you've done. It's what your boss is trying to make you do. You've heard about it already? <laughs> we heard the whole thing while it was going on, Sonny. You know, I look like an old grizzly, but we use newfangled contraptions. We got one of them things you call a radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we cruise around with our radio on when we're out in the wilderness. We picked up the whole conversation. Bill here is the boss ranger of these parts, and he's not going to let you fellows risk your lives. Oh, we're already parked for the night, ranger. No use going any farther until daylight. You're not going any farther, period. Until the ice gets off this road. You think it's bad here? Wait till you get ten miles from here. Oh, it sounds like you fellows have been over there. Oh, not yet. We know the pattern. Now lock your trucks and set your brakes. We'll take you back to Canyon City in our snowmobile. Leonard Grant there, dispatcher. This is Ranger Bill Jefferson. Yeah, he's here. Hold on just a minute. Hey, you better put your earplugs in, Sonny. I don't think he's going to be very happy when you tell him what you've done. Bill Jefferson, this is Leonard Grant. What's happened to my trucks on Big Snack Drive? Nothing. I've got all your drivers here in the snowmobile with me, and I'm bringing them back to Canyon City right now. What? For what reason? I'll explain that to you when I get back. I just want you to know what's going on so you won't fear the worst when they don't answer your radio call. You tell me now, Ranger. Take my drivers back to the trucks. I'm running this outfit, not you. Take them back right now, do you hear? All I hear is you yelling your lungs out. If you're not careful, I'll stop and secure a warrant for your arrest. Canyon City Truck Company, Leonard Grant speaking. Boss, uh, this is Nick. Why are you talking on a phone, Nick? How come you're not using your truck radio? Well, me and the boys are in a ranch house about 20 miles outside of Middletown. What are you doing there? You're not stalled, too. Where are the trucks? They're covered with snow. We also got a shifted load on the second truck. The truck almost jackknifed, and Larry was about to pull out of it when the load shifted. We can't move because of the snow drift. Guess we'll have to wait until we're plowed out. Hey, boss, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Nick. Wait for the plows, then straighten out the shifted load before you go on. Goodbye. Lee, Nick, and his outfit are having troubles just the same as Big Jim. Send out for coffee and sandwiches. I'm staying here until that ranger gets in with the boys. (laughs) 
Bill Jefferson, I want to know on what grounds you did this. You're buttoned into private business. Be thankful that I did. If the state trooper has caught you doing this, you'd be in real hot water, my friend. Doing what? I'm not breaking the law. You aren't. Oh, you're an old hand at plucking in these mounds. You know the law. If my men want to take chances, that's their business, not yours. Perhaps. But you fail to realize that I overheard you threaten your men in a radio conversation. Oh, is that breaking the law? They could have quit their jobs. Len, you amaze me. Come on off it, man. You know very well that you'd be charged with manslaughter if anything happened to your men or to the occupants of another vehicle. You created a hazard to public safety on a highway. The hazard has the potential of killing one or more people. What's the matter with you? Have you lost your mind? Excuse me. Yes. Yes, this is Leonard Grant. Yes, Mr. Todd. How are you, sir? Oh, uh, yes, I, I know. The trucks haven't arrived. No, sir, I can't make any promises. We're doing the best we can to get your shipment to you. It may be a few days, but... The railroad? Oh, I don't think you should change, sir. I'll get your shipment to you if I have to bring it out by helicopter. That's right, sir. No, sir, there shouldn't be any more delay. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Goodbye. Boy, you sure fixed me fine. I can sue you for this. Hello. Oh, yes, Mr. Peabody. No, sir, the shipment won't arrive today. But, sir, Mr. Peabody, let me explain. No, sir, you can't get better service from the railroad. Good day, Mr. Peabody. My fault again? No, it isn't. I'm sorry I'm acting the way I am, but I can't seem to control myself when I see good contracts going out the window. If my trucks are five minutes late, my accounts start talking about the railroad. Len, I'd like to help you. I can see now that you and Spence Niehoff are at it again. Glad to listen if you'd like to talk. Here, uh, have some coffee and a sandwich. The man thinks better when he's not famished. Bill... You're nobody's fool. I know that. Yes, I've got a lot on my mind to unload, and I've got some serious problems. Ah, but why should I bother you with them? Why should you be interested in helping me? It's my job to help people. My duty is a ranger and as a Christian. You really mean that, don't you? Yes, I do. All right, here goes. I've got to talk to somebody. I can't think of anybody better qualified to help me than you. So, now you've heard the whole gruesome story. Have you tried to come to some agreement with Spence? Yes, several times. But you know him. He hates truckers. He won't lift a finger to help. Probably feels the same way about truckers helping the railroad. Yes, I will honestly admit that I haven't much use for the railroad. What's the answer? This cutthroat business is gradually putting me out of business. Last year I lost three good accounts to Spence. But he isn't making a red cent on them, actually. He can't give shipper to receiver door service. Yet in the winter months, he can get the stuff into a nearby siding. That's more than I can say. Well, you heard what happened on the phone. I think you know the answer to your problem as well as I do, Len. You mean work out a deal with Spence? Right. Uh, I know he wouldn't do it, but what do you have in mind? Have you ever heard of trailer on a flat car service? You mean piggyback? Yeah. It's been tried in the east. It's worked out very well. But the railroad's got its own trucks on that deal. If they bring piggyback service out here, I'm a dead duck. Sure you are, if you wait for it to happen. Bill, I get what you're driving at. I've got the trucks, so why not start the ball rolling before anybody else does? Well, now you're talking like a progressive businessman. Spare a few minutes? Well, as I live and breathe. Close the door and sit down. What brings a trucker into my office? 
I hope it's not the usual fall and spring battle we have, because I'm not listening. I have an idea how we can end the battle permanently, and to our mutual advantage. Oh, you don't say. What uh, stroke of genius is this? Piggyback service. You supply the flat cars to haul my trailers, and my tractors will give the door-to-door service. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, Leonard Grant, you make me laugh. The moon will be made of green cheese when the time comes for me to work a deal like that with any trucker. You uh, must really have your back to the wall to propose such a crazy idea as that. I knew I was wasting my time to come here. You haven't got a brain cell working or you'd see the advantages to both of us. I've got enough cells working to know better than to help a trucker. Makes me feel uh, awfully bad, though, that you're being forced out of business, uh, But that's life, I guess. It's too bad you can't compete with me. But, uh, well, business success is survival of the fittest. You won't even hear me out? I'm a busy man. I've got lots of freight contracts to work on. You'll be out of business soon, so why should I bother with you? first defeat gets you down. You know better than that. Pick yourself up by your suspenders and fight for your new idea. But, Bill, trailer on a flat car service involves the railroad. If I can't get Spence to even listen to me, then I'm licked for good. I might as well go out of business right now. You know what I do if I can't get the little cogs in the wheel of a large organization to help me? You'd go to the big cogs. You said it, my friend, and I wouldn't waste time either. Bill, you're right again. I'll write a letter to the president of the railroad right away. I'll approach him on the advantages he'd have by using my idea, since I have special equipment already for this part of the country. Then hit Spence where it hurts. I don't follow you. Come on now, you know what I mean. There's more than one way to skin a cat, you know. Sure there is, Bill. I get it. I'll work through my customers. They can bring pressure on him to make him see the light of day. Well, this is pretty new to me. Um, I'll have to think it over. I realize it'll take a few days or even a week to get this new plan organized. But the moment you're ready to start, then... But I'm not really sure that I... I want this door-to-door piggyback service as soon as I can get it. Len has really come up with something. Why, it'll solve all my shipping problems, then, and it'll help your railroad as far as that goes. Um, well, I want to take some yes, time... Yes, sir, to... I like this idea. Len asked me if I was interested So I've told him and I'm telling you Just get the piggyback service going And I'm going to give you both more business Than you know what to do with Well, thank you, but I... Spence, I want piggyback service as fast as possible Oh, what brings you here? Have a seat. You uh, know what's bringing me here. What do you mean? All those phone calls from your customers. And then I have a letter here from the president of the railroad. Well, now I know what you're talking about. I wrote to him, but he hasn't answered me. I'm bringing his answer. Oh? What is his answer? Well, uh... I'm to work out the details of piggyback service with you at once, if not sooner. And uh, we're to use your trucking equipment and get the operation running within one week. That is five business days. Wonderful, Spence, for both of us. Yes, uh, <clears throat> that uh, isn't all he has to say. Yes? I got the worst balling out of my railroading career for being so bullheaded. He says I should have work this out sooner. I I should have waited until you came to him. Uh, I didn't tell him I had approached you on the subject. I know you didn't. That man can read between the lines. He wouldn't be president if he couldn't. Len, um, what do you say we bury the hatchet? Why, I'd be glad to. Fact is, I was hoping you'd suggest it. Piggyback's done more for me than solve freight hauling problems. 
that showed me that a bald head like myself ain't going to last long until I learn how to cooperate and get along with people. Sometimes even with my competitors. <laughs> See you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. You know, there's one good point about winter. Despite the cold weather and the snow, winter gets rid of the pesky skeeters. Oh, the mosquito's a little fellow, all right, but I've never known such a little creature who can be such a big pest. Of course, there aren't any of the pint-sized buzz bombs around Naughty Pine now. They've all been frozen out. But in today's story, which takes place in the summer, our rangers are soon going to get their necks full of the pests as they're called to Central City a city in the heart of the Southern Forest District. What do you say we travel south ahead of the fellas and hear the story, Sleeping Death? Right now, Dr. Amos Midge stands outside a hospital room pondering the symptoms of one of his patients. He talks with his intern, who is completely puzzled as to what the diagnosis can possibly be. Dr. Midge, I'm stumped. I'd give a lot to know what's wrong with that man. I think you know, Doctor. Why don't you tell me? Yes, I know what it is. It's just that I can't believe it. It's a very unscientific remark. I know. It's the dread of an epidemic that I'm thinking about right now. This horrible disease is carried by our little friend, the mosquito. Mosquito, huh? I know it's not malaria. It couldn't be elephantitis, could it? No, it's not. It's sleeping sickness. It's 50 miles over to the town of Carter. It's there that Dr. Louis LaForge talks with an ambulance attendant in the emergency room of the General Hospital. Both men have a grave look on their faces. Some more sleeping sickness, Dr. LaForge? Yes, Ben. It makes the fifth case you've brought in this week. It isn't even a week, just three days. Why are we finding it here in this area of the States? It certainly is rare, but not impossible. They had an outbreak in Indiana not so long ago. What's the cure? <laughs> Profound question, my friend. The cause we know, but the cure we aren't sure of. Some respond, others do not. Those that don't just kind of sleep on and on like living dead. Now let's take another trip to another hospital located to the west of Central City and look in on a staff meeting of the Morris Clinic and Research Foundation. Professor Joel Morris is presiding. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we must call a meeting of all the doctors within a hundred miles of our institution. 
It has to be determined at once the extent and the seriousness of this sleeping sickness. I hope our fears will not be substantiated. Believe me, I never hoped and prayed for anything in my life more than that this sleeping sickness be restricted to a few people. But we must find out. When do we plan to have the meeting? I'm calling the meeting for Saturday morning. Oh, it's short notice, but we can't afford the delay of a weekend. Our office staff will send special delivery letters to everyone at once and telephone the doctors living too far out. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there isn't any need to use valuable time in surveying further the number of sleeping sickness cases you're now treating as we're all very much aware that there's but one topic of conversation among us. I agree, Joel. I'd like the chair to appoint committees immediately so we can formulate plans to combat this epidemic. I'll second that. Yes, I, that's I, good. I, 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 very well, gentlemen. I, I think that's a wise decision. Um, I, I would like to ask Drs. LaForge uh, and Dr. Midge to join me on plans for mapping preventative measures. And Dr. Klondike... Paperwork is necessary to efficient planning, but it doesn't get the job of killing the disease carriers done. That's right, Lewis. But now we've an idea of the area over which the epidemic is spread. Our pencil efforts are ended. Now we're ready for action. Yes, and in record time. I'll call the mayor and the health commissioner and ask them to meet with us in half an hour. I only hope they have the man and equipment to get... According to the map we've drawn... We've taken in the counties involved, Mayor Peters, and we want to spray this whole area. That's a pretty big order, Dr. Mitch. You mean you can't do it, Mayor? We can do it, Dr. LaForge. It'll take a couple of weeks to cover the area you gentlemen have marked off. Two weeks? That's right. Gentlemen, the mayor isn't telling stories. We have mosquito abatement equipment, but it's small scale. and It takes us at least two weeks to spray the city under normal control measures, working the men eight hours a day. Commissioner, this is extremely urgent. We must spray this area at once. And not this area only. We've got to spray the whole country for 50 miles around and do it quickly. We need more equipment. We need it right now. The longer we wait to kill the pests, the more sleeping sickness cases will break out. Yes, this can't be an ordinary spraying job. Gentlemen, I know this is a serious problem. I'll be glad to work my men night and day and even hire more men to get the spraying done. But I can't make a promise of a sudden and efficient job. Mayor, uh, Commissioner, where can we get more equipment? Professor Morris, I suggest you ask the county and state authorities for help. In the meantime, we'll start spraying the city on a round-the-clock basis. I'll gladly give you all the help I can. But the county only has three spraying rigs. Any help you can give us will be valuable, Superintendent. Is it possible to get men and equipment from the surrounding counties? Yes, but their equipment is just as sparse as ours. There are several companies that do this kind of work, too. Fine. We'll get the authority, and then we'll get them spraying, too. Well, don't get too optimistic, Doctor. All the combined equipment we can lay our hands on will not be enough to do the job you need done. We're not equipped to handle an emergency such as this. I've been afraid of that. How long will it take to get the sprayers operating that you can get your hands on? We'll start operations in half an hour. Mr. Secretary, you must be joking. I wish I were, Dr. LaForge. The state hasn't any equipment for frog fogging. We leave that chore up to the county and local city governments. Uncle Sam takes care of the national parks. I'm sorry to hear this. We need equipment, and we need it badly. I'm sorry, too, Doctor. I wish I had a hundred pieces of equipment that I could rush to your area. Uh, say, uh, why don't you contact the ranger boss in your area? Perhaps he can give you the help you need. I believe you have something there. 
If the ranger in charge can't help, he might know where we can get the help we need. Be sure and let me know if there's anything I can do. I'll inform the governor. I'm sure he'll be of the same mind. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Gentlemen, uh, my committees laid all the facts before you. We're making headway, but it's not enough. The whole area within a 50-mile radius of Central City must be sprayed within a week. Well, but who's going to create a miracle? The way we're going, it'll take a month, and every citizen in the area could have sleeping sickness by that time. Well, gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, we've been given the suggestion to call in the ranger in charge of the Southern Forestry District. Call is being placed to this gentleman now. I can't make any promises, but it's certainly worth a try. My committee and I will meet her before this hour. Hello, Ranger Headquarters. Ralph Hodges speaking. Mr. Hodges, this is Professor Joel Morris. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. I wondered if you could come to my clinic right away. Yes, I can. Uh, may I ask why the invitation? Well, yes, you can. We've got a baby epidemic of sleeping sickness on our hands. We need your help to keep the baby from growing up. Mm, you don't say. Well, I'll be in your office in half an hour. Professor Morris, I'm uh, Ranger Ralph Hodges. Oh, I'm happy to see you made such good time, Mr. Hodges. I'd like you to meet my two colleagues, Doctors Midge and LaForge. Nice nice to meet you, Doctor. Thank you. Sit down, Mr. Hodges, and uh, we'll bring you up to date on our problem. Thank you. As you may or may not know, sleeping sickness is carried by the mosquito. It's very rare for an area such as this, but the facts are that we have an epidemic on our hands. Now, uh, you'll notice that... Now that you know our problem, can you help us? You're our last hope. We're already using all the available equipment we can get for hundreds of miles around. Yes, gentlemen, I can help you. Oh, great. Thank you. What uh, kind of help can you give us? Well, I have two large truck rigs that can fog a thousand acres a day. Wonderful. And I have a fogging device rigged on a small plane. Oh, this is excellent. Just what we need. How soon can you put your equipment into operation? As quickly as I can get back to headquarters and get my men and equipment back into town. Well, you can leave now if you wish. We can talk with you later after your men and equipment are working. Fine. I'll be on my way then. The sooner we get this plague under control, the better off we'll be. <laughs> returns to headquarters, and within half an hour, the two large trucks and the plane are in operation. He puts his men to work using an efficient plan to cover the country between headquarters and Central City with a killing fog. However, all of the men and doctors haven't been trained like Ralph has. Soon chaos results from good intentions and sincere effort. Some parts of the terrain involved aren't being sprayed at all, and others have been sprayed two and three times by different crews. Professor Morris tries to direct the operation to the best of his ability, but his efforts are futile. He finds Ralph and tells him of the additional problem of lack of coordination and system. 
Ralph, but what do you suggest we do to get all the men to work together? And Professor, what we need is a general. This is an army of men, and they need a leader who knows how to handle this type of operation. You're right. But who will we get? There aren't any of us who have enough experience for such an operation as this. Wait a minute. Yes, Professor? I've got the band. Well, that's fine. Who is he? You. Oh, no, 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 not me. But I recommend Bill Jefferson of the Northwest Forest District, who could also bring in more equipment. Teletype, will you? Ah, uh, I watch now. Bill, come quick. Yeah? What's up, Grey Wolf? It's a message from Ralph, sonny. He needs help. Great Scott, sleeping sickness. Ah, uh, but plenty bad stuff. What are we going to do, young feller? Stand around with our hands in our pockets? No, we're going to swing into action, old timer. Grey Wolf, will you answer the teletype? Well, Stumpy and I get the men in and ready to move out? Ah, I do right away. Fine. All right, let's get to work, Stumpy. All right, fellas. Stumpy's going to see to it that you fellas get the trucks and flying boxcars and get you and your equipment flying south as soon as possible. You said it, Bill. Let's go, you young whippersnappers. We got a job to do. Now, stop me, get trucks to Central City pretty fast. I'll say, Will. Even if he has to fly them there himself. Uh, I think you want us to fly two spray planes down to Central City. Well, that's right. We won't have a co-pilot, a radio man, but I think we'll make it all right. Uh, as long as two engines keep going like clock, we not have trouble. <laughs> that's what counts, all right, Grable. Well, let's get out to the airport. We'll let the flying boxcars take off first, because we'll be able to get there ahead of them anyhow. Boxcar. Yeah, Stumpy got him off in good time, all right. Our planes are ready. Let's take off. Uh, see you in Central City, Bill. Right. Push the throttle as wide open as you can. Professor Morris, uh, nine tenths of the area assigned to me is sprayed. We haven't got much more to do. Should be finished by uh, 6 o'clock this evening. Oh, that's good news, Ralph. Over and out. Say there, young fella. We're going to have to pack the boys home in the morning if we work right through the night. Will you have the job done by sunrise, Mr. Jenkins? Well, I don't know for certain. We can sure make it a good race. Anyhow, we'll be finished gassing the skeeters not later than 8 in the morning. Good work, Mr. Jenkins. See you in the morning. Bill, I have to hand it to you. You and your men have worked a miracle in getting this spraying job done. Thanks, Professor Morris. We're used to this type of work. It's just a matter of practice. Well, I don't agree, but have it your own way. Say, what about the planes you brought in? You haven't used them yet. We'll use them in the morning. I'm keeping them for the double dose. 
Also to spray the swamp and river areas. They've got the most powerful fogging equipment made today. They'll cover this whole country in several hours. We'll start while the dew is still on the ground. The gray wolf's truck is pulling up in front. Let's see what he wants. Gray wolf, you're sure fast. Uh, we not finished yet, Bill. Why not? Why'd you come back? There isn't any swamp where you fellas are supposed to be working. But there are men by name of Cy Boone. Huh? What's the matter with him? Cy Boone got his road barricaded. He's standing guard with rifle. Cy's biting off more than he can chew. How far did you go? Central City. And almost all area ten miles around has been sprayed. But this man keep us from finishing job. Professor Morris. Yes? I'm going to be gone for a while. Will you please take over any calls that may come in? All right. I can get you on the radio if I need you. Yes. I'll be out paying a call to Cy Boone. I want to get stumpy and then find out why Cy won't let us spray his land. Here's the road to Cy's place, the ornery old cold cat. Uh, you not have much concern for other people. Well, there's always one like Cy Boone in every crowd. We don't spray his place. The folks for a couple of miles around here will be in danger of catching that there sleeping death. Holy Gray Wolf, there's the roadblock that you told us about. What you do now? I'm going to remove the roadblock. Bring old Betsy along, Stumpy. <laughs> you don't think I'd leave my rifle behind, do you? Let's go. I'm watching the brush, but I don't see any signs of a human being yet. <laughs> I didn't know the birds down here carried rifles. You see him yet? Nope. Shot came from our right. Woo! He hit one came from the same place. Keep walking. Give Gray Wolf time. Okay. But I ain't hungering to stop one of them there little... Good boy, Stumpy. Drop gun, you. Keep hands up. Walk out into road plenty quick. All right, you. Come on out before I come in and get you. You only got a busted hand. Good work, fellas. Now we can find out what this is all about. You all must be that big shot ranger boss they shipped in here. That's right, Boone. What's more, he's used to handling tough guys, so don't try any more shenanigans. Yeah, we'll just wait until my hand gets to feeling better. I wouldn't make any threats, Cy Boone. We don't scare from the likes of you. Now, what's the big idea of blockading your land so we can't spray it? That's my business, stranger. You all just get up and get. This is private property. And I say you ain't sprayed, and that's what I mean. You plenty big fool. You catch sleeping sickness, and then you wish you let us fog... I ain't up to listen to any of your palaver. Now, get! All right, let's go, fellas. He's within his legal right. Well, I do declare... A ranger with brains. Don't consider yourself the winner, Boone. I'm coming back with a court order. There's Cy Boone's place down there. When are we going to get the court order so we can spray his place? I sent Ralph over to the county seat to get it, Stumpy. He should be back by the time we get through a spray. I'd sure like to give Boone's land a dose from up here where it's safer. Hey! Somebody is shooting at us! You're not joking, old friend. I can see somebody standing in the yard down there shooting at us. I'm turning out. I hope Gray Wolf follows us. Yep, he sure is. Whoever's doing the shooting is crazy. I'd sure like to know why Cy Boone won't let us spray his land. Yeah, so would I. We'll find out just as soon as we get the court order in our hands. Yes, sir. Then if old Boone starts acting ornery, we'll put him in the pokey and let him cool off while we cover his place with fog. Hello, operator. This is Professor Morris. Yes? Are you sure? Yes, the rangers just walked in the door. I'll ask them to investigate immediately. Goodbye. 
What's wrong, Professor? Why, the phone company just called and told me they've been getting calls for help from Cy Boone's place. Well, I say, just ignore it. No, Stumpy. Maybe he changed his mind. Let's go, fellas. Stumpy, you try to knock this apart with some of the tools from the car. Quaywolf and I'll go on to the house. Okay. If I can break it up, I'll drive up. But don't count on it. We go now. Boone House, plenty far in. We run... Half mile now. Yeah. He's got a lot of land. House must be around the bend in the road up ahead. There it is. I can see roof through trees. Rangers. Oh, I'm sure glad you all got here. We could have gotten here sooner if it weren't for your miserable roadblock. What's happened? My wife and son are sick. Must have got what you were talking about. Guess you men were telling the truth. Now I've been a fool, and now how are we going to get them out? Forgot all about that roadblock. We take a look at wife and son, and then we figure a way to get them out. Sure, sure, anything you say. Well, they're in bad shape, Boone. We've got to get them out of here quickly. Oh, what a fool I've been. Why didn't I let you spray my land? And this wouldn't have happened. How will you get them out, Bill? It could get dark now. Maybe small plane land close by, but not in dark. We'll have to take them to the roadblock in Boone's car. Then transfer them to our car. All well, the handling won't do them much good, but can't be helped. Let's get them out of the car. Listen, Stumpy, get through roadblock. Gentlemen, <clears throat> gentlemen, we have good news for you. There's much to be thankful for. Sleeping sickness is well underway to being controlled. There were two new cases today, but there have been no deaths in the last two days. With the area now completely covered, we can rest more easily. And I know you'll want to give Mr. Bill Jefferson and his men a token of your appreciation. Mr. Jefferson, we of the medical profession and of the local government in this area, thank you for all you've done. Gentlemen, thank you for your generous applause. But I would remind you that your own leaders were big enough men to invite someone from the outside to come in, and that in itself is commendable. But I do want to add that the whole area accessible by roads has been covered by ground crews and a second dose by the fogging planes. Tell me what happened to Cy Boone's folks, Doctor. Well, they got under care just in time. Well, Doc, you could almost say it was a good thing that those people got sick so as we could get in and spray the land. That's what a man gets for being so stubborn. Well, actually, Mr. Jenkins, the mosquitoes probably did their job of infecting his folks even before the spraying started. <laughs> well, what do you know? And we're fortunate that we didn't run into lots of other folks with the same antiquated ideas. <laughs> Looks like it took sleeping sickness to wake him up.
See you next week for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, have you ever been forced into a difficult position by someone's mistake? It's hard to prove that you're not guilty when the facts say you are. Today's story is about John Patterson, the ranger in charge of the Forest Service Accounting and Purchasing Office, which is located at Junction City. All purchases and all disbursements for ranger payrolls and equipment are made through this office. John has a lot of responsibility because he handles the books for the whole Northwest Ranger District. Let's drop in on John as he and his family sit down around the supper table, and we'll find out what happens in the story, The Shortage. Jan, what's the matter with these biscuits? They're no different than any other time I've made them, John. Jerry, how many times have I told you not to slurp your milk? Leave the table. Go to your room and stay there until you can learn to eat like a human being. I'm sorry, Dad. It was an accident. Accident? Nothing. You've been told a thousand times about this. Go to your room. Oh, Daddy, it was an accident. The glass slipped in Jerry's hand. April, children are to be seen and not heard. Who made you Jerry's defender? Oh, Daddy, you're getting to be such a grouch. We can't even talk to you anymore. Go to the playroom, children. I said Jerry's to go to his room, not the playroom. John, leave the children alone. When a man's children can't even apologize, then things are getting to be a pretty sad state of affairs. Is that so? Yes, John. John, what's come over you the last two months? You never acted like this before. You've always been kind and loving. Before you punish the children, you always let them have their say and then make your decision as to, to whether they deserve punishment or not. You're, you've always been fair before, but not anymore. I think you're sick. Well, I don't have to stay around here and take insults from you. Where are you going? You haven't even finished your supper. I'm going out. Where? I said I'm going out. O-U-T. Jefferson speaking. Bill, this is Janet Patterson. Oh, hello, Jan. What's wrong? Oh, it's John. What about John? 
Must be pretty serious to be calling at midnight. Bill, there's something wrong with John. Oh. Well, I haven't seen him in several months. So this comes as quite a surprise. What's the trouble? I don't know. He won't tell me. He's been missing since right after supper time this evening. Is that right? Uh, do you have any idea where he might be? Oh, no, I wish I did. Bill, please help him. Well, sure, I will. I'll get the boys. We'll be over to your place in about half an hour. Oh, thank you. See you then. Keep the gas pedal down to the floor, Henry. If I get any closer to the floor, my foot will be dragging on the road. I wonder what kind of trouble John's in. Maybe I ought to say it another way. How could John get into trouble? Uh, that's what I think. He fine Christian man, good family man, and top ranger. I agree, fellas. How can he be in trouble? He's managing the account purchasing office with ability for the last five years. Never had a bit of trouble since he's been the boss there. Junction City. Now turn your large headlights off, Henry. We'll wake people up with them. Okay, Bill. We'll be at the home in a couple of minutes now. I'll turn the emergency lights off, pal. I want to make this as quiet as possible. Cut the speed of your car and coast up to the house. We'll get out quietly and walk in. Uh, plenty of good idea. I'll use advertising there is something wrong. Easy does it, fellas. Hey, Jan's waiting for us. Boy, it's 1.40 and still no sign of John. Hello, Jan. H Hello, Bill, Stumpy, Gray Wolf, Henry. Hi, Hi Jan. Jan. Bill, he still's missing. Where could he be? What could have happened to him? Take it easy, Jan. We'll find him. We'll call you as soon as we know something definite. If he comes home in the meantime, just tell the operator to call us on the radio telephone. She'll know what to do. All right, let's go, fellas, and quietly. Well, the office is dark black. Well, there isn't any sign of light in the building. Stumpy, Gray Wolf... You fellas cruise around, see if you can spot John. Henry and I'll take a look inside the office. Perhaps we can find a clue. We take a careful look. We'll pick you up in half an hour. Okay, see you later. Hey, Bill. How are you going to get into the office without breaking in? I've got a key, Henry. This office is in my district and under my jurisdiction. <laughs> That's right. I'd almost forgotten about this place belonging to the Forest Service. Since John's been handling this office, we haven't had any problems. I get regular reports, and the books are audited once a year. Well, everything looks normal. All the desks are neat, except John's. Yeah. wonder why he left the ledgers on top of his desk. Must have worked late. Perhaps he's running his trial balances so he can have them in tip-top shape before the audit. Boy, I'll say he's been working on the ledgers... Look at the adding machine tape in the wastebasket. Hey, don't touch anything, pal. John left things the way he wanted them, and we could cause him hours of work by messing things up for him. Uh, what do you make of it, Bill? I don't know. Like you said, he sure used a pile of adding machine tape. Now look here in the wastebasket. Discarded trial balance worksheets. Hey, Bill, look at this worksheet. Hmm. He's out of balance here by $5,893.14. Made so many corrections on this one, he threw it out because it wasn't legible any longer. Bill, you don't think John's having trouble I'll with... Be careful what you say, pal. You can read your mind. Now, don't you breathe a word to anyone but Stumpy and Gray Wolf what we've seen. Okay, Bill. We can't jump to conclusions. Right. To seeing these books, it's imperative that we find John as quickly as we can. If I remember correctly, the auditors will be here in two days. Well, 
weave honeycomb this here town at Junction City until we're blue in the face and no John. Uh, but right. We look every place but along riverfront. That's where we're heading now, fellas. Hey, a sheriff's car is pulling alongside. <laughs> I wondered how long it would take before their curiosity got the best of them. Yeah, they're pretty sharp boys, all right. Anything that gets by them isn't worth talking about. Hello, Al. Your curiosity got the best of you? Hello, Bill. Henry. Ray Wolf. Stuffy. Hi, Al. How are you doing? We've been watching you guys since the minute you come roaring into town at 138 this morning. <laughs> you fellas are really on the job. we got to be with rangers prowling around in the wee hours of the morning. Only joking, of course. Anything we can do to help? Not yet, Al. Now, please keep this under your hat or a ranger might get hurt wrongly. Joe and I haven't seen a thing that's illegal. Thanks, Al. I always consider a man innocent till I can prove him guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, John Patterson, you haven't seen him, have you? Yeah. He's been walking along the riverfront for hours. Must have plenty on his mind. Go straight down this street and you'll find him. Stumpy, you call Jan and tell her we found him. We'll bring him home in an hour or so. I'm going out on the dock and talk to him. You fellas stay here, at least for a while. Okay, Bill. We understand. Fine. I'll see you later. Hello, John. <laughs> Bill, what on earth are you doing here? Looking for you. Oh. Jan called you? Yeah. Didn't come home at midnight, so she called me. We're radioing that we found you. That's nice of you. Man must have an awful lot on his mind to spend the whole night thinking about it along the river. Now, don't get any ideas about me being here, except to think. I'm not a coward, nor am I insane. It's just that I like to walk along the river and think. Well, every man has his own liking as to where he wants to spend his time and reflection. John, you're in trouble. Uh, how do you know? Jan says you've been different the past two months. Yes, I, I guess I have. Want to tell me about it? Yes. I've got to tell someone before I burst a blood vessel. The... Well, the purchasing disbursing ledgers are out of balance by $5,800. $5,893.14. How do you know? We started our search at the office. I pulled some of your worksheets out of the wastebasket. You do know? Yeah. So will the auditors by the end of the week. Yeah. And then my family will be covered with disgrace like a... like a dripping mop. My family won't be able to hold their heads up in church or in school or anywhere. Listen, John, what kind of a Christian are you anyway? What do you mean by that? Don't the Lord's promises mean anything to you? He's promised to be with us all through life. The Lord didn't promise a smooth and easy road. Yeah, but... Well, I've never had it like this before. You know, in Deuteronomy, the Lord speaks to the children of Israel. He finds it necessary to refresh their memories by saying, And thou shalt remember all the way the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. I will never leave thee or forsake thee. Mm -hmm. God is our refuge and strength very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Thanks, Bill. I... Well, I guess I'm not like Job or the Apostle Paul. I'm not a very strong Christian. Oh, I wouldn't say that, John. You've forgotten to let the Lord carry your problems. I think we've all done that at one time or another. 
till we've learned that the Lord's promises are as good today as the day he gave them to us. Mm-hmm. Say, it's 4.30. I'd like to get a couple of hours of sleep before I go back to the office. We're all going to get some sleep. But you're going to sleep yourself out. The boys and I will open the office in the morning. Jan, you shouldn't fix breakfast for us. You're dead tired. Yes, I'm tired, Bill, but I couldn't think of letting you go to a restaurant to eat. You fellows worked so hard last night. Hey, that first batch of bacon and eggs will fit just fine on my plate. If anybody else reaches for it, they draw back a short arm. <laughs> <Stumpy, you're laughs> All right. <hungry. laughs> All right, Stumpy. Here you are. Oh, it's good to hear laughter in this house again. Two months seems such a long time to be without it. How John sleep? Like a baby. He needs good sound sleep so badly. I hope you understand why he's acted the way he has. Oh, I do. If only he had let me on in on his problem. But I guess a good man will do anything before he'll shame his family. I'm glad you understand. It's the way men act when in a tight spot. But I wouldn't have been ashamed. There's something radically wrong with the books. I know that. So do we all. Now our job is to prove it. Uh, how long will it take to do that? Who knows? John's a good accountant. If he can't find the error, then it's going to be rough. Well, couldn't you delay the auditors? Yes, pal, I could, but I think that would be unwise. Sometimes the truth is an awful bitter pill, but it's better to swallow it as it comes. It might look worse for John if I tried to hold back the audit. I don't have a good plausible reason to do so. This office has been running smoothly for five years. Yeah, I see your point. We wouldn't want to do anything that would hurt John or make the problem appear worse than it is. What will the auditors do when they find the shortage? They'll make a second audit, which will also include your personal bank account. If John can't properly explain the shortage and show them a reasonable error, they'll report it to our superiors all the way back to Washington. What'll happen after that? The Secret Service will be here to make their own audit. A secret audit. If they find the charges factual, they'll arrest John. Oh, no. Bill, you know John didn't steal any money or any material purchased through the office. Please, can't you help him? Jan, I'm John's boss. And nobody's going to tromp all over my men without good reason. Our job is to find the reason why they can't. Right now, we don't have one. I'd rather fight a dozen forest fires than have to do with this job. I've always been taught that figures don't lie. Yeah, it looks like we're wasting our time, Sonny. John's figures check with ours right down the line. Yeah, I know. I've been going on the theory that John might have gotten excited when he found the difference the first time and has been making the same error ever since. Uh, not possible. Man can work on figures in ledger till they have no meaning. And he not find a mistake no matter how hard he tries. Well, what do we do now? Let's each take a set of ledgers and check for a reversed entries. What's posted as a credit might actually be a debit and vice versa. Carefully examine each voucher or invoice... Hello, John. You have good rest. Yes, thanks to you fellows. Did you find anything? No, sorry to say. We find your figures perfect. Ah, it looks bad, John. We come to the exact difference you show. I was afraid of that. I've checked and rechecked my figures so often I can recite the ledgers to you page by page. When are them auditor fellers supposed to show up? Around noon tomorrow. Then my goose will be cooked. <laughs> will you stop seeing jail bars in your eyeballs? We ain't done with this yet. Hey, Bill, you're making with an idea. I can tell by that look on your face. John, I'm going to inform Colonel Anders of this problem. What? Are you for me or against me? He'll fire me right on the spot. Simmer down, sonny. Would you rather the auditors inform their superior and he calls Colonel Anders and tells him? 
That'd be mighty embarrassing for the colonel. Yeah, that's right. The colonel says he's been told it'll take the punch out of the auditor's report and save him a red face. This is Bill Jefferson, operator. Yes. Hello, Colonel. Well, not so good right now. Uh, I'm sitting at John Patterson's desk right now. I thought I'd better let you know that his books are short $5,800 in round figures. Yes, that's correct, sir. Yes, the boys and I have substantiated this fact. Right. Yes, I think you're wise in doing that, sir. All right, I'll keep you informed. Goodbye. All right, let's have it. You look like you just ate all the frosting off the cake. Bill, you're smiling. What's he have to say? He expressed appreciation for being told by us rather than the auditors, John. He's also certain that something's wrong with the books beyond your control. He's going to call the chief auditor himself and tell him to get his men here pronto. And he's also going to raise the question at the right time as to why this shortage didn't come to light sooner. But the colonel's going on the supposition that this shortage goes back before my time in this office. That's right. The colonel wasn't born yesterday, you know. John, your book's balanced to a T except for the one amount. That could indicate an old auditing error. However, as the colonel said, we've got to wait until the right time to pop the question. Well, this new hope you've given me is only a slim thread. But right now, it's like a like a rope ladder to me. Now I'm anxious for the auditors to come. Boy, when are those guys going to be finished? It's just nine o'clock. I'm getting tired of doing nothing. Ah, uh, you not only one. You won't have to wait much longer. Here comes the auditor now. Here it comes, fellas. Get that jailbird look out of your eyes, sonny. How much are you out of balance, Felix? How'd you know the book's gone down? Sir? John told me. I see. I'll have to report this at once, you know. Are you sure you can't find it? Positive. Looks like your friend here is in real trouble. Let's not jump to conclusions, Felix. The books are off $5,893.14. Is that jumping to conclusions? Well, you have a point there, all right. I've got to send a wire to my boss. We'll take this up in the morning. Well, the funeral march will be played in the morning for John Patterson. My career in the Forest Service will die a miserable death. John, I ought to punch you right in the nose for saying that. Why? I just spoke the truth, didn't I? No, you didn't. I thought you were going to trust the Lord to carry your burden for you. I forgot myself for the moment. Well, you better not forget again. If you think you can carry this load without the Lord's help, you're sadly mistaken. You'll never make it. Now let's go home and sleep like Christians who believe the Lord's promises. You know, I've never seen the day when Bill could sleep as late as he's sleeping this morning. Bill isn't sleeping, Stumpy. He left here an hour ago. What? You gone now? Jan. Huh? What's it? Did he say where he's going? No, John, he didn't. He had a light breakfast and slipped quietly out of the house. Then I noticed the car was gone. Why? I. Uh, why did it. I mean, at, at a time like this when uh, I. Take it easy, John. Take it easy, Sonny. Bill ain't ever let anybody down, and he won't start now. John, don't you have more faith in the Lord and in Bill than to doubt them? Yeah. Sure, Jan. I do. Let's go to the office, fellas. Hey, here's Inspector Anderson. Inspector Anderson? Yeah, he's with the Secret Service. The Secret Service? Stumpy, Grey Wolf, Henry, how are you fellas? Oh, it's been a long time since we've talked. Yeah, how do you do, Inspector? Good uh, to see you. Andy, this is John Patterson. How do you do? Patterson, you're in a bad spot. 
Our boys and I are going to have a go at your books and see if we can help you. Oh, I appreciate your cooperation, Inspector. What'll happen if you can't help me? I have a warrant for your arrest in my pocket. Where's Bill? Why doesn't he show up? I thought he was my friend. It looks like he ran out on me when I needed him the most. Uh, take it easy, John. Bill not desert you. Uh-oh. Here comes Andy. Does it still look as bad as before, Sonny? Yep, it sure does, Stumpy. Mr. Patterson, uh, sorry I have to put Hold you... Hold it, Andy. Hello, Bill. Good to see you again, but uh, not under these circumstances. Good to see you, too, Andy. However, I think you're reading into this factors that are only circumstantial. Well, I disagree. I know you fight for your men, but this time you lose. I have a warrant here, and I'm taking him in. If John is guilty, he'll go to jail. I'm not through trying to prove that he isn't. This gentleman with me is Dr. Cornelius Clifton. Oh, Why, you're the professor of accounting at State U. That's right, Mr. Patterson. Dr. Clifton is the outstanding accountant in this part of the country. With your permission, he'd like to look at the books, Andy. Bill, uh, why aren't you satisfied with your findings so far? Because I know John. He's a fine Christian man, and he wouldn't lie. This is a bit unusual. All right, I'll go along with it. I'll give you until noon tomorrow to find the trouble. If you can't find it then, I'll have to arrest John and take him in. Put a doubt in my mind that John is guilty. I, I want to be sure he's guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt before I arrest him. I hope you find him innocent. Thanks, Andy. You fellas keep the coffee and sandwiches coming. Dr. Clifton and I are going to stick with these books until we find the trouble. Henry, bring up all the old ledgers from the basement vault. This audit is going to be from the day this office opened. I'm going to work from last year's ledgers and go back each year till we find the error. You call the entries, I'll check the ledgers. All right. I'm ready when you are. $501.62 credit, $2 debit, $3,076 debit, and $80 reversing entry check voided. That finished the 1952 books. These are the 1950 invoices and vouchers. Hey, look at this. An invoice for $2,046.57. This invoice was voided. What's the ledger say? Double that is 5,093.14. Hmm, let's see now. We've found it, Bill. Your theory is right. The adjusting entry to offset the voided check is wrong. This makes a counterbalancing error. And John's innocent. Dr. Clifton, I'd never believe this if I didn't see it with my own eyes. No, nor would I. It's incredible, but true nevertheless. Are both of you gentlemen satisfied? Have I satisfactorily traced this counterbalancing error through the ledgers to its discovery by John? Indeed. Of sure right. sure, yeah. course, John didn't know what hit him. I'm glad we found it. We all are, especially John. I'll never cease to praise the Lord for this, this miracle. Thanks to you, Bill Jefferson, for not letting me condemn an innocent man. Yeah, we can all thank the Lord that Bill stuck to his guns. If he hadn't been so firm in his belief of John's innocence, we all would have made a mistake. Right, Stumpy. Never again will my faith in the Lord be shaken. The only shortage that actually exists is, is in my faith. <laughs> Right you are, John. The Lord's promises never fall short. It's just that we don't make full use of them. It's a good thing that Bill had the courage to stand his ground. Boys and girls, let this be a lesson to you. Stand firm on your Christian conviction. That's what the Lord wants us to do. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger! Yeah.
Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Well, winter's closing fast on the forest wilderness, and the rangers are making their last inspection of the wildlife and forest conditions before the Lord puts a clean white blanket of snow over the woodlands. Today we find Bill and Ranger Tom on their way home and well on the last lap before they turn toward Knotty Pine and rest. And before you know it, they'll be into the story, The Hermit. Easy, big boy. Easy now. I know you got lots of energy, but we still got quite a ways to go. Hey, Bill, wait up. Close to him. Whoa there, big fella. Oh, Maud, old girl. Come on, take it easy now. What's the matter, Tom? Oh, Maud's getting tired. Hasn't got the oomph that Storm has. <laughs> uh, sometimes I think Storm has too much vim and vigor. More than he knows what to do with. Not only that, he's five years younger than Maud. Now well, we better rest the horses here. Yeah, this sure is rough country. Bill, what say we just mount and walk a bit, eh? I'd like to stretch my legs. Okay. I don't know why they can't make saddles out of foam rubber. Oh, this leather gets as hard as concrete after a day's riding. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> say, Bill, hmm? wonder who's down in that old line shack. There's smoke coming out of the chimney. Hmm. I don't know. It's an abandoned shack. Let's take a look when Maud gets rested a little. That shack hasn't been lived in for years. Well, guess Whoa, whoever's in there doesn't want much company. He must have heard us. Strange he didn't come to the door. Yeah. Of course, there could be something wrong. Could be. Take a look, huh? Bill, somebody just looked out the window. Yeah. Something funny here, all right. I tried to dismount. You take Storm and get away. I'm going to find out what's going on. Bill, I think the door's opening a little. Never mind getting off that horse, Ranger. The man's got a right to live alone and in peace in his own house. Now get out of here before I start throwing some lead. He's got a gun on us, Bill. All right, mister. Don't mean any harm. Just trying to be neighborly, that's all. See you some other time. Never mind. Just keep away from here if you want to stay healthy. Now get. All right. So long. Let's go, Tom. Before the fireworks start. He isn't joking. Right. Come on, Storm. Let's go, boy. Come on. Come on. Pleasant surprise, find you here. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hello, Ralph. Hello, gentlemen. Just thought I'd drop by and see how you were before winter sets in. Nothing important, just uh, taking a look around, that's all. Uh, anything out of order, sir? Not a thing, Bill. Everything looks in fine shape, in accord with the best traditions of the Forest Service. Thank you, sir. We certainly want to keep them that way. Yeah. If we meet a couple more characters like the one we met this morning, I'm afraid our tradition will be shot full of holes. And us rangers, too. What are you talking about, Tom? Oh, yeah, what goes here? <laughs> what Tom means is we were threatened with the business end of a 30-30 when we got too close to an old line shack up Shady River Way. Well, he wasn't just making chin music. Believe me, he'd have put daylight through us if we'd ever tried to get off our horses. <laughs> I believe you're right. That old prospector sure wanted to be left alone. What prospector, Bill? Uh, who drew a bead on you two? Come on, I'm curious. Uh, you two talk like dog chasing tail. Go round and round and get nowhere. <laughs> well, the truth is, we stumbled onto some ornery old fellow living in an abandoned line shack. 
haven't the least idea who he is or where he came from. I do. Huh? Ralph. Well, Why, who is it, Ralph? Come and tell us. Well, Colonel Landers told me uh, his story, and it's one of the most interesting ones I've heard. Yeah? What's his name? Name is Dr. William T. Warburton. Doctor. Dr. Warburton. A doctor? That ornery old fella, a doctor? You mean a real M.D.? Not only an M.D., but with a whole string of other degrees as well. Well, what's well, that? Right. Oh, about that? oh, but he doesn't talk like an educated well, man. Right, His right. speech was rough. Boy, I'll say it was. Yes, that's part of the mask. Doesn't want to be discovered. Well, this is very interesting, Ralph. You mind telling us his story? Yeah, I think it'd be a sad one. Maybe much trouble to make men come to wilderness to hide. You've made a shrewd observation, Grey Wolf. The story goes back about two years ago to the operating room of a large hospital in the east. Dr. Warburton was about to perform a critical brain operation, which was not unusual, except that the patient was a very dear friend of the doctor's. In fact, the best friend he'd ever had. The patient is completely under, Doctor. Very well, nurse. Pulse? Uh, 73. Respiration? 17. Dermatome? Yes, sir. Cole, when are you going to learn how to put an instrument into the surgeon's hand? I want to feel the handle of that knife sting my palm from now on, understand? Yes, Doctor. Good. Tissue? How's that, sir? <laughs> oh, you're a good intern, Cole. Hemostat. Retractor. Sponge. Hemostat. Forceps. Doctor, how much longer? One hour. You can have a relief nurse take over if you're tiring. Clear that field, Cole. Yes, sir. Very little blood. Prepare 30-day chromic sutures. Now, second phase. Yes, sir. Doctor, the patient began to show the strain of long anesthesia. Hmm. Uh, Cole, 10 cc's of adrenaline. Quickly. Right here, doctor. Inject. Hurry, doctor. Pulse and respiration are failing. Yes, nurse, yes. Knife. Knife, someone... Never mind, I'll get it. Doctor, the patient. What? Cole, 20 cc's at once. Here's a syringe, doctor. I've got it. <laughs> Dr. Warburton. Cole, I've... I've failed. I... I've killed my best friend. That was the beginning of the end of a wonderful career in surgery. Yeah, I can see what you mean, Ralph. But why? Sounds like simple heart failure to me. The heart just wasn't strong enough to stand the long strain of anesthesia. But you see, Bill, Dr. Warburton blamed himself for subjecting his friend to that strain. Mm, but such things, who can know? Oh, I not think he was to blame. I'm sure it was not his fault in, in any way. Yes, and that was the opinion of all the doctors in the hospital. In fact, several weeks later, the chief of staff called on Dr. Warburton at his home and tried to reason with him. Found the doctor in a state of nervous exhaustion and under the influence of liquor. Bert, you've got to stop blaming yourself with this. I can't. The autopsy shows you didn't kill him. The heart just stopped, that's all. How could you know? Every test gave evidence that his heart would stand up under the strain. That's what you say. You're just trying to comfort me. It was poor judgment on my part, I tell you. Can't you understand? I made a mistake. It was my fault, Steve. And I'm paying for it. Don't be absurd, Bert. Now, look, listen to reason. I've been asked to come here and invite you back to the staff. Back? What do you mean? Can't you understand? A human life isn't like a machine. Make an error on a machine. You buy a new part. And fix it good as new. I can't do that for Jim. He's gone. And I'm through for good. When you sober up, you'll come to your senses. Then get back to work. You've got a whole life ahead of you. And we need you. The medical profession needs you. Need me? Need a failure? 
Don't kid me. Get out of here and leave me alone. All right. I'll be back when you're when you're not so drunk. Do you have to rub it in? Now get out of here. Get out. Ah, it's too bad. It's obvious that he never did go back. No, he never returned to practice. Fled out here to the West, has been living like a hermit ever since. Roaming the country as a prospector most of the time. And I guess he's moved into the old line shack for the winter. Come spring, he'll move on, I guess. Oh, not too bad he takes this attitude. Everybody make mistake or two in lifetime. Even doctor. But think what good they do. That's right. And there's this. The higher up in life you get and the more responsibilities you take on, the more serious are your mistakes. Well, it's been nice talking with you fellas, but uh, I've got to move along. Well, it's good to see you, Ralph. Wish you could drop by more often. I uh, wish I could too, but well, I have enough to keep me busy down in my own district. You know, I'd like to go out and visit that old prospector one of these days just to talk to him. Better be careful, Bill. He's become very proficient with the business end of his rifle. And he evidently doesn't want to be bothered by anybody. You wait here, Storm, and behave yourself like a good fella. I'll see if I can not talk to that ornery old doctor in the cabin over there. <laughs> Storm, you act like you understand every word I say. Uh-oh. I can see the business end of a 30-30 looking me square between the eyes. I just keep on walking as though I didn't see it. <coughs> Hold up there, Ranger. You ain't welcome here. You ain't invited, see? Uh, guess not, by the looks of things. Hold up there, old-timer. There's nothing wrong. I just want to talk with you, that's all. I'm not even armed, as you can see. Well, uh, I suppose there isn't, uh, ain't any harm in talking. And you're not, uh, you ain't carrying a gun. And... All right, Ranger, come on in. But no funny business. Or I'll make you look like a hunk of Swiss cheese. Now you aren't, uh, ain't such a, a bad young fella after all. Have a chair. Uh, I ain't, uh, I am, ain't, aren't uh, used to talking with anybody for uh, quite a spell. Thank you. Ain't much for associating with people, you know. <clears throat> yes, I gathered as much from the reception I got. <laughs> well, uh, you know how it is. Uh, I don't like nobody... Prying into my business. Oh, I know what you mean, Doctor. As I was saying... Uh... Doctor! Oh, I'm sorry, I guess that kind of slipped out. And then you know who I am. And you know my secret. Now listen to me. You get out of this shack, do you hear? Get out. And never let me see you again. Doctor, just a minute, please. Believe me, not I... Not a minute, not even a second. Get out of this cabin before I put a bullet through you. All right, that's the way you want it. I only want to help you. You'll help me by leaving me alone. You understand? Leave me alone. Well, Bill, did you get to talk to that old fellow? <laughs> About two dozen words and most of that over the muzzle of a rifle. Oh, what a mistake it is to try to run from the realities of life. Uh, that one thing no one can run from, Bill. oneself. It's too bad, Grey Wolf, especially in the case of Dr. Warburton. Because medical science needs him, and sick people need him even worse. Incidentally, Tom, he's not an old man, even though he looks like one. Now, wait a minute. Listen. Stumpy, what's the matter? You got trouble. Trouble enough, you fellas. 
There's a mountain climber laying on a ledge way up on the side of old Baldy. He's got a busted head. Oh, well, why don't they bring him down? You got to have experience and equipment to do this job. Must have thought he was a human mountain sheep or something. Somebody's got to get him off of there. Well, you come to the right place, Dumpy. We do it. How? Sounds like it's going to be tough. Tough or not, let's not stand around and talk. Tom, you get a doctor from the hospital and bring him here. We'll leave instructions just where we're going. Stumpy, Grey Wolf, let's go. We're going to climb old Baldy and get that man down if it's the last thing we ever do. Uh, I notice rest of climber is pretty upset over accident, Bill. I can imagine. This fellow's rope must have been severed on the sharp ledge. Stumpy, you stay here. Keep our rope straightened out. And keep the floodlight on that ledge. Uh, keep rope straight. Most important when we climb. Yeah, don't worry none about that, Sonny. I'll keep them straight, all right. I've climbed more mountains than there is on the map of the United States. Now, you fellas, be careful. I sure wish I had a skyhook. It would be easier. Here he is. He got cold as ice cube. Maybe you better hurry and lower him. About 200 feet down. I think you're pretty close to right, Green Wolf. You take a look at our injured friend while I signal Stumpy to drop the small line. Rig the harness so we can lower him as soon as we get the heavy rope up here. Okay, Bill. Stumpy! Watch the line! Stumpy! Watch the line! I'm lowering the small rope, Grey Wolf. Soon Stumpy ties down the heavy rope, gets back up here. We can lower the injured fellow off this ledge. Oh, not fine, Mill. I got harness on him. Tom should have Naughty Pine Doctor waiting for us when we get down. Well, Doc, what do you think? Pretty bad, huh? Yes, yes. I, I'm afraid he's suffered a severe injury to the brain. He's in critical condition. I'm afraid he's done for unless the right operation is performed. Can't you do it, Doctor? No, no. I dare to undertake the delicate surgery needed in this case. In fact, there are only two men in the country who are proficient enough in the Warburton technique. And they're way across the ocean now on vacation. Warburton technique? Why, I... Oh! Stumpy, can't you stand on your own two feet? Uh, sorry, Sonny, I'm just an old man, you know, and uh, my foot slipped. Uh, what were you going to say about the Warburton technique? Uh, hey, where's Bill? He gone, uh, just like that. Oh, say, that's right. Uh, where did he go and why? He was standing here uh, and... He'll be back, Doc, don't worry. Uh, you better see what you can do for this poor fellow here. Yes, yes, uh, he can certainly make the last minutes of his life a bit easier for him. I'm surprised that Bill's running out on us. I wonder... Don't if... worry. He'll be back. Well, looks like somebody's snooping around again outside. This 30-30 is going to talk business this time. I'm getting sick and tired. Now... We'll find out who's out there. Hold it right there, Doctor. And don't turn around if you want to stay alive. So, you're back again, Ranger. And you think you've got the drop on me. I'd just like to get one crack at you with this rifle I'm and... not joking, Doctor. I said don't turn around. Drop that gun, now. All right. Since you seem to be in command right now... Step back three steps and turn around. Oh, you haven't got a gun at all. I'll Don't try you. to get to that gun. You'll never make it. Now, inside. 
I want to talk to you, Dr. Warburton. There's not a minute to waste. No, 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 I can't and I won't operate on this man. And that's final. You've got to, doctor. You have no choice. Don't I? Who's going to force me to do something I don't want to do? Listen, doctor. You took an oath to serve human need whenever and wherever needed at all times of the day or night, didn't you? Yes, I did. But that's all in the past. I'm not a doctor anymore. Can't you get that through your thick head? I'm not bound. Doctor, there's only one thought that's going through my thick head. And that is that here you stand arguing with me while a man's life is ebbing away. Don't you care? In your hands and in your mind is the power to save this man's life. And you refuse to do it. Dr. William Warburton, with all that ability at your command, you're a murderer. And you'll stand charged as such before God and before your fellow man. If you don't do what you can, don't you understand? The death of your friend was a tragic one, Doctor. I know, but it was only a mistake. Can't you see that? An error in judgment that any doctor in the world might have made. Yes, I... I can see that. But now, you're deliberately letting a man die. And insofar as you do, you are guilty of this man's death. Aren't you? I... I don't know. I haven't practiced in years. I, I'm afraid. But you could take a look at the man... That's the least you could do. You could tell the doctor from Naughty Pine what to do to save the man's life. Or have you forgotten all you knew? You know you haven't. No more than I could forget how to swim or write my name. All right. I'll go take a look at this man. But I won't. I can't touch a knife. All right. I'll accept that for now, doctor. Come on. We'll ride double on storm. Who is this man you brought me? He certainly a doctor. Seems to know his stuff. He is a doctor and a good one. One of the best in the United States. Uh, I'll tell you more later. He seems to have finished his examination. What do you think, doctor? Is he going to die? Yes, I, I'm afraid there isn't much we can do for him, poor fellow. You have it wrong, Doctor. There isn't much we can do for him, but there's a lot you can do for him. You can save his life, can't you? See here, Bill, I, I don't get this. How can this man save his life? The patient needs brain surgery. Uh, unless... Yes, Doc. What were you going to say? Uh, Never mind. If this man is a surgeon, whatever he needs will get my fullest cooperation. I have a complete emergency kit with me, including anesthesia. Thank you. Well, doctor, what do you say? We haven't much time, you know. All right. Bill, get this man on the stretcher. Here, let me shift the body. Don't touch that head. Now, uh, uh, under with it. Yeah. Now, back again, back again. Easily. Good. Now, Doctor, you get the equipment set up for the brain surgery. It'll be a crude operation, but I think... I know it'll work. Ready? Good. Instruments. Tourniquet bandage. Now, inject the sodium pentothal, Doctor. Right. Knife, please, Bill. Here, sir. <laughs> Tom, reflect that mirror a few degrees more this way. <laughs> Fine. Now, pray. Oh, God, help me to remember. Second knife, please. Yes, sir. How long will it take? I think about 15 minutes. This is only an emergency. If I can repair the damage temporarily, the man will live. 
He must die, please. Here. Now we just wait. We've brought him out of the anesthesia, and he should come out of the coma shortly. That is, if I haven't lost my skill. Let's trust God for full restoration of your powers, shall we, Doctor? Yes, Bill. Thank you. Uh, the hemorrhage in the brain has been stopped, excess blood removed, and the damage area mended. Now there must be a reaction soon. Or we've lost the battle. Five minutes, Doctor. How will we know when he comes out of it? He'll open his eyes for a moment, then fall asleep. Ten minutes, Doctor. Pulse is a bit weaker. I hope we weren't too late, Bill. But I'm a little afraid. How much longer do we have before we'll know, Doctor? Five minutes, and we'll know the answer. Five minutes are up. His pulse is dropping just a bit. I'm afraid... Doctor! His hands! He's moving them! Good. That's a hopeful sign. His eyes are opening. He ain't seeing much, but they're open. Gentlemen, good news. Our patient will live. Well, gentlemen... I'd say the operation was a success. His pulse and respiration are weak, but steady. Before we move him, he'll need a transfusion, of course. Well, I'll gladly give blood, Dr. Warburton. And I'll do the same if you can use the blood of a dried-up old fossil like me. Ain't much good except just to keep the old pump going. <laughs> What's the matter, Doctor? <laughs> Nothing really, Bill. I, I just happened to think... That's the first time I've laughed since I ran away from the world. Bill, do you think Dr. Warburton is really going back to practice medicine? I wish I knew, Tom. Right now, he's over at Naughty Pine Hospital checking on his patient. Dr. Warburton! Gentlemen, I... I've come to say goodbye. You're going back? Bill, I'm taking a plane east within the hour and returning to my first love and very rightful place in life. Oh, doctor, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. Good to hear that. Thank you. And, and, And Bill, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you've done for me. You've made me understand that I can't run away from myself. And what's more important, that I can't run away from God. Sort of gives you that satisfied feeling to know Dr. Warburton has returned to his true calling in life. Certainly true, boys and girls, that you you can't run away from yourself any more than you can run away from God. Be sure to listen again next week at this same time for more adventure with Ranger Bill! Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. 
pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. There are two schools of thought on how to handle the teenage gang problem. One group says, use the strong arm of the law. The other group maintains that the Christian approach is best. We'll find out which works best in Naughty Pine, where there are two gangs of teenage lads who are waging war on each other. Here's the story, Mrs. Kane Wins a War. Let's go to the back of Mrs. Kane's large home on the outskirts of Naughty Pine. This lady's house is on the front of a ten-acre plot of ground. The back area is covered with trees, rocks, bushes, and darkness. For some strange reason, the two teenage gangs have picked this area to wage their frequent battles. Right now, another fight is in the making as the two gangs of boys creep toward each other across the back of Mrs. Kane's property. The moon is up, and the snow on the ground makes the battleground pretty well illuminated. Art and Phil of the river gang take the lead as they advance against the hill mob. Hey, I can see the hill gang now, Phil. Yeah, Moose is leading the way. Let's set a trap for him, Art. Okay, what'll we do? We'll get alongside the back of Mrs. Kane's chicken house. When Moose and the rest of the guys pass by, we'll jump them from the rear. Yeah, that should work keen. Let's get going. Hey, you guys, follow us. Jump them. Pass the word, you guys. Don't jump till we tell you. Here they are. Quiet now. Yeah, I wonder where that Don't river gang is. Get them! Come on, hit them! Come on! 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 Come O'Rourke, take your men and cut around behind them. Okay, Carol, we're going on the double. The rest of you men come with me. You've got to stop this before somebody gets seriously hurt or even killed. Get him again. Son, get one score. Come on. we got to look out. Beat it, the cop. Let's get out of here. All right. Let's quiet down or I'll take you all in. Hey, you stop squirming around like a worm on a fish hook and behave. Make him behave, O'Rourke. Don't you be worrying about that, Cal. I've got five of me own, just like these scalawags. I know how to make them toe the mark. I'm not going to ask you tough guys what you're doing because you're, you'll are you only double-talk me to death. But listen and listen hard. I'm running out of patience, and the next time this happens, you're going to jail. Next time, I start biting instead of barking. Hey, you guys, pipe down. We ain't going to let the cops scare us, are we, fellas? Yeah, no, that old lady either. She's the one that turned us in, sure as shooting. We'll get even with old Mrs. Kane for calling the cops. Let's do it the same time we get the Hill Gang. Yeah, how about tomorrow night? Keep it under your hat before the, so the cops won't find out. I'll challenge Moose in school tomorrow. If the Hill Gang ain't turned yellow by now, they might show up. We're inviting you and your gang to finish what we started last night. Is that right? What about the cops? What's the matter, Moose? Don't tell me you're chicken. Don't you call me a chicken, Phil. I'll clean up the hall with you right now. Yeah, you and what army? Don't forget, there's two of us. That's right. Where's your gang, or are they scared, too? You'll be there tonight, and I'll show you who's jelly. You'll have a mouth full of floating molars and a couple of fat eyes. We're going to take care of that old lady, too, at the same time we take care of you guys. Right now? Ever see the time I wasn't? 
Come on in, Jack. Grab a chair. Oh, peace and quiet at last. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a school teacher, Jack. My job's a pushover compared to yours. Oh, it's not that bad. This has been one of those days when it would have been better to have stayed in bed. <laughs> That's so? What's wrong? Well, I don't know exactly. I heard rumors that the Hill and the River Gangs might battle it out soon on the back of Mrs. Kane's property. Oh. Those young fellas aren't going to be satisfied until somebody gets seriously hurt. And they'll be in trouble. Were you able to find out when this scrap is going to take place? No. No, I wasn't. I only overheard snatches of conversation and a few disconnected remarks here and there. But adding them up, they spell trouble. There's a lot of bad blood running between those two gangs. So far, we've been able to keep it from spilling over inside of school. Yeah, I know. You and the rest of the teachers have done a fine job of keeping the warring tribes under control during school hours. Bill, I must be on my way. Exams come up tomorrow, and I have a lot of work to do. I surely wish you could do something to put an end to this nonsense before those lads live a lifetime of regret. I'll have a talk with Cal. Perhaps he knows more about this. Well, do whatever you think best. I came to you because you seem to have a knack for working these problems out for everybody's good. Well, thanks for your confidence. I'll follow this through and see what can be done with the young fellas. Thanks, Bill. Well, let me know how things turn out. If I can help, just tell me what to do. I'll do that, Jack. Bye. Bill, wait a minute. What is it, Jack? Well, there's one thing I forgot to mention. Oh, what? I also have good reason to believe that the lads may take revenge on Mrs. Kane for calling the police. That is, they seem to think she did. I'm glad you told me that. This makes a horse of another color. I'll get the sheriff on it right away. That's as much as I can tell you, Cal. I don't imagine it's much help. It sure is, Bill. My men and I broke up their fight last night. I sure would give ten dollars to know when the next one's coming off. Yeah, I can imagine. Bill, uh, I'd appreciate your help. You, you have a great knack for coming up with the answer to this sort of thing. How about it? Well, I'd be glad to help, Cal. I think we ought to go out and see Mrs. Kane and tell her of the possible danger she's in. Oh, that's good for a starter. Mm hmm Let's get going. Time's running out. Imagine those young toughs threatening revenge on a nice elderly lady. Now, gentlemen, I appreciate your concern for me, but really I can take care of myself. I wish I were sure of that, Mrs. Kane. I'd be glad to station a couple of men out here until this blows over. You'd better listen to him, ma'am. Those lads get pretty rough. I'm listening, Bill. But I'm not going to pay any heed to the sheriff. I think he's an old worry wart. Now, Mrs. Kane, uh, it'll be too late for me to protect you and your property after something happens. Now, please, please listen to reason. Sheriff, what those young men need is love and attention. Why, I've even thought of inviting them in for tea and cookies. You, you, you what? You heard me, Calvin. You aren't deaf. I've raised boys of my own, you know. They were just as rough and tumble as the lad you had to, to fight on my back lot last evening. I called you because I didn't want them to hurt each other. But, but, Mrs. Kane, I... Now, don't you butt me. You just march right out of here and take care of enforcing the law. I'll take care of those young lads... You see when I show you that I'm right. All right, Mrs. Kane, you win. But don't say I didn't warn you if anything happens. Let's go, Bill. Right. Good day, Mrs. Kane. Goodbye, Mrs. Kane. I hope you'll be safe. <laughs> you kind of took a beating, old boy. What do you mean, you? <laughs> didn't see you making any home runs or even stealing third base. <laughs> Right. But at least I admit it. Uh, come on, Cal. Cheer up. Perhaps we're bucking up the wrong tree. 
Yeah, I hope so, Bill. She's a fine lady. I, I'd hate to see her get hurt. I don't see the law around. Do you, Phil? No, they're not around. Tub and Lefty have been watching since after supper. They haven't seen hide nor hair of the cops. It's safe. Good. Let's get over to the chicken house and fix those windows. We'll show that old lady she can't rat on us and get away with it. Yeah. Pick up rocks on the way. We gotta hurry before Moose and his gang get to the joint first. <laughs> see the hill gang we got plenty of time to take care of those windows yeah send a couple of the guys to take care of the house windows not all of them just a couple of small ones we got to scare this old lady good hey tub lefty go take care of the house just a couple of small windows okay, okay. you guys this is far enough get ready with the rocks you guys let them go make it good Hey, the river rats beat us to it. Let's get them. Use your rocks on them. Hey, just I got Boys, boys, stop this fighting. Stop this instant deal. Let's get out of here. The old lady's been here. Let's go. Let's get going. Come on. Hold it up. What are you stopping for? We got to get out of here. Bill, we can't leave Mrs. Kane lying on the ground. Why not? If we go back there, we'll be in real trouble. You mean we'll be in a lot more trouble if we don't? She might be hurt bad. We can't just leave her there. Yeah, I guess you're right. Let's go back. There she is on the ground. Why, oh, she must be hurt bad to be still laying there. She's been hit on the head with a rock. Yeah, and she's bleeding. You go in the house and call the sheriff. Tell him to get a doctor. The sheriff? Yeah, I ain't afraid of him. Hurry up. If this old lady dies, we'll be in tr more trouble than we know what to do with. Mrs. Kane, lying on the ground. Uh, take a look at her, Doc. You two lads stay right where you are. Keep an eye on them, O'Rourke. Sure, no, they won't be getting away from O'Rourke. She hurt bad, Doc? Well, I don't know yet, son. Let's get her into the house before she freezes to death. Now, that's Bill. Let's wait a minute, and then we can use the three-man lift. I want O'Rourke free so these two toughs don't get away. Warn Mrs. Kane that she might get hurt. Now you smart Alex will pay for this. How do you feel now, Mrs. Kane? I feel fine, Doctor. My head aches a little, but outside of that, I, I feel all right. Yeah, well, that's good news, Mrs. Kane. I've got two of the hoodlums right here. I'll lock them up and then get the rest and haul them in, too. You'll do no such thing, Calvin. We didn't hit you on purpose, Mrs. Kane. You must have walked into the rock. Yeah, we didn't know who threw the rock that hit you. Believe me, we didn't mean to hurt you. We know that you plan to get even with Mrs. Kane. Yeah, but all we were going to do is break some windows, not hurt her. I don't believe your story. I'm taking you two tough guys in just the same. You can tell your story to the judge. Don't you dare do that, Sheriff. I'll not press charges, and you look awfully foolish trying to hold these boys without a charge. Besides, Art and Phil are the only ones who stayed to help me. Certainly that means that they're not all bad. Well, I, I didn't know about that. Well, she has a strong point, Cal. If she won't press charges, you'll be up a tree. Well, well, all right, I'll, I'll bide my time, but... But I'll get them sooner or later. Mrs. Kane, why do you refuse to press charges against these lands? They and their gang have committed assault and battery. Bill, 
Do you see the pictures on the mantel? Yes, ma'am, I do. The older man is my husband. The two younger men are my sons. My husband died after World War I because of his wounds and also from the effects of gas. My sons were killed in World War II. Gentlemen, the men in my family died because of violence and fighting. Perhaps they'd be alive today if the world had more love and kindness in it. You're right there, Mrs. Kane. I, I'm sorry to hear about your husband and sons, but uh, what's this got to do with these lads? Uh, Bill, will you hand me my Bible, please? I'd be glad to, Mrs. Kane. Thank you. The Beatitudes tells what I mean. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Gentlemen, this is my plan for showing these lads where they should walk. Our Lord is the very essence of love and kindness. And he came to bring joy and peace and love to all men. What these two young men need is some of the very things the Lord brought into this world. Let me try the Lord's way with these young men. I know it'll work. I see your point, Mrs. Kane, and it's, it's well taken. <laughs> I'll admit I'm a tough cop, but I, I guess I have a heart that beats under this badge. Mrs. Kane, thanks. We won't forget this. That's right, ma'am. We'll talk to the other guys and tell them to lay off. You've been very kind to us. Thank you. I've never seen such a change come over anybody as what's come over these two lads. Aye, Carolyn, that's a miracle you're watching. When a person radiates love like Mrs. Kane does, some of it's bound to be rubbing off on those who stick around. So now you know the whole story, guys. I say we ought to lay off fighting and leave Mrs. Kane alone. Yeah, I say that too. And anybody that doesn't agree will get a mouth full of floating molars. Mrs. Kane is a fine old lady. You say that none of us is in trouble, Phil? That's right. Mrs. Kane even talked the sheriff out of taking us in. I think we should tell Moose and his gang to lay off too. And no more fighting on Mrs. Kane's property. I'll tell Moose and his bunch in school tomorrow. If he don't like it, we'll make him. What a bunch of sissies you guys turned out to be. An old lady says a couple of sweet words to you, and you fall all over yourself. I'm just telling you, Moose, lay off. Yeah, and who's gonna make me? I still gotta get even for that old lady calling the cops. Yeah, you just try it and see what happens. Well, I'm gonna try it, and you won't stop me. That's what you think. We'll be watching Mrs. Kane's place. If you guys come near, you'll go away a bloody mess. Ha! Ah, you guys are turning chicken. You wouldn't start anything because you'd be in the doghouse with that old lady. But you can be sure we're gonna get even. You'll get even, all right. Even with the top of the ground. Stay away, Moose. I'm warning you, stay away. You guys be quiet so Mrs. Kane doesn't know we're out here. She might be worried if she finds out why we're here. Okay, Art. I'll pass the word. I don't see any signs of the Hill Gang yet. We better not see them. But Moose isn't chicken either. Yeah, I know. But he'll wish he was so he can fly out of here if he tries to hurt Mrs. Kane. Shh. Here they come, through the trees. Where? I see them. To your left, Art. Oh, yeah. 
So Moose can't take advice. Let's go after him and catch him way out back. Yeah. Come on, let's move out. Come on, get him. Hey, hey, the cops! Let's get out of here! Hold it! That ain't the cops! It's an ambulance! Listen to the siren, it's different. You're right. Come on, let's find out what's going on. Hey, it's Mrs. Kane, and she's out like a light! What's wrong with her, Doc? I'm not sure yet. Uh, looks like a brain hemorrhage. You mean she's bleeding inside her head from that rock? I'm not sure, son. But the blow from the rock could cause this. Boy. We're all set, Doc. Let's go. Boy, I wonder what's going to happen. <clears throat> yeah, I wonder what's going to happen. Take it into the hospital. Pipe down, you guys. What's the matter with the old lady? Yeah. What do you care, Moose? She's bleeding inside her head. Yeah, from the suck on the noggin she got from the rock. What, do you think she's going to die? We ain't no doc. But if she does... You guys are in as deep as we are. We'd better go over to the hospital and see how she makes out. I ain't going to no hospital. We can't help the doc now. No, no, but we could show that we want her to get better. Well, not me. I'm lambing out of here. You're yellow, Moose. You're as yellow as a banana. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll show you guys. Come on, gang, let's go to the hospital. All right, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Which hospital is she taking? Are you there? Go. Hello, Bill Jefferson. Bill, this is Cal. Oh, yes, Cal. What's up? Yeah, the doc just called me and said he's going to do emergency surgery on Mrs. Kane. Hmm? Brain hemorrhage. Yeah? Also told me all the kids from both gangs are in the waiting room. I'm going over there. If she dies, I'll have those smart Alex in the clink before they know what hit them. I'll be right over. See you at the hospital. Don't any of you monkeys try to leave this room. I'll be sitting right here by the door. Bill, what's going to happen to us if she dies? Yeah, we didn't do it on purpose. How are we going to find out who's to blame? Or will we all have to go to jail? When are we going to know whether she's going to pull Whoa through? Whoa there, fellas. Whoa there. One question at a time. If Mrs. Kane dies, the sheriff will arrest all of you, and then it'll be up to the judge to decide the outcome. Now, I know you fellas didn't do this on purpose... But you'll have to admit that you were warned by the sheriff and told to stop your fights. I've asked the doctor to tell us one way or the other what's happened. How are we going to stay here with nothing to do? The oper operation might take hours and hours. Well, I'm sure it won't take longer than four hours, Art. Four hours? Man alive, that's, that's a long time. What do we do? All of you fellas have gone to church or Sunday school at one time or another, haven't you? Oh, yeah, sure. But what's that got to do with this? You fellas can help Mrs. Kane by praying. And while you pray, you can ask the Lord to save you from your sins and make clean-cut lads out of you. How long's it been since Doc started operating? Half an hour. Boy, it seems like half a day. Bill, I'd never believe it if I didn't see it. Who would ever think these roughnecks could pray like they've been doing? Perhaps we're seeing a miracle, Cal. This is the only way the Lord could get them to hold still long enough to deal with them. Well, they've been here for two and a half hours. We've been waiting for three and a half hours now. How much longer is it going to take? I don't know. I think we lost. Maybe all the praying we did ain't no good. Yeah. Maybe it's because we ain't been the right kind of guys. Hey, it's a doc. Hey, doc. Hey, hey how's it going? What's, What's the word, doc? doc? How's she going to be, doc? You can go home, fellas. Mrs. Kane's going to be all right. Well, 
It's so nice of you two to escort me home, gentlemen. We're glad to do it, Mrs. Kane. My mother's got the house all ready, and she's going to stay with you until you're on your feet again. Oh, how nice. Oh, my, the place looks different. <laughs> In uh, what respect, Mrs. Kane? Why, the walks are shoveled and the firewood stack. <laughs> my, the whole place looks so neat and clean. Now, who went to all the trouble to do this for me? Mom! What's this all about? We just want you to show you that we think you're wonderful, Mrs. Kane. We're sure glad you're coming home from the hospital for good. Well, isn't this nice? These are the lads who fixed up around here, Mrs. Kane. Well, thank you so much. It looks fine, but, but what are you doing all this for? Because you did so much for us, Mrs. Kane. You were kind to us when we should have been punished. You spoke nice to us when we should have been yelled at. Yes, ma'am. We've talked with Moose and his gang, and we've decided to quit fighting and join gangs so we can do good. Help folks, just like you helped us. Praise the Lord. And now a bite of faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Boys and girls, I don't think that there's anything I can say that will add to Mrs. Kane's quotation from the Bible. We'll see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger! again. Our program today gives me, Ranger Bill, just a little time to talk to you moms and dads about our adventure stories and why we're on the air. We all know that every time a boy or girl listens to one of our programs, he gets some impression of the Christian life and the character of the people involved. So we must be constantly alert to guard the image that's presented to make it realistic and truthful, neither setting up false ivory tower heroes for fellas and gals to aspire to, or creating the impression that Christianity is an impossible goal in this day and age. We also try to present Christians as people, something which they are. The faults of a Christian don't have to be glossed over. He's human, too. So we try to present to you, the listener, a story that, from your point of view, is a factual photograph of a way of life, namely the Christian way, and showing individuals living, seeing, understanding this way of life, or maybe missing it completely. Let's all be honest before God so that truth can survive, and our young people will turn out to be the good citizens and real Christians that we want them to be. Ranger Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. Say, have you ever read the story, The Penalty of Command? Well, if you haven't, I'll give you a brief idea what it's about. The main theme of the story is to show the price that a boss has to pay because he's a leader of men. You know, a lot of folks think that a boss has an easy job. 
Well, it isn't so. The leader has more strain mentally than those who work under him. Sometimes he has to make decisions that he knows will make him unpopular. But it's a right decision and for the good of all concerned. That's what happens in the story, Stumpy Gets 30 Days. Bill and his rangers are moving the most dangerous animals in the world. These are the American bison. Heavy snows have made foraging in the upper pastures almost impossible. Young stock are suffering the most as they flounder shoulder high in the snow. Yes, the rangers have supplemental feeding stations for the buffalo, but the animals also need pasture so they can forage and get exercise. Let's join the fellows as they ride herd on these ornery critters. Bill, Stumpy's getting a pretty bad time from a young bull. Yeah, I noticed that, pal. I wouldn't worry about it. The old Kyher can take care of himself. I sure hope so. By the way that bull keeps charging and worrying Stumpy's horse, I don't know. He's trying to move away from him, but that critter keeps following. Boy, he's really got a chip on his shoulders. I'll keep an eye on him. Hey, Gray Wolf and Tom are having trouble with their side of the herd. Let's go. Hey, yo, Stumpy. Come on, boy. Let's get out of here. Think you and Tom can hold them now, Gray Wolf? Ah, uh, we do. Thanks for help. They not try and break away again. I hope not. Keep a close eye on them. They're in an ugly mood. Uh, I watch them close. Hey, Bill, we're stumpy. Huh? Well, I don't know. Should be over on the other side of the herd. I haven't seen him for several minutes. Gray Wolf, take charge of the herd. Let's go find Stumpy, pal. Get your rifle ready. Stumpy's in real trouble. The young buffalo bull finally made a full charge and gored the old-timer's horse. The horse went down, with the old fellow being thrown from his saddle. Before he could get up, the bull gored him and then rolled on his chest. Stumpy's horse, Maud, is frantically trying to help her master. Now the bull is getting ready for another charge. The wounded man and horse make a desperate effort to protect themselves as the beast turns and charges at full speed. Then suddenly... you got here. I, Bill, I, uh, he's in bad shape. Uh, yeah, you said it. Henry, ride like the wind to the chuck wagon and call for a helicopter on the radio. Then tell Gray Wolf to stop the herd and bed him down. I'll stay here. Bill, do you think he's... Well, he's hurt pretty bad, huh? Yeah. You standing here doesn't help. Get moving. Yes, sir. Up best. Come on, girl. Easy does it, boys. Every bone around his chest has been crushed. We're watching ourselves, Bill. Sit him down slowly now and slide the stretcher. There we are. That's good. Okay, fellas, take off. Hey, aren't you coming with us? No, I gotta help the fellas get the buffalo herd under lock and key. We'll get to the hospital as quickly as we can. Get going now. Yes, sir. He pulls through this one. He's badly injured. Come on, Storm. Let's join the boys. And we'll have to take it easy, big boy. Old Maud isn't able to run any races. Come on. Let's go. Come on, old girl. We'll take you where it's safe and warm.
Have the fellas got the gates open, Grey Wolf? Uh, not right, Bill. Maybe we hold back now so animals not drive too hard and break fence down. Yeah, pass the word. Uh, I do plenty soon. Henry, lay off! Okay, Bill. Hey, what's up? I just told the boys to hold back. The bison can drift through the gates and not crash into the fence. Oh, how long before we can go to the hospital? Right away. Here comes Grey Wolf. Get okay to go now. Tom and boys lock herd inside fence. Everything plenty quiet after animals settle down in new home. Now, that's fine, Grey Wolf. I'll breathe a lot easier now with those ornery rascals locked up. Why didn't you go in the helicopter with Stumpy? We could have handled the herd. I didn't want to take any chances with the buffalo as spooky as they've been. Being short two hands might have caused another accident. One's enough. Well, let's ride for Naughty Pine. I'm sorry, fellas. I, I don't know any more than I did an hour ago. Well, we understand, Doc. How long before the crisis? Mm, perhaps an hour, a day, a week. Uh, I can't tell. He's very seriously hurt. That buffalo bit an awful job on the old-timer. Uh, we stay here until we know one way or other. Make yourselves comfortable in the room across the hall. It's empty. Thanks, Doc. Uh, Bill. Uh, yes, Doc. By old sound medical reasoning, the old-timer should have cashed in before he got here. Undoubtedly, his clean outdoor life is helping him fight. I I don't know. There are a lot of things about this case I just don't understand. But I think you fellas have been doing a lot of praying for your old friend, right? Yeah, we have. From the moment it happened, we've all been praying one continuous silent prayer. thy decision, we shall humbly accept it, because your wisdom is perfect. Lord, the plea of our hearts is that Stumpy be healed and returned to a normal life. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Almighty God, help our friend. Give him strength to fight and fight to live. God, if you want him to come home, then we obey your wish. But we want that he live. Raise him up if it be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, in Jesus' name, we ask that you help the doctors to bring Stumpy out of this. Yes, we've ribbed the old-timer about his age and his jokes and about a lot of things. But really, Lord, we love him. We need his bright and happy outlook on life to lift us up when the going's rough. Please, Lord, if it be thy will, raise him up to be strong and healthy again. Amen. 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 It's seven hours since we talked to the doc. All they do is run in and out of Stumpy's room with all kinds of gadgets. It must look like a medical supply store in there. But nothing's happened. The old timer doesn't get worse and he doesn't get better. How long's this going on? Take it easy, pal. Seems like only several minutes to the people who are fighting for Stumpy's life. We must be patient. I know it's hard, but we're used to difficult jobs. Yeah, you said it. Hey, here come Doc. Hey, he's smiling. It's all over, huh, Doc? And you won. No, Bill, we won. All of us working together as a team won the battle. Huh? We did all the work with the patient, but you fellas prayed. <laughs> can't make any of your corny jokes because I'll climb the wall if I try to laugh. <laughs> He's recovering all right. Right off his ornery nature sticks out. <laughs> We're very happy to be sitting here talking with you, old friend. Well, you can say that again. Boy, Stumpy, you sure gave us a scare. Ah, uh, you hurt plenty bad. You fellas don't know how happy I am to know I've got real praying friends. Oh, what do you mean? 
Don't try to pull the wool over my eyes, sonny. And every once in a while I came to, but I didn't open my eyes. I heard the doctor and nurses whisper about how close to death I was. You fellers ain't fooling me none. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It warms my old ticker to know I got real friends who stick through thick and thin. Uh, not what friends for, Stumpy. Christian friends no good unless they pray for one another. Well, I'll never forget this. Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, our time is up, fellas. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow, Stumpy. Yeah, it'll be fine. So long, right, Stumpy. Goodbye. So long, Stumpy. See ya. Say, hey, Bill. Yes, old timer. How's Maud? What happened to her? Ah, uh, she's all right. The gore she got was only a graze. The impact knocked her down. I've got her resting and taking it easy. That's fine. She's a wonderful horse. She tried to help me by fighting off that old bull. I know, Stumpy. Maud will go on record as one of the great horses of the ranger service. We won't forget her heroic deed. That's good news, Sonny. Well, I'll sleep all right now. Come in, Bill. You want to talk to me about Stumpy, Doc? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, Bill, I, I don't know quite how to say this, but... Well, I'm not satisfied with the old-timer's progress. No, he's, he, he's healing all right. His chest is slowly correcting the crush it took. Yeah, I understand, Doc. Uh, you mean you're of the same opinion? Mm -hmm. I've noticed for several weeks now. His morale is good, but not aggressive. I agree. He doesn't have a defeatist attitude. I'd, I'd rather call it, well, a... Uh, I don't know just exactly what I would call it, unless it would be to say that he, he acts like a tired old man dreaming about retirement. Mm -hmm. I think you hit the nail right on the head, Doc. He's fighting to get well, but the old spark is gone. Sort of like a patched inner tube that's afraid of another blowout. <laughs> Very aptly put. But how can we get the spark back? I don't know. It's a shame to let it go out or even just smolder. Say, Doc, let me take him home with me. Perhaps some good home cooking and homey surroundings will help him. Stumpy, you're sure getting your old appetite back. Yep, I sure am, sonny. Of course, that ornery varmint had to go and sit on my stomach and flatten it out, but I keep <laughs> stuffing it best I can. That'll put it back into capacity shape. Especially with Mom's delicious cooking. <laughs> oh, Stumpy. Man, man Stumpy. The way you talk, you'd think Mom was the only good cook alive. Here, Bill. Have some more meat. Oh, thanks, Henry. I think I will. Say, old-timer, how about walking down to the office with us? Uh, Henry will drive you back. Yeah, how about it, Stumpy? Well, I'd like to, Sonny, but once around the block and a little puttering in the backyard's about all I can handle right now. Bill, what's wrong with Stumpy? I don't know, pal. I wonder the same thing. He act like old man, tired old man. Yeah, that's about it. And his morale is high. He isn't sour about his accident. He just acts plain tired. He not old timer we once know. Stumpy never let age make him old. He always young in mind and heart. Yeah, you're right. You fellas go on into the office. I'm going to stop in here and see the doc. Okay, Bill. Let us know what he says. I will. See you in an hour or so. Hello, Bill. How's our old friend? That's what I came to see you about, Doc. You busy? Nope. Be right there. Yeah, I didn't get much sleep last night. Yeah, that's the life of a doctor. <laughs> Guess you've lost many a night's sleep, too, huh, Bill? Yeah, lots of... Stumpy isn't making much progress, is he? Other than recovery. No, I'm afraid not. Doc, 
Are you sure he's physically all right? Yes, yes. I, I've x-rayed him from head to foot, and he's getting several different shots to build up his general health. Takes enough pills to choke a cow. He's doing fine. But will he completely recover with his mental attitude the way it is? Well, it's hard to say. In my opinion that he won't. He'll baby himself, and then, well, that's not what I want. He's got to stretch his muscles, put in some hard work, repair the damage done to them. I don't mean he should climb a mountain first thing in the morning, but it eventually should come to that. Bill, his full recovery depends on proper exercise and circulatory stimulation. The stimulation given with liver and iron shots doesn't take the place of the real thing. Well, then moderate exercise increasing to hard work won't hurt him, huh? It'll do him a world of good. If he doesn't, he'll be an invalid the rest of his life. He has to be willing to feel his pulse pounding in his blood vessels. Well, I'll keep trying. Maybe in a few weeks he'll change his mind. Well, I hope so. If he doesn't, you'd better buy him a nice rocking chair. Have you got more papers to file, Bill? Uh, yes, pal. Uh, here's a fistful. That ought to do it. Sure appreciate your help. <laughs> well, that's Okay. I get a kick out of filing papers, especially when I have to look for them again when they're filed in the wrong folder. Ah, well, there we are. That's finished. Well, what are you working so hard at? You've been writing out half a dozen forms there. Oh, hello, Gray Wolf. Everything all right out in the barn? Uh, horses have enough food and water for the rest of day now. Well, I'm glad you're here, Gray Wolf, because I have something to tell both of you before I tell Stumpy. Oh, what is it, Bill? Uh, that's sound important. It is. Henry, you wanted to know why I've been so busy with these papers. Yeah, I was just curious. These are Stumpy's retirement papers. Bill, you're joking. Am I? I've worked on them for three hours. Call that a joke? But, but why? I asked the same question, Bill. Why? Why? That's obvious, isn't it? He's a tired old man and no longer of any use to the Forest Service. You mean you're going to put him out to pasture just like that? No warning? No chance to recover? Just throw him out? If he can snap out of it by the time the papers come back from Washington, I can stop his retirement. How long would that be? Thirty days. That sounds like a jail sentence. This will kill the old-timer. I suppose you think this is a barrel of fun for me. You tell old-timer soon? Yes. I'm going home now and tell him. Stumpy, I wish somebody else could tell you this, but I have to because I'm your boss. These papers I have in my hand... What kind of legal papers are those, honey? They're your retirement papers, Stumpy. I know you won't believe me when I tell you I'm your friend, and I'm sorry it has to be this way. So, you're putting me out to pasture just like an old horse, eh? Huh? Papers won't be back for 30 days. My signature clinches your career. If you can improve yourself by the time the papers return, I won't sign them. You figure I'm a tired old man and I ain't going to get well, eh? I don't know the answer to that, Stumpy. You're the only one who does. Is that right? Well, young fella, I'll show you that you can't throw me out of the Forest Service. In 30 days, I'll be running road races up to the tops of the mountains. What do you think I am, some old billy goat that can't eat tin cans anymore? You give me 30 days just like a judge, and I'll make you eat those papers. Henry, Grey Wolf, I don't want to argue about Stumpy. The die is cast, and that's the way it's going to stay. Bill, I heard you pray for Stumpy to get well. I heard you plead with the Lord for his recovery. Why? So you could throw him out like an old coat? Maybe it would have been better if he died. At least you would have had the pleasure of breaking his heart. Henry, you're talking out of line. Is that so? Well, I've got plenty to say, and I'm going to say it right here and now. Why do you have to throw the old timer out? 
Can't you keep him around and give him easy jobs? Bill, you're killing him by inches, and I think it's a dirty trick. Uh, I agree with Henry. All men work hard many years, and his faithful friend. And that not mean anything to you? Why, you not let Buffalo beat your chest flat and stick horn into stomach. Then we see how fast you recover. Fine reward, old friend, get. Bill, you wrong. All wrong. I've been wrong before, Grey Wolf. But my decision still goes until I'm proved wrong. Hey, what are you fellas doing here? You're not off duty. Well, the forest ain't gonna burn down with all the snow out there. That's beside the point. You're not off duty. Now, we're taking time off to tell you we think Stumpy's getting a dirty deal. Yeah, yeah it sure is. What's gotten into you, Bill? You just can't give the old timer the boot like this. Tom, Paul, the rest of you, listen to me. I'm giving Stumpy a fair chance. Also, I'm actually doing him a favor. He's not fit for active duty. According to regulations, he can't retire for two years. But he'll get full retirement pay. You won't have to pay it to him long. He'll die of a broken heart. Yes. You know the Forest Service is his whole life. Everything. It's a cheap trick, Bill. A cheap trick. Yeah, sure. cheap. All your words and arguments won't change my mind. I'm still the boss here, and what I say goes. Come on, fellas. You can't talk to him. That's right. I think I'll put in for a transfer. Yeah, I mean, get out of here. See ya. Grey Wolf, I've got an idea how we can beat Bill at his own game. Oh, that good. I have idea too. We put heads together. Let's move Stumpy back to his own house. Then you and I will take turns helping him get back on his feet. The other fellows will help, too. Oh, that's plenty of good idea. And now I tell you a secret. Huh? I have same idea. So I make phone call to doctor. He say old friend can take all the exercise he can get. A little at first, and then more. Doc say it only way old-timer get back on feet. And you think it's a good idea? Mm, it only way to help Stumpy. Wonderful. Let's get started, then. Thirty days isn't a very long time, unless you're sitting it out in jail. Sonny, this old body ain't what it used to be. Uh, you haven't got an old body. The doc says your body's doing fine. All it needs is lots of muscle stretching exercises. Come on, let's do three blocks today. Okay. I can take the three going all right, but I don't know about the three coming back. Oh, you'll make it all right. If you can't, I'll carry you. <laughs> It'd be like a cold carrying an old horse. <laughs> do half mile walk plenty of good now we try three quarter mile today <laughs> a few weeks ago i could do three quarters of a mile on a dead run now i'm not sure i can do it on a slow walk oh you stretch muscles plenty good and they get strong and healthy yeah but if i stretch them too much they'll snap like rubber bands hey paul where's the fire breathe deeper stumpy got to push your ribs back out where they belong. Okay, but I don't want the air pump to blow a gasket. You're doing the mile walk in fine shape, old timer. Yeah, pretty soon I'll be ready to race Bill up the nearest mountain. <laughs> Henry, get the dock. I got a terrible pain in my chest. Don't waste your time on me, fellas. I'm just an old fossil. Nonsense. The doc says all you had was a muscle spasm in your chest muscles. Here, yeah, these hot packs will straighten it out quick as a bunny. Yeah, I'm beginning to think Bill's right, just like he always is. Stumpy, you not talk like that. Discouragement is Satan's best weapon. I know, but what's the use of avoiding the facts? My bag of bones just can't take it anymore. Come in. Oh, Mr. Stewart. How are you, sir? Just fine, Henry. Uh, hello, Stumpy, Gray Wolf. Good to meet you. Howdy. Stumpy had a Charlie horse in his chest muscle. That's why we're baking him in hot towels. He'll be all right shortly. Oh, glad to hear that. For a moment, I, uh, I thought my trip was wasted. Huh? What do you mean by that, Mr. Stewart? Well, Stumpy, I've uh, heard the news about your retiring from the ranger service, and, uh, 
Well, I want you to come and work for me as chief ranger. I got a lot of private forest that, uh, well, needs expert care. You can name your own price, Stumpy. I want your experience and knowledge to protect the thousands of dollars I got tied up in trees. You ain't joking, are you, Mr. Stewart? Oh, I don't joke about things like this. What do you say? Well, I don't know what to say. I'm sure tempted. Give me a week to think it over. By that time, my 30 days will be up. You do fine, Stumpy. We walk three miles at almost double time. Yeah, I'm kind of pleased with myself. You keep wind good after you run block. I think you make fine recovery. Thanks, honey. Hey, here comes Henry like a bunny with a burr in his toes. I wonder what's up. And we know plenty quick. Boy, boy, am I glad I found you guys. What's up, Sonny? A big brown envelope just came in the mail for Bill. It's from Washington. And this is the 29th day. Well, now's the time for a showdown. Let's go. I'm ready. Fellas, hey Stumpy, you're looking fine. Never mind the hogwash. Tomorrow's the thirtieth day, and that's why I'm here. You're still gonna throw me out of the Forest Service? Well, what's the big grin for? Yeah, I don't see anything funny about this. Stumpy, you're not going to be retired, huh? The papers are still here in my desk drawer where I put them after I talked to you. Here, take a look. Uh, but. But what was in the big brown envelope? Just a supply of new reports. While you're catching your breath, let me explain. Regulations say that when a man Stumpy's age is disabled 90 days or longer, he must be retired for safety reasons. I didn't want this to happen. But I knew if I extended sympathy, it would happen. Because you were hurt pretty bad. So I had to put the old fighting spirit back into you, old friend. The doctor gave up, but I didn't. Well, I'll be a horned toad polecat. How'd you know I could get fit as a fiddle in 30 days? You're a ranger, aren't you? Oh, boy, that was a rough one. Bill sure knows how to handle his men. Yes, sir, even after they've been gored and rolled on by a buffalo bull. See you next week for more adventure with Ray!